Welcome to Area 2000. This program introduces our listeners to the scientific approach to discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation during the work week, call Angela Thompson between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. at area code 702-456-1606. That's Angela Thompson at area code 702-456-1606. And now, Area 2000. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. And uh, you all have the Bigelow Foundation to thank, as you know, for this program. And thank them, you should, when you get an opportunity to give them a call. We'll get their number on the air during the course of the show. Well, all right. I think you're going to enjoy this evening's program. Uh, My guest is going to be Ray Fowler, but first we're going all the way to Michigan, where we're going to find Linda Howe. We'll have to find out what she's doing in the state of Michigan. Good evening, Linda. Hi, Art. What in the world are you doing in Michigan? (laughs) Tonight I'm in Grass Lake, Michigan, near Ann Arbor. This weekend, a seminar was held in which abduction investigators Bud Hopkins and Professor David Jacobs of Temple University, both of whom have been on Area 2000 in the past few months, talked with mental health professionals and teachers about the UFO abduction syndrome. The seminars were provoked by the Robert Bigelow-sponsored Roper survey in 1991, which focused on unusual personal experiences. According to Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, that survey indicated that perhaps one in 50, one in five zero Americans fall into the human abduction syndrome or uh, aspects or characteristics which may indicate some kind of involvement with that syndrome. If so, education about the phenomenon is important, especially in the mental health profession, and this was the sixth in a series of such seminars that have been held around the country. And your guest tonight, Raymond Fowler, has been an important and longtime investigator in the abduction syndrome, doing the very important books about the Betty Andresen case. And uh, I think this will be a very important program for listeners uh, because the human abduction syndrome is perhaps one of the most puzzling uh, subjects right now in this entire phenomenon. Uh, I've also visited the laboratory of Dr. W.C. Levengood, the biophysicist from the University of Michigan, who has worked so hard the past three years on analysis of plants from crop formations in the United States, Canada, Australia, and England. One of his most important findings is a change in plant cells that indicate an intense energy has been applied to these plants in a very short period of time, only seconds compared to the two or three hours that known hoaxers have taken to create man-made formations. I'd like to play an excerpt from a conversation that I recorded today with Dr. Levengood as he talked to me about evidence for rapid heating. Mm-hmm. For the three years I've uh, been looking at these crop circles, there is a consistency to alterations. There's there is a consistency within alterations of the plant cell which indicate a very rapid heating. Now, how do we know that that's a very rapid heating? We know that because the, uh, there are tiny uh, anatomical structures in the cell of the plant called cell wall pits. These cell wall pits, um, as, as we found through our research, this didn't come about suddenly, but we found that they, when, when the cell is heated, it expands like a balloon, and these cell wall pits expand on the surface just like there would be a spot, you'd blow up a balloon, there'd be a spot on it, and they expand. When the heating disappears, the cell goes back to its original state, but the cell wall has properties, it's called viscoelastic properties. This means that it's uh, like it's partially like a rubber band uh, that's stretched that doesn't quite return to its original shape. So when you would look under a microscope, let's say at a plant that came out of one of the formations in England, you might find a change in just if it may be more oval than a plant that wasn't affected by some energy that's yet unknown. That's right. The, the, the pits are measured, and we make a, a, it's called a statistical analysis. We measure a lot of pits on the normal plants, or what we call controls, 
and we measure a lot of pits on the uh, uh, from the crop formation. And you can say, well, how do you know the, the heating is rapid? Well, what we found is if the if the heating is continued, we can duplicate this in a microwave, but only if it's heated very briefly in a microwave. And this is like an ordinary microwave in your kitchen, where the heat uh, is created internally in the plant cell very rapidly. If that, if that heating continues beyond a few seconds, then the cell expands, but then it begins to collapse, and the total the average size of these cell wall pits ends up smaller. And that. it would cook the plant, wouldn't it? And it would cook the plant, right. Now that seems to me to be one of the fundamental points that the general public has not understood. Whatever's happening in the cross circle, it's some kind of an energy from a biophysical, biochemical point of view, but whatever it is, is rapidly enough that it's not cooking the plant, but if these plants continue to grow. Exactly. This Anything that's heated this fast, and with this amount of energy, would indeed, with time, cook the plant cell. It would, it would kill them. And we never find that, in fact, the plant goes, goes right on growing. And one of the hoax circles last year, the people who made it said it took them two hours to make one of the formations. Yeah, that's right. You could never, <laughs> you apply that kind of energy, you know, it wouldn't. Uh, You'd have nothing left to right. grow. Absolutely. Now, uh, the other. Uh, 
obvious, rapid eating. And art. Dr. Levengood is now studying soil samples and plant samples from people in Michigan and other parts of the country where they have had either rings or circles in their backyards or front yards seemingly associated with what we now call the human abduction syndrome. Hmm. And what is interesting is that in that soil, that in some cases in the abduction syndrome, appears to be hardened or baked or dead, he has found that when some of the plants from these rings and circles in the yards of abductees are planted, they grow at an accelerated rate exactly as he has found from plants sampled in these various countries that he has studied the last three years. Wow. Um, do you find yourself now drawn more to the abduction aspect uh, than you have been, Linda? I think it has been equally interwoven in my own investigation and work since I did a strange harvest back in 1980 because of the Judy Doherty case. Um, I had not been aware of the uh, whole abduction syndrome until I started working on a strange harvest, and that is what led me to the Judy Doherty and Cindy Tyndall case, and that was the mother and daughter who had been traveling with their family in uh, Houston, Texas, in May of 1973, and it was the, an incident in where five people in a car apparently all lose time, all at the same time, but no one has any uh, conscious memory of what happened during that event, and that's something that Ray Fowler probably tonight could go into, the whole issue of there are multiple witnesses, and there are cases of where there are people in a car that seem to be simultaneously affected by amnesia. Um, it's part of this uh, manipulation of our minds that we don't understand very well. Has there been any uh, uh, hypnosis done in that case yet? Yes. Um, in When I did a strange harvest, I worked with uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, who was then head of counseling and testing at the University of Wyoming, with uh, Judy, who was the mother. And that case came about in one of the ways that researchers often receive uh, cases. She had been suffering very severe headaches, and she had been having nightmares, but she had no conscious memory of any event that related necessarily to these headaches and the nightmares. She sought out a medical doctor for treatment of her headaches, and it was the medical doctor that suggested that perhaps this was a, related to some sort of psychological trauma that led to eventually hypnosis, and in the hypnosis, she could see a beam of light that had an animal going up in it, but she could not clearly see what the animal was in that first hypnosis session. Later, while I was working on a strange harvest, uh, that case became known to uh, a group in Arizona uh, that were also working on uh, the entire UFO phenomenon and all its complicated facets. Uh, they uh, got me in touch with her, and eventually we did the uh, hypnosis session in which she broke through her amnesia completely and saw a brown and white calf going up in this beam of light. Ten years later, her daughter, who had been a teenager in 73 and had rejected everything about that night, had rejected her, uh, her mother's claim that there uh, was something unusual, finally sought out help herself. And in her own independent hypnosis with John Carpenter in Missouri, she also saw a brown and white calf going up in a pale beam of yellow light into yet an unidentified object in the sky. And that's how, throughout my entire uh, research of mutilations, I came into the human abduction syndrome. Boy, this multiple witness business is particularly interesting, isn't it? That's because you have at least some kind of verification. And in their case, the mother... Uh, never talked with the daughter, and in fact, the family have stories about how the daughter never wanted to hear anything about what her mother or anybody would have to say, no matter what. So you had a resistance to the entire idea of UFOs or anything else. So, perhaps some sort of psychological protective mechanism. Yeah, the daughter was extremely resistant and avoidance of the subject, and then eventually, which does happen sometimes, and Ray probably has cases uh, himself where something, whether it's in dreams or some other way, people are nagged by something, and eventually, as uh, her as Cindy got older, uh, something bothered her, and she eventually went into hypnosis, and out came a very, very similar story. Well, I sure do thank you for all of this, Linda. Um, fascinating stuff. Well, and to know that there's, circle, there's a circle in a yard in Michigan right now that soil and plant samples are being studied by a biophysicist who 
absolutely did not three years ago think that he was dealing with anything but meteorology. <laughs> All right. Linda, are you going to be back in Philadelphia next week? Yeah, next Sunday. All right. We'll look for you and your report then. Thank you, and my best to Ray Fowler. Thank you. And uh, Ray Fowler, indeed, coming right up. Uh, Raymond E. Fowler was born in Salem, Massachusetts, and received a B.A. degree from Gordon College of Liberal Arts. His career includes service with the USAF Security Service and with GTE Strategic System Division. He retired early as a task manager and senior planner involved with major weapons systems development. He is, uh, he is uh, quite a contributor to ufology. He's respected by UFO researchers throughout the world. His investigative reports have been published in congressional hearings, military publications, newspapers, magazines, and professional journals in the USA and abroad. The USAF UFO Project's chief scientific consultant, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, has called Raymond Fowler, quote, an outstanding UFO investigator. I know of none who is more dedicated, trustworthy, or persevering. Ray currently serves as National Director of Investigations on the Board of Directors for the Mutual UFO Network, an international group investigating UFOs. He has appeared on over 200 radio and television shows around the United States since 1963. He is a three times published author. He uh, is director of his own planetor planetarium and observatory and a very popular speaker. And this morning, or this evening rather, he will speak with you. Here all the way from Massachusetts is Ray Fowler. Good evening, Ray. Are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Good evening. Uh... Excellent. Oh, um, I don't know about excellent. Now our telephone connection seems to be uh, a little bit noisy. Uh, maybe it's on my end. I can try a different channel if you'd like to hold for a second. Um, let's, let's try it. Let's, uh, let's switch and see if we can clean it up. Um, or on the other hand, it may just be... Uh, in the line itself. We have quite a long connection here. Uh, is that better? Um, as a matter of fact, it is. Here we go again a little bit. Oh, we'll, we'll better leave it alone, I guess. Okay, well, we'll see if it clears up. If it doesn't, uh, at some point, I'll simply redial the number and we'll reconnect. Ray, welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, I take it that you heard uh, Linda's report. Yes, I did. Very, very interesting. I, I had heard about his work <clears throat> before. But it was nice to hear him personally describe it. Um. You have been an uh, investigator um, for MUFON for how long, uh, Ray? Oh, I started out as a state director for the state of Massachusetts probably back in the, uh, back in the 70s after I uh, got out of NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. So it's been quite a long time, probably since uh, 1970. All right. Um, you must run into all kinds of fascinating stuff. Tell us a little bit about MUFON, if you would, and uh, what exactly do you do? Do you go running about to different parts of the country or the world investigating some of these cases, or how do you pursue it? Well, when I was the state director for Massachusetts, for MUFON and for NCLAP, I did a lot of on-site investigations, hundreds of them. Uh, when I was made director of investigations for MUFON, I really uh, didn't do too many of the on-site investigations of just regular reports. I was more involved with abduction reports uh, and also in putting together a field investigator's manual from UFON, keeping that up to date, and receiving telephone calls from people all over the country who had, uh, had UFO experiences. And then my uh, duty was really to refer them to the state directors from UFON for investigation. So instead of doing an awful lot of on-site investigations now, I refer a lot of cases, and I pick uh, a few cases that I'm very interested in and give them the FBI treatment, maybe spend two or three years investigating just one report rather than uh, just a, a, an on-site investigation of a regular UFO report. I'm spending more time on the abduction phenomenon. Right now I'm uh, concentrating on uh, a facet of the abduction phenomenon that uh, I think deserves further study, and that's the paraphysical nature of some of these <coughs> uh, abduction reports. The one that Linda just mentioned, for example, the Judy Doherty case, is fascinating because it involved uh, an out-of-the-body experience mm -hmm. uh, as, as well as a physical abduction. And in my correspondence with uh, 
Oh, I must have gotten around 4,000 letters uh, in response to the watchers and uh, personal contacts. I find that a certain percentage of the abduction reports involve uh, OBEs. And uh, <clears throat> being a nuts and bolts person for so many, many years, uh, I sort of ignored things like this, and a lot of other investigators are too. So right now I'm concentrating on that facet of the abduction phenomenon. It's fascinating, uh, and I think that uh, it you know, should be uh, given the FBI treatment as well, and I'm trying to do that right now. I talked to a lot of uh, serious investigators, um, Ray, and uh, many of them now seem to feel that the abduction aspect of the whole UFO controversy is the best path to follow in trying to prove something or trying to uh, uh, finally put our hands on, on some real evidence. Uh, it, would you share that view? Uh, yes, I would. And another thing I'm very interested in is the <clears throat> physical marks left on abductees. I'm collecting uh, dozens of uh, photographs of scoop marks in exactly the same location. In fact, if you lay these out on the table, many of them you would think were on the same person. Uh, in the same place, uh, the same size, uh, they may vary a little bit. Uh, I think this is one aspect that has to be looked at, too. Where where are these marks generally on the body? Uh, well, usually, but not always, usually they're on the leg over the uh, tibia or, or shin bone. Mm -hmm. uh, another place it would be on the arm or on the spinal column, uh, sometimes on the, on the back and forehead, but mm. the most common one that I'm finding is uh, just over the... Uh, uh, shin bone. Are these marks, uh, when you see them, always in a healed condition, or uh, are some of them uh, that are more recent actually not healed all the way, or w what do you find? Most of the ones I've seen <coughs> are healed. Uh, if you've read The Watchers and, and, and uh, know about uh, some of the things I reported from my own personal life, when I went to the dermatologist, he said it was in the process of healing. Hmm. Uh, but I haven't been able to get to anybody were except uh, Jack Weiner and his seems to be healing as well. Uh, he was one of the Allagash abduction abductees. I have never been able to get to someone other than myself the next day to see, you know, what it looks like. Usually you get these reports, uh, oh, months or years after they happen. Uh, most people don't even know what these things are. They'll, they'll have a close encounter UFO sighting and they'll have flashbacks or dreams, uh, uh, of an abduction experience, and finally, a uh, certain percentage of them uh, get involved with a UFO investigator, and uh, lo and behold, they look at that scoop mark, and they say, wow, you know, this is a benchmark of the abduction phenomenon, and ask them, you know, when did they get that? And if they remember, it usually coincides with uh, a uh, UFO experience. How many uh, people do you suppose, and, and this is speculative, I, I guess, uh, uh, have had uh, these abduction experiences, uh, and what percentage of them seem to recall it? Uh, I know that the Bigelow Foundation did a big study on it, indicating as many as one in 50. Would you uh, would you think that to be uh, credible? I would say that one in 50 have exhibited the typical benchmarks or, or characteristics of a, an abduction experience, but that doesn't uh, perhaps qualify them as an abductee because there may be some other phenomena that are involved that... Uh, that, you know, coincides with the, the, the abduction phenomenon. Uh, I would say that probably a, a high percentage of that uh, one in 50 uh, may have had uh, an abduction experience, uh, but it, there's no real way of telling. I think this is the first step, a statistical study like this, and I think it must be refined. I think that these people, or a certain percentage of these people, uh, should be uh, chosen and, and investigated further, and uh, then a percentage uh, may be out of that. All right, Ray, hold on just one sec while I ID the station, and we'll be right back. <laughs> this is Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. It's Sunday evening. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening, everybody. This is Area 2000. My guest is Ray Fowler all the way from the state of Massachusetts. And we're right. talking about abductions this evening. Ray, are you still there? I sure am. Good. Um, what in the world, I'm going to backtrack a little bit now, um, got you interested in this whole field of work? I mean, how did you come to it? Well, I was interested.
interested in experimental aircraft and space travel as a teenager back in the mid-40s, and when flying discs appeared in headlines uh, uh, all over the country and, and uh, the Air Force immediately took an interest, uh, I took an interest as well, and as a teenager just began collecting information uh, on the subject. And then on July 4th, 1947, had my own daylight disc sighting. And when I was working on a farm uh, in broad daylight, I saw this uh, uh, disc-shaped object, which I thought was a parachute at first, drifting along. And uh, as it got closer, I saw that uh, there was no uh, person and no shroud lines, and it descended in a falling leaf motion. Uh, so that really piqued my interest. In fact, the newspaper, the few days after, that was on the Saturday, the Monday newspaper, the local one, uh, had been a headline to the disc seen in the area. I think that when it became apparent that the discs were not uh, experimental aircraft and that our government and other governments had uh, launched investigations, uh, I became extremely interested. Uh, during my tour with the uh, Air Force Security Service, uh, I came across various people who uh, had been directly involved with the UFO study, and it was being taken very seriously. So when I got out, I began to perform uh, on-site investigations myself and send unsolicited reports to Project Blue Book and to NICAP. And then NICAP, uh, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena at that time, uh, sent uh, their state director, uh, Walter Webb, who was assistant director of Hayden Planetarium in Boston, to see me and uh, sort of took me on as an on-the-job trainee uh, investigator, and from there I became state director and then became involved with the University of Colorado Air Force Sponsored Study and with uh, Dr. J. L. Hynek Center for UFO Studies and from UFON, so it's been sort of an evolution. Uh, it sounds as though, though, uh, if I had to guess, that your own sighting did it for you. Uh, yes, and when I look back in retrospect, uh, and after I did the Andreasen Affair investigation, some other abduction reports, and recognize what had happened in my early childhood also might have been involved with these experiences. I think that perhaps my, my interest might have been subconsciously influenced by that. It, that's just sheer speculation on my part. But uh, there has been a burning interest as soon as they, you know, appeared uh, uh, in the 1947 wave. Um, can you tell us about the Andresen case? Yeah. Uh, there was sort of a lull in uh, activity in Massachusetts, and no one had really looked into an abduction report locally here, and we contacted Dr. Heineck and asked him if there were anybody in Massachusetts that had reported an abduction experience, and he sent a copy of a letter that came from uh, Betty Andreasen, uh, who lived in South Ashburn in Massachusetts. And uh, she was a very religious person, a uh, fundamentalist Christian, and... Uh, she interpreted her experience as being religious, but when you took, lifted that out of the experience, uh, it was a typical abduction uh, experience, the same type of entities and so forth into the house. But all she could remember was them entering the house. Uh, I, I'm a little curious. Um, in what way did she connect it uh, to her religious faith? What did she feel had occurred to her? She felt that because these things could come through the door and do the things they they did, that that she was uh, involved with angels. <laughs> and uh, so we decided to uh, give it the FBI treatment. Uh, I did a ru real rugged character reference check on her, for example, and uh, decided that she was a, a sane person. And uh, we conducted uh, a couple of years of hypnotic regression sessions and uh, for the Andreas and Affair Phase 1 investigation. Actually, it's been three, and I'm on a fourth now. Uh, and she relived being taken out of the house. Her family were left behind with one entity. They were put in sort of a state of suspended animation, except for her daughter. Once in a while, the entity would let her out of this state. But she was taken and uh, given a physical examination, and uh, a lot of strange things happened to her, and then returned to the house. Uh, and we thought that was the end of it. Uh, but while she was uh, on the operating table, they, they took something out of her nose. And uh, we tried to find out how that got in there at that time, but she became so emotionally upset that the hypnotist didn't want to push it any further. So it wasn't until later on when she uh, was available again, she had moved to Florida, that we did a phase two investigation and found out that uh, something had been, uh, her eye had been taken out and something had been put mm -hmm. somewhere uh, within her head. And we assumed behind the eye maybe. Uh, and that's probably how that got in there. And they were taking it out that way. Uh, it, it's, been a, it's been a long investigation. Uh, I'm doing the Phase 4 investigation now. That, that there's just 
house a wealth of detail, not only with Betty, but with members of her family. It seems this is a family phenomenon. She must be a very patient lady to go through these years of research. She feels and uh, uh, that uh, she's supposed to be doing this. <laughs> Uh, they told her that she was supposed to be doing this if you accept it at face value. And uh, uh, so she is uh, very willing, but uh, sometimes I feel very badly for her when she's reliving some of these experiences. What, what kind of detail did she give you about the beings that had taken her? Well, the beings that had taken her initially uh, were probably about four and four and a half feet tall with a uh, head shape much like an inverted pear with... Uh, large mongoloid eyes, a diminutive mm -hmm. nose, slit for a mouth, and uh, holes for ears, maybe a tiny earlobe. Uh, they communicated by telepathy. They, they didn't walk. They floated, almost like a, a, a skater, you know, along just above the uh, floor or sure. above the ground. They could make right-angle turns. Uh, when they came into the house, uh, they left one behind, and they came in in a row. And, and as they came in the door, through the door, uh, they would appear and disappear, and there'd be sort of a wisp of, like, uh, vapor behind as, as they came in. They, used to, they came in, appear, disappear, appear, disappear. And when they went out, there was a slot in this line of entities, and she was swept off her feet and floated in this line, and she went right through the door as well, which is another typical characteristics of people being taken through doors, through walls, through windows with these, with these beings. Uh... That was that particular type of entity. Another type of entity that she has seen and others have seen with these. That, that first one that you described, though, that is the one commonly described again and again and again, isn't it? It is. And uh, another type of entity that seems to be controlling the activities of these entities uh, look very much like us. Uh, they don't have the jumpsuit uh, garments uh, that these small ones have, these uh, uh, almost skin-tight garments, but... They, would, they look anything like what an extraterrestrial would look like. Uh, they, weigh, they, wear, they wear white robes. They're about seven feet tall. Some have blonde hair. Some have gray hair. They have blue eyes. And they, like the entities, communicate by telepathy and seem to be behind the whole thing. Uh, there is an intermediate entity that looks just like the small ones but taller that uh, seems to be in control, too. That seems, that seems to be a pecking order here, uh, if you accept all of this at face value. Phew. Um, have you concluded uh, through your research anything at all about motive? In other words, what what they're doing or why they're doing it? Well, it's hard to know at this juncture. What we do know is that uh, one of the things that usually happen during these abductions is that sperm and ova are extracted from uh, male and female abductees. Then there's a big leap of faith. <laughs> if we take it face value, what some abductees, including Betty, are told by uh, the abductors, uh, there seems that, and I can't explain this really, I've tried to in the watches, but I'm not really sure about this, there seems to be a symbiotic genetic relationship that exists between them and us. In fact, what they told Betty was that those three and a half, four and a half foot beings were actually <clears throat> human fetuses that had been removed from human surrogate mothers and grown outside the womb. And when, when you hear things like that, and when you look at these things, these hairless things, and you look at the mongoloid eyes, and, and you say to yourself, wow, they, and so many people describe them as looking like fetuses, you so, wonder if, uh, you know, if what she allegedly was shown uh, is uh, real. In other words, you would expect uh, more human characteristics from a human hybrid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it would seem, again, if you take them, what they told Betty at face value, face value that uh, they, they claim that they're doing this because mankind is becoming sterile. And, you know, several years after that was said, I began to read newspaper reports about this very thing. Because mankind is becoming sterile? I had I'd always heard it the other way, Ray, that, um, uh, that they were taking some sort of genetic... Uh, uh, something or another from us because their genetic code had become... I was just going to get to that as well. Uh -huh. They're having problems as, as well. But what they're saying is that mankind is becoming sterile. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, several years after this uh, was told her, a number of major newspaper articles came out that indicated, I think, was 50% drop 
over the last several decades of, uh, of sperm count in, in males. I believe, I believe I just heard that not long ago. Yeah, so that, that, that's very interesting. Well, I guess all you can say it right now is that they're, they seem to be interested in the reproductive systems of uh, male and female. They take sperm and over, and they seem to be doing what we might call a genetic engineering program of some, mm-hmm. some kind. Uh, if you accept the, at face value the surrogate mother and removal of fetuses, uh, uh, then you probably could go all the way and say yes, that what Betty witnessed uh, on board a craft of these, uh, the woman, uh, uh, two fetuses taken from a woman and put in uh, tanks and so forth, uh, uh, you know, it, it could be true. That, um, Ray, that sounds as though, if you take it as you say at face value, they have some sort of proprietary interest in us, and you can choose not to answer this question if you wish, but would you think that might mean that uh, they would uh, be our creators or interested in us after the fact? I claim, and again, you see, you, as a, an investigator, I'm more or less a reporter, uh, and what they told Betty, since we're talking about Betty, that they have been around since our beginning, and uh, that would probably imply yes, it would. that they may have had something to do with uh, our beginning. Uh, they, that they tremendous leap in, in evolution, uh, you know, back, uh, if, if you go back uh, and, and look at the beginnings of man, uh, it, it, one could speculate that uh, they tampered uh, with a, uh, uh, a pre-human being, if you would, and, uh, and, and made them uh, in their own image. But, you know, that, again, is sheer speculation at this, at, at this point. Wow. That, that would indicate they would have a lot more genetic knowledge than that which we've amassed about ourselves so far. And it looks as though an awful lot of diseases, maybe even cancer and AIDS and some of the rest of them, may have uh, genetic solutions if there is ever to be a solution. And one would almost long for them to assist us in one of these areas. No, that, that brings up another question. You know, why why don't they, why haven't they, or are they doing something uh, that we are unaware of uh, over the centuries and so forth that, that, that has been helpful to us through these abduction experiences? You know what? You wonder why over and over and over again uh, that they're doing these things, uh, not, not just talking about the alleged uh, fetus removal, but so why are they, uh, why are they taking... Uh, making punch biopsies why are they why are they taking uh, sperm why are they taking over why are they uh, interested in us physically uh, and so many people uh, you know you, there's got to be a, there's got to be a symbiotic relationship between them and us they, what they seem to be saying is that their their survival is dependent upon our survival now you can spec hmm. you can speculate what that might mean has anybody toyed with the idea? I understand that uh, a lot of people who claim to have been abducted uh, are frequently abducted and then re-abducted and re-abducted. And uh, I wonder if it might be possible to, crazy as this may sound, in a sense, send them a message. Send who the message now? Well, send uh, the uh, abductors a message through an abductee. In other words, uh, uh with the presumption that somebody is going to be abducted once again, as seems to be the case so many times, simply give them a message from us and try to open some channel of communication. Well, they, they can communicate. <laughs> My opinion is they, that, that's no problem. They, they could communicate any time they want. Uh, I think this is one of the reasons uh, that, uh, one, a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons that they considered a threat to national security, as I was talking to... Exactly. Uh, scientists who work for the uh, Air Force, uh, one of the Air Force projects, and they felt because of the evasiveness of the phenomenon. Hello there? Yeah, okay, I don't know if that was. Uh, evasiveness of the phenomenon, that uh, you had to treat something like that as a, as a threat. Uh, in fact, some of the early, uh, some of the early uh, documents uh, that were released through the Freedom of Information uh, Act indicate that, that uh, I have one right here, that uh, action which must be considered evasive when sighted or contacted by friendly aircraft and radar. <laughs> uh, so when you have something that violates a country's airspace, 
doesn't identify itself can mm -hmm. outpace anything that you send up to to do something uh, with it. <laughs> you don't know where it comes from. You don't know what it's doing here. And uh, it disrupts weapon systems uh, and does all kinds of things. You can see from a military point of view that uh, this must be treated as a possible uh, potential threat. And I, I'm certain they do. Um, that brings us to uh, the whole cover-up question, but I want to ask you a question about contact, Ray. Um, I've come to the conclusion after doing talk shows about this for years and years that there are a lot of people with religious faith out there, a strong religious faith, that would be terribly challenged by contact uh, by these by these beings, if there was some great official, you know, the the saucer lands on the White House kind of deal, a White House lawn kind of deal, um, that I unless they were protected, uh, if they made contact in the wrong way, a lot of people would try to do these beings in. In other words, society uh, really may not be ready for contact. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well. Uh... I'm a devout Christian myself, and I must say that this has caused me to really <laughs> expand uh, my faith, much to the consternation of some of my <laughs> my peers, who uh, some of them uh, would feel that uh, even the existence of extraterrestrial life is, is nonsense. And you're right. Uh, a study made by Brookings Institute for NASA back in 1961 indicated that two groups in this country would be the most devastated if just alien life was discovered, never mind in discovering us and making contact. The first group was uh, fundamentalist Christianity. The second group, believe it or not, were scientists, science and engineers, because oh. the technology, they felt, would be so above our science and technology that you could compare it to uh, Western scientists with all their equipment and so forth going into an aborigine tried and, and, the, and sort of... Uh, the witch doctor there would probably be their equivalent of science, and there would be a huge gap uh, between uh, scientific knowledge. And, and you, you, you make that comparison, you're talking about Homo sapiens sapiens on the same planet. You know, we have we, we have PhDs from MIT on this planet, and we have Aborigines still in the Stone Age. It must be very interesting for an extraterrestrial race to be studying. Yes, it. indeed. <laughs> uh, if you had uh, evidence, and I frequently ask this too, Ray, if you had incontrovertible evidence that they existed, and you sat down and thought about it yourself, that is, whether you would release it or not, uh, would you? Sure. I feel it's part of man's evolution. I think that I think that when you look back, uh, you know, and we're talking about the impact, for example, on uh, science and, and religion, uh, when you look back to the early days, you know, prior to Galileo, Copernicus, and... Uh, the rest of them kept up. Uh, you had a, a system that was wed to Aristotle's uh, thought about the universe. You had a, a geocentric universe. And, and, and then you had a discovery that sort of turned the world upside down. All of theology, all of science was wed to Aristotle. And you had what was called a Copernican revolution. Uh, and it was a very painful process for, for people to go through. But, you know, here we are. We accept these things now uh, as, you know, common knowledge, but it was a part of man's evolution. And I think holding information like this back, as disruptive as it might be, is part of man's heritage and, and evolution. Uh, uh, I know that there's something like this, uh, the abduction phenomenon, for example, uh, the uh, uh, crash retrieval uh, bit, all of this was made public as the President of the United States get up and, and, and showed positive uh, uh, positive evidence that all this was going on, that it would cause disruptions. You, you don't have to do much to cause the stock market to uh, crash, for example. No, you sure don't. Uh, there are a lot of things that would happen. Uh, but, again, I, I feel very strongly that it's that something that it's growing up pains for the human race, and it's something that we've got to go through. And I think that UFO investigators who come into this with... Uh, their own worldviews, their own religious systems, uh, including myself, have gone through almost uh, a grieving process because our world has been turned upside down, as it were. Uh, the things that we thought were uh, normal, the way things should be, <laughs> turn out not to be that way at all. And, and, it, and it is a painful process when you, when, when you uh, have to start expanding your worldview or your religion or whatever. 
Uh, Ray, with all that you've investigated, um, I'm curious, have you come to any conclusions about whether these beings are friendly uh, and one should not fear them, or given an opportunity in an abduction uh, situation, would you advise somebody instead, if they could, to run like hell? Well, first of all, I don't think you could run. Uh, and second of all, I think if they if they were uh, hostile, and like we consider hostile, that they could have done something a long time ago. Uh, I think they're only hostile because they're something that's completely out of the, the ordinary to the, uh, well, to, to everybody. I mean, anything unknown is hostile. Well, it produces fear, that's for oh, certain. Yeah, fear. I mean, to have an abduction experience is not even the equivalent of having your dead grandmother sort of float through the wall and, and start talking to you. It's so completely out of the realm of possibility, uh, if even probability, that it's awfully hard to to accept that something like that can happen. And even after it happens, and you mentioned how many people remember this, I think Dr. Bullard's study indicated that maybe 30% of abductees remember most of the abduction uh, without hypnosis. Uh, and sometimes it'll come back with a complete flashback, for example. And it affects a person for life because there are questions that will never probably be answered they never can tell if it's going to happen again. I talk to people sometimes for almost an hour on the telephone, just listening to them. They're afraid to go to bed. They go to bed, they leave the lights on, they lock the doors, they keep the radio going, because they don't know when it's going to happen again. Uh, it can really disrupt a person's life. What do you tell them about the probability? They must ask. In other words, they would ask you, look, in all the cases you've investigated, how many of them have turned out to be multiple abductions of a, of a single individual? What are the chances, in other words, that I'll be abducted again? What are the chances? I think the chances are very good. I think it usually starts or at least around five or six years old, and it continues. I think Bullard's study indicated that it continues uh, maybe the 30s or 40s, and sometimes uh, even after that. But I would say that that probably is the baseline, five or six years old, probably earlier, but how can you tell? Uh, except in a few cases where the parents might be uh, witnesses of it, uh, until they're 30 or 40 years old. and then Well, that's not much comfort for an individual, is it? Oh, no, it isn't. Uh, and I've dealt with a lot of people who, including the Allagash uh, abduction case that uh, I, I just finished a, a short while ago. That yes, that's the next thing I'm going to ask you about, Allagash. No, see, that started when the twins involved in that were, again, uh, you know, five or six years old. They didn't know that. They thought they were dealing with ghosts and paranormal phenomena. Sure. I can imagine that people would attach all kinds of different uh, uh, scenarios to it based on their life. In other words, if they're devoutly religious, they're probably having a religious experience. Uh, or if they're uh, uh, into sort of a new, new age sort of thing, they calculate they've had an out-of-body experience. They probably attach all kinds of... Uh, uh, scenarios to this, don't they? Yeah, and I, I think that uh, it's possible over the Andreas and affair that Betty has uh, superimposed her religious religious beliefs on her experience. But I wouldn't, I I wouldn't, uh, you know, uh, be dogmatic about that. Uh, it could possibly be that they, in turn, are using her religious beliefs to help to calm and assuage your fears. Mm -hmm. And then it could be a possible connection. You've got three things there, and what I try to do is. Uh, stay neutral and say that these are three possibilities because she's not the only one uh, that uh, seems to have a, a theological content, as it were, to their abduction experiences. And at the MIT conference, uh, uh, I guess it was Bud Hopkins was saying that he felt that uh, that theological content uh, should be ignored <laughs> and uh, that uh, it was a waste of time to look into it. And a lot of Investigators are saying that the paraphysical part of the uh, abduction is a waste of time. Let's deal with the nuts and bolts. What's, what's your feeling about that aspect of it, the out of body? The aspect is that I've come across so many cases, including the one that Linda uh, Morgan Howe was talking about, involving an out of the body experience uh, abduction and the physical body being left behind. Uh, I've come across so many of those that I'm saying that my. Next, well, I'm working on it now, uh, book, and uh, we'll 
deal with this uh, particular aspect. I, I think that you can't ignore these things. See, what a report written by an investigator usually reflects that investigators, unfortunately, <laughs> because no one's completely objective, his or hers own world view. Sure. And if you are strictly a nuts and bolts UFO researcher, if you have a paranormal thing happen, you ignore it. It never, never comes up in the report. Uh, and there are a lot of other things. If there's a religious aspect to it, that may be dumped, too. And what you do, unfortunately, is you just give one facet of the UFO phenomenon in that particular report. I feel that if you're going to investigate these reports... You, you've got to follow it wherever it leads. Wherever it leads, you've got to have a baseline that includes everything. Yes. And then if you find this over and over and over and over again, not just a few isolated incidents, if you just find a few isolated incidents, you say, well, this could be, you know, the personality of the person and so forth. But if you find it over and over and over again, that will be a real baseline, not what happens to be a, a mirror image of what you think uh, should be or shouldn't be. People can put themselves in an altered state, and I wonder, Ray, if you think that one of these altered states is likely to bring on an abduction, uh, uh, an abduction. In other words, if you if you wanted to um, if you wanted to experiment uh, with uh, with an altered state, would you think that it might have a chance of bringing something like this on? Uh, that's possible. Usually, I think the altered state comes from the outside upon the uh, abductee. Uh, I don't think that the abductee can call, as far as I know, I mean, I don't know of any case where s someone can cause uh, something like this to happen. I think there are some people, and there aren't too many people, that can, uh, uh, of their own volition, uh, have an out-of-the-body experience. Uh, but even then, uh, I've challenged these people sometimes to do various things for me, and uh, they haven't been able to perform, perform yet. So that the real OBE seems to be something, uh, for the most part, something that comes from the outside. Uh, it, it may be a near-death experience, for example, uh, or, or, or uh, someone, uh, I don't know how many cases I've read about, someone who's actually not dead, physically dead or pronounced dead, but is in a situation, for example, a car going over a cliff, and they're in the car, and all of a sudden they're outside of the car and they're watching everything. Uh... Wow. Ray, uh, we have a break, a five-minute break here at the top of the hour, and, uh, and then we'll be back. So relax for about five minutes, and we'll be right back to you. Uh, that's Ray Fowler, and Ray, I'm going to redial your number during this break. Okay. All right. You're listening to Area 2000 on a Sunday evening. From KD KDWN, the Talk of the West, I'm Art Bell. We'll be right back. Good evening again. Welcome back to Area 2000 on a Sunday night. By the way, for those of you that uh, have not yet had an opportunity to view it, the shots of the space shuttle working on the Hubble telescope are absolutely astounding. And they can be seen in a couple of places. Uh, CNN is running them with occasional breaks. Uh, if you want it uninterrupted, uh, I'm not sure if they're carrying it tonight, but C-SPAN, if you have access to cable or satellite, C-SPAN has also been uh, running uh, the shuttle video uninterrupted, and it's quite spectacular and should be going on shortly. So you may want to get that locked in on your television set. My guest is Ray Fowler. Fascinating stuff. We're talking about abductions and uh, we have redialed ray but there is a significant storm i guess going on in the northeast and so we may be troubled by the same static ray are you there i sure am all right well it sounds a little better we'll see how it what kind of storm are you having ray well we had a tremendous rainstorm with maybe a couple of inches uh, of rain and uh, now we're getting a sort of a cold wave behind it a lot of wind blowing and i think it's probably blowing the uh, telephone lines i've changed a couple of, to a couple of different channels here i think it's a lot better yeah it does sound better good um, all right, the, to finish up with the out-of-body experiences, it is a fascinating aspect, and you're right, I found that a lot of researchers, uh, if it involves this aspect or the religious aspect, run away from it. And that seems to me to be sort of a deviation from what ought to be a real scientific approach. Yeah, I, I've finally decided that... Uh, uh, well, I've watched Dr. Heineck and I've watched Dr. Jacques Vallée move from a strictly nuts and bolts... Uh, <coughs> 
uh, interest in the phenomenon to uh, uh, in more interest in the paraphysical side of it. And well, yeah. In other words, some of the nuts and bolts might not be nuts and bolts that we recognize, and so I guess it's... That's, a... that's correct, and uh, when you have an object disappear and appear uh, on radar, uh, as you're watching it visually, as if it were going somewhere else and then coming back into the space-time continuum, uh, we might be... I think Dr. Heineck in his later years was, was thinking that uh, they may be extraterrestrial, but maybe they travel uh, in another dimension that... Uh, uh, well, you're just ahead of me. I was uh, not uh, the same. I was about to ask you about the possibility of uh, it being dimensional travel uh, as opposed to travel through space itself. Um, why not through time or another dimension? Is that not at least as likely? Well, yeah, and this is why I'm interested in the paraphysical aspects of this, because when a person is taken and, and his body is left behind, he or she is taken by the same entities, uh, and don't ask me how to explain it, <clears throat> they are physically examined, uh, quote-unquote, the same way that they would have been if their physical body had been taken with them, and then they uh, return. Do you think this uh, will, uh, Ray, do you think this is going to lead you into um, uh, perhaps some research with the people looking into uh, near-death experiences? Already have. In fact, uh, Dr. Ring has just uh, written a, a new book, and he's probably one of the leading advocates or uh, uh, researchers into this. And uh, he had come to the same conclusion as I had in the in the Watchers, where I think that there is a definite connection uh, between. Uh, and this sounds incredible. I never thought I'd even be saying this uh, to anybody, let alone on <laughs> radio. Uh, on a radio. Uh, when you talk to people who have gone through what Dr. Bullitt says, uh, uh, the tour in the other world in the, the theophany, which m most abductees don't go through, and what they describe uh, the, uh, is very similar to what people who have the near-death experience describe, uh, so much so that uh, this is another aspect of the uh, abduction phenomenon I'm concentrating on as well. Uh, and uh, it's caused Dr. Ring, who has been working with the near-death experience for many, many years to look at the UFO phenomenon for the first time uh, mm -hmm. after he met Betty and Bob Andreas, uh, Bob, uh, Luca is now Betty and Bob uh, Luca, uh, and uh, the Andreas affair and the investigations into them uh, has led him to look into the whole of UFO abduction phenomenon. So all of a sudden, you have the NDE expert coming from one direction and so-called UFO expert <laughs> coming another direction and and they're meeting each other. It's fascinating because those are the exact two aspects that this program is concentrated on. I, I was surprised. Well, surprised. I'm pleased to hear that. And so am I in view of the fact that the research may now be moving, uh, the two areas of research may be moving toward each other. Fascinating. Um, how, are you, how are you now going to proceed as you move into these areas? Are you going to start contacting uh, these investigators more and more, or how are you, how are you going to move now direction-wise in your investigations? I guess I'm going to concentrate on those reports, including the Andreas affair, uh, on those reports that uh, report the uh, OBE and the NDE type uh, uh, characteristics. And uh, if I look into enough of them, uh, try to come up with some kind of analysis uh, of the similarities, much the same way that Dr. Bullard did with his study of uh, the abduction phenomenon in a general way, but specifically look at these particular cases and see how they stand up in comparison uh, to each other, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a long study. You know, I've just really started it. Uh, and, uh, uh, Ms. Fowler, is there anybody uh, else doing similar work now uh, and, and moving down some of the lines that you're anticipating or have begun to move down? I know of, and I was really surprised to hear it, is uh, uh, Dr. Ring. Uh, and again, uh, he has started at the other end, starting from the NDE and working toward the UFO, and I'm working toward the UFO and <laughs> working toward the the NDE and, and interviewing people who've, who have had out-of-the-body experiences and near-death experiences as well, I mean, aside from the UFO phenomenon, as well as people who have had the UFO abduction experience and have had these experiences. One of the things that have happened to even people who haven't had 
the abduction experience, I find over and over again people who have had a close encounter mm-hmm. of any kind with a UFO that they, a lot of them, a large percentage of them, begin to experience a, a variety of psychic phenomena. Some of them had no interest in psychic phenomena. Nothing like that had ever happened to them. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it goes on for a few weeks and it stops, and sometimes it goes on and on and on. Uh, uh, poltergeist phenomena, out-of-the-body experiences, uh, strange synchronistic things happening. Uh, and how this, how this connects with the UFO experience they had, I don't know. One can say that the experience enhanced their so-called psychic ability, so that they were able to detect things that they were always there, but for some reason the experience somehow enhanced their psychic abilities. Or one could say that it's a continuation of the experience, and all I are seeing is sort of the visible tip of something that's going on, a monitoring system or something that's going on. But as an investigator and a reporter, all I can say is that you have A, a close encounter with the UFO, and B, coinciding with that, in many cases, you have an eruption of psychic phenomena, so-called. And we call it psychic phenomena, that's just a name. You really don't know what it is. <laughs> well, you're really following a fascinating area of research, and I'm going to stay close to you if I can and find out where it goes. I really uh, think you might be on the right track. I'm curious about this. Uh, the UFO community itself, uh, for years, has faced, uh, you know, people like yourself who would come out uh, would face some sort of ridicule, and I wonder if now, uh, following the path that you're following, uh, you're liable to face ridicule from the standard UFO community. Oh, I'm sure. I had a, a business meeting with some people uh, this afternoon, uh, and two very, very enthusiastic uh, people who have been involved in the nuts and bolts study for, for years, and, and uh, uh, they're very, very rigid in their particular beliefs, uh, and they wouldn't have anything to do with with what I was talking about. It was interesting to to talk to them uh, face-to-face and, and, and so forth. And I guess what why it didn't interest them is that they feel, and I feel too, that the scientific method uh, for uh, proof of uh, UFOs can't possibly apply to paranormal phenomena. How can, how can you... How can you capture something like that, and, and how can you uh, measure it and test it and so forth, except in a statistical way? What they're looking for, and, and what I'm looking for, too, is uh, the physical evidence, something that you can measure in a laboratory, just like uh, the gentleman that's uh, uh, examining the crop circle. You know, this is the physical part of the phenomenon, uh, or, or examining uh, physical traces uh, that are left behind uh, uh, ground effects, or... True enough, um, and I'm not discounting it, Ray, but gee whiz, years and years and years of examination of physical evidence, and we still have no real answers. So, no, all, it, all it does is give you uh, some evidence to support the anecdotal data that comes forth from a witness indicating that, you know, I saw an object sitting there in the field. You go to the field and you see uh, what looks like a microwave radiation that's baked the, baked the earth down to maybe a foot or something, and you see... Uh, three or four pad marks, and you take a penetrometer, and it looks like a ton sat on each thing. So you can say, well, you know, something was here, and they described that something was here. Therefore, something must have been there. But it really doesn't tell you right. where it comes from, what it's doing here. <laughs> right. You know, what of anything you can do about it. It, it, it. I guess what it, I guess it gives you very, very strong evidence that there was a machine-like looking object sitting there, and it took off, just like the witness said because there'd be no way for the witness to be able to, uh, you know, to uh, duplicate what is left behind. But it really doesn't give you the, uh, the answers. If the abduction phenomenon is real and not illusory, uh, and whatever this is behind it uh, wants to communicate through that means, that's the only way we're going to know. My own opinion is that we are like uh, the donkey being led by a carrot, I think that the phenomenon, slowly but surely, is going to allow us to very slowly but surely uh, come to terms with it. And, I, and, I, and when you look back, and I've been in this since 47, as far as interest goes, and 63 since an investigation goes, uh, it has been a, a, 
a, a, a process. I mean, you had the flyovers, and uh, that was very hard to accept. Then you had the close encounters. Uh, I can remember researchers back there th when people would say that they saw a machine-like object rather than a distant object uh, close by that they were scoffed at, and that was hard to accept. Then you had the landed objects, and the researchers scoffed at that for a while and then finally accepted that. And then you had the close encounters of the third kind where entities were seen and associated with the object, and people were locked at, reports were thrown in the wastebasket, and then finally that was accepted. Now you've got the abduction reports, and uh, finally that being accepted is getting into out of the UFO research community, into the uh, health professional community. Uh, it, it's sort of been... Uh, and here you are, one step ahead of that. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> what, what it seems to be is that we've been undergoing a conditioning. It reminds me of a story I heard <clears throat> where some missionaries were trying to contact this tribe, and <clears throat> they overflew the village with an airplane, scared living daylights out of them. But after, the, after they saw the airplane for a long time, they didn't run, so they rigged up a rope with a basket on it, and they dropped it down, and they were able to circle the plane so the basket would stay fairly still. And... Uh, the natives finally would come out and start getting closer and closer to the basket, and they put some machetes in it and some tools and so forth, and finally they they grabbed those, and finally they were trading back and forth, <laughs> and then finally they landed the plane and they and they, they made contact. Unfortunately, uh, their intentions were uh, misconstrued and they got killed. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we uh, Ray, if we are the natives, and the conditioning uh, is underway now. How how far through that process do you think we might be? I don't know. I just have this strong, strong feeling that, uh, you know, we started out at the base of a pyramid, and over the years, you know, the the lines on either side are, are getting closer and closer to the, the top. And the people that I talked to have had the abduction experience, uh, had the same impression. Uh, I'm trying to be very objective, and I say maybe, maybe not, but I feel it's the phenomenal wouldn't waste its time to be doing all it's been doing since 1947, and it's been doing an awful lot uh, just for the fun of it. There, there has to be a, a purpose behind it. It's not a natural phenomenon. It's an intelligently controlled phenomenon. Uh, they interested in our weapon systems. When I <coughs> worked for GTE government systems, I was involved with the development, uh, research and development and production of the Minuteman missile and talked to launch control facility officers and uh, fellow Sylvanians or GTE Sylvanians we were at that time and other subcontractors and contractors out at the sites. And they were disrupting our equipment. <laughs> oh? Disrupting our equipment and uh, we couldn't do anything at all about it. Uh, why were they doing that? Were they testing our defense systems or they were trying to tell us something? Disrupting our equipment in what way, Ray? Well, uh, and Dr. Heineck confirmed this when I talked to him. Uh, one launch control facility officer told me that uh, this thing was tracked by radar 100,000 feet up and was disrupting uh, uh, the, the total communication system of the, uh, the launch control facility. In other words, the LCF, as they call them, uh, would have found it very, very hard to communicate to the launch facility. Uh, to, you know, fire a missile. Uh, other uh, launch control facility officers told me sometimes the whole the whole flight would just go down. Just, huh. um, <laughs> uh, there were guidance control systems. And you don't think you were uh, the victim of some sort of electronic countermeasure? Yeah. You know, I got in a big trouble with my company for publishing some of that stuff. Uh, the Pentagon called and uh, the Strategic Air Command called and they threatened to send a letter of displeasure to my company if I didn't stop this stuff. <laughs> uh, oh. But that would have meant the mattress, and I talked to you at the parents, and uh, that would have put me right out of the defense industry, so I had to be very careful after that. But, uh, you had a crypto clearance. Ah, oh, that was an interesting avenue to follow and probably go nowhere with. Uh, Ray, as a result, without being able to tell us anything specific, which would be a violation of law, was there anything you ever uh, found out with such class that not, um, other than what you just explained that would lead you to believe that uh, we're dealing with extraterrestrials? Uh, when I was uh, with the United States Air Force Security Service, uh, we each were in buildings. We weren't supposed to know what each building was doing. We were actually 
doing uh, uh, electronic spying on the Russians with uh, sophisticated direction finders, and uh, we would conduct mock raids on Russia, and they'd tune up their air defense uh, command and send up fighters to meet the uh, aircraft approaching. And what we would do is, using direction finders, we would know where every one of those radar sites were. We had people who were linguists were recording uh, everything that was said, uh, all the procedures, there were people taking Morse code and so forth. Uh, I talked to another person uh, who wasn't always supposed to tell me this stuff, but he was saying that they used the uh, uh, crypto uh, channels to relay UFO information from England to, uh, you know, the Pentagon. Uh, I never got involved because I wasn't involved with the teletype that uh, he was involved in. Oh, now, wait a minute. You mean after Project Blue Book, the government's interest actually did not wane? Uh, well, this is back in, uh, this is back in the 50s. Oh, I see. Okay. Back in the 50s, right. Well, not the part of the group, but, uh, all our operation was just taking us while we went through a performance in the world. In fact, the NF-146 uh, revision E uh, specifically states that the Aerospace Defense Command is responsible for collecting uh, uh, information on unidentified flying objects from both civilian and military sources, regardless of, uh, Project Blue Book. <laughs> I see. Project Blue Book uh, since 1953 was uh, probably just a public information group that uh, that uh, was used to, uh, well, they, they did send some of the better reports uh, to onward somewhere, but uh, basically it was just a three-person group at the, uh, the, the Pentagon that, uh, uh, well, not the Pentagon, at Wright-Patterson at the Air Force Base, uh, and the public information officer at the, at the Pentagon that uh, essentially tried to assuage uh, public uh, uh, panic or interest uh, in the subject by explaining them away of natural phenomena or man-made objects or hoaxes and so forth. Uh, but the real reports that had scientific value would go somewhere else. But uh, this is back in the 50s. I, I talked to a person, a very reliable person, who was uh, in photography, and he told me that uh, he had seen many I mean, gun camera and uh, uh, stills of, uh, that he developed them himself. Uh, he wouldn't give me any details. All he would do is admit that uh, this was being done and it was uh, standard operating procedure. Dr. Heinrich told me that uh, when fighter planes took gun camera photographs that uh, they would land and they would be debriefed and the canister would be taken somewhere and they would be seen again. But, well, Gordon Cooper uh, has gone on record stating that when he was at what was called Europe Air Force Base, which is now Ed Edwards Air Force Base, that they were there, they had equipment set up to take photographs of uh, something, I've forgotten what it was, when they had a UFO land, and they actually were able to photograph the UFO. And he said, again, the canisters were taken, and they were debriefed, and uh, as he said in his drawl, off to Washington, never to be seen again. <laughs> so well, then you obviously are a believer in the government cover-up. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> it, I would call it a co I would call it a cover up, but I, I I'm not sure that's the right reason. I, I would wouldn't think it was more of a cover up than uh, keeping stealth and uh, some of these other things secret. Uh, uh, I think there's a number of reasons why something like that would be done. I mean, I think I explained that uh, any object that penetrates our airspace without permission uh, is automatically considered a potential threat, and just normally all the uh, regulations that uh, that center around uh, uh, national security would center on that particular incident or incidents. Something I always wonder about, Ray, we have um, come a long way with stealth technology ourselves. I mean, that's, that's the state of our art. And one has to imagine with a technology that would be greatly in advance of ours, you know, if they didn't want to be seen, we wouldn't be seeing them on radar or with our eyes, for that matter. Uh, you have cases where <clears throat> you get a radar lock-on, and... Uh, Suddenly it's gone. Yeah, yeah, and then they change the radar frequency, and it'll be there. As soon as that the radar waves, you know, make contact with the object, uh -huh. it's gone. They change frequency again, it's there. Uh, that's documented. In fact, at one time, it even got out in the, the local newspaper uh, that it happened before, uh, uh, you know, it got to... Uh, to where it was supposed to go and then quelled. <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm surely not an expert uh, on stealth technology, but that capability is different, I think, is it not, Ray, than the normal 
stealth technology we have, which would... Uh, that, w- that is, but, you know, uh, the fellow I was talking to today, Barry Greenwood, I don't know if you ever talked to him before, he's probably got one of the largest civilian libraries of, uh, on, on government documents and everything to do with UFOs. We were talking about stealth today, and he was saying that he had documents that go way back, uh, oh, I think into the 60s, where the Air Force uh, was trying to... Uh, who came up with the conclusion that a disc-shaped object uh, would have uh, very little visibility on, on radar. And that, that, that's when they were starting a joint project with uh, Canada uh, to build a, uh, a disc-shaped object, the Avro Company. And uh, the problem was that it was very unstable, and there was really, uh, there was n- really no, uh, there was no room to have a lot of fuel. <laughs> I mean, you have airplanes, you've got these wings that... that uh, uh, fuel, and then you have the fuel tanks and so forth, but you have this disc shaped thing, and it was very unstable. I, it, it only got a few feet off the ground. I've seen, uh, in fact, I've actually seen the movies of it uh, tested. So a disc to be stable would, would require the kind of technology we've heard about that's very different than that which we have uh, to propel one in normal aerodynamic flight. In my opinion, is a flying disc, so-called. The flying saucers don't fly. They're the equivalent of what we would call a diving bell. Uh, huh. What what you have is it's something. Usually you don't have an object that comes down and and, and goes from point A to B. If you do at some point, some sometimes. But most of these sightings you have, they come down, they they go around a very very local area, and it like something pulls them up on a <laughs> kind of a rubber band. You know, it's, it's it's almost like and they come down in a falling leaf motion, almost like they didn't have any weight or mass. Uh, and then they just suck right up. It's almost like uh, they aren't aerodynamic. They that they, they just lower them down to do their thing and then taken up again. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, all right, Ray, we're at the bottom of the hour, and I'm going to ID the station, and then uh, perhaps we'll take a few calls if you're up for it. Okay. All right, stay right there. Uh, Ray Fowler is my guest. This is Area 2000. <laughs> Jackie Gong's Plaza downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening from Las Vegas. You're listening to Area 2000 on the top of the West KDWN radio. All right, here it is. The phones are going open in the metropolitan area of Las Vegas. You can reach us at 383-8255-8255. If you're calling from outside the state, toll free, it's one 800 Three three eight eight two five five one eight hundred three three eight eighty two fifty five. The wild card lines are area code direct dial. In other words, uh, area code seven zero two three eight five seven two one four seventy two fourteen. And then finally, if you have never called the program at all, feel free to use the first time caller line at area code seven zero two three eight five seven. 7213. And uh, Ray Fowler, are you still there? Right. All right. Let's experiment uh, uh, with the great unknown for a moment and go to the lines. Uh, good evening on our first time caller line. You're on the air with Ray Fowler. Hello there. Hello. Yes, you're on the air, sir. Oh, um, yes. I'd like to um, ask you I, I read your book on walkers, watchers, actually, and I wanted to know. Um, you said that these um, craft um, can go through space-time. Um, I actually um, that they could. Uh... Uh... Okay, he gave up. <laughs> he got nervous. Ray and gave up. Okay. Um, Wildcard line three. You're on the air in Las Vegas with Ray Fowler in Massachusetts. Uh, good evening. Hello. Hello. Uh, turn your radio off, sir. Uh, okay. Off. And uh, and then give us some idea of where you're calling from. I'm calling from Santa Cruz, California. Santa Cruz. All right, go ahead. And uh, I just wanted to uh, mention something about my some stuff my dad told me when he was in the Air Force. All right. Go ahead. Are we live? Yes, we're live. Go ahead, please. Um. Yeah, my father was in the Air Force for 23 years, and uh, he told me he was in the missiles. And uh, I guess he started, I don't know what exactly happened, but he, uh, within the last couple of years, he was sick in the retirement home, and he was telling me all kinds of stories about some stuff they were doing down in Dreamland. 
uh, working with some weird uh, flying equipment, I guess they recovered. Uh, well, that does present a good opportunity. Thank you, caller uh, from Santa Cruz. Um, Ray, I had my own sighting. I live uh, in the Pahrump Valley, which is uh, about 65 miles west of here, and just about a valley or so over from what they call dreamland. Right. And uh, in all my life, Ray, um, I've never seen a thing until just a, a couple of months, a few months ago, and I saw this incredibly large triangular craft, totally black, uh, floating, not flying, and I know the difference, just um, about 150 feet above me. didn't make a sound, utterly silent. And I wonder what you can tell us about what's going on at Greenland, if, if you know of anything at all, and uh, whether or not there are these craft that are sighted may not be the kind of craft that you're talking about, but something we are doing. I'm sure we're doing a lot there. Uh, the self was flying a lot longer than, you know, they were willing to admit. To admit. And I'm sure there are a lot of other things flying there. I think the room is that we have uh, uh, craft retrieved craft saucers there, uh, for want of a better term, and that uh, we are somehow flying them is uh, a, a strictly a rumor, no matter what uh, Bob Lazar and William Cooper and Jim Lear might want us to believe. I, I think that we need a lot more evidence. I think when you have uh, an experimental test range and you have uh, state-of-the-art equipment being tested there, it's going to look very, very unusual. And very rarely, in fact, unless there was an accident, you just don't fly uh, experimental aircraft out of a test range. Uh, you know, if it crashed, uh, the, the security aspects would be horrendous. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so. I, I, I don't think that we're dealing with uh, extraterrestrial stuff there. Uh, the triangular craft is very interesting because we've had reports of that in this area. We just had one reported a couple of weeks ago in Vermont, uh, flying at three top levels, making no noise. Uh, and then Belgium, you know, several years ago, they had lots of reports of these things. Uh, uh, but again, uh, what you saw, uh, you know, doesn't sound like something that we could do. Maybe, maybe it is. I, 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 you know, I have no answer to that, that, that question, except that I'm sure there's an awful lot of exotic things going on. Well, I'll tell you this, Ray. Um, I had never even heard of a triangular craft until I had my sighting. I went on the, on the radio on my syndicated program, and I told the story uh, quite extensively, and all of a sudden my fax machine lit up and I have never seen so many triangular craft in my whole life, so there are... <laughs> there are a lot of them. <laughs> in fact, uh, boomerang-shaped craft as well. Uh, up in state New York, uh, back in the, the late uh, late 80s, uh, there are thousands of sightings uh, in upper state New York. Dr. Heineck uh, and Philip Imbrugnu uh, wrote a book about it. There were so many of them. And the interesting thing is that news of what was going on there, and these things were hovering over reservoirs, atomic uh, plants, and houses, and moving uh, without any noise at all. Uh, some people described them almost as big as a football field, uh, very similar to what happened in Belgium. The interesting thing is that usually the news about these things were just confined to the local newspapers and uh, the local TV stations, and this this seems to be true uh, about the UFO subject uh, in general. Uh, you know, in the old days, uh, if you had something like that happen, uh, the Associated Press and uh, UPI would pick it up and it'd be in the newspapers. But what I find now is unless you subscribe to a news club service that, uh, that uh, looks into all of these various local sightings all over the United States, you wouldn't that UFOs existed. <laughs> well, you may find this of some interest. Um, about a week or two weeks after the sighting I had, a most unusual story appeared in my little Pahrump Valley Times, um, which I still have. Somebody gave me. Uh, and I'll just read from it for a second. The low-flying aircraft over Pahrump late last week and again Sunday night, which is when I saw it, were probably part of a classified training exercise, according to a spokesman from Nellis. A number of Pahrump residents were talking about a big aircraft that passed over their homes last week, and judging by the areas that people live in, it appears the C-130 circled most of the valley and buzzed some homes several times. So it was a classified mission, and they're trying to sell us on the fact that it was a C-130. I was never so insulted in all of my life. I've flown on C-130s, and um, I guarantee this was no C-130. 
They could have tried to sell a lot of things, but a C-130, frankly, I found to be insulting. Oh, they, they, they have done this over and over again in the Blue Book days. Uh, actual, incredible uh, explanations <laughs> like that. Now, whether they're trying to cover for an experimental aircraft or they're trying to cover exactly. for a UFO, which they most likely knew was there because of the, the radar installations they have there, uh, I, I don't know. But uh, this, this is typical of the old Blue Book days. Fascinating. Uh, Wildcard Line 3, good evening. You're on the air with Ray Fowler in Massachusetts. Oh, good evening, Art, and uh, Mr. Ray Fowler. Good evening. Uh, you know, as far as I'm loud noisy been here, and uh, I live up here in uh, Blairs in Northeast California, and uh, they've been sending the B-52s, Art, uh, uh, over our region, I guess over that scrapyard in Arizona. Anyway, I'll get quick to the point. Uh, I've been hearing a lot about these uh, missing children. And, uh, you know, a lot of them can't be found. I was just kind of wondering if Ray knew that, has any information about maybe, uh, are they being abducted or uh, what's the situation of a lot of these children that can't be found? Yeah. Good. Well, it's not the air. All right, it's a good question. There are a lot of missing children. Ray, some of them uh, are coming to no good uh, because of foul play right here on Earth. I wonder how many of them might be meeting some other fate. I haven't the uh, slightest idea. I think that's in the realm of speculation. And until you had some eyewitness reports of a, a child being taken uh, by a, a strange object or a beam of light or something like that and not returned, I would say that this most likely has to do with human uh, abductions. And depending upon the, the age of the child, you have a lot of runaways, for example, uh, as well as abductions. I mean, this, this horrible thing that happened in... California recently where someone actually came into a house and took someone out of the house. It, it, exactly. Things are going on like that. So I would... the, the man alleged to have done that has now been officially charged with a crime. Ray, there is, um, uh, there is a, a space mission, a very complex one, underway right now. And the reason I bring it up is because I've been watching the spacewalks, which are fascinating. And one would have to imagine that if they were here, they would take particular interest in anything taking us off our own planet. And I wonder if you've heard anything about that. The astronauts, what have they seen officially or unofficially? What do you think's going on there? Uh, well, astronaut General McDevitt uh, uh, saw uh, a cylindrical UFO with a pole sticking out of it uh, uh, back in uh, Gemini 4. Uh, Gordon Cooper stated uh, at a United Nations meeting that we were trying to get the United Nations to... Uh, get involved in UFO research, uh, stated that there were NASA, NASA officials that uh, had uh, encounters with, with UFOs. Uh, a uh, very respectable professor was sharing uh, uh, the same program or podium with uh, one of the astronauts, and I won't mention names, but uh, was talking to the astronaut, and, and the astronaut said that uh, they see them practically every mission, he says, but if you quote me, I'll deny it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's hearsay, but I trust the person who told me. It was he trust the astronaut personally. Um, hey, you're right. I, I think this is, this is going on. Uh, Gordon Cooper, uh, I was told by one fellow from NASA, I was not a player, and I don't think that he was very well liked uh, by some people because of the statements uh, he was making. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, he, when he was in the Air Force back in 51, for two days, uh, he was the leader of a fighter squadron, and uh, they chased UFOs that were coming over the base, and they were just above the operating capability of the F-86s that they had, but they were round, metallic, they were making right-angle turns, uh, whatever they were, they were under intelligent control, and they were made of a metallic uh, uh, material. Uh, but it seems that uh, most likely uh, the astronauts, as well as any military person, uh, even an airline pilot, I don't know if you're even aware of this, but one of one brought a commercial apply to commercial carriers. And once a commercial airline pilot makes what they call the public safety report, as they're supposed to do, they see uh, anything that might be a threat to national security, but UFOs are one of the things on the list. If they divulge the contents of the equivalent of a military service report, they are subject to 10 years of jail and $10,000 fine or both. Uh, in 1954, 
that was imposed upon all the ma major aircraft, uh, airline carriers in 400, over 400, it was 450 pilots uh, protested and signed a petition against it, uh, but it didn't do any good. Ah, well, I can see why why the military wants uh, the information from the pilots. Uh, it's a shame, though, that they're being civilians. Uh, aren't a lot of talk about it. Sure. Another aspect of this, Ray, would be uh, something that's not talked about a lot, and that is we have a gigantic series of uh, KH uh, uh, satellites and uh, Landsats and other satellites that are capable of looking down on Earth. And one would imagine that if there were things flying about, there would have been significant evidence gathered uh, from from that. Uh, uh, sure. I'm sure that there are. I'm also, I have talked to an Air Force colonel, for example, that was uh, working with the U.S. recently. Uh, no, the uh, we have recently just got and she is the commander of one of the officer factions. Huge telescope, and uh, they will be tracking things uh, in orbit, things that are unknown and things that are unknown, and uh, giving the azimuth elevation, the uh, right ascension de declination of whatever they use to uh, what was North, <coughs> the North American uh, Air Defense Command there, now Space Bomb. Um, right. Uh, he claimed that there were things coming into orbit, not of orbit, <laughs> and uh, they, he asked for you know, started asking questions about this, and he was just told to mind his own business that there was a blue ribbon panel looking into this, and uh, uh, that his job was just to send the data in. <laughs> let's, I'll tell you, let's, uh, there's an awful lot of people that want to talk to you, so let's uh, keep it in here. Good morning, Line 3. You're on the air with Ray Fowler. Uh, this is Fritz from Los Angeles. Thanks again to the Bigelow Foundation for that most outstanding educational program. I want to say to uh, Ray about... This book definitely has changed the rules. Uh, he has the advantage of most of the UFO researcher and scientists because he has the metaphysical background, the knowing, I would say, the cosmic ABC. Uh, Ray, you also pointed out in your book the acceleration of UFO's activity is directly related to man's increasing inhumanity to man. Can you tell us about the coming event, the planet mass change of, uh, as a phase? because of man's ignorance. All right. Thanks, uh, Fritz. Uh, what about it? our behavior down here connected to the... No, uh, I don't think that was in my book. I think maybe he read some of his own ideas and brought up and mm -hmm. indicated in the book was that according to what they told Betty, that uh, because of what we were doing to life on the planet, the explosion of the atomic waste and things like that, uh, so they didn't go into any detail that man uh, was going to become sterile, and therefore they were clutching sperm uh, and uh, over, not only from man, but also from a variety of life forms on, on Earth. But uh, they never indicated uh, anything about man's inhumanity to man or to her, and nor did they mention anything uh, spectacular coming uh, in any detail. Uh, they indicated that, that something was going to happen but they didn't say what. There are a lot of people these days, Ray, uh, with a, with the feeling that something is imminent. Do you do you get those vibrations as well? Yeah, yeah, I do, and from uh, the abductees. Uh, but again, I think you've got to be very, very careful. Uh, uh, I think because of the the state that the world is in right now, that people are probably looking for something from the outside to, to help feeling that sure. yourself are helpless <laughs> to do anything about our situation. Therefore, something had to come from the outside. Uh, so you've got that mentality, that mindset, uh, and then you've got the abductees, and you, you wonder whether that, you know, where you draw the line between what the uh, abductees are allegedly told and uh, or whether they're part of the same mindset in, in, in hoping that whatever this is that happened to him, it, it, it's going to be helpful. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. I, I understand. Uh, good evening. Um, on our first time caller line, you're on the air with Ray Fowler. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, Henderson. Okay, go ahead, sir. Uh, I'm fairly convinced that uh, this uh, probe into Mars that, uh, that they lost recently. Yes, the Explorer. Yeah, yeah I think uh, I'm convinced that that was a big cover-up. I think they know where it's at, and they evidently shut it off or something. Uh, I was just 
like to have your thoughts on that, and I'll uh, listen up. All right, thank you. Uh, what about the Mars Explorer, Ray? There are a lot of theories firing around out there about it, that there was a lot on Mars they didn't want us to see, and so they shut it off. And what do you what do you feel about that? Uh, I have no I have no opinion. I I've, uh, I've read articles by people who feel that uh, that's so, but uh, uh, again, that may be wishful thinking on their part. Uh, you have the so-called face on Mars uh, enthusiasts. Uh, you may indeed have some artifacts up there. We, we really don't know until we get there. Uh, it seems that has, there has been, not only with the United States probes to Mars, but Russia's uh, Phobos-1 and Phobos-2, mm -hmm. they had serious problems. And if you can believe what came out of Russia from, a, uh, from an astronaut, uh, that Phobos-2 actually photographed a cylindrical object approaching it prior to its uh, uh, going off the air, if you can believe things like that, if that really happened, then maybe there are some things going on up there that we don't know about. Uh, you look back at uh, some of the <coughs> news clippings of, uh, uh, concerning what the uh, NASA used to call the uh, galactic ghoul, <laughs> where very strange things would happen to our satellites in the early days especially. With, uh, uh, they would uh, go off the air and not transmit and then come back on like uh, something had repaired them or something. But, now, all of this stuff is speculation. Uh, these things happen, and you, you don't know the answer. I, I think it's very unscientific to, uh, you know, to come to any specific conclusion of why they're happening. Most likely, the most probable thing is that uh, we had problems with our Mars, uh, last Mars probe, and not saying it's possible if they shut it off and so forth, but uh, uh, right now, that's just sheer speculation, and they were wishful thinking on some people's part. All right. Well, there may be a lot of wishful thinking involved in this entire area, and it, I guess it's sometimes going to just separate from the uh, uh, reality. On our first time caller line, good evening. You're on the air with Ray Fowler. I'm going to put All right. Well, try again. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to be better. Um, I've read your books, um, The Watchers, and the book you talked about uh, men becoming sterile and the aliens uh, could see the future but do little about it, about changing it. Also, the aliens were like, showing abductees, uh, um, films about like, Earth being destroyed, but possibly. Um, what I'd like to know is, do you think the aliens could possibly be uh, from the future, possibly, um, you know, now that they need help, they're coming back for reproductive um, things, and they're, they're taking the hybrids to the future. Uh, it sounds kind of wild, but... Uh, well, actually, not that wild. Uh, thank you. You did very well there. You finally got it together. That's kind of what we've been talking about, isn't it, Ray? Uh, yeah, I, I had to talk about time travel with Dr. Uh, Michael Swords, who you might want to get on sometime. Uh, we, we've already had him on. Uh, he he uh, has hypothesized that uh, they may be from uh, our future. They may be us from our future and coming back to get uh, uh, some genetic material. But again, you know, that's... Uh, I. I <laughs> There are a lot of answers, or, or possible speculative answers that you can give, but you can't really prove any. All, all you can say is that there is a phenomenon going on, and uh, if you accept at face value what's going on, that they're very interested in our rep reproductive systems and our reproductive material. Uh, I guess that's as far as anybody can go. Then you can start speculating why, uh, and uh, all depends on how much you take at face value that the abductees uh, tell you as well. So. Uh, you know, as an investigator, a uh, reporter, uh, one can only, you know, uh, record what has uh, allegedly happened and uh, maybe do some speculating, but really, you know, not coming to any specific provable conclusion. Well, at least you're having a nice, you're holding a nice open mind about all this. And uh, I think that's to be applauded because I'm um, desperately afraid that a lot of the rest of the UFO community for years and years concentrating on a very narrow area of, of uh, physical evidence may have missed something very important. I think uh, it's the same thing with uh, medical doctors for years ignored the near-death experience because they had been trained that things like that just don't happen. They must be hallucinatory. Just as doctors ignore alternative treatments that uh, many times are very effective. But now you have medical doctors writing books on NDEs. And <laughs> exactly. You know, it's it, it got out of the grassroots uh, interest and into the medical, uh, uh, you know, p profession. I think the same thing is happening with the, uh, the abduction experience. It's, it's getting into the uh, area of uh, health professionals. And, uh, well, look at Dr. Mack at uh, Harvard uh, University, uh, who has ever thought that uh, 
professor uh, of psychiatry at uh, Harvard University it would become uh, an abduction uh, research. <laughs> Precisely. All right, short on time. Wild card. Uh, good evening from Jackie Gons Plaza Hotel. You're on the air with Ray Fowler. Where are you calling from, please? San Diego. San Diego. Go ahead. Yes. Well, uh, what can you tell us about Area 51? <laughs> Nothing. Uh, he can tell you nothing. And and if he did know something with the security clearances he had, he could probably not tell you. Thank, thank you. I don't know anything about it, even with the security clearances, except for the rumors that come out of there, and I consider them rumors until I see something more substantial. All right. Wild card line three, good evening. You're on the air with Ray Fowler. I'm calling from Reno. Reno, Nevada, yes. Ray? Yes. Have the aliens told anybody anything telling or profound other than just directions to lay on the table and oh, that's don't remember right. anything. Have they yeah, communicated they, they anything? Have. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what have they said, uh, Ray? Well, again, it may reflect the personnel, person, personality or belief system of the uh, the individuals. For example, uh, Betty Andreessen uh, has indicated on several occasions that they equate themselves with uh, the uh, origin of the uh, uh, part and parcel of the Judeo-Christian tradition. But, you know, that <laughs> you can't prove something like that. And uh, they, as I mentioned before, when you have something like this happen, not only with Betty or someone else, you have three alternatives. You can say that the individual is superimposing their own religious belief system over the phenomenon. You can say the phenomenon knows about the belief system of the individual and is using it as part of their control system. Or you can say that, yeah, they're, they're, they are part and parcel of, uh, of uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition and uh, the aerial phenomena reported in the Bible, allegedly, and so forth. I don't know. <laughs> so when people ask that question about these profound things coming out, those are the profound things that are coming out. That's fairly profound, actually. Oh, it's very profound. Yeah. And as I mentioned at the MIT uh, conference uh, Afterwards, uh, a bunch of the uh, experts got together and they said, well, when things like that come out, that, uh, that's uh, a danger. We, we don't want to talk about this. We ignore this stuff and get on with, <laughs> with, the, with the real work. And yes. So you've got to take everything into consideration and you might not believe it to be so, but you at least include it as part of your baseline. Indeed. <laughs> Line two, good evening. You're on the air with Ray Fowler. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, I was sleeping. Uh, about three, four years ago. And I woke up and I to look down. I looked down and saw my father stretched out in bed full of sleep. And I was literally sitting there beside myself, watching myself, sleeping. Then the wall in front of me lit up and turned an intense, bright light. And then, black hole images, black hole images appeared in, in this world of light light. And uh, the images, they seem to be symbolic or symbols of uh, events or, or things that happened during the course of my life. But I was so freaked out about what, what happened and what I was looking at. Colin, I'm curious, how did you uh, end up with that impression from the black holes that it was symbolic of the events in your life? Was this just a feeling or was it? They were, they were like, uh, they were almost like uh, pictures of, uh, of, um, there was one particular image that that still stays with me because when I saw this, yeah, you know, I I couldn't sit there and look at it. All right, caller, I'm Ed. I'm terribly sorry. We're, we're we're at the end of the program and I'm going to have to go. Um, thank you very much for the call. Um, is that uh, from what you heard, uh, Ray? Oh, it's similar to uh, someone who's had a near-death experience and has their whole life flash before them. I mean, he he. Uh, I think what he was going to say, that he freaked out and somehow just popped back uh, into his body again before he saw anything else, but, but I'm not sure exactly what he was going to say. All right, well, I'm, I guess we're not going to be this week. Ray, it has been a pleasure, and there's just not enough time to explore these sorts of areas fully. You need hours more.
maybe days or weeks. Um, but the time is up. The clock is a clock, and I've got to go. Well, you can give a plug for the Allagash abductions by uh, uh, Wildflower Prince, uh, Target, Oregon, sometime during your program. It would be appreciated. Well, you just did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ray Fowler, thanks a million. Okay, though, thank Take you. care. And that's uh, Area 2000. Uh, as I said, I, I'm, I'm really sorry that we don't have more time, but we don't. That's it. Thank you, folks. See you next week at 8 o'clock for another Area 2000. And be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000. And now... Area 2000. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Area 2000. Sunday, 8 o'clock is when it happens. I'm Art Bell. On behalf of the Bigelow Foundation that makes this program possible, and I think you're going to find it indeed a fascinating one this morning, uh, we've done a number of programs on Mars and on the artifact that uh, may or may not be on Mars. This morning we have uh, Professor Stanley McDaniel uh, with us, uh, who is going to talk to actually the author of course, the McDaniel report that got all this going, and so we'll see if we can get to the bottom of it. As is the case, just about every program, we're going to go all the way first, though, back to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where we're going to get yet another glimpse into another reality, glimpses of other realities. It's her segment. Her name is Linda Howe, very popular, and so now all the way back to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and good evening, Linda. Hi, Art. Hi. I also uh, will have something to contribute on the Mars story uh, tonight. Good. But first, since our mysterious subjects on Area 2000 often involve the sky, I thought that it would be perhaps worthwhile to update listeners on some current sky events that are occurring around us right now. A phenomenon that happens only twice a year occurs again on December 21st at 3.26 p.m. At that moment, the sun will stand still in its winter solstice. The word solstice comes from Latin, which literally means sun to stand still. At the solstice, the sun stands, in a sense, in the same place as its southward motion relative to the background stars comes to a stop. After the solstice, which is only a day and a half from now, the sun's path starts shifting northward again, back toward longer, and eventually warmer days. And all this is because our Earth tilts on its axis by 23 and a half degrees as it orbits the sun. If that were a change to the slightest bit, you might have an always cold north and an always hot south or some other combination. But after that, we have a path that is perfect in just such a way that we have the seasons and the changes that we do in life and living. For those of you who stayed up late on December 13th to 14th to see the Geminid meteor shower at its peak, there is another coming in the early morning hours of December 22, only two days from now. That is the Ursid meteor shower, which appears to come from the direction of a little different constellation. Happens around midnight on December 22, you should be able to see 20 meteors an hour until sunup. After Christmas and New Year's, conferences begin again and in their exploration of the unknown. The trial research conference series begins January 22nd to 23rd in Scottsdale, Arizona. Triad is meant to be in conference this year uh, at the beginning of 94 on the question, are there intelligent life forms out there? Triad says that its goal is to bring challenging fields of research to locations around the country so that professional education can reach more people in more parts of the country more frequently. For ticket information, there is a phone number to call in Springfield, Missouri. That number if people can write this down, is area code 417-882-6847. That's for ticket information for the Triad Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona, January 22 to 23, on the question, are there intelligent life forms out there? Researcher Angela Thompson with the Bigelow Foundation also has received a report from Freeport, Texas, that a radio man aboard a Coast Guard cutter said that around 1.30 in the morning on Sunday, December 14th, the a large oval-shaped object moved overhead. He said the object had an orange glow and that through the binoculars, he thought he could see windows. 
According to the report, the object rose into the sky, turned a blue color, and then disappeared. The Coast Guard radio man said that shortly afterwards, two very bright objects shot up from the ground in the direction of the object, and they also disappeared. Tonight, our guest on Area 2000 is Dr. Stanley McDaniel, Professor Emeritus and former chairman of the Department of Philosophy at Sonoma State University in California. This year, he published an analysis of research on unusual surface features in the Cydonia region of the planet Mars and raised some serious questions about NASA's mission priorities or lack of priorities in the Mars Observer regarding the Cydonia region. Now the observer appears to be lost for yet unknown reasons, but Professor McDaniel's report emphasized that the scientific analysis by several scientists of an unusual face-like feature and nearby pyramid-like features in 1976 Viking orbiter photos suggest that the features might be artificial. Artificial structures on Mars, if proven, would force a redefinition of human evolution in a larger cosmos that has other life forms. Tonight, I discuss that issue of possible artificial structures in the Martian Cydonia region with Dr. Mark Carlotto, a PhD in electrical engineering from Carnegie Mellon University in 1981. He has worked in fields of image processing and satellite remote sensing for over 10 years. Dr. Carlotto has authored scientific papers about his computer enhancement work of the unusual Martian features in such prestigious journals as Applied Optics, Digital Signal Processing, and the Journal of British Interplanetary Society. He also authored a recent book about his work entitled The Martian Enigmas that shows how computer enhancement has helped to get more details from the original Viking photograph. Tonight, I began by asking him if he thought the face was artificial, not made by nature. I think uh, that there's a 51% chance that it's, uh, that it's artificial. Um, Only 51? Well, I like to be conservative. Uh, however, I think the, the, the 1% over... over uh, even odds is, is is more than enough to justify um, um, the uh, the work that I've done and others have done because the, the payoffs are so great. Um, it's uh, I, I like to try to be careful not to not to oversell this. Um, there's really no way of verifying when you're dealing with remotely sensed imagery, and you know Mars is, is one example. But uh, whenever we're doing studies. Uh, of you know, using satellite imagery of the Earth and doing uh, land landform analysis, you really need to look at the ground truth because you can be fooled by by um, by imagery, uh, and you really need to go there to to know for sure. Or you need to have imagery that's just so good that there's no question about it, and that that's not the case. I, you know, quite quite frankly, I think there's a uh, I feel that, and I always have felt that uh, there's a, a fairly good chance that this is this is artificial. Uh, but I like to be conservative and kind of keep things, um, uh, uh, you know, keep things uh, um, conservative in my in my estimates on this. Um, well, when you were your own personal first thoughts, then you began to think, "My God, this is artificial." Um, like I said, it, it was almost uh, an, an intuition when I first saw the the. Um, the face on Mars in the newspaper article that uh, something about it just sort of grabbed me and, and um, even on the caption I was real artificial face staring up from the surface of Mars even though it kind of made light of it um, there's something about it that uh, just sort of grabbed me um, and, um, and the more you work with it the more, the more I've, I've worked with it, the the more I'm convinced there is something there because essentially every test and experiment that I've done has has uh, has indicated that uh, that it is unusual. But the, the one thing I did mention was the fractal analysis, and all all this work published uh, in peer-reviewed uh, journals, mm -hmm. the methodology that evaluated it. Object for an area um, about the size of the state of. 
of Rhode Island. This was really all the imagery I had available at the time. What the fractal analysis um, does is it, uh, if you will, it ranks the image by its degree of artificiality, and it uses fractals as a model for deciding whether something in an image is artificial or natural. Fractals are, have been used to model a whole range of natural phenomena. In fact, if I seen the Star Trek II, the Genesis sequence where they create this, this magnificent planet, it's all done with computer graphics and fractals. Well, essentially what we're doing the fractal analysis is turning, turning it around instead of using fractals to, um, to uh, generate images, we're using fractals to analyze it. And when you do this, the face stands out like a sore thumb. As being totally anomalous. As being highly anomalous. In fact, being the most anomalous feature uh, over this area I mentioned, uh, uh, slightly uh, greater than the size of the state of Rhode Island. And then the question that remains is, if it is artificial, why did somebody build something that was a mile high and a mile and a half long, shaped like a primate head? Well, that's <laughs> that's anybody's guess. I mean, that's that's... That's a loaded question. Um, the, uh, you know, a lot of people have speculated on, on terrestrial connections, and um, I think, I, basically, I, I guess I like to take things one step at a time, at least, um, in, in this sort of a, of a um, conversation, say, uh, just, uh, just this, that, if, if the basis is artificial, then it's going to change all of our lives. The sort of juncture we're at right now is um, trying to collect some better imagery to decide whether this is in fact artificial or natural. If it's artificial, then um, it's going to open, open up a whole range of, of, uh, of uh, investigations. And the impact of artificial structures on Mars might, in fact, overwhelm the scientific community. Professor McDaniel pointed out in his analysis that in 1960, 33 years ago, the Brookings Institute was contracted by NASA to prepare a report called, quote, The Implications of a Discovery of Extraterrestrial Life, unquote. And in that report, it said most significantly that the greatest area of concern might be that of the impact upon scientists themselves. Quoting further, it has been speculated that of all groups, scientists and engineers might be the most devastated by the discovery of relatively superior creatures, that these professions are most clearly associated with the mastery of nature rather than with the understanding and expression of mankind. As a result of these possibilities, that major social upheaval and psychological devastation of many scientists might occur the report spoke of the possibility that scientists and other decision makers might interfere with the release of extraterrestrial information, even to the extent of withholding it altogether. And that art is from a report, 1960, the Brookings report to NASA right early on that already implied that if we did have information about other life forms in the universe or the solar system, that the next step might be total repression in order to save the status quo, I guess, of the scientific community. And I think this would be a very important subject to discuss with Professor McDaniel. Do you really think that would occur? Uh, Hello? Hi, Linda. Do you really think that would occur? Do you really think that uh, the scientific community, uh, I'm asking, I guess, for your opinion now, would uh, turn its back to the degree that they would uh, cover it up and just sort of close their eyes and and, and uh, uh, deny it? I have experienced that personally in my investigations of the animal mutilations for 15 years. I have experienced having people look at the hard data that showed that an excision in an animal was not uh, cut with predator's teeth, that it actually was cut with high heat, and still insist that it had to be clostridium bacteria. It is a form of denial that is not logical, but it exists, and it has happened in other uh, sciences as well. Well, not only is it not logical, Linda, but it's also not scientific. How do these people call themselves scientists and block facts? Well, this 
is probably one of the cruxes to why there is a government policy of silence on this whole other alien life form issue. And ours is not uh, to debate this tonight, but I think to explore with a man who's done a great deal of thinking about the whole NASA mission of trying to get out into this solar system and to explore. And if, in fact, there are artificial structures on Mars, why is it that there has been resistance about photographing the Cydonia region again? Uh, why is it that science would not be the first in line to say, let's go back and take a look at these features and let's try to get closer photographs? Right now, we don't have an orbiter up there with a camera. We had hoped that we would. I understand that in uh, January or February, we will be launching another uh, unmanned orbiter to the moon to do a photographing of the surface of the moon. It's called Project Clementine. And that, that there's a possibility that that orbiter may be also sent to an asteroid. If we are going to be able to do that, it is possible that these kinds of uh, photographic orbiters might be launched again to Mars in the near future. Uh, one way or the other, I think that Professor McDaniel uh, would agree, it's important that we at least try to resolve what might be in that Cydonia region to the best of our ability and open our minds to the fact that we are uh, possibly a very probably not alone. It is the most in important question for mankind, uh, Linda, without question. Um, another wonderful report. Where will we find you next week? Uh, let's see. Next Sunday, I think I will be back in Philadelphia again after uh, a trip to Tennessee, and uh, I may have a report from there to share with you next Sunday. That's excellent. We'll look forward to it, and uh, thank you very, very much. Yes, and my best to Professor McDaniel. Uh, I think his report is going to be coming out in book form. It's extremely important information, and I'm glad he's on tonight. All right. Thank you, Linda. Good evening. Uh, that's Linda Howe. That was a good report, and it relates and uh, makes it a kind of a neat segue to Professor McDaniel. Professor McDaniel is, of course, the author of the McDaniel Report, much discussed in scientific circles, uh, the basis of, um, as a matter of fact, a couple of other shows that we've done, uh, most notably with Richard Hoagland, and we'll ask him about that. Professor McDaniel uh, has quite an extensive professional background. He's a member of the uh, board of directors of the Alan Watts Society for Comparative Philosophy in Sausalito, or was that, rather, in uh, 1972 to 1974, a member of the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy, a member of the American Philosophical Association, a founding vice president of the board of directors of the Foundation for Critical Thinking, professor emeritus at Sonoma State University in 1992, Chairman, Department of Philosophy, Sonoma, uh, Sonoma State University, 1971 through 4, and 1989 through 1992. Professor of Philosophy at Sonoma State University, or Park, California, 1966 through 1992. And instructor, Brook, Brooklyn College, uh, the Brooklyn College, the City University of New York, 1964 to 1966. And I should say, uh, many books and manuals published, but most notably, and I guess recently, uh, the McDaniel Report, a uh, very, very controversial report. Here is uh, the professor, Stanley V. McDaniel. Professor McDaniel, good evening. Yes, good evening, Art. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Um, that's quite a background you've got. When did... Uh, you read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um... It is, uh, uh, it is fascinating what you've done, and uh, I've had many people talk about it. Uh, one of the recent guests we had that covered quite a bit of your report and uh, speaks about it is Richard Hoagland, uh, and I wonder if you're familiar with Mr. Hoagland. Oh, well, I have spoken with all of the researchers in this area uh, over a period of over a year, and uh, Richard Hoagland, of course, being one of them. So I've had uh, extensive telephone conversations with... Uh, with Hoagland and Di Pietro and the others uh, who have done research in this area, yes. All right. Um, it's hard, almost hard to know where to start, but what made you, I guess, what made you publish this report and how did you get involved with all of this? Uh, I'd be happy to talk about that because it is rather interesting. I, uh, 
I had seen a copy of um, a book by Randolfo Pozos, The Face on Mars, um, which was published around 1987, I believe. And it, this book by, um, by Pozos, who's an anthropologist, uh, is an account, a global um, account of a computer conference that was organized by Pozos and Oakland on the topic of the Martian phenomena, uh, which lasted over a period around 1984-85. And uh, I hadn't seen that some years back. Uh, thought it was interesting. Uh, filed it away and uh, piled up my mind for a number of years. And uh, a year ago, September, when I heard of the Mars Observer being launched, I remembered that report. And the gap to inquire, uh, what you not to the face that was going to photograph these objects. And I, uh, I did some searching around trying to find this out and stumbled across a couple of documents. One was the um, 1992 edition of Richard Hoagland's book on the Monuments of Mars, uh, which in its appendix gives an account of the um, apparent uh, likelihood that the Mars Observer would not photograph the object. That upset me. And then I saw also an article by a man named Harold Torrance uh, analyzing the possible geometrical shape of um, the, one of the objects in Cydonia, the, what's called the DNM pyramid, and I was tremendously impressed by the scientific care taken by Mr. Torin, who is a cartographer with the Defense Mapping Agency in Washington, D.C., and very highly qualified. And uh, so I began to write up some topics that might be used for a radio program on this issue, and, uh, in fact, I was trying to get uh, the PBS uh, radio people to uh, do a, a program on this, and I was writing up some issues that might arise. And as I got further and further into it, I began phoning the uh, different researchers, talking with them, thinking, well, maybe this will turn into a paper of 30 or 40 pages. And um, as you see, and perhaps you have it there in your hands, it ended up being a book of uh, almost 200 pages. So that was how I got into it. All right. Um, prior to the Viking photos, um, how good was our imagery, or what imagery did we even have prior to Viking? Anything? I think there were Mariner 9 images of, um, of Mars and even of that area, and I believe the resolution was around 300 meters per pixel, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Maybe I may be not quite right about that, because I didn't devote a lot of time to that. Um, and uh, that would have been such a poor resolution, you couldn't really tell much at all. How, how much of an improvement was Viking? Well, then, uh, I think it's, 100, it's, um, it's 150 feet, or around 50 meters per pixel for the Viking. So uh, that means that each um, dot on the um, uh, digital uh, photo uh, is uh, no smaller than 50 meters across. Uh, yeah, 50 meters across. So we went from 300 uh, to 50. I believe that was correct, yes. And just as a matter of curiosity, had the Mars Observer done its job, what would the rev rev resolution have been there? Uh, it would have been around um, 5, I think, is what it was. Uh, it, in other words, it would have actually settled the question. Oh, yes, probably. Probably. Not absolutely, but it would have given such quality that... Uh, uh, that uh, a great deal more information will be obtained. Yeah. All right, Professor, let me quickly identify the station. We'll be right back to you. Surely. Professor Stanley McDaniel is my guest. This is Area 2000. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. It's a Sunday night. This is Area 2000. I'm Mark Brown. Back down to Professor Stanley McDaniel, author of the McDaniel Report. Professor, are you still there? Yes, I want to correct myself. I said five. I was thinking of a different camera at that point. No, it would have been as low as 1.4 meters. Per oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, very, very precise. Yes, indeed it is. Um, with what we have right now uh, and with all the study you've done, 
how convinced, I mean, you, you, you heard uh, the guest that Linda had. Uh, he suggested a 51% probability that the items on Mars, the, the structures, are artificial. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what percentage would you assign? Uh, if I might, can I spend a moment on that? Um, uh, that was Dr. Carlotta who was speaking, uh, with whom I've spoken a number of times. He, he pointed out that he tends to be conservative on this. Uh, but uh, the guiding principle behind my report is this, and it's the one that Dr. Carlotta was also following. That is that any reasonable degree of doubt regarding whether these objects are natural or not uh, creates a profound and compelling ethical obligation for the government and NASA to give extremely high priority to obtaining high-resolution photos of these things. And so that's what Carlotta was saying when he said if there's even a 1% uh, favorable uh, tilt to the data, that that produces a tremendous obligation on the part of the scientists to, uh, to look into it further. One would imagine that with, with even a 20 or 30% probability, that would be more than enough under the circumstances. That would seem to be the case. Now, um, my judgment is this. I, I have gone through... As far as I know, all the research that's ever been done on this thing, and I certainly may have missed some, but I think I'm not going to stop. And I put that back to this from the point of view of scientific methodology as is understood in the area of philosophy of science. And I have found that uh, the data consistently tilts in the direction of artificiality. There has not been one single test performed on the available data that does not tilt in that direction rather than, in the, than tending to disprove the artificial nature of the object. So I would say that the chances are higher than 51%. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you get really deeply into the data, it begins to get, you begin to feel a chill on the back of your neck because it just looks like you've got to say these things have got to be artificial. But uh, being scientists, uh, we have to be cautious and um, so uh, I, I wouldn't want to give a definite percentage, but I think it's more than 51%. What about uh, hard math in this area? And I don't want to get too technical because it's a general audience, but sure. is there a way, Professor, to um, to do some math and uh, to put probabilities and to input all this to a computer and for it to... Yes, actually, a professor of physics right now is uh, in the process of trying to develop a statistical analysis of the data that's been developed by the other researchers, and I have hope that uh, we'll have soon some uh, uh, results. I would say that in Richard Hoagland's book, he made uh, The Monuments of Mars, he also made a move in that direction. Uh, there is a small discussion of that issue there, too, and some uh, formulas in mathematics. Yes, well, he claims to have developed some new form of, um, of, of physics to apply to some of the equations he used. I didn't uh, quite understand all of it. Uh -huh. But even with, uh, I guess my question is, even with standard uh, mathematical formulas, you're, you're suggesting there is there is a way to approach this. Right. Actually, those are two different issues. Uh, the physics that he's working on is has to do with the interpretation of the meaning, the possible meaning of the object. And uh, what we're talking about here is a statistical effort to, to show the probability that the things are artificial, which is a little different uh, from that. All right. Uh, what have you done along that line, and what can you tell us about it? Well, there are at least two that could, could be brought into view. Um, uh, first of all, maybe I might go back to a comment made by Dr. Carlotto. He said that um, uh, data taken from a distance, photographs, images from a spacecraft, are not uh, uh, proof. And, uh, of course, he asked for what they call ground truth. In other words, somebody actually standing there looking at the thing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's often mistaken to mean that there's no evidence that the things may be artificial. The general public often confuses the, the, the difference or doesn't understand the difference between uh, proving something is true and establishing a probability that it might be true. <laughs> now, the data that comes in from the spacecraft, the Viking photos, is evidence, and um, analysis of the data shows that that, that evidence uh, tilts in the direction of the space probably may well be artificial. So it isn't as though if you don't have ground truth, you can never have evidence. 
the photographs are definitely evidence. Let me ask this. If an individual were standing there, virtually in front of the face, yeah. is, it, uh, is it probable that individual would be able to uh, scientifically come to some determination, or would the scale of the object uh, perhaps... Uh, uh, in other words, what evidence could one gather on the ground? It's a question that's often asked. It's hard to say until you're there. Uh, if the face happened to be made of uh, some kind of uh, stones that were placed together to form a sculpture, uh, then, of course, that would be perfectly evident. If it was um, a car, say, in one huge piece by some means unknown and then weathered over a million years, uh, then you'd have to talk about probabilities, I think, because uh, even though it may be severely weathered, there may be such detail in it, and in fact we already see detail that's quite remarkable, uh, that there would be no way to uh, conclude other than that it is artificial. Professor, what weather would there be on Mars? Um, the storms, to start with. Uh, there are high winds. Um, the dust storms are not common in the area of Cydonia, but from time to time uh, there are planet-wide dust storms. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is wind weathering. Um, there, there has been water uh, uh, erosion on Mars, although I believe in the area that we're talking about, that is not likely to have been the case. Uh, there's, of course, heating and cooling that produces fractures of various sorts. Those kinds of things can produce uh, changes. What is the atmosphere of Mars made up of? Mostly carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. And it's very, very thin, but it is enough to support winds and, uh, and weather. And it would be, I presume, corrosive in nature. The wind certainly would be. Uh, well, yes, especially dust blown by the wind, yes. Uh, there's no way to estimate the age at this point of the objects, is there? Uh, no, there, there is a one hypothesis, uh, which is Richard Hoagland's, uh, and, and he hasn't put it forward as anything absolutely proven, but there, there does seem to be a sighting line from uh, one of the objects nearby to the face, which would align with a solstice sunrise uh, about 330 million years ago. Hmm. And... Um, if that was in, an intentional alignment for a sighting of some sort, then that might be a possible dating. Uh, Vincent DiPietro and Gregory Molinar and, and Dr. John Brandenburg, who are another group of researchers, feel that that is not likely, and they believe the objects are in the order of, um, of many, many more millions of years old than, than that. Um, I'm not totally familiar with all of the objects that are there. Are there any uh, what would appear to be classic pyramids? Well, um, there is a group of, um, of faceted objects, uh, facets, in other words, they have sides that seem to be fairly regular, like pyramids, about eight miles um, uh, west of the face. Mm -hmm. And then south of the face and south of that group, which is called the city, um, is the huge object called the D&M Pyramid, which also appears to have uh, evenly uh, faceted uh, sides. The reason I pursued that is because, of course, the pyramids in Egypt um, were mathematically quite precise, and I think oriented in a mathematically precise manner. Yes. Has anybody taken a look at the objects on Mars for a comparison? Yes, an architect, uh, actually, is an architectural designer named Robert Fiertek in uh, Connecticut. Uh, has done a careful analysis of these objects. He studied them for four years, and uh, uh, especially the uh, pyramidal shapes in the area called the city. And of course, when we say the city, we, we don't mean there is a city there, but it's referred to in that way as a, a metaphor. Um, and uh, he came up with the conclusion that the arrangement of the objects and the regularity of the faces that are visible uh, it's very, very hard to explain other than as an architectural um, complex of some sort. Huh. And uh, in my report, I do a quote uh, from a short paper of his on this topic. So uh, he has found architectural symmetry in this group, uh, and uh, there's even some drawings in my report on this that show uh, some of the um, measurements. Let me, I'll say the most outstanding one is this. Um, in this group of objects, there's a little arrangement of uh, what appear to be five little hills. They're probably around uh, 100 feet high. And um, they're arranged uh, like a, a, a cross. Uh, there are four of them at right angles to each other, and then one right in the middle. 
and this has been called the city square. Around those objects, these large pyramidal shapes um, uh, look roughly, when you look at them, they look like they're in a sort of a pentagon. Now, Mr. Firtek made very careful measurements. He checked and rechecked from the apexes, or the tops, the very pointed tops of these uh, pyramidal shapes that surround the city square, and he found that they form an almost perfect pentagon shape. Uh, with um, with equal angles in the right places for a symmetrical pentagon. This is of uh, significance not only because it is almost impossible that would happen by chance. It would be very difficult to find five mountaintops in nature like that come up with regularity, but also because a large structure to the south of that called the DNM Pyramid also appears to have itself a pentagonal shape and is about the same size as the Pentagon uh, shape that was found in the city area. Hmm. So uh, so that's part of the architectural analysis, and that's of some interest. Professor, as you look at the cluster of objects that you have studied on Mars, and then you examine the rest of the surface of Mars, are there other areas where there are uh, uh, anomalies yes. very much like this one? In other words, is this a common area or an uncommon area? No, they're, they're, the researchers have located um, uh, maybe one to two dozen objects on other areas of Mars. Some of them have been located by searching in um, uh, areas similar to the Cydonia location, ones that are located right near what would have been the shore of an ancient seabed, etc., uh, trying to infer what kind of areas would such things be built upon. And uh, I'd say there's a dozen or more, anyway, uh, objects that have been uh, identified as uh, suspicious. Most um, interesting is one called the um, Crater Pyramid, uh, which is uh, some, I think, 200 miles or so uh, away from the Cydonian area. And it is a very clear-looking uh, four-sided pyramidal shape that is perched on the rim of a crater. Uh, it's the highest thing for hundreds of miles around and uh, doesn't look like it could have been um, uh, natural, partly because when the meteorite impacted, it apparently caused no damage to this object, which suggests maybe the object was built on it after the, the crater was made. Ooh. Um, there's no indication that, uh, that, for example, the material piled up on the side of it where the crater would have impacted and that there would be what they call an impact shadow behind the object. And um, so uh, so that's a very interesting object. But yes, there are mm -hmm. quite a few. Most of those are outlined in uh, Mark Carlotto's book called The Martian Venus, the Elizabeth Object. Well, it probably calls for conjecture, um, but I'm, I'm interested. Would you, would you think... Um, which of these two probabilities would you think more likely than an ancient civilization uh, of some sort that was thrived at one point apparently on Mars did this, or that somebody from some place else did it as uh, to, to leave some sort of message? Or I'm fumbling here, but I think you understand. Oh, uh, Art, you just outlined the two major theories on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Vincent Di Pietro, Gregory Molinar, and John Brandenburg have come forward with, with what they call the Cydonia Hypothesis. And it is the hypothesis that these objects were created. Uh, oh, by the way, I, might, I, I, I should say that their theory doesn't cover uh, or doesn't deal particularly with the objects in the city area. They're mostly interested in the face. But they believe that these objects were created, or they hypothesized that these objects were created by indigenously evolved Martians who uh, grew up and uh, evolved on Mars the way we did here on Earth, mm -hmm. and that they did look like human beings, uh, which is why the faces look humanoid, um, and that uh, they then passed away. Now, that theory requires them to um, put forward my idea that Mars remained habitable long enough in the past for this evolution to have occurred, and that does seem to be a subject of controversy among scientists. Most scientists seem to believe that that could not have been the case, but the, but there, this is still in doubt. So um, hmm. uh, it, it is possible that on Mars there were um, uh, warm periods, uh, certainly signs of water erosion and oceans even, or lakes. And uh, so that's one hypothesis. Uh, Richard Hoagland and Will Curran, on the other hand, uh, have the viewpoint that this probably didn't happen because of the unlikely of um, 
independent evolution on Mars, and so their hypothesis is more along the lines that um, this area was settled in by uh, extraterrestrial visitors, probably from beyond the solar system, and uh, for purposes unknown to us. So those are the two two main theories. Do you lean more toward one than the other? I remain neutral on the topic. <laughs> I, uh, I would say this. Um, the Detectual Moron and Abandonment Theory postulates that the people were at a stage of development socially and culturally approximately the same as uh, Neolithic uh, times on Earth. Uh, and that, that being the case, these objects would be more like religious objects and probably not designed to send any specific sophisticated messages to the Earth. Um, on the other hand, the Hoagland theory is that there is a mathematical method embedded in geometry of the relationship between the objects, and this would have to come from a very sophisticated technological civilization. So, um, uh, since there is, a, I, I'm very favorable toward the evidence that there is a geometrical uh, configuration up there of some sophistication, and so I tend to. Um, to give maybe the edge to the Hoagland Corn theory. What what uh, what do we know about Mars past scientifically? In other words, uh, you said there was water on the planet at one time, or there's evidence there was water. What about atmosphere? Um, is, is, is there any way to know what once was? I, I have to bow out on that one. I'm not an expert planetologist on Mars. That wasn't my uh, job here with this document, but. Um, I believe that it's, it's understood that there may have been uh, more atmosphere on Mars in the past. There have been some articles come out on this recently um, uh, speculating about um, possible warm periods with more atmosphere and uh, uh, conditions that could promote life. But, um, but I, don't, I don't have the data enough to say uh, whether or not there was a, a, a richer atmosphere. All right, let's deal with NASA a little bit. They, they claim, I guess, that uh, the phase on Mars is a trick of light and shadow? This is the strangest thing. Um, for a year now, they've been sending out uh, answers to inquiries made by congressmen uh, on behalf of constituents, where NASA says that NASA scientists have determined that the facial appearance is a trick of light and shadow, meaning that the, the lighting, has the way the photograph has by the way, there's just two such photographs that we really know of that are of any value. And that the lighting angles of these photographs were just accidentally, uh, the shadows were thrown in such a way that it happened to look a little bit like a face. And they say the proof of this is that a photograph taken later from a different lighting angle shows no face at all. And that proves that the original photos showing a face were nothing but a now, it turns out that no one has ever been able to identify any Viking photos made that uh, were taken later in which the face disappeared. And on inquiries I made to NASA, to Mr. Donald Savage, public information officer at NASA, I had some conversations with him just as I was finishing my report. He was unable, even after checking all throughout NASA, to say that at this time NASA has any idea whatsoever which photographs there were that they were referring to when they said there was a photograph taken later in which the face disappears. Oh, boy. Not very scientific. Uh, I'm afraid that they really cannot produce such a photograph, and um, I was shocked when after they learned through my uh, discussion with them that they could not identify such a photograph, they maintained and are still apparently sending to congressmen the statement that there's a photograph taken later in which the face disappears. Uh, this seems to me to be highly irresponsible. Uh, I've heard this from so many people about NASA. Highly irresponsible, they say. Um, what in the world is going on in NASA, in your opinion? In other words, what are they doing here? They e Even with the Mars Observer mission, they thought tooth and nail to avoid uh, photographing this region once again. We have to be very, very careful with what they say. They have made a number of, of efforts to make it sound as though they're just going to do everything just fine. And the way they do this uh, is to say, well, we are going to photograph the region. Well, the region is some millions of square kilometers. And... Yeah. Martian objects occupy only 
900 square kilometers, uh, the ones of interest here. And so saying they're going to photograph the region is uh, oh, means nothing. Another thing is they will never say that they're going to give high priority to these objects. Um, so, so what happens is they'll give the illusion that they are, they are really going to do something for the public, but when you really look closely at what they're saying, uh, it turns out to be a false promise. I have a section on this in my report called Misleading Assurances, and yeah. that is something one has to be very, very careful about. Indeed, they had a plan, did they not, to restrict access anyway? to these photographs? Well, this is one of the things that causes one to wonder about what's going on. Um, I'll, I'll let, if I may, I'll take a moment to go over that. Please. In previous uh, missions to Jupiter, for example, and so on, where they had photographs, the cameras were under the auspices of the JPL um, Jet Propulsion Lab and were what they call facility instruments. That is to say, they were facilities that all the scientists involved and as well as the public could uh, utilize. And as a result, there was no uh, delay. As soon as the photographs came in and were converted into visible form, they were broadcast on television. And, and everyone may remember the Neptune uh, uh, episode uh, a oh, few yeah. years back where they did that, and it was very, very exciting. In the case of the Mars Observer, they changed the procedure. They farmed out the camera to a private contractor under what is called a principal investigator contract. Now, these principal investigator contracts have clauses in them that allow the investigator to retain the data for personal use, as it were, um, uh, for long periods of time before releasing it to the public. Uh, this is supposed to be to pay them back for the effort and time they took to develop their experiments. Um, now, in the case of the Mars Observer, the time period was six months. If the photographs, uh, the, the, the Mars Observer mission was two years long. If the photographs of the Cydonian object weren't made until late in that mission, say almost two years into the mission, then the public might have had to wait as long as two years and six months to, uh, to even see the photographs, much less know whether they've taken photographs of these particular objects. Now, toward the very end, when the Mars Observer was about to go into orbit, uh, there was a lot of clamor. People were saying, we want photos. So they said, no, we're going to give you public photos. You can come to one of three locations in the United States, and we'll set up a kiosk. And we'll, um, one of them was Houston, I believe. And um, then you can sit there and wait and hope that we might put some photos of the Cydonian area on the screen, but you won't know whether we're going to do that anyway. Huh? Uh, this was a kind of a joke, but it was an effort to, uh, to sound as though they were going to disseminate the information to the public. Another excuse they gave for not putting photos of these objects on public TV right away was that uh, it would interfere with their programming of the other NASA uh, broadcasts they like to put out. Uh, somebody pointed out these are mostly reruns of old NASA missions, and um, uh, to imagine that the Cydonian thing couldn't take priority over uh, over reruns of old NASA missions. Uh, yeah, it just doesn't add up. That doesn't add up. Now, one final thing on this is very important. NASA then began putting out a document that said that they were not treating the Mars photos from the Mars Observer any differently than in any other mission. Now, what they did was they, they this was a, a misleading technicality, it's based on a technicality. What they meant was, was that for all principal investigator contracts, those were not being treated any differently. But the big difference was, is that in previous missions, the camera results were not part of a principal investigator contract. So for NASA to say they weren't treating it any differently uh, than any other missions was technically in a certain sense. But effectively, it was radically different, and, and for NASA to do that struck me as not very sincere. Well, they have not seemed very sincere throughout all of this. Uh, I'm curious, with what you've done with your report and Richard Hoagland uh, running about the nation, doing interviews and so forth, what is the uh, NASA attitude? Let me take exception to that characterization, running about the nation. Every time well, I, electronically and doing interviews. <laughs> Every time anybody mentions Richard Hoagland, for, uh, there's been an effort to build up an image that Richard Hoagland is somehow uh, the, the bad boy. I, I don't know how that gets out. 
But I have dealt with this man for over a year, and I don't find him to, to be... Uh, nor, nor do I. I think it has to do, Professor, with his enthusiasm. He is enthusiastic, and I'll admit that. Okay, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I just want to take exception. I think all of the researchers are very highly people of high integrity. Um, what was your question again, Art? I'm sorry. Well, my question was, with Richard Hoagland out there, let's put it that way, and, and with your report and others, uh, what is NASA's attitude? Uh, NASA, uh, I believe the attitude is that these researchers are irritants, they're madmen, they're out to make money off of it. Um, they're just uh, uh, trying to make a buck off of what is a mistake. Um, it, it's really incredible the ridicule they've been subjected to. Uh, just about uh, three or four days before the Mars Observer was lost, uh, Dr. Michael Malin, who is not himself a uh, uh, NASA person, but is the uh, principal investigator for the camera we were just talking about, uh, put out a statement on Internet in which he tried to uh, uh, ridicule the, um, uh, the people, such as Richard Hoagland, uh, saying they built up a cottage industry uh, with this. Uh, they've written books, which he seems to think is bad. And he adds, and of course, National Enquirer and other tabloid published reports. So what they've tried to do is uh, make it look as though uh, the researchers uh, are uh, on the same level as the National Enquirer. Hmm. And uh, it seems to me, with the body of evidence that exists and the scientific uh, mathematical probabilities, NASA is, is the one that should be the subject of uh, mainstream scientific ridicule. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, I have taken the arguments against the objects being uh, artificial, or probably artificial, put forward by NASA people, and I have found that al almost 100% in every case they are fallacious from a strict logical point of view and do not do not seem to acknowledge scientific methodology. I claim them and as a matter of fact, that's why I really wrote the report once I got into the topic. Uh, as a philosopher, I was so shocked by the poor nature of the reasoning that was coming out of NASA uh, that I really went ahead with this report. All right, Professor, this is a point where we have to take a break uh, for news at the top of the hour. That means five minutes to sit back and relax, and we'll be back at it. All right, uh, stay right there, and we'll be back with Professor Stanley McDaniel. Uh, right after the news. You're listening, of course, to Area 2000 from Las Vegas. I'm Art Bell. Glad you're with us this evening, and if you'll stay right there, there's a lot more to come. on Mars in the Sidonia region, region of Mars. I want to remind you just before we rejoin him, your contact at the Bigelow Foundation is Angela Thompson. She can answer questions if you have a story for her. If you have something that you feel uh, deserves to be investigated, I urge you to contact her. And you can do so during the business week at area code 702-456-1600. Zero six. That's area code 702-456-1606. Once again, here is Professor Stanley McDaniel. Professor, are you still there? Yes, I am. Mark. Excellent. Excellent. Um, all right. Well, we're still at NASA, I suppose. And uh, I, guess, I guess what I want to know is, first of all, why private contractors uh, became involved at all. I mean, this is... Uh, American taxpayer money that uh, funds all of this and uh, so why did they get private contractors and why did they hold on to photographs and uh, uh, so forth why not just keep the whole thing in essence public I, I don't know the details of that but I, I can say that apparently it was to save money because um, private contractor would develop the experiment uh, construct the uh, hardware and uh, place that hardware on the spacecraft and, uh, of course, uh, the uh, information gathered from the various experiments uh, all that carried out by the would eventually be made uh, available to the American public. 
Uh, the only problem is that when you're talking about photographs of these controversial objects where NASA has behaved in such a uh, very questionable manner, uh, it raises the specter that during the six-month period uh, uh, in which the uh, public uh, has no idea what's going on with these photos, that changes might be made in them. And, um, or that they'd be lost, or for that matter, we don't even know whether they would photograph the objects. So, um, in particular, the private contractor uh, for the photographs is a, an especially problematic thing. Now, I have put in my report a set of recommendations, one of which is that uh, in any future private contractor arrangement, um, the uh, Martian objects would be exempt from what they call the proprietary period. In other words, those uh, let, let the private contractor do what he wants uh, with the uh, other images, but every image that comes in from that area where the face is located should uh, be exempt from the proprietary six-month period. Has that been officially proposed to NASA? Uh, I have put it in my recommendations, which have been sent to a number of congressmen and uh, and also uh, to the president's office. I don't know whether the president has read it or not, but uh, I, uh, I've done the best I can. That raises one point. Um, I have had to try to distribute this document at my own expense, and I ran out of funds way before I could uh, send any to, uh, to more than a, a very handful of congressmen. I'm trying now to raise funds to pay for sending free copies to uh, to all of the members of Congress, and it has been difficult um, uh, to uh, to get this done. So I have to say that at this point, only uh, four or five people in the government have actually been sent uh, a copy of this. And as far as NASA goes, I've only managed to send about three to NASA officials, which, by the way, have been ignored, uh, received no commentary on them. Hmm. Uh, this. To me, um, Professor, it's just a gigantic mystery. In other words, with all of this evidence, more evidence than they have pointing to anything else on Mars mm -hmm. that might be of interest, for them to so actively ignore setting this as uh, you'd think it would be their outstanding number one priority. You would think so. There have been theory after theory. One of the first ones I ran into was the theory that NASA didn't want to seem like uh, they, they were doing something crazy because Congress would cut off their funding. Um, in other words, they say, well, we're going to look, now we're going to look for things that were built by aliens, and Congress would say, you are not. I had not thought about that, mm -hmm. but, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Any evidence that these objects are artificial, uh, I mean hard evidence, would, as was suggested in the first interview this morning, force a redefinition of human evolution. That's right. And uh, it was suggested that perhaps some of the biggest impact would be on scientists yeah. rather than society. I happen to think there would be a gigantic impact on society, but uh, Linda postulated that uh, scientists would be impacted and perhaps would go into massive denial. Do you think that could be? I'm afraid I have to say I do think it could be the case. Uh, with our atmosphere today where we've seen movies like uh, Star Wars and Star Trek and so on, many people feel that at least the American public or the public... Uh, who watches those kinds of things, is better prepared than they would have been, say, 60 or even 30 years ago. Mm. And that's probably true. But uh, there are an awful lot of people still who uh, believe that the, the Earth was created 6,000 years ago. So uh, uh, it would impact them rather uh, heavily, I think. What about the social impact? And I, I love to ask this of my guests, but if somehow you got hold of irrefutable photographs, that, uh, that that would show these objects were um, were artificial. Would would you hesitate before you published? W would you hesitate at all? Would you think sit down and think through the social implications? Forget your fellow your colleagues, but y the social implications. Uh, well, it's the business of science to put forward the truth, and that information would impact many scientific theories. Uh, about the nature of the universe, including physics and program and, and planetary uh, uh, science. And so it would be a scientific thing, if I may put it, to withhold such information if that were, uh, were discovered. So, so you wouldn't give it a really a moment's thought? 
I, I don't think so. I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, there may be some negative effects, and the government uh, could be worried that the power structure would be altered or something. But the positive effects would be incredible. In California alone, if you can imagine what a boost it would give to the space industry, uh, there would be a manned mission to Mars mounted almost immediately, I think. Yeah. I can't imagine that not happening. And um, uh, so the industries that have to do with space and space-related materials would, would be uh, um, given a tremendous shot in the arm. It could divert uh, attention away from uh, the craziness we've got on the planet today and begin to alter our sense of who we are in a positive direction. So then other than the one motive, possible motive uh, you mentioned on the part of NASA that they might be the subject of ridicule or a funding cut, more importantly, right. um, what other motive might NASA or the government have for not wanting any of this to be public? Uh, as I worked on my report, I ran across different theories. I myself don't know what one to choose, but um, uh, one that was suggested was, of course, the Galileo syndrome, which is uh, the thing that happened to Galileo, namely that the establishment structure depended upon its particular view of the universe, and Galileo's discovery of uh, the moons of Jupiter uh, began w was seen as, um, as undermining that, and so they... Um, uh, tried to phase him out, as it were, in order to hang on to their uh, uh, their particular viewpoint. That's one. Another one, though, that's interesting is the one that I've come across in the uh, UFO uh, area. Um, the idea that extraterrestrials may have, in fact, contacted government people and so on, and, uh, and that uh, this whole thing is part of some widespread... Uh, massive conspiracy to hide uh, the existence of ETs from uh, uh, from the people for reasons unknown, political reasons, I would suppose. Do you favor that? Well, I would say this. The Martian objects are concrete evidence of the possible existence of extraterrestrials, either contemporary or past. Uh, they're, uh, they're that face sitting up there is a, a huge, massive um, uh, statement. And uh, so it's a real mode in the eye <laughs> for anybody who wants to try to cover up uh, the possible uh, reality of extraterrestrials. So it, it could be the focus of a real cover-up <laughs> because it is so obvious, yes. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, SETI, uh, the Search for Extraterrestrial yes. Intelligence. Um, I guess that a lot of that has been defunded, or a lot of the funding that was going to it's flow uh, stop. Mm -hmm. What, uh, how sound was the science behind the whole uh, project in the first place? I, I, as far as the particular radio telescope project that we identified as SETI uh, went, I imagine the science was quite sound. But the problem with the whole SETI endeavor was is that it did not include the concept of looking on other planets in the solar system. It under uh, went under the assumption that the only messages we would get from anybody would be from uh, radio waves coming from distant stars. And as a result, um, the uh, the effort was directed only at receiving radio signals and, and not at looking at anything on uh, the surface of other planets. Well, where, where you're really suggesting that uh, the, the uh, possible evidence is hiding, in effect, in plain sight right there on Mars. Uh, that's, that's correct. Now, there's one other very important aspect there, and that is that uh, the people interpreting the messages and looking for uh, the kind of message you would get are almost all from one very limited range of science. Uh, anthropologists, archaeologists, psychologists, sociologists, none of those people are involved as far as uh, uh, interpreting uh, messages. And in, in the case of the uh, objects on Mars, the criticisms have come from NASA geologists and astronomers, but they cannot recognize uh, possible information that would be of an archaeological nature, for instance. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, Carl Sagan, who is one of those NASA astronomers, uh, recently, just this year, I believe, uh, wrote to someone that the time to call an archaeologist was only after the planetary scientists at NASA had decided that things were artificial. So rather than say that we should use archaeological knowledge to find out or, or evaluate whether the things are artificial, 
He says, we astronomers will make the evaluation first, and then if we think they're artificial, then we might call in an archaeologist. Huh. Uh, uh, while we're on the subject, uh, Dr. Sagan, why uh, has somebody who would be such a force for, for good in these areas seem to be, uh, I'll use the word obstructionist, uh, with regard to uh, the whole UFO controversy, what evidence exists, uh, the, uh, uh, the abductions which um, uh, have been uh, the center of a lot of recent study, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the objects on Mars. Why is he obstructionist? Well, I can't uh, guess what his uh, motives are. I don't know him personally. I've never talked to him. Um, I do know that uh, there are some interesting things that took place. For example, Dr. Malin, the camera operator for the Mars Observer camera, um, uh, had made a statement in uh, rejecting the uh, Sidonian objects that he was not going to assign his priorities on the improbability, the improbable assumption that Mars may have ever been inhabited. Yes. Now, Dr. Sagan had written in uh, around 1960s, and I'm looking forward to hearing my document, trying to, to locate it, because I actually have it quoted here in my document. But he had written that um, the chances uh, of extraterrestrials visiting uh, the solar system uh, were one in 10,000 years, uh, once every 10,000 years. In fact, here it is here. In 1963, Dr. Sagan wrote a... Uh, a paper called Direct Contact Among Galactic Civilizations by Interstellar Spaceflight. And he concluded that on the basis of probability projections, mathematical formula, that the solar system is likely to have been visited by space gang civilizations on an average of once every 10,000 years. And in that article, he even suggested that these visitors might have constructed bases with the remnants of them on the moon or other planets in the solar system. Uh, now, if someone as prestigious as Dr. Sagan could imagine that it is a possibility anyway that we've been visited um, more than once, then Dr. Um, uh, Malin's argument that it's very speculative and improbable uh, is apparently at odds with this. So even among these people, um, uh, they were contradicting each other. Now, Dr. Sagan being someone who says that we might have been visited and uh, so on, uh, it's very strange that he would uh, that he would then take a position uh, ridiculing the uh, the Sidonian objects among others. Precisely, but that's not been his only area of ridicule. Yes, I'm not as familiar with the UFO uh, area, so I haven't uh, seen too much of that. But I have seen the ridicule he's, he has lavished upon the uh, face on Mars. All right, back for a second to the Viking photos. Surely. Have we gone as far as we can go? Uh, I know that uh, computers continue to get better and faster with more storage, uh, and uh, that video enhancement techniques have come a long, long way. Right. Uh, how are we doing with that? Have we gone as far as we can go with state-of-the-art? Well, I don't think so, and I think there's a great deal more that can be done with just the Viking images. That's uh, apparently agreed upon by several researchers. In addition to that, what's very important is for other scientists who are in the fields of geology and archaeology and anthropology and so on to um, make independent evaluations of uh, even the data that we currently have so as to spread this information out among the scientific community and give it some air, air of legitimacy if indeed they find it so. And that is beginning to happen a little bit, but I would encourage interested scientists to... Uh, to try to get involved. So, so I think that's an area of expansion. Dr. Carlotto has suggested that the entire surface of Mars should be subjected to the fractal analysis that he was speaking of in his interview earlier on the show. And uh, uh, that would be a very, very fine thing to do. So there's a lot that could be done even with the Viking material. So there's even the possibility that with the Viking material and the right science uh, applied, you could give NASA effectively a scientific kick in the rear end. That's what I think has to be done. Um, doctor, it was mentioned when, when uh, Linda spoke of Dr. Carlotto's qualifications, she mentioned that he had had uh, scientific articles peer-reviewed, published in prestigious journals, uh, such as the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society. What she did not mention was that the major scientific uh, journal of planetary science in the United States, the journal Icarus, turned down Dr. Carlotto's uh, articles uh, 
hmm. and not for the reason that that they were not scientifically sound, but for the reason that the subject was considered unsuitable. Did they offer any definition beyond that? No, I believe they just simply uh, refused to have anything to do with any article that had to do with uh, possible Martian uh, artifacts. And as a result, scientists in the United States are not generally privy to, and I was not aware of the nature of the research that's been done. And I think that, that that influences many, many scientists. All they hear is the propaganda put out by NASA that ridicules the uh, the researchers, and they don't realize that legitimate research has been done. This is so frustrating. Is there? A, do you find any handle in NASA at all? Are there any people in NASA at all that reach out, or is the attitude fairly similar? I don't know. There's a lot of them. There's some 24,000 employees at NASA. I think um, I have no way of knowing. I hope that some of them will see my report and will uh, will uh, think carefully about it. But the people I have talked to or seen statements from seem to me to be impervious. Uh, so uh, so I, I don't think anything's going to jolt them except a rather large-scale uh, scientific or public movement. Is there anything, if you could make a wish, that the public would get behind something, what would you say to the public since you're speaking to them at the moment? Well, I think we have to realize that... Um, it may look as though worrying about artifacts on Mars is a minor problem in comparison to all of the uh, social problems we have today, such as violence and gun control and so on. But I think that needs to be thought through carefully and reassessed, that if, if anything could contribute more to our understanding of ourselves and perhaps bring about a revolution in our way of seeing ourselves and behaving, it might just be knowing that we're not alone and knowing that uh, at least at some time uh, being similar to ourselves existed elsewhere and they might even have been our own ancestors so i think that the the level of importance given to this particular study should be a lot higher than many people maybe uh, maybe credit it boy i'll say all right the mars observer that would have settled this or at least told us a whole lot more yeah um, Richard Hoagland um, has a lot of very strong theories on this subject, mm -hmm. and he thinks basically the Mars Observer was sacked. <laughs> and I wonder if you agree with him on that. Um, well, of course, it's a very strong thing to have to say. Um, people have said that there's no way that it could have been done deliberately because so many people have to be involved in a mission like that that uh, that it couldn't be covered up however i i i don't i don't i'm not making a judgment on it but i will say this i think it's awfully strange there are a lot of very strange things about it one outstanding one is that the mars observer did not cut out on us until after they had uploaded the instructions for putting it into orbit mm -hmm. So it went all the way up there, and it experienced that very same uh, thing, by the way. They turned off the uh, the transmitters a couple of times before they got to Mars. Uh, and as you may know, it was turning off the transmitter that seemed to trigger the problem when they tried to turn it back on again. They couldn't get signals back. Yes. But they had done that before on the way up, and um, uh, for for it to go out on us when it's about hours, literally hours away from orbit, um, and the, after the instructions that would put it into orbit had been given to it uh, was a very strange coincidence. In other words, it could then go into orbit and we wouldn't know it. But All right, there are a couple things I want to ask you about. One is I had heard that it was in the process of pressurizing uh, some sort of fuel tank or something or another. Is that is that correct? Yes, there had to be uh, some explosive bolts uh, fired, which create a vibration, and the reason they turned off the transmitter was to protect uh, a uh, vacuum tube. Ah, uh, I yeah. see. Um, so then there were things that were going on that potentially could have meant an explosion? Yes, yes, it, it's possible, although for a long time they said they really didn't think that could have been what happened. Uh, there was another curious thing, though. Just as it was getting ready to go into this phase, uh, what they had done was they'd initiated uh, a power in burn, uh, which, or they were going to do it. I think they actually did it. 
Um, now, what this was was a way of powering the spacecraft into its initial orbit uh, using fuel that had been saved because of their um, uh, very precise uh, initial launch, actually. And with that option, they were going to be able to start photographing Mars to start one whole photographic cycle early, a uh, mapping cycle, they call it. Mm -hmm. And so they were going to be able to photograph it as much as at least 20 days earlier than originally planned. And there was a time of value there because there was a solar conjunction, which is a situation where the um, uh, sun gets between the Earth and Mars, coming up on around December 16th. And in fact, it just, just started just a few days back. And um, that would interfere somewhat with the reception of photographs from Mars. Uh, actually, it would interfere with them sending signals back to control the spacecraft. So um, uh, getting in uh, 20 days early would have been a great advantage, and they could start taking photographs early. Now, as that started to happen, NASA suddenly changed its um, scheduling and said that they weren't going to really start their uh, mapping orbit until the originally planned time, even though the spacecraft was going to be going early. Hmm. Uh, this led to the speculation that they wanted an early period to take photographs that uh, the public wouldn't, wouldn't uh, be aware of. Uh, it was a very strange occurrence, and this happened just in the few weeks prior to the actual orbital insertion. Um, the public pressure got quite hard on NASA at that time. I was aware of letters being sent to uh, Glenn Cunningham at JPL and so on, and the public was really uh, 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 making an onslaught, I think, there to try to get them to uh, let the photographs out. And then uh, uh, at the peak of all that, they, uh, they lost the spacecraft, uh, or reported it lost. So there was sort of this funny business going on around there. So I, I think that Mr. Hoagland's viewpoint, he has said it's mere it's speculation, but I think that it's, it's not entirely unreasonable. He also see, feels that um, contact will be magically reestablished with the observer in the first uh, couple of weeks of... I um, didn't think that until recently. I've talked to him on the telephone uh, just, uh, just a few days ago, and oh. as now he thinks with the success of the Hubble mission... Uh, there may be not the same need for NASA to uh, recover the spacecraft. Oh, just hold on one second while we once again identify the station. Uh, Surely. Stay right there, Professor. This is Area 2000 from Las Vegas. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Professor, um... Let's um, let's talk a little bit about Hubble. Uh, it was a success. Richard Hoagland uh, felt that it would not be, and I, I, I really shouldn't say that because it's my understanding it's going to be about six weeks, is it not, until we know whether all that stuff they installed up there is, is functional? Yeah, yeah, that's true. They have to go through many tests. Uh, so it, insofar as uh, the installation went, it, I guess, is a success. Would Hubble have any application at all for looking at anything as close as Mars? I have heard that that is more difficult for the Hubble. Um, I have to beg off there and that I don't know the details. Uh, Richard Hoagland does know, and I'm sure many others do, but I don't know, except that I have heard that for some reason looking at nearby planets is less desirable for that uh, instrument. All right, back then to the Mars Observer very quickly. Uh, by the way, I don't think it could, with all of its power, I don't think it could uh, give us what the Mars Observer would have given us. Sorry. Uh, back to the Observer for a second. Another thing I heard that puzzled me greatly was they, uh, early on when they had this failure, they suggested to the public, you may recall, that a transistor which had given them uh, problems and been reason for a, a previous failure right. was thought to be what was wrong. And something clicked when I heard that, and I said to myself, a multi-million dollar spacecraft or satellite, uh, and if they've already had one failure and they, they knew it was one specific transistor, what are the odds they would send a billion dollar instrument up with the same problem? I mean, that's that's just scientific ignorance. What happened to the Challenger? Uh, this is uh, uh, a terrible uh, situation. We, uh, 
we uh, we would assume there will be so many backups and redundancies. Of course, the thing has to you do have to look at the weight. But um, yeah, that does seem very strange. Another thing that is strange is that there were apparently tests they could have performed, which they did not perform. Um, I think they finally did. Uh, yes, they did finally try to operate the uh, French-Russian uh, uh, device. There was a signal, a uh, one-watt signal they could get from another um, uh, radio on the on the Mars Observer, and they tried that and were unsuccessful. There was another suggestion that they use the laser altimeter, which was a uh, laser beam that would uh, help the observer find its distance from the planet and aim it at the, at, at, at the Earth and um, uh, possibly pick up that signal. I believe they rejected that as too much trouble or too expensive. Um, so it's not clear that they carried out every possible uh, test to, uh, to get it back. Do, do you consider it possible that they may still suddenly announce uh, in some great surprise that, gee, they've located it? or it's back if on the air? If they're running it clandestinely, then it is possible. If they're not, then it might not be possible because the batteries would have run down uh, if the solar panels weren't uh, um, uh, oriented properly during... Uh, it would only take a uh, matter of hours before the power would finally uh, go out. So the thing wouldn't have enough power left to, uh, to return to us unless it had managed to keep its solar panels in uh, the right orientation. Um... It was Richard Hoagland's view again that it might even be sending pictures back now. Um, and I don't know a whole lot about scientifically about uh, frequencies that are used or power levels or who might be able to hear it. And Richard was looking for an observatory, some sort of... Right. That, that might check on signals that are coming back. Could have, um, it could have begun taking photographs as early as November 8th, I believe, um, uh, based on the data up to the moment that we lost it. Um, Let, let's approach it from this angle. If you were in NASA and you wanted to do the whole thing uh, uh, secretly, would it be possible? In other words, could you take photographs and either store them for transmission later or take the transmissions as they... Uh, uh, as the pictures were generated and do the whole thing secretly? Could it be done? Well, the argument against that is that it takes too many people to run the mission, and therefore it couldn't be hidden. Um, I don't know how that would be. Uh, uh, given the government's activities, it's possible, I think, that uh, a whole clandestine operation could be underground underneath JPL or somewhere. <laughs> or at, uh, at perhaps another uh, large Earth station somewhere else on Earth. Yeah, who knows? I mean, if, if there was a deliberate need to do that, it certainly could be done, I imagine. However, uh, as far as getting the photos and messing around with them, that isn't impossible. That's quite possible, I think. Uh, it takes quite an antenna to pick up these things, and you have to know just how to do it. A gentleman named Lee Clinton, who is a radio amateur, has done an article on this. Uh, indicating just how amateur radio people with the proper antenna equipment could uh, search for signals. And um, that's been published in a couple of places. Do you happen to know the frequency range? Uh, no, I don't, but he wrote this article giving that, and it is available either through Richard Hoagland or I believe that Lee Clinton is on Internet, uh, excuse me, on CompuServe. CompuServe, all right. Yes, and uh, his last name is C-L-I-N-T-O-N. Uh, first name L-E-E, -E, and one could look, I don't have his uh, CompuServe number in front of me here, but one could look on the ID list there and maybe find out how to get in touch with him. I think that he uh, uh, logs on to the space forums there on CompuServe fairly regularly. Oh, yes. Um, I happen to be an amateur radio operator, so... Uh -huh. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, uh, so you could, uh, could possibly understand what he was uh, saying. All right, what is our, assuming that Mars Observer is history, Mm -hmm. What is the next best uh, Project Clementine uh, was mentioned? What's going to Mars in the future? What's the next chance? I understand that the Clementine that is being launched, I believe, in January to go to the moon could be diverted and, uh, and sent to Mars instead with relatively little expense. The Clementine option was uh, one of the ones put forward uh, at the time when NASA was saying they were going to try to get a quick uh, return mission, one as soon as possible, 
and uh, I believe that the JTL people, uh, for unknown reasons, uh, refused to, to look at that uh, option. Um, my understanding now is that NASA has apparently dropped the idea of uh, trying to get a quick return mission and is just going to go for, uh, for uh, something more elaborate, possibly around 1980, uh, 1996. Well, I'm not a great... Uh, believer in conspiracies, but it sure does look like NASA doesn't want to go to Mars. And it looks like when they were on their way to Mars, they didn't really want to be. And one can conjecture that they made a choice late not to. And uh, I just, uh, there, there, something smells fishy with this whole business, but one has to ask, and I will, Professor, if they if they were concerned about what was there or public revelation uh, of what was there, then why launch a billion-dollar spacecraft that you're going to have to end up uh, uh, turning off or taking away from the public as, as they did? In other words, it was bad PR. It was a bad move, and if you didn't want to go to Mars, then why launch? Yeah, it, it could be that they really wanted to find out what was there, that they have very deep suspicions themselves, even though they're not letting us uh, know that, and that their purpose in sending it up was just to do what we wanted them to do, namely find out, but, uh, but they weren't going to let us know. Um, and in fact, that's one of the reasons that one might think the mission is, to go, is ongoing uh, secretly, is that uh, now they may be finding out what they needed to know. Uh, I grant you that the idea that they're doing it on purpose and that it's still operative is uh, considered very far out by many, and I'm not espousing it, but um, I want to say that in 200 pages of analysis that took me over a year to, to research, uh, the thing does smell. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I would put it. It's just not, it doesn't uh, compute, as they say. Yes. Um... Just very briefly, um, what, we, we do have uh, ground. Uh, we had people walking on the moon. We've got lots of good pictures of the moon. Are there any uh, similar objects uh, or areas of interest on the moon? Well, it's very interesting. Um, Dr. Sagan has argued that the face on Mars is um, uh, just an accidental formation. No matter how much like a face it looks, he says, well, out of millions of objects on the surface of the planet, you're bound to find one or two that look like a face. Now, the fact is, is that nobody has ever found anything on the moon that looks like that. And the moon is covered with the most bizarre kinds of uh, shapes and forms. Uh, if Sagan were right about it, we'd probably find at least one or two faces scattered around in our own deserts as well as on the moon. Yes. Uh, so uh, the fact is, is that nobody has seen anything like that. However, there is a literature of interest in uh, in strange uh, occurrences or reflective uh, uh, phenomena that have occurred on the moon, and I think it's still an area for uh, for research. That uh, there may be stuff there that uh, that isn't being looked at as carefully as it should be, and I think some people are uh, presently uh, following out that course. Um, just briefly, we went to the moon, we sent men to the moon, and then we kind of came to uh, not a full stop, but nearly a full stop mm -hmm. in, in, term, uh, in terms of uh, exploration. Um, would you say that a manned mission, for example, to Mars is absolutely justified uh, based on what we know so far? Oh, oh absolutely. I, I couldn't think uh, uh, the, the future of the human race, uh, I believe... Uh, has at least one point of reference in space um, in the other planets of the solar system. That's, that's one of the economic expansions if you want to look just at pure economics. And uh, the science fiction writers today have been really hard at work for the last decade or so um, uh, speculating and uh, developing scenarios for how asteroids could be used for mining, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not to speak of possible even population expansion. So. Uh, uh, there are many people, including myself, who think that is the way that we need to go. Do we have the technical expertise now to send men to Mars? I, I'm sure we do. I was looking at a video produced by NASA, I believe it is, just recently, and they were saying that the only thing standing in the way was uh, finances. But technically, we could do it, yeah. All right, uh, Professor, I would like to open the phone lines for just a few moments here and take a few questions from uh, listeners. Would you be willing? Yeah. All right, good. Let's do it. 
Uh, in the local area, everybody, metropolitan area, it's 383-8255-8255. Uh, Toll-free out of state, it is 1-800-338-8255. Uh, the wild card lines, area code 702-385-7214. And the first-time caller line, 702-385-7213. And uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, good morning from Jackie Gaunt's, good evening from Jackie Gaunt's Plaza Hotel. You're on the air with Professor Stanley McDaniel. Hi, my question is, uh, what do you hope to accomplish by writing this report? All right, that's a good question, actually. Where are you calling from? Uh, San Diego. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, what would you say is your prime motive, Professor? I'd be happy to answer that one because it's one that many people may not believe, but my motive was uh, philosophical ethics. I'm a philosopher, and philosophers have criteria for uh, reasoning. And what I was mostly motivated by was, was my discovery of the uh, the extremely poor reasoning that was being used against the uh, uh, the researchers, and the very high quality of the researchers' activities. So my primary motive was to study what is called the epistemology of this topic. In other words, the uh, the nature of how knowledge is is uh, found. And uh, and to critique and evaluate that aspect of this whole thing. So my my basic motivation was academic, I guess you'd have to say. All right, um, let's see what we've got here. Uh, wild card line two. Good evening. You're on the air with Professor McDaniel. Yes, uh, Radio Free America. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, I would like to ask Dr. McDaniel a question. Uh, in if uh, taxpayers' money is being used uh, to finance all this and uh, all of a sudden it's being hijacked by private uh, <coughs> private investors, um, wouldn't that tend to uh, reflect badly on our government, namely that uh, the elected officials aren't representing the people of the United States? All right, thank you. Well, did you want an answer? <laughs> well, I think he did, yes. Uh, and so go ahead and tell him what I think he wants to hear. <laughs> well, certainly it would, and, and there are some uh, people who are thinking that NASA may be violating its own charter, if not in the letter, at least in the spirit of its charter, which is to, uh, to make information on outer space uh, freely available to the American public. Uh, NASA, of course, is saying they are going to make it available. Uh, in the case of the Mars Observer, we get it eventually. But uh, this six-month proprietary period was simply uh, uh, not appropriate for an issue of such importance as artificial objects that might exist on Mars. Uh, Professor, what would it take to get together a group of uh, scientists, appropriate scientists, to look at all the da data you have and to expand on it and put together, in effect, a report that would force NASA uh, to probably uh, uh, talk about a manned mission or talk, in other words, uh, a fairly significant amount of uh, scientific evidence they I, could not ignore. My experience in the, re in the response that I've gotten from those scientists who have seen my report indicates that reputable and, and uh, solid scientists could be brought together in a conference to do just what you're talking about if such a conference were funded. And I don't think it would take a huge amount of money to fund a conference like that. It would, it would be in the order of tens of thousands of dollars, but it wouldn't be millions. It would be uh, within the range of any any uh, philanthropist who would be willing to put forward those kind of funds. Well, other than doing this program, um, that is my connection with the Bigelow Foundation, but that is certainly the kind of work uh, and the kind of thing that they're, they're funding. And uh, I wonder if you... Uh, discussed it uh, with the foundation or whether they've come to you or perhaps that's something that should be done well perhaps that's something that should be done let me let me just put it that way and i'd be uh, happy uh, myself to talk to anyone or or they could talk to researchers uh, on that topic but i really do think uh, let me say art that you you pinpointed just what i thought of um i think that the most important strategy today that could take place would be the one you suggested, namely to get the scientific community involved in a, in a uh, way that no one could say that they're a bunch of kooks. Uh, to date, uh, NASA's had a free reign trying to ridicule the investigators to make them out as crazy. Right. And if you get, uh, you know, 20, 30, or even 100 really solid scientists and they look at the data and come up with a good conclusion, I think that's the best thing that could be done. 
All right, very good. Uh, line one, good evening. You're on the air with Professor McDaniel. Good evening, Art. Good evening, Doctor. Um, doctor, just to let you know, according to uh, Richard Hoagland, he had four copies of your report um, supposedly delivered to the president. And from what he hears, um, it's like NSA. No, never says anything. So, uh, uh, yes, I, I think that is correct, yes. Well, plus, caller, uh, if you write to the president, you will generally get back a letter saying thank you for your input. Yeah, I think nice. about it. And there's a mechanical signature at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, uh, I would think that that being a philosopher as you are, uh, what probably would have grabbed you, and I don't know your background in mathematics, would, that would be the pure mathematics of it. And uh, I would, that's something that really intrigued me, uh, hearing Richard Hoagland, sorry. Um, I would think just the, the mathematics itself, because to me, mathematics is pure science. And there's really no way to alter it that I know of. Yes, there's material in my report. There's new research that hasn't been put in any other document so far, and it involves a very careful analysis of um, of the uh, what's it called the geometry of the DNM pyramid uh, that establishes very strong, very high probability uh, that the model of that pyramid put forward by Errol Torn is accurate, and um, and uh, this. Um, uh, this particular side of the mathematics is um, is in my report for the first time uh, ever. Uh, as a matter of fact, that research was done while I was writing the report, and I got it from the author of it and uh, and was able to insert it on the fly, you might say. So yes, I think you're right. This is there is uh, we we didn't get to go into that as far as we could have, Art, uh, when we talked earlier. But but there's this mathematical side, yeah. All right. Thank you, Paula. And the art, it just tells me another thing. Question everything people tell you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, again, that seems to be the path to follow and then to force some hands. Do you think, with good, solid scientific evidence, that the majority of the mainstream uh, scientists would ignore it or would embrace it? And I mean with good evidence. I think the majority would be willing to embrace it if they were if they were given a fair shot. Uh, as it stands, the, the the balance is tilted the other way because of the ridicule. So I think if the data were were really got out, for example, if a journal like Icarus would be willing to to print this material. Uh, well, you've already indicated some difficulty in getting some things on this published. That's right. There's been an information blackout, and they've tried to keep it in the realm of. Uh, of National Enquirer level material, and uh, that isn't fair. Uh, so I, I think, as you said, a conference of that sort that you were talking about would be a, a good start on that. All right. The other thing I'd like to do is send as many copies as I can of this report to uh, to scientists. Um, uh, so that's another another thing. What reaction have you had so far to what you have done to your report? How is it received? It has not been as widely distributed. It will be published by North Atlantic Press in January, I believe it'll come out, uh, in a regular paper format. Um, until then, it has been available only in a uh, home-done spiral bound, although it's of good quality. Uh, you may have seen it uh, there. Um, no, not yet. I would like to. Uh -huh. But um, uh, so it hasn't gone around too many. I'd say at the most we've had maybe 200 total that have gone out. All right, let me understand. In what manner is it going to be published? Is it coming out? It will uh, be as, as, as a regular book? paperback in large size format with uh, some diagrams, yes. Ah. Uh, yeah. And uh, that should be in uh, mid to late January that that will be available from North Atlantic Press. Uh, in the meantime, it has come into the hands of a number of reputable scientists. Uh, I could mention, for example, Dr. Robert M. Schock, who is the Associate Professor of Science and Mathematics at Boston University and is the man that did the very exciting work on the geological dating of the Sphinx in recent times. And how would you characterize his reaction? He, he believes that it is, uh, I can quote from him, he says, I am convinced that it is not only worthwhile but extremely important that the investigation into the Sidonian objects be continued utilizing the best techniques and researches, uh, resources available among the scientific community. And I have a similar support uh, coming out from uh, 
uh, a number of other reputable geologists and physicists and astronomers. So, um, so those scientists who have seen it have been uh, uh, favorably impressed. Now, I'm sure also if it were given to certain NASA scientists that they would uh, probably throw it in the wastebasket. <laughs> I did send one of these to Dr. Bevan French at NASA headquarters, um, and uh, uh, I received absolutely no response from him whatsoever. I never, never got an answer back. Boy, to me, this just does not add up. As I always understood science, it is the uh, science is 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 just hard facts. And uh, anybody who would call themselves a scientist and would ignore evidence or ridicule evidence uh, is very suspect. Well, it's very strange. I talked to Dr. French on the telephone prior to sending him this, and he sounded as though he was interested in the topic and uh, didn't know uh, all that much about it and wanted to know more. And then I sent him a 200-page uh, uh, detailed analysis of all of the material and with argumentation, and uh, he doesn't, uh, he, ne he never replies. So I don't know what's going on. All right, Professor, one more quick call. Um, Maybe a couple. On the uh, wild card line two, you're on the air with... Uh... Yes, uh, good evening, um, Mr. Uh, Dr. McDaniels. Your mention of the professor at a Boston University with reference to the Sphinx. Is he the one that uh, uh, has put forth the uh, idea that it is 10,000 years old, also not eroded by sand but by water, and that it may be the establishment of a colony pre-existing... Uh, uh, the Egyptians, and even uh, possibly uh, alien. That is correct. All right, thank you. Yes, there was a TV special on this just recently. All right. Uh, 10,000 years old? I believe that's a minimum number th that they discovered, yes. Mm -hmm. Could be older. All right, wild card line three, uh, time grows short with Professor McDaniel. Good evening. Hello? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, turn your radio off, please. Um... Turn it off? Yes, turn it off. Turn off your radio, please. Well, I can't reach it. All right, well, then we'll move on. Line two, you're on the air with uh, um, Professor Stanley McDaniel. Hello? Hello. Yeah, uh, Art, um, you asked a question earlier that was really interesting. You said, why would they send a billion-dollar project into space knowing there was a problem with it? Were you talking about the Mars Observer? Uh, that is correct. Maybe it wasn't a billion-dollar project. It could have just been an empty can if NASA's has come par compartmentalized as it's supposed to be, there might not have been anything in there, and they could have diverted the funds somewhere else to some other technology. Well, that's a lot of conjecture. <laughs> uh, it's it's a, you, uh, your conjecture is as good as anybody else's. Well, it's certainly an interesting option, although I think that um, at launch time uh, they discovered these uh, contaminations in the camera area and so on and so on, so probably people did see that it had instruments in it. Uh, but uh, but it's worth considering. <laughs> I mean, it comes in I think. Cutting the defense budget, they need money going somewhere else. Uh -huh. And they say, gee, we sent it up there, it doesn't work, sorry. Mm -hmm. All <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you, okay. caller. Uh, anything is, of course, possible, I suppose, when you don't know. Um, so, Professor, you're, I guess, if, to sum up here, uh, where do you go from here? Where do you want to go from here? Well, I finished my project, and I would, uh, uh, to some degree, uh, rather uh, leave this one behind now and go to other things. I've got lots of other things I'd like to be doing. Uh, however, I'm finding that just being the author of this, I'm, I'm having to uh, remain engaged to some degree, and I would like to support uh, what I just told you about, namely uh, trying to get uh, mainstream scientists to, uh, to look at this and, um, and to have someone fund a conference that would uh, allow that to happen. Certainly with the, uh, with the publication of this, um, the widespread publication, you're likely to be right back into the thick of it again, are you not? I say that it's hard to avoid, but to the best of my ability, I'm going to maintain uh, uh, a low profile. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm certainly glad you decided to come on the program this morning. It's been ex the opportunity. extremely informative, and uh, you're a good interview. Thank you very much, Art. Professor, thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. That's Professor Stanley McDaniel, author of the McDaniel Report, and I hope you enjoyed all of that. I want to remind you, the Bigelow Foundation, Angela Thompson is your contact. That's Angela Thompson at area code 702-456-1606. That's area code 702-456-1606, and I'm sorry, the clock 
is what it is, and uh, we have simply run out of time. We'll be back again with Area 2000 next Sunday uh, between the hours of 8 o'clock, right here, 8 and 10 o'clock, uh, right here on KDWN Radio. So thank you all, and good morning. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000, a program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach for discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation, please call during the week between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., area code 702-456-1606. Ask for Angela Thompson. That's area code 702-456-1606. And be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000. Discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation during the work week, call Angela Thompson between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. at area code 702-456-1606. That's Angela Thompson at area code 702-456-1606. And now, Area 2000. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Area 2000. Hope you had a great Christmas. I certainly did. My name is Art Bell. This program is uh, kind of a special thing every week. Kind of. It is very special. It is, uh, it is made possible by the Bigelow Foundation, as I said in the open, if you would like to contact the Bigelow Foundation. Angela Thompson uh, is your contact there, and you can reach her during the business week at area code 702-456-1606. Four five six sixteen zero six. All right, we've got a lot on tap uh, this morning. Linda Howe leads it with her report, her look into another reality, another dimension, another area, and then we'll we'll hear from Chad Deakin. Uh, Chad is going to talk to us, uh, and we've heard from him before, actually, in a, in a crowded uh, telephone booth with Linda Howe in England. Uh, you may recall that program, and he spoke to us then and will now about crop circles. And uh, so stand by for that. A lot of fa fascinating discussion this morning. Let us begin all the way back in Philadelphia with Linda Howe. Linda, good evening. Oh, let's see. Uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps we should be going here. Linda Howe? Hi, Art. Hi, Linda. And Merry Christmas to you and to Bob Bigelow, the Bigelow Foundation, and Chad Deacon in Canada. Uh, he is a true colleague, and he and I and others spent two very uh, complex and full weeks in England this past summer investigating the crop circles, and I reported from there uh, with him and on several uh, of the stories that were happening there. And uh, it was only a week or two that I was in Michigan with Dr. Lovingood, who has been examining some of those exact same uh, stems, seeds, and various other parts of the uh, wheat and rye plants in England that we brought back and has found that there have been some kind of fundamental changes at the chemical and the physical level of those plants that, quoting Dr. Lovingood, cannot be hoaxed. And I think tonight... What will be valuable is that Chad brings perspective on that phenomenon from Canada to England, uh, is up on his speed on what has happened in the United States, and so he has an international perspective. And I thought also that uh, while that phenomenon has been happening, it has happened in parallel with animal mutilations in England, the United States, and other countries all happening at the same time that crop formations happen this summer. And... It seems now, year-round, month after month, whether it is Bud Hopkins, David Hopkins, David Jacobs, Leo Sprinkle, or any of the investigators using hypnosis, or a researcher like myself who is not using hypnosis but is very interested in the patterns of abductions around the world, all of these phenomena 
that seem to be having to do with another reality that is outside of the one that we accept every day that we get up and we go to work and we come home. Something else is happening around us day and night, affecting thousands of people globally. Just a month ago, researchers in Canada, psychologists at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, had spent months doing research with what were considered to be people who, they said, reported at least anomalous phenomena and some described as UFOs or unusual sightings in the sky. And in the November 1993 Journal of Abnormal Psychology, which is a very respected journal, these investigators in Canada, led by Dr. Nicholas T. Spanos, a professor of psychology at Carleton University in Ottawa, they reported in that journal a summary of their findings over several months concerning people who had reported some kind of an anomalous phenomenon, including what we would describe as unidentified flying objects in the sky. The researchers found the eyewitnesses to be as intelligent and mentally healthy as other uh, people and not more prone to fantasy. Of 49 adults who had seen unidentified flying objects, 10 said that they had seen a craft close up. This is consciously having nothing to do with hypnosis. 10 said that they had seen an alien being. 7 described verbal contact with alien beings. Eight reported telepathic contact. Seven remembered total body paralysis at some point, and in most cases that would be when they were asleep and waking up and noting that they could not move. Eight reported missing time, which has been reported by Bud Hopkins since 1980. And two recalls going aboard a spacecraft. These are conscious memories having nothing to do with hypnosis. And in this summary that was reported, the whole bottom line was that these people were no more different than you, I, or anyone that was considered to be normal in the population. Now, another part of this is, what did the media start doing as a result of this Canadian uh, report that appeared in a very respectable journal? There were newspapers all over the United States and Canada, maybe other parts of the world. And they began doing their own interviews with people that said that they, too, were haunted by something that seemed, from their definition, to fit the category of UFO. Well, recently in Washington, D.C., a story with a full-color uh, photograph of two women in Catlett, Virginia, appeared in the newspaper and the title of this was Living in the Light on Earth. They are haunted by shadows of UFOs. And in the context of this Canadian report on people who are basically mentally sound, their intelligence is no different from the average population, but that they are reporting some kind of an interaction with something that is, comes in form of a disc, has light, and seems in some way to have an interaction with humans, these two women reported to the Gannett uh, News Service, which made uh, the papers in USA Today and other stories, that in their small town of Catlett, Virginia, these two women said that, and this was a quote, sometimes a spaceship, and they described it as a saucer, touches down at the corner of the farm that they live on in a Virginia horse farm 50 miles west of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. They said that sometimes, and I'm quoting from the Skinnet News Service, the beings, and this is their quote, materialize out of thin air. That has been one of the patterns in the, uh, what we would call the UFO, human abduction syndrome, now for at least 30 years. People say that something that appears to be a being of some sort actually comes into the outside, right out of the air in front of them. In other cases, people report seeing beings coming uh, down a road, and in some cases, actually coming out of a new disc. In this case, these women in Virginia, as we speak, during the fall of, and winter of 1993, are saying that they are seeing what they call beings that don't resemble humans are materializing out of thin air. Then they describe what we all have heard from Bud and from David and from others on Area 2000, 
of being taken sometimes to something that is full of light, that they have been poked and prodded, and that they have had excisions taken from their skin, and they describe a trauma, but they are returned. They are returned to their horse farm in Virginia, and they discuss it from the point of view of humans who have had an experience that may be akin to a cat that we might take to a veterinarian. We do it because we want something to happen to uh, perpetuate the life of that cat, and the experience of the veterinarian is frightening and traumatic for the cat, but we, the humans who take that cat, know that there is a good reason. There may be, as is suggested by several abductees, that as traumatic as these abductions are, there may be in the long run some reason for why this is happening to humans globally, that in the long run we may learn, might have something to do with our own survival. No proof, and this is still a huge unknown, but I think it is very significant for our Area 2000 listeners to realize that psychologists in Canada, maybe other universities, are taking this syndrome extremely seriously, but doing research and reporting on it, and newspapers, at least in the United States, are uh, making the effort to go out and do research and contact people to say that they have had contact with something that they think is beyond at least the reality of the day-to-day earthly uh, life that we live here. And if so, the big question is, we end 1993 and we begin 1994, are we going to have a revolutionary moment where we say, as a globe of government, we aren't alone in the universe? Well, what, how would you predict that yourself, Linda? What does 94 look like to you? Well, I keep hearing from Washington, D.C. contacts that something is afoot from a political level. Now, what that force or uh, energy or whatever it is that is behind these current speculative rumors are, I'm not sure. But there seems to be a growing sense that in this coming new year, that at least some kind of a public statement might be made, maybe by this administration or by another country or another government. While we're on that subject, Linda, the new Secretary of Defense, Bobby Ray Inman, Secretary-designate, right. um, has allegedly made a very interesting statement in the past uh, about UFOs. Are you, have, have you heard about that? Well, he was tracked down by um, a Maryland investigator and was asked if he knew about MJ-12. And for those who have stayed with Area 2000 over the past few months, they would know that MJ-12 uh, refers to possibly an inside group inside the government that has originated from the Truman administration and has been replaced as people have died by others who have you might say, the keys to the kingdom of the knowledge about UFOs and uh, other life forms. If there's any truth to MJ-12, the one person who might know about their knowledge would be Bobby Ray Inman. He has served in the government and in the intelligence community for a long uh, portion of his life, and I think that the timing right now that he would be tapped to take this particular very important position in the, in the cabinet as Secretary of Defense is, if nothing else, timing is interesting, and he has, if of anybody, he may have knowledge about this uh, other phenomenon we'll call um, another life form in the universe. He may know that we are, in fact, uh, interacting with or being interacted with by other life forms, and if he is, a Secretary of Defense, 1994 may be the first year where someone in that kind of position in the government uh, might also be in a position to finally talk to us honestly about what, or at least a portion of what the government knows. My own sense of things is that we, we have only six years until we turn to the year 2000. In those six years, if we don't get past this paradigm that we're alone in the universe, something is truly askew. It does not make sense. There are too many eyewitness testimonies, too many 
confidential military sources, too many intelligence sources that are speaking and saying, yes, we have had ongoing communication, relationships, interactions with something else out there in the universe since at least the 1940s. And now we're in the 90s. We have to come up to speed with the facts. And it may be that the government has been correct, that it may be that in the long run, if we all look back and say, yes, it took half a century to get through all of the old conditioning about our being alone in the universe, it may have taken 50 years to get the population of the United States and other countries up to the point where they could say, all right, we can accept the fact we're not alone in the universe and that then we have to deal with the implications of the statement, we're not alone. Well, again, with Bobby Ray Inman, uh, Linda, he is renowned for saying exactly what he feels, mm -hmm. um, not uh, necessarily a team player, somebody who will do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. You have to wonder if it couldn't be something as simple as a question put to the new Secretary of Defense by somebody in the press early on about something like this to break it all open. Well, we could all hope that would be the case, but you have to also remember he may have been independent uh, of mind in his career, but you cannot have served in the agencies that he has and not be some kind of a team player. Mm -hmm. And I think personally that the reason that the policy of silence of this government and probably other countries has survived for so long is art. This is a story that is very difficult to tell. People don't have the ears and the mindset to hear about another life form or intelligence involved with the planet in all these various facets that we talk about every week. So it may be that it has been easy for the government to wait out a kind of generational shift, one generation, second generation. Now we're moving into a third generation since the 1940s. And even if Bobby Ray Inman knows specific details, he may also be saying, look, we have to wait uh, up number of more years before we can tell the whole story. But my point of view personally is, as uh, a person who has come, uh, lived in the United States and been a journalist and a writer, is at least in this uh, government structure, that we as a public, we need to know more about what the truth is, because it may affect our future. And that's the part that I think is the hard nut to crack. The government has a story it doesn't know how to tell, but it also is representing a public that by constitutional rights has a right to know and by uh, future rights uh, should know in order to make some kind of informed uh, comment or reaction to what it may unfold next year or the year after. And that's the hard part. And it may be something that would be worth asking the radio listeners. If they were in the shoes of an administration, and they were faced with um, the complete and total knowledge that we had another intelligence interacting with this planet that was other than human and more sophisticated, would it make sense uh, to inform the entire planet now, uh, or would there be arguments to perpetuate the policy of silence? That would be a very interesting question uh, to debate. Well, it sure would, Linda. Um, of course, once a lie has been told, the older it gets, I think, the more uh, momentum uh, is accrued toward continuing the lie. That's the problem. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year, and when you finally admitted it, or if you were to announce it, you would be revealing the fact that for this X number of years, you had been lying to the American public. Right. And there was one government guy, and I really believe he was talking uh, heartfelt. He said to me, this goes back many years ago, he said, the people associated with, he referred to it as MJ-12. And I, I think of MJ-12 now as like the word Kleenex or Xerox or kind of a generic term that simply means people on the inside who have had the very difficult challenge of writing 
an almost impossible story of, of contact with another intelligence that we don't comprehend and it apparently does not comprehend us very well, that this MJ-12 generic term uh, would refer to people that this man said, this was, a, this was the quote to me, they would rather be dead before this story comes out. Now, the only reason that I can think about that is that it has been such a complex force to ride, so to speak, of dealing with other knowledge that was completely outside of the experience of the planet as a whole on a natural day-to-day -day basis, and that there were certain people in our government and other governments who had knowledge that was completely outside of the day-to-day -day survival and activities of our planet and that over the last 50 years that they have had to make the hardest decisions about whether or not they kept this information to themselves and monitored whatever was going on, or would they reveal part of it? If they revealed part of the story about contact from another intelligence, how far would it unravel? How big would the story go? And then the only issue would be social and, and money and all of that, would it remain in the same status quo as it exists? And it may be that the government has had psychiatrists and psychologists and various other people hired telling them, once you open this Pandora's box, you have to be ready with answers or you're going to have an unruly mass on your hands. Mm -hmm. And if anything like that happened to ours, the policy of silence by government may not be as insidious as it has been portrayed sometimes. It may actually have been an act of benevolence, an effort to ignorance is bliss. Well, you know they're going to paint it that way, surely. Yeah, and in the long run, here we are sitting at the transition of centuries. And it may be that there are a lot of people uh, we'll call it inside this generic MJ-12, using that simply as a symbol of people uh, on the inside and not knowing what it's called now. They may want the story out, but that they're afraid of the repercussions. All right. Linda, as always, a, a wonderful report, and you generated plenty of questions with it, too. Things to think about. Well, and when you uh, start with Chad, who is a true friend and colleague, uh, this spillover to the crop circles uh, raises this interesting question that Colin Andrews, George Wingfield, and others uh, three, four years ago said, why is it that the English Army seems to be, and that's not proven, but seems to be involved with creating hoaxes in the crop circles in order to convince the rest of the world that there's nothing to this phenomenon but a hoax? We know that the science says the hoax does not answer it. Why would the English military have been called into action to create something uh, to cover it up? You've really caught me by surprise. English Army, how is the English Army, how are they or were they involved, Linda? It's back to the 90 and 91 uh, research that was done where BBC TV, Nippon Television, others uh, brought infrared, they brought uh, star scopes, they brought a whole series of cameras and uh, higher tech technology into the cross circle summers with the idea that they would track it, watch it, monitor it for uh, two weeks at a time and see if they could find anything that would give them an insight as to how these circles were made. During one of those watches, it found in the middle of a circle that there was a Bible, some sticks, and some candles, and very odd things. Colin Andrews said at the time, George Wingfield said at the time, that they had sources inside of England who said that the army in England had been, or people were telling them that the army had been ordered by someone to put those particular elements, a Bible and a candle and some various odd things, inside of the middle of a circle whole point being 
that they were trying to move the crop circles, apparently, into some kind of, for lack of a better word, we'll just say occult or mystical um, association, and to take it completely away from the possibility that there actually was something from somewhere else in the universe perhaps involved with our planet. None of us know who is making the crop circles, but the fact that people were in England and getting, we'll call it underground, non-proven, but at least uh, so-called confidential sources saying that the military was even involved in keeping the story quiet. It comes to this huge issue, why? Why would crop circles around the world be considered a national security issue by any government? Why would the entire planet not be involved with uh, tracking, monitoring, and trying to find out what was behind the crop circle phenomenon? Well, that's a good segue to Chad Deakin. Um, Linda, as always, it's wonderful. Next week, where do we find you? I should be here. All right, in Philadelphia. Yep. Well, I sure appreciate your report, and it's a great segue. And thank you, and Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year. Take care. Thank you, Linda. That's Linda uh, Howe with a glimpse into another reality, actually the reality that we're going to be exploring in just a moment with Chad Deacon. This is Area 2000. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. And good evening from Las Vegas. I'm Art Bell, Area 2000 underway. My guest, Chad Deakin, is founder of Pacific Research. He has been conducting extensive investigations into the crop circle phenomenon since 1990, both in Canada and in England. His specialty, detecting and photographing physical anomalies, which cannot be accounted for, repeating, which cannot be accounted for by hoaxing. In 1992, he was a member of Project Argus, the most extensive scientific research effort to date. His findings provided a substantial portion of the Argus report and were recently reprinted in the uh, MUFON Journal. He is founder of Pacific Research, as I said, has written uh, many articles, as well as an 18-page report on Canadian crop circles. He's been interviewed numerous times on radio, television, and in the newspapers, and has lectured uh, in Vancouver, Bath, Glastonbury, England, and the Whole Life UFO Conference in New York. Although he works independently, he is in close contact with key researchers such as Colin Andrews, George Wingfield, Dr. W.C. Levengood, and uh, many others. Here is Chad Deacon. Chad, uh, good evening. Welcome to the program. Hello, Art. Thank Hi. you very much for having me on again. Sure. Um, where do we find you? Where are you uh, this evening? I'm currently in Seattle, enjoying Christmas with my relatives. Well, we've got a better connection than we did at that phone booth in England. <laughs> uh, Chad, I guess I'd like to begin with, uh, with your career, how and why you got into all this. What in the world led you into this kind of research, Chad? So, Art, um, I've been interested in UFOs in the past, uh, but not more than most ordinary citizens. Uh, until 1990, when I saw a TV show, Unsolved Mysteries, uh, it was on crop circles. It was quite a good show, and that was the first time I'd ever been exposed to the crop circle phenomenon. And it, uh, once I heard about the facts of this strange phenomenon, I realized immediately that there was something very, very odd going on that we cannot explain in any way in traditional terms. Our science and technology was not able to explain what was going on here. And this was, it seemed to me that it was like a door that was opening to possibly another dimension. When, Chad, um, did the whole crop circle phenomenon begin? I mean, has it been going on forever? Is it just something that we noticed suddenly uh, and, um, you know, had been going on for some time, do you think? Or did it, did it have a definitive beginning? It's very, very difficult to trace it back throughout history, although we do find occasional references to a phenomenon that appears to be similar to crop circles. But it really came into public prominence in the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, 
the reason for that is because they started appearing in numbers in one particular area of the world, and that is in South Central England, in an area uh, of Stonehenge, Avebury, Silbury, megalithic uh, monuments dating back to pre-Druid times. Huh. During those, during the early 80s, uh, the numbers were quite minor. There were maybe uh, three, four, five, half a dozen per year, and progressively each year we saw more and more. And Colin Andrews and Pat Delgado were one of the first researchers that uh, started investigating this on a full-time basis. But at that point, it was apparently confined to uh, Great Britain? That's right. Yes, it was. And not only that, but they were just simple circles. Uh, that's how it began, very few in number. And over the next few years uh, through the 80s, each year progressively saw more and more of these circles, and they became more and more complex. So there was a definite evolutionary process involved here. When, uh, when you were in England, I had a chance, as you'll recall, to chat with a fellow who claimed that he was faking crop circles and had done many. Yes. Um, so you've looked at this aspect of it. it. It makes the whole thing very controversial. Fellow people like him, um, I think, uh, convinced the public it doesn't take much. One man admitting that he's been faking it, and everybody goes, oh, well, okay. And they dismiss it. That's right. That fellow was Robert Irving that we had uh, in the phone booth with us. Mm -hmm. Now, the approach I take to crop circles is a, a, it's a physical investigation. I look at the actual way the stems are bent, uh, any sort of anomalous effects on the ground, et cetera, et cetera. I look for footprints and any other signs that I can find in, a, in trying to determine whether a person could have been responsible for this. And when, when we're talking about crop circles to the public, I think this is the, the most important thing to address because that is the most obvious answer that comes to people's minds is that, oh, these things are just hoax and it's a, a bunch of college students or whatnot having fun with uh, researchers and that the more us researchers look at the phenomenon, the more people try to have fun with it. So I think it's important to lay this to rest. Um, there's, no reason, there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. And I've spent four years of this uh, out that people, although there have been some hopes that perpetrated, that people simply are not involved in the vast majority of these cross circles. It's just not possible. Well, why, I, I guess, uh, is my next question. Why is it not possible? And what do you see in the human-produced crop circles um, that you don't see in the others or turn that question around? Okay, first of all, uh, there are several people involved here. Uh, probably the most prominent ones are Doug and Dave. They were the two elderly gentlemen who first came forward uh, about three years ago. They're British, and they went to the press and said that they had created all the crop circles since 1978. Um, then Robert Irving came along and also a strange fellow named Jim Schnabel. Now, what these people all have in common is that not one, not one of them has any proof that they had done any of the formations. These are simply claims, and uh, we've put all four of them to test. We've got them to make crop circles in public. Doug and Dave were filmed making a crop circle, very famous uh, case, uh, and it was presented on a uh, video called the Crop Circle Communicate. Yeah, I saw them. They had a, a, a board and a chain, and uh, they would tromp about with it. Uh, so what did you notice of their efforts? Could they produce one in the time allotted, and did it meet the requirements of other crop circles that you've uh, examined? No, they, they actually failed dismally. Um, we allowed them to do to make a crop circle in ideal conditions, in daylight, in other words. Mm -hmm. uh, all crop, the vast majority of crop circles are made at night. We allowed them to use ideal conditions. They only got halfway done in their lot of time. They, they had to quit. Uh, the other reason they quit is because the result was very obviously quite pathetic. Most of the stocks were still standing up. They popped up. Uh, it looked quite a mess. There was no beautiful flow to the um, to the lay of the crop at all. And when you look at an authentic one, most of them have an incredibly beautiful lay. They're perfectly pressed flat to the ground. They look like they've been combed into place. When the light is uh, shining off them, they have a, a, a tremendous sheen to them. It's just a, a very beautiful thing to behold. And 
none of these people, Doug and Dave, Robert, or Origins Novel, have ever been able to produce anything in public that looks like the real McCoy. So that's one reason. And the other reason is that uh, there are so many anomalous effects that I have photographed and recorded that simply can't be done by the human hand. And some of these effects are multiple layering. It's where you get uh, the intersection of, say, a path with a ring or a path with a circle. Uh, I have seen as many as four different layers, and it's not just one layer of crop on top of the other going in different directions, but they're interwoven with each other without any damage to the stalks. Hmm. You'll have to remember that the stalks are very brittle. Most of the formations that grew late in the heart of the season, and they were very dried out. You try to bend them the slightest bit, and they will crick or break. Hmm. Uh, what I saw had no symptoms. There was no sign of uh, footprints in the soil. Um, are you suggesting that the stalks are so brittle that uh, pressed as they are in the making of the circle, whatever it is that does it, they should have broken? Um, not in just pushing them down, they will be crimped. But in trying to interweave them, uh, you have to look at it like weaving a cloth. It's quite intricate. In doing that by hand, you have to bend them seriously, and you'll find the crimps or bends at various places along the stalk, whereas in an in a authentic crop circle, there's only one single bend, and that is at the ground level. Hmm. Other things I've seen is, uh, in some cases, literally thousands of individual stalks still standing, single individual stalks. Most of them are just inches apart, and they had never been flattened to the ground. There was no crimp or any mark of a crease. They had simply never gone down. While getting all the other ones around them. That's right. And anybody using uh, a mechanical device, it would have had to be just inches wide. Or, or even one would ima uh, imagine a meteorological uh, explanation of some sort would also affect them uniformly. That's weird. Yes. Uh, and uh, we, We've looked at every possible explanation. And like initially, we're just trying to eliminate people because they've caused the most problems, uh, the claims of hoaxes. So we try to eliminate those, and uh, uh, with what I've described, and there, there are literally dozens of other things I have noted that simply couldn't be done by human beings. Not only that, but I've approached uh, Robert Irving and uh, Doug Bauer of the Doug and Dave team, mm -hmm. asked them about these strange anomalous effects, and they didn't even have any idea what I was talking about. They had no idea what I was talking about to them. Th their answer to me was simply that, we just make them. We can't describe. We can't explain to you what you find. You're probably imagining things. So just, just out of idle curiosity, why would Dave and Doug? Why would they do this? Uh, is it just, just to get people going? I mean, what reason do they give? Well, those those two fellows claimed that they were doing it for fun. It started out as a prank, and uh, because of the uh, the response that they got from us, the attention that they discontinued it and did more and more and more. Now, first of all, you have to realize that there have been over 3,000 formations just in England uh, since the early 80s. So these two guys are trying to claim having done 3,000 formations only during the three months in summer, pretty well, because that's the time you find crop circles, mm -hmm. um, sneaking out at night three times a week without their wives knowing that they were out in a field, spending at least four to six hours at night, usually in very dismal conditions. If you've ever been to England, even in the summer, you know it's pretty rough out there. A lot of rain, cold, dank, muddy fields, and that they, they were doing this for fun. It, it really defies the imagination. It doesn't add up. Besides, uh, where else are crop circles now found? It obviously is not just Great Britain. I know there have been reports here in this country. That's right. I would imagine in your Canada. And uh, and elsewhere, uh, how world, how much of a worldwide phenomenon is it now? Well, uh, we've been averaging about uh, one to two dozen in Canada per season. The same goes for the states. Uh, this is just a rough uh, estimate. We've got reports from Holland, from Eastern Europe, from Russia, from Germany, from Japan, from Australia. Uh, I've left out a few countries, but there are basically worldwide pretty well worldwide. Uh, interestingly enough, mostly in industrial nations. We don't know why that is, but 
There have been many, many, many thousands. And let's face it, Doug and Dave don't fly around the world. No. Um, what evidence is there, uh, Chad, that whatever is doing this is also doing it in other areas? Is there any evidence of that at all? In other words, is there, any distur is there ever any disturbed dirt or anything else that would indicate that had there been a crop there, you would have ended up with a crop circle, if you follow me, uh, in any point other than in the middle of some farmer's crop? Not really. Um, we get many, many reports from people that we can't substantiate. We get no photographs or real proof. We have had several reports of circles in trees, but we haven't been able to substantiate that. I've heard of a few in ice fields in the north uh, and a few other odd places, but uh, again, we have no evidence of this. I take it just to be a mistaken identity, and the numbers have been so small that um, we're not even paying much attention to them. I would say 99.5% at least of all the ones that have been reported to us have been in cross, which is a very interesting phenomenon in itself because um, I look at the, I don't know what the intelligence is that's making these, but I know it's not an earthly intelligence. It's something uh, alien. Why? Whatever whatever it is, if, if I were them and I were trying to leave traces on Earth for, to get people's attention, I couldn't think of a better canvas than wheat fields or any kind of um, planted crop because if nobody sees it at the time that it's created, it will certainly be found by the farmer at harvest time. It's an absolute guarantee that it will be found. And you can't put it anywhere else on the planet where you get an absolute guarantee it will be seen. All right. Let's say it is that an alien intelligence is behind it. Chad, um, what have we made of them so far? Do we see any message? Do we see, are we able to decipher any meaning in any of them so far? Well, there, <laughs> there have been tantalizing meanings. We have seen some astrological signs, uh, such as the sign for Venus, Mars, Mercury, uh, but not that often. We have seen tantalizing hints at ancient languages, such as ancient Hebrew, uh, Egyptian, hieroglyphics, etc., etc., but nothing that we can really put a finger on or nothing that will spell out a message to us. It seems more like these are symbols. Really All right, let's try this avenue. How about anything repetitive? In other words, do you see any pattern uh, frequently recurring? Not really. No. The only pattern that we seem frequently recurring are simple circles, so, or circles with rings on them. Sometimes there's a vague resemblance from one year to the next of a few, but most of them are brand new, uh, new designs, new patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're looking for some sign of a message, um, and I, I realize that I may be looking out of my own dimension, uh, or within my own dimension and not looking out of mine. You look for anything we would understand, as you suggested, planetary symbols, uh, some sort of language, some repetitive nature to what's being done, uh, something that would tell you that it's a, an intelligence rather than a random occurrence. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty well without doubt. There is an intelligence involved, not just in the placing of the formations in, in wheat in the crop field. Um, we have only on one or two occasions got them to go across roads or anything of that nature. They're always placed quite nicely in fields, uh, so they're well aimed. What about percentage of fakes? Now, uh, obviously you were unable to examine every one of them that occurred, or even perhaps most of them. But in those you did examine, did you ever find one that you declared a fake, or one that you thought perhaps a farmer did to attract attention or charge an admission or whatever? Uh, I haven't certainly gone into one that I could absolutely declare a fake of. Uh, I have gone into quite a few where I can't say for sure whether they're fakes or not. I, there's just not enough in the formation, there's not enough comple uh, complexity for me to say absolutely that this is a, a genuine phenomenon or that or a circle or that this is a, a fake 
I will simply say I don't have enough information on it, therefore... Well, have you, have you ever detected a farmer, for example, charging admission? Uh, in other words, whether it was an obvious profit motive? No, no. And I, I'd like to address that aspect. There have been very, very few farmers, and they've all been in England, who have charged admission. And uh, I really sympathize with, with their plight. When they get a crop formation in their field, first of all, because it's laying so flat, they literally lose hundreds of dollars in lost uh, harvest because they can't pick it up anymore. Not only that, but people will go charging into their fields from all different angles, tromping through more crop. Right. They're faced with a loss, and simply what they're really trying to do is recover some of that loss. And it's not a profit-making kind of thing. They never make up for the loss. They have to have somebody in place. They have to pay this person to collect the money. And they really don't get enough people looking at them to make it worthwhile. They're just... I only know of two or three farmers that have done this to date out of the thousands of circles we've seen. So the profit motive is not there. All right. I've never seen anything really suspicious. All right. Um, there are molecular, uh, reportedly molecular changes in this wheat. And I wonder if you can catch us up on that at all. That seems an area of fruitful uh, uh, research. In other words, changes that would occur that you would not see occur simply by crushing the crop normally. What do you find? Okay. Um, well, first of all, Dr. Levendrit, uh, who is a biophysicist in Michigan, a very respected biophysicist, uh, he's retired now, he has taken on uh, looking at crop samples in his laboratory. He spent thousands of hours, literally, last three years looking at this. What he has just recently come up with, first of all, he didn't know what, what to look for, so it took him quite a long time to, to, to know what part of the plant to look for, what changes to look for, etc. He has just come out with this, uh, a recent report, which is quite definitive. This is a, a real bright light for us in trying to prove the difference between a hoax circle or um, something like wind damage and the real phenomenon. What he has found, just to put it uh, very simply, is in the cell wall of the plant, especially around the seed head, there's what is called a microfibril tissue. Now that is a tissue that looks like cheesecloth when you blow it up on a microscope, and this allows for the transfer of nutrients between the cells. In this tissue, there, through this tissue is an ion transfer, and he has found that in affected crops, the ion transfer is much greater than in, in an unaffected crop. These microfibril tissue holes, that I would call them, where the uh, ions that the ions transfer through are enlarged, substantially enlarged, allowing for a faster, freer flow of ions. And that you will not find in a mechanically damaged stock or in wi uh, wind damage or any other form, only in affected crops. How would we produce that effect if we wanted to? Um, about the only known way that he has come up with is through microwave activity. He has put stocks into microwave ovens and uh, blasted them for 20 seconds or, or something of that nature and has gotten not identical but similar effects, which leads us to believe that the energy involved in this is of a microwave nature. Not saying it is microwave, we're just saying it's something similar to microwave. And the other thing we realize... This, this is, is going to begin to get a little technical, Chad, but um, it may well be that the microwave frequency used on the stalks would determine um, uh, uh, or would vary um, the effect on the stalks and on the membrane, the cell wall tissue you're talking about. I wonder if Dr. Levengood has experimented at all with uh, varying the microwave frequency. Um, I don't know if he's gotten to that point in his lab. This report just came out about a month ago, and it's uh, very time-consuming, the, the test that he's doing. But certainly, if he hasn't done it yet, he's, he will be doing it to see. He's trying to estimate what the amount of energy that is required. He's got a pretty good idea already, and it's, it's massive energy that's involved. I know people have asked have asked me, how do you know it's not coming from a satellite, that this is a Star Wars technology, mm -hmm. some sort of a laser beam coming down and curving mm -hmm. the energy to a field to make a pattern. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be a big story, too, wouldn't it, Chief? Yeah. 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 
Chad, are you still there? Yes, sir. Good. Um, well, I wanted to ask ask you next about humans. Uh, indeed, they've had watches out. They've had cameras planted. They've looked for these crop circles uh, uh, to be in formation. Have they ever found it? Have they ever photographed one in the making? Well, they haven't. We've been uh, incredibly frustrated. Uh, nobody... They have People have reported seeing them made, but we don't know what to make of it. We... Uh, the actual crop circle researchers themselves have never seen one being made, and I have spent many, many nights out in the field. What details have you had uh, from anybody who claims to have seen them uh, uh, in the making? What do they say? Uh, the common thing that they say is that the air is very still before it happens, dead calm. Suddenly, the heads of the wheat start uh, waving back and forth violently, back and forth, back and forth. There is a, a whistling and howling sound, although there is no real wind around. And uh, suddenly, within a split second, all the crops lay down flat to the ground in a spiral. With nothing visible seen? From the the conditions that you just described, Chad, are similar to those described by people who um, are in the vicinity of a tornado. Yes. Yes, that is true. It's very similar very still prior to the occurrence. They hear the noise. Um, in the desert, which is where I am, very much in the desert, Chad, we have these mini tornadoes. Uh, one did uh, a little damage out near my home recently. They're not really tornadoes, as we understand them. They're certainly not spawned by a storm. But they are created through some sort of meteorological condition or swirling of winds, or I don't know precisely what does it, Chad, but have you looked into that? Absolutely, yes, we, we, we've looked into that, all sorts of meteorological conditions. Um, in England in particular, because of the rain and the stiff winds they get occasionally, and the rolling hills which catch it, catches the wind at uh, odd angles, there's a lot of damage to the fields. I've seen fields that were up to 75% damage, flattened, or mostly flattened. The crop circles, they're no resemblance whatsoever to any kind of wind damage that anybody has ever seen. They are like cookie cutters, uh, stamped out, very, very clean, clear, defined edges, whereas wind damage is just what you, do, you would expect. Um, undefined, uh, usually very lengthy corridors where the wind touches down and then picks up again. Hmm. Would seem to eliminate wind then. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, back to humans. Has there ever been a human standing uh, in the middle of a created crop circle? In the middle of a crop circle as it was created? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, nobody. No. Uh, the closest we got is people who have been uh, several hundred feet away. And these were in the daytime, by the way. They were not at night. And uh, we have to take their word for it. We have no photographic evidence. Hmm. Huh. Um, then your best evidence um, you would consider to be what about the fact that these are related, uh, uh, for example, um, the relationship to UFOs. Is it a, uh, a tight relationship, Chad, or very loose, or what do you think? Well, uh, personally, no, I guess, I, I'm guessing, but personally, there is a loose relationship to UFOs. It may be a lot tighter than I realize. Uh, we have seen strange lights over the fields at night. Last year, in 1992, there was a sighting near a crop circle uh, by a team of researchers of a structured UFO. It wasn't that far away. It was Stephen Greer. You started one of them. I have, yes. Okay. There were at least five witnesses. They all report the same thing. Uh, one of the witnesses is a friend of mine, a very, very rational person. I believe what he says. It was a, a three-dimensional structured craft. They saw the light. It went around. They saw the light. They even heard any sound. It showed the light from the east. It disappeared. That was, uh, that was an unusual sighting. Uh, other than that, we, there have been lights reported at night. And a few times in the daytime, and we have this on film, silvery objects were seen skimming across the tops of uh, wheat fields. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, these 
objects were very small, anywhere from a foot to three feet in diameter, but shiny silvery objects, self-propelled evidence, uh, obviously, you can see from their motion. Um, but other than that, uh, there, have, there were a few other reports of strange lights like Ferris wheels in the sky, mm -hmm. but I myself have not seen any of these. Uh, the best I can tell you is that one night we were on a crop watch and there was a tremendous flash on the horizon. It seemed to be quite a ways away, sort of like sheet lightning, but in fact it was very close to us. All the lights went out in, in the village where I was uh, staying and the electric company had no idea why the lights went out and they had no idea what the flash was. So you go on crop watches? Yes. Uh, and I take it you just pick a high point and... Uh... Do you use night vision equipment, or what do you do on one of these watches? Um, we do have night vision equipment, and uh, I, use, I personally use a camera. I have a wide-angle lens on it. I put it on a tripod, and I'll take time exposures from anywhere from five to minutes to half an hour and then see what I get on, on the photograph uh, the next day. In, in one particular incident, uh, this is the best one I've been on, we, we mostly come up empty-handed, but in one incident... There was a very large formation in the field, and that was in uh, August of this year. Beautiful formation, very, very spectacular, very strange uh, anomalous effects in the lake. I had a, very, a, a powerful feeling that this field was uh, super energized, and I wanted to go back that same night. I thought something else might happen. So I went back in my car with a friend, and we parked on a hill overlooking the field. We sat there, I took pictures. We sat there until about 2.30 in the morning. It was quite cold. And uh, we just got cold and tired, and we didn't want to leave the car running all night. that the people trying to research this UFO phenomenon do. Uh, it just, it, it occurs and occurs and keeps occurring, but not so that you can carefully and scientifically document it uh, and almost seems to avoid uh, areas where there are researchers or foils them, as you, as you have just said. It, it can, must be tremendously frustrating. It, it, it's incredibly frustrating. We run into this constantly. Um... About two years ago, Colin Andrews and a crew did the same thing. They were on a night watch with sophisticated equipment. They watched a field. Uh, they were up on a hill watching a field. They sat up all night. Just before the sun came up, while it was still dark, a fog descended on the field. Uh, there are many, many witnesses to this. They have it on film. A fog descended on this field, which is not totally uncommon in England. They took on this particular field. And uh, when the, let me guess, when the, when the fog lifted... Got it. There it was. There it was. <laughs> or did they say right in front of their eyes, but they couldn't penetrate the fog. There it was. And this, this, is, this happens time and time again. It's very, very obvious. The intelligence does not want to be seen. It's taking mm -hmm. great uh, lengths to be to a great and testing us. And you mentioned Project Argus last year. Yes. Um, what, what exactly was that? The Project Argus was funded mostly by a, grant, a very generous grant from the Bigelow Foundation. And it was uh, an effort, an international effort, by about uh, two, dozen, two to three dozen people, uh, about half of them were scientists. We went out and we used all kinds of electronic instruments, anything that we could think of, to try to determine mostly what the energy is that's involved in this, to try to detect it coming from the sky, from the ground. We tried to find traces of radiation in, in the... Uh, uh, the crop and the soil. We took soil samples and sent 
send them back to have them analyzed in the labs. We yes, I, I was going to suggest, Chad, um, what about the possibility, uh, if there is the funding, mm -hmm. for uh, some sort of microwave energy sensor or sensors mm -hmm. placed in a lot of likely locations? Um, that might yield some information, since it seems to be a microwave uh, radiation doing this, or maybe. Wouldn't that be an idea? It's a great idea, and uh, we actually did it this year. Um, by the way, the Project Argus didn't come up with a smoking gun. We, we got some very interesting... Uh, what were the final conclusions of the report? Well, the final conclusions of the report were that electronically we weren't able to detect anything. But again, with the physical anomalous effect on the ground and, and other things that we couldn't really put under a microscope, we continue to gather tantalizing information. Uh, when you put it all together, you cannot get a full picture of it. But we're gathering more and more information. What really came out of Project Argus is that we were uh, able to eliminate tests that we didn't need to do anymore because we have quite frankly exhausted them, which is very helpful. Uh, it tends to focus our, our um, projects for the following year. And this year, as I mentioned, Microwave was one of the, the uh, detections. Yes, Chad. Will you speak? Uh, do you speak from time to time with Doctor Lovingwood? I'm in regular contact with him. Would you ask him for me uh, if he's considered experimenting with uh, varying the microwave frequency and trying to produce uh, an identical effect uh, to the one he observes on the uh, cell wall tissue? Uh, that might yield some interesting results if you could actually pin down the rough frequency that's being used. Mm, yeah. He has done experiments on the amount of energy that's required to get an equivalent effect. Do you know what he's concluded? Um, he told me about a, it was about a year ago when he was doing this, that something in the nature of a, now don't quote me exactly on this, but it's something in the nature of a 20 to 30 second blast of microwave energy from a household microwave oven. Now, you have to remember that this is very, very close quarters. Yeah, I understand. You're only inches away. And to get the same effect from an airplane or a satellite, uh, the energy is absolutely mind-boggling, and we simply don't have a microwave generator that is capable of uh, creating that much, uh, that much power. Particularly from that far up in space, it would have to be a... Uh would have to be a geosynchronous satellite that puts it 22,500 miles above Earth. Yes. And again, it, it would be so incredibly dangerous that somebody would have been killed by now. Or at least somebody would have detected the energy. Mm -hmm. oh, getting back to Dr. Lovengood, um, I did a test myself on germination. He did some germination tests. In other words, taking the seeds from crop circles and from control samples without, uh, outside of the crop circles to so get a comparison and uh, germinating them uh, under laboratory conditions. I did this under laboratory conditions at home, and the results were the same as his, very odd. The seeds from the crop circle germinated much faster and at a much higher rate than the seeds from outside. What happens to the seeds of the, um, uh, uh, of the um, stacks that he puts into a microwave oven to try to produce a similar effect? Do you get a similar effect with the seeds? I don't believe he's done a, a germination test on them yet, although it's obvious that this will be the next step. Well, well, that's a good question, isn't it? Yes. And furthermore, uh, after the germination, they, when I began to grow them, I planted them in my garden. And I planted one set under a very bad condition in full shade, and another set in full sunlight to do a comparison of how, they, how fast they grow. Right. Uh, the set the control and from the uh, circle sample in the full sun, there was no difference in the growth. They grew normally. But the set that was in the full shade, which is very bad conditions for wheat, they need sun. Um, the seeds from the crop circle grew at a very fast rate, almost normal. Not quite. They were a bit stunted, but almost normal. As compared to the other uh, sample, which what? It grew twice as, twice. Uh, twice as tall. Inexplicable. Wow. We have no idea why. Something has affected the seeds. The energy that uh, caused the crop circle has affected the seeds in such a way that it's changed something in the genetic makeup of, of the seeds. 
Well, then he's going to surely want to follow up uh, with the artificially produced radiation and see if he can get a similar effect. That's fascinating. Yes, he would be doing this, that this winter. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we're in that weird period of time, uh, Chad, now between Christmas and New Year, and uh, in the New Year, and it's uh, traditional to make predictions. So I thought I would ask you to make one in the area of crop circles. What do you think is going to go on in this next year? Well, our, that's a tough one, but uh, <laughs> judging from the past, I would venture to guess that uh, the crop circles are going to become even more complex and that each year we have gotten more tantalizing information on the crop circles. It's to keep our attention. I mean, these are obviously to get our attention. They're right whatever reason i think there's going to be more of that we're going to get more information and we may hopefully get closer to what the purpose of these are and where they're coming from well perhaps you're right perhaps up until now it's been to get our attention and maybe one, once our attention is fully focused we'll begin to see some sort of message or but documentably uh, you're suggesting every year we're getting more crop circles that too is very interesting not necessarily more. Uh, the height of the crop circle numbers were in 19, uh, let's see, oh. 1990. Oh. Which season there were 1,000, in, just in England, in one single season. 1991, they cut back to about half of that. 1992, about 400. And uh, this year, 1993, somewhere around 300. All right. Uh, Chad, let me ask this. Uh, what you're suggesting is not very far off the peak of the sun cycle. That's right. And uh, we are now very much in a declining uh, mode for the 11-year uh, sun cycle. Has anybody done any research uh, into a relationship? Well, Dr. Levengood, being a, a, a true conservative scientist, believes that this has to do with the sunspot activity. Oh. Yeah. He, he, wants, uh, he wanted me to, to say that because... <laughs> He doesn't believe in uh, alien intelligence uh, or anything of that nature. And to us, that's fine. He, he's a good scientist. What's really important to us is his research and the results of it. Well, um, I had a discussion with Dr. Levengood, and I said, okay, supposing the energy that's involved here has something to do with sunspot activity, I can accept that. But what I can't accept is that how this energy could, be, could randomly affect wheat fields in such a way to create these incredible patterns in the field it well there, there is no specific explanation oh it would have to be a guided energy and there, there are two aspects of the crop circles one is that there's an energy involved in allowing the wheat to go down mm -hmm. and the other one is that it, it is guided just like a paintbrush mm -hmm. i look at the whole phenomenon like an artist using the energy like a paintbrush to draw on a canvas of wheat these spectacular patterns to gain our attention. That's the closest analogy I can make. And not only that, but I see different, uh, if you would have entities or artists involved, there's some similarity between some of the formations. You can almost see that the same entity is involved in certain ones. They have certain characteristics that are similar. And that goes for Canada, comparing with some of the ones I've seen in England. Hmm. Some are very, very sophisticated, incredibly beautifully laid down. Others are much more childlike in their nature and uh, maybe not quite as well laid down. And it all, also, there are varying amounts of energy that are applied. Some are flat to the ground. Others are maybe just a few inches off the ground. They haven't been completely pressed down as if uh, less energy was involved. Well, coming back to the sun cycle, I, of, of, of course, uh, spots, what we call sunspots, are actually uh, flares, and we, we get flares from the sun uh, most frequently at high activity points during that 11-year cycle. Um, but I know of no specific energy, nowhere near that specific, that could affect, uh, affect the Earth uh, through the atmosphere, none at all. Nevertheless, uh, what kind of parallels has he been able to make between sunspot activity and crop circle activity? Simply that... Uh the period around 1990 was the height in sunspot activity, and that coincides with the, the sheer numbers of crop circles seen. Yes, and has there been a, um, uh, a decline uh, that coincides roughly with the decline in the sunspot cycle count? 
Currently, yes. It is now in a decline, and we're seeing a decline in the numbers of the crop circles. But, again, the complexity is picking up. They're much, much more complex than ever before. Yeah, that, that wouldn't make sense. Oh, no, it just doesn't tie in. We, we have looked literally at hundreds and hundreds of different explanations. We have people with PhDs in all different disciplines, including mathematics, music, uh, you name it. Uh, we yeah, it's enough to cause a scientist to drive them to drink or something. They will. <laughs> well, well, it just becomes more and more tantalizing. It's more of a challenge all the time. And I, I might add, um, Ed, uh, Art, that not only am I looking at the physical anomaly, uh, the anomalous effects in the field itself, like in the stalks and the soil, etc., but also the strange effects that are noted on equipment that we've been using. And this is another category that isn't talked about very much. All right, tell, tell us. Now, it's worth mentioning. I'll give you an example of this here. For one thing, I and, and most people have noted headaches as we walk into the crop circle. Quite pronounced. Not a painful headache, but just like somebody put their hand on your brain and started squeezing a little bit. Hmm. And this sensation um, ends once you leave the area. Not in all of them, but in a lot of them. And uh, in one formation, I always have a tape recorder, a little pocket tape recorder. I put it in the center of the formation where the center swirl is and lay it on the ground, and I, start rec I just let it record while I'm photographing and doing my measurements and things. Because in the past, there have been electronic beepings and chirpings that have been recorded, so I'm just curious to see if I can pick any of this up. Mm -hmm. In this one particular incident, it, the tape recorder recorded for a full hour, when I took it back and listened to it, I realized that the entire recording from beginning to end ran at half speed, exactly at half speed. And the re I know that because you can hear us talking. Occasionally you can hear voices. Mm. The whole thing ran at half speed. It wasn't because the batteries were going dead, because it, was, it wasn't declining in speed. It was exactly the same speed. This tape recorder is not capable of recording at any other speed. And it's never done it before. It's never done it since. There's nothing wrong with the unit. I've had it analyzed. In that same formation, a German film crew came in and uh, wanted to film me pointing out these anomalies uh, on the ground. We went ahead with it. They had a fully charged battery pack. They had a, a needle on their camera that showed a full charge. Uh, the battery pack normally lasts about 35 to 40 minutes. Their battery was flat, completely stone dead within eight minutes. Oh. They were totally amazed. They All right, that, that Chad, would indicate um, some strong electromagnetic uh, activity of some sort, and that, seems to me, could be measured. You would think it could be measured, but we haven't to date found any instrument that will measure it. And interestingly enough, we have only experienced this sort of battery, rapid battery drain is what we call it, mm -hmm. on rechargeable batteries. It hasn't been noted on ordinary throwaway batteries, only on rechargeable. On NICATs. That's right. Huh. Um, another phenomenon that occurred again this year, but has been noted in the past, is camera failures. Uh, I flew with three other people. Two of us had mechanical cameras like Pentaxes with no electronics. Right. The third person had a fully electronic camera. Everything was electronic, an $800 camera. He could not get a photograph of one particular formation when he flew over it. The camera jammed every single time. Yet when he aimed it out the other side of the uh, window of the plane, it, it worked perfectly. Hmm. And every time he aimed it back at the, the crop formation down below, it jammed on him. He never did get a picture of it. Hmm. And that also is quite common. Or film that won't develop. You take pictures and the photographs of one particular formation are all blank, whereas everything else is perfectly, perfectly in focus, perfectly exposed, everything's perfect. Well, that would certainly indicate the presence of some sort of energy Chad, uh, stand by one second while I ID the radio station here. So. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. It is, and this is Area 2000. Good evening. I'm Art Bell. My guest is Chad Deakin, and I'm going to open up the telephone lines now. So let me give you a quick version of the numbers. You're welcome to uh, call us with a question if you like. In the metropolitan area of Las Vegas, the number is 383-8255 or 8255. Toll free outside the state, it's 
800-338-8255. The wild card direct dial lines are area code 702-385-7214. And finally, if you have never called the program at all, use this line, the first time caller line at area code 702-385-7213, 7213 with all the long distance lines. Please allow them to ring until they're answered. Uh, we'll come to you as soon as we can. If you're disconnected, pick it up and try again. Uh, Chad, are you there? Perhaps. All right, good. If you're up to it, I would like to let you uh, subject you to um, a little bit of the uh, the great unwashed American public with questions. That's always a lot of fun. All right, it is. Uh, let's see what we can do. Wild card line three, uh, good evening. You're on the air with Chad Deacon. Uh, uh, yes, uh, two questions, one for Mr. Bell and one for Mr. Deacon. Um, first, Mr. Mr. Bell, uh, you mentioned uh, that um, uh, Defense Secretary Dezing that uh, Inman had uh, been, tr been asked by a Maryland investigator uh, about MJ-12, but you did not uh, mention what Mr. Inman's reaction was. Well, was allegedly. Um, well, no, you go right ahead if you wish. I don't know. I was waiting. Uh, oh, I see. All right. Well, we'll we'll get further into that. It was kind of a side uh, side topic from what we're now on. So you had a question otherwise? Yes, uh, Mr. Deacon. Um, uh, I'm interested in uh, whether uh, in Project Argus you had more fully explored the Star Wars technology, um, uh, microwaves or lasers, as possibly being a cause of the uh, crop circles, and whether now you mentioned that the the uh, uh, you had determined that excess energy uh, w uh, would have to be uh, involved, which would have killed mice and hedgehogs. But I understand that uh, there is a very finely focused, finely tuned uh, technology involved uh, with the Star Wars uh, technology, which would uh, be able, perhaps by uh, computerized uh, programs, to create interweaving or multi-layering. Multi and uh, I'm interested in... Uh, and what you, uh, whether you've explored this more deeply. And uh, again, also I'm interested in uh, what Mr. Bell's reaction is to, to the first question. And I'll uh, open with your answer. All right, thank you. Um, all right, well, I, I, that, that would divert us uh, uh, entirely from where we are to talk about the Bobby Ray Inman business. So let's just focus, uh, Chad, if we can, on his question to you. And that is the Star Wars technology aspect. Uh, how hard did you look at that? Well, it's, it's uh, difficult to deal with the unknown. Um, first of all, we have literally several hundred miles to cover, even though that most of these craft formations are happening in a relatively small area, say uh, 30 miles, a 30 mile cir uh, circular area. It's difficult to cover all the fields and to get the instrumentation in there. But I, I would just say again that since craft circles were known before the late 1970s, we have some cases, including in Canada. It's hard to imagine that this sort of technology, even if it exists today, which I highly doubt, and most of us doubt this, that it would have existed back then. And uh, one might guess, though, that if it did exist, farmers' fields might be a pretty good place to test it. Yes, they would, uh, but why continue for 15, 20 years? True. And there's so much attention when they're literally hundreds and hundreds of people around in very, very close proximity to these. It just seems like it's too dangerous. Particularly as people like yourself began to seriously investigate it, you would think at that point um, they would halt it. Sure. And if the government were carrying out secret experiments, wouldn't they be more inclined to do it in a, a closed-off area, say like Area 51, where mm -hmm. the public can't get, uh, uh, can't get into? Why would they choose a populated area? Um, there are many, many aspects that we have thought about that simply don't add up. They, they just don't make any sense. All right. Well, let's keep moving here. On the first time caller line, good evening. You're on the air with Chad Deacon. Hello there. Hi, this is George in Orange, California. Hi, George. Now, well, the comment I'd like to make is um, what, uh, what Larry Wilkinson of the Crap Center said that, you know, that it was a uh, blatant around them became totally still and quiet at the time of their abduction 
And um, it just seems like there are... Uh... You see a relationship there. All right, caller, thank you. Uh, Chad, what about that? There is a connection between the two phenomena, a kind of a very still atmosphere just before the event. Yes, exactly. And uh, looking at all the facts, Art, um, most of us would have to say that the UFO connection is probably the strongest, even though we don't have any absolute evidence. Nothing points to more to, uh, to anything else uh, like UFOs. So while it is a loose connection, uh, according to your own uh, words earlier, yes. it is nevertheless the best connection? The best we can come up with at this time. We know that there's an intelligence involved. It's very, very plain to us. It's playing little games with us, and uh, we feel its presence. Uh, it plays little tricks with us, and uh, it's certainly, it, it must be of an alien nature. That's, oh, that's really something. All right, uh, wild card line three. Uh, good evening. You're on the air with Chad Deacon. Hello, this is Mike from Redding, California. Hi, Mike. Uh, turn your radio off, Mike. Okay. Uh, there is a delay system here, everybody, so please, when you get on the air, immediately turn your radio off. Yeah, there was a, uh, a story I heard recently about um, a crop circle that when they looked at the pattern on the crop circle, um, they found a, a coin inside the crop circle that was had the same pattern printed on it. Uh, have you heard anything about that story at all? Where was this coin? Uh, this was supposedly a crop circle in England. All right. Chad, have you heard anything of that? Not of that particular one, but it uh, it sounds an awful like li the one in uh, Germany. There All right, caller, thank you. Uh, there, there was one like that in Germany? The famous case in Germany of a complex crop formation. It was uh, many circles joined together by lines, and a fellow went into it. Uh, a lot of mystery around this one, but we know the facts. That the fellow went into it with a metal detector. We don't know why, because nobody else has done it before. And uh, in the center of the circle, one of the circles, he dug up three metal objects, and they turned out to be plates. One was uh, pure gold, one was pure silver, and I believe the third was pure bronze. Wow. And uh, it had the imprint, the exact imprint of the crop formation on it. Uh, it was taken away very fast. It was bought up by a collector. Wow. The gold one was melted down, but apparently the silver one and the bronze one still exist. Now, we... Again, like anything else, there are a lot of strange stories surrounding this. What the absolute facts are, we don't know. It's one of a kind again. It's never happened before. Um, if this is an authentic case... Well, have there been similar searches, uh, Chad, made of crop circles looking for this? Well, people will dig up the center of crop circles. Uh, I've run into this quite often. If you're not the first one there, if you're there a day or two later, you'll find that the center quite often is, is gone. Somebody's taken a shovel and taken all the dirt away for souvenir, for testing, or for... All right, we're talking to a very wide uh, part of the world uh, right now, Chad. Uh, a lot of states, a lot of them uh, farming states. If you could give any advice to a farmer who might have a crop circle suddenly appear, what would you tell the farmer? Number one, don't let anybody into it until a researcher has been there. This is really, really critical for us, especially for me. Um, I, I need to get in there before anybody else does to check for footprints, before the uh, stocks are crushed, before any damage has been done to it, to try to get some samples, to do the photography, to look at it very closely. After I, after I or other people like me have spent, say, two, three, four hours in it, then it could be open to the public. Now, this is really difficult, but... That's the one thing I always ask of farmers. Please, please, please save it in its pristine form until we get there. All right, well, look, I'm going to put myself in the position of a farmer. I go out one morning. Somehow I'm on the higher ground. I look out. Oh, my God, there is a big crop circle right in the middle of my field. Well, I, I'm going to go flip open the yellow pages to crop circles. Uh-uh. <laughs> I mean, who do I call? Generally, the first people they call are UFO researchers or if they don't have them, they'll phone the press. Uh, in England, it's, I'm talking mostly about North America. Right. Because of the vast areas we're covering. In Canada, I'm trying to cover 600,000 square miles. Uh, in England, we're talking about a very small area with a lot of rolling hills. 
the vast majority of the crop circles are discovered either by the farmer or by somebody driving by first thing in the morning because there's hills all over and they're easily seen. Well, if you get a call, Chad, that one's occurred somewhere, uh, even if you did go and investigate, presumably most times they're hundreds or maybe even thousands of miles away, yes. you can't possibly get there fast enough to do any research before, you know, a whole herd of people have gone over it. Oh, and that's, especially in Canada, this is very true, and it's, it's a problem. Uh, last year, I was fortunate enough to be called by a farmer who I knew from before. He phoned me up and said he had a brand new crop circle in Oats. It was a circle with a ring around it. He asked me if I wanted to come out and look at it. A few people had already been there, and I said, well, okay, I'll do it. Uh, I mean, I'll get another chance in Canada this year. So I flew out to, uh, to see it. I got there about noon the next day, and uh, a brand new one had formed that very night. He knew it wasn't there before. It was... Uh, within sight of the road, not a well-traveled road, because he had traveled by it that evening on his way home. It wasn't there in the evening. It was there the first thing in the morning. He knew I was coming, but he didn't tell anybody, and he watched it from across the road to make sure nobody else would go into it. He didn't, he didn't touch it. I was the first one into that, and uh, that was a really precious one for me. It wasn't very complex, but it was really important. I spent six hours in it, crawling on my hands and knees, starting from the very outside looking for footprints for one in the soil, very dry soil. I didn't find one single clot of earth disturbed, pressed down or disturbed in any way. In this particular formation, the wheat, uh, this one occurred in wheat, although the one he phoned me about was in oats. The wheat wasn't completely pressed flat to the ground. It was a few inches off the ground, which showed that if anybody had done it with an instrument, you would not have had the wheat uh, popped up a few inches. So no physical object of any kind had been in this cross circle, which proved to me uh, this was one of the rare cases that no no human was involved in this. It wow. not possibly have been. Also, in Canada, we don't have any tram lines like they do in England, sort of tractor marks. There's no way to get into the field without leaving a trail. You'd have to be dropped by a helicopter. There's what a, what no a, other way to get in there. Yeah, what a puzzle. All right, uh, Chad, let's keep moving. Line one, uh, good evening. You're on the air with Chad Deakin. Yeah, Chad, I had a conversation with Paul Winfield this last week here in Las Vegas at the UFO convention. Apparently, he said, and I was in search of, because I'm um, studying the old ancient Hebrew text and ancient languages in correlation with the crop circles, it appeared to me at first when I started doing this that if anybody was going to try and give us a message, the first thing they'd do is send us their alphabet. And if the simplest crop circles are a form of teaching us their alphabet, the more that we've had time to study them, the more complex the sentences would be. I asked him if he had a copy of any research done on the chronological order of appearance and, uh, and uh, locations, and he said to date he doesn't know of anybody that has a listing of chronological order of appearance. Do you know where I could get hold of something like that? I think your best source would be Colin Andrews. Colin who lives in Connecticut. And uh, you had said once before that uh, there's been other studies on this. What actual uh, messages have they come up with, or what sentences have they come up with? Because I've come up with at least one. Yeah, uh, there were a, a couple of cases where they, it almost looked like writing. These were crop formations, We at least that's what we call them, but they look more like hieroglyphic writing. And uh, one was uh, supposedly translated by a fellow in California. Eric Beckhold, and the translation was so odd that uh, I, I hesitate to repeat it. It, it said that uh, fill up your it said fill up your wells. There's a, a drought coming. Huh? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Right. Actually, that would be relevant for a farmer, I suppose. Yeah. Um, one uh, caller, caller, what did you get? Well, the one sentence that we were able to um, depict was the serpent race returns. The serpent race returns. Yes. Which formation was, would that have been? In England? Yes, it was one out of the earlier ones in, in England. But um, it seems to me that if, if, if the government had anything to do with it, they certainly wouldn't be doing it in a field and immediately going out and erasing it. No. And if the message, if it is in, case, in fact a message, then it means that whoever is trying to give the common people the message, the government doesn't want the common people to know what the message is. Caller, could you supply Chad Deakin with a photograph of the... Uh... Uh, the one from which you deciphered that message. Uh, if you give his name and if you give his address and everything, I'm sure we can get in touch with him. All right, we'll do it. Thank you. Um, all right, so 
uh, there you have it. Uh, what is what is your address? How would he uh, send you something, Chad? Okay, uh, it's Pacific Research, Box seven four five three seven twenty eight zero three West Fourth Avenue, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and the postal code V six K one R zero. Yeah, I, I would appreciate uh, any information from anyone, because that's what we're doing. We're all right, you better do all that again. That's a long address. It's, yeah. Uh, it's Box 74537, and the street address, 2803 West 4th Avenue, Vancouver, Canada, V6K1R0. That's some address. <laughs> Long address, yeah. <laughs> All right, good. Well, hopefully he will send you um, a copy of that. That's fascinating. Yeah. All right, on the first-time caller line, um, good evening. You're on the air with Chad Deacon. Well, uh, are any of these crop circles in Scotland? You've mentioned only England. Uh, true. Thank you, caller. Uh, what about Scotland, Chad? I believe there have been a few, uh, something like half a dozen perhaps at the most. And there have been a few in Wales. But again, the vast, vast majority are in South Central England. All right. Line, line two, good evening. You're on the air with Chad Deacon. Good evening. You know, it appears to me that the, um, some of these crop circle formations resemble um, uh, schematics for electronic circuits, especially if you paste, place them in certain configurations. Um, hmm. It also um, uh, it appears to me that uh, some of the characteristics of the crop formations, like um, you were saying, you couldn't take pictures of certain ones. Uh, certain anomalies involved with the formation of the circles uh, have characteristics of, I don't know if you're familiar uh, with Wilhelm Reich yes. and uh, his experimentations with Oregon Energy. That's right. uh, a lot of the characteristics that are displayed in these crop circles um, <clears throat> were the same type of effects that he got with Oregon Energy. Also, um, are you familiar with radionics at all? Not really. All right. Well, let's hold it there. Thank you. Uh, nevertheless, his comment about a schematic is of some interest. Maybe we're looking at it, uh, Chad, in the wrong way. Uh, an electronic schematic, I've not seen the similarities, but who's to say that they're trying to give us a schematic of electronics that we understand? Well, that, that leads us to one of our biggest frustrations, or at least my biggest frustration, um, I, what I say quite often is if these intelligences are so advanced, why can't they give us a uh, language that we can understand? If these indeed are communications or some form of a language or uh, schematics of something or other, why not talk to us at, on our own level? We have put Twelve years of research into this, and there are a lot of really good minds working at it, and we haven't been able to come up with anything of significance in the way of the language or uh, any kind of meaning like that. Why fool around? Why not just put it in English? Why not even Latin, German, whatever? Sure, if they really intended to communicate with us, that certainly is true. Sure, talk to us on our own level. Sure. Hmm. All right, puzzle after puzzle, more questions and answers. Wild card line three, good evening. You're on the air with Chad Deacon. Good evening. This is Fritz calling. Yes. It's only fair that I announce that tomorrow, uh, Monday, the Mandela Williams show will also have a UFO program for those out there in the UFO land. I'm sure you're going to tune in. Now, I would say this. It is my firm belief that the crop circle phenomenon is definitely connected with UFOs, but with our current level of scientific knowledge and understanding, and Chet just pointed out, it is very difficult to analyze uh, the pattern. After all, it is a uh, conditioning process, or what I call from below. But my scenario is this, that above 1,000 or 2,000 feet in a different dimension sits the spacecraft, looking through a dimensional window, and just like a slight projection to a screen, the focus and through the crap circle formation our awareness. Since we don't look up, they have to catch our eyes looking down. All right, Fritz. Good, uh, good, good question. Another dimension uh, that the craft itself is in another dimension, uh, Chad. 
a lot of work being done about other dimensions, period, as it relates to UFOs and travel and all the rest of it. What do you think about that? Well, sure, that is, that is a definite possibility. Um, for, for one thing, we're looking at the crop circles not just in a two-dimensional plane, but in a three-dimensional plane, and we're getting computer, uh, using computer graphics to, to try to do that. Um, and as far as trying to find out where this intelligence is coming from, it could very well be from another dimension, another... Yeah, toward that end, Chad, have they uh, taken a computer and modeled these uh, circles in different dimensions, looking for some sense to them in other dimensions, as, as if, for example, you would view them from the side rather than from above? Absolutely, yes. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in that right now. It's, it's relatively new, and uh, uh, we have a long ways to go yet. What we're finding are, uh, getting back to the language and symbolism, uh, possibly electronic uh, circuits or whatever, we're finding a very interesting mathematical relationship in the crop circles. Oh. It's based on a diatonic scale, which is a musical scale. Um, taking the diameters and the distances that circles are apart from each other and the widths of paths that connect them, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, there's a very, very interesting relationship there. So possibly, if there is a language, it may be mathematical, and maybe they are trying to talk to us on that level, a very simple mathematical level. Um, Gerald Hawkins has done a lot of work on that. Uh, nothing definite yet, but uh, the most tantalizing area yet to be explored is the mathematical aspect. Fascinating. Uh, all right. Well, hope, hopefully you'll update us. I, I'd sure like to keep track of what's happening, Chad, so I hope you'll uh, keep, sure. in, keep in touch. Uh, there are constant developments. All right. Good, e surely. Good evening on the first-time caller line. You're on the air with Chad Deacon. Yes, hello. Turn your radio off, please. Okay. Yes, a question. Uh, somebody has a crop circle to report. How are they going to get through uh, by writing a letter quickly enough? And I have another question after that. All right. So is there a phone number? Chad, is there, uh, is there a number or a central reporting point, or how, how, do, how does somebody do this? Uh, I'll give up my phone number. You, you, uh, are you sure you want to do that now? Sure, that's fine. All right. It's uh, area code 604. Okay. 732 Zero zero nine two, zero zero nine zero, zero zero nine two. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I'll read it again. Where where is that, Chad? It's in Vancouver. Vancouver, British Columbia. Area code six zero four seven three two zero zero nine two. Right. Okay. And the other thing is that I was in England in seventy eight around Stonehenge and traveling around the country, and remember seeing these large indentations in in the these very low cut grass fields, and it was almost like looking at a golf course. And seeing these big round circles that, that had little channel channels going into other circles, and and there was also mounds that were protruding above the ground that were very strange, and I, I never got an explanation for those. And what, what year was that? In 70, 77. 77. That is pretty well pre crop circle time. That they may have been mounds, burial mounds. I've been to Stonehenge several times, and all around Stonehenge are very low mounds. They're only about uh, four to ten feet high and they keep them uh, they keep they, they cover them in grass they're not crops in fact they're grass and they keep them closely cropped but uh, I, I don't really know what you were looking at but I doubt if it was crop circles well the other the other they're not really crop circles but the other things they were like just right on the ground and indentions in the ground maybe maybe eight inches deep and perfect circles and just everything seemed very symmetrical and um, they were just all over the countryside that they have been ancient excavations or excavations for the stones, the, the large stones that they built Stonehenge with. Mm -hmm. uh, in a crop circle, you don't get an indentation in the ground. There's no physical imprint whatsoever. Hmm. It's only the crop that is bent, flattened to the ground. But the ground itself is physically untouched. All right. Thank you, caller. Um, Chad, uh, again, you know, with... If that kind of radiation was used, or some sort of radiation, one would think that it would also affect the microorganisms uh, that are normally found uh, teeming in uh, a fertile earth. And would that not be uh, another area of investigation? Sure, yeah, and it has been investigated. The microorganism is very sensitive, of course, and uh, any small amount of energy would affect it drastically. And, and, and we have found 
no effect. No effect. Also, insects uh, are there are tons of insects in the fields at all times. Uh, grasshoppers, uh, aphids, things of that nature. They would also be affected, and and they haven't been. Only those two porcupines. I I, I just don't know why porcupines would have been virtually cremated. This is just enough to drive you up a tree. It's just. There's just no evidence that you can find time and time again. There are little bits and pieces of different things. When you piece them all together, you simply, like a puzzle, you don't, it doesn't fit together. You can't get a whole picture, at least not yet. So this will drive you then to continue to investigate all of this. How are you going to proceed? We're, we're very short on time now. But where does your investigation go from here, Chad? Back to England. Back to England. That's right, yeah. Next year I'll be going back for another month. There will be more uh, scientific uh, testing, more instruments used, more f uh, observations, et cetera. Anything we could possibly think of. There are a lot of very imaginative people, scientists included, involved in this. Until we can get the smoking gun, so to say, we won't stop. Once you're a crop circle investigator, you cannot put it down. It's totally infectious. All right. Well, you have been a joy to interview. It's been great. I'm sorry we could use hours more, but we don't have them. Oh, thank you very much, Art. It was a pleasure so, to be on your show. Chad, I, I would like to uh, be sure to invite you back. We're going to have you back again. Sure, I'll give you an update for the coming year. Wonderful. Chad Deacon, thank you. Yeah. And uh, that's it, folks. I'm sorry. We're out of time. We'll do this again next Sunday evening at 8. Uh, to all of you left on the line, uh, thank you for being so patient. I'm sorry we didn't get you all in. Remember, your contact at the Bigelow Foundation is Angela Thompson at area code 702-456-1606. For Area 2000, I'm Art Bell. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000, a program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach for discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation, please call during the week between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., area code 702-456-1606. Ask for Angela Thompson. That's area code 702 702- 456-1606 and be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000. At downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. And now, Area 2000. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another Area 2000, 8 o'clock Sunday night. This is the time. I'm Art Bell. You're listening to a program dedicated to an examination of two major topics UFOs and life after death. And uh, we will consistently uh, be doing that week after week. And as usual, we'll begin the program this morning. I guess I ought to—I uh, guess I ought to tell you—we've got a particularly interesting guest tonight. His name is Mark Davenport, and we're going to be getting to him right after our glimpse of yet another reality, which comes beaming all the way from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with Linda Howe. So let let us not waste any time. Get right underway. Linda, good evening. Hi, Art. Um... Well, the whole issue of are there intelligent life forms out there is a question that the Triad Research Conference is going to focus on in Phoenix, Arizona on January 22nd and 23rd. Uh, speakers scheduled are Professor John Mack from Harvard, Professor Jack Tasher from the University of Nebraska, Yvonne Smith, a psychologist working with abductees in California, Guy Ambrose, an abductee who was on the uh, front cover of one of the national newspaper magazines this past year. John Carpenter, uh, the uh, psychiatric hypnotherapist from Springfield who's been on Area 2000. Colin Andrews, a researcher of the Cross Circle Mystery. And Michael Lindemann of the 2020 Group in California. 
they are going to also uh, provide an option for people attending that conference to, they call it, dine with the researchers banquet, in which people uh, going to Phoenix to this conference will have an opportunity to sit with some of these people and talk more personally uh, during dinner. They will have workshops for professionals and for people using hypnosis. Uh, that will be conducted by Professor Mack and John Carpenter. There will be a group meeting for uh, the abduction syndrome experiencers with Yvonne Smith and Sky Ambrose. The conference will take place at the Sunburst Hotel and Conference Center in Scottsdale, Arizona, and the cost for the two-day event will be $50. Uh, for further information, people want to write this number down, they can call 417 area code 882-6847. That's coming up in about two weeks in Phoenix. Then, for our Area 2000 listeners interested in Nellis Air Force Base's Area 51, there will be a public hearing on Monday, January 31 at 7 p.m. in Caliente in Nevada. The issue is whether the White Sides Mountain and Freedom Ridge above the military site should remain public land. The Air Force has stated that it needs to acquire the land to maintain public safety, quote-unquote, without explaining what the danger is. Glenn Campbell, Secretary of the White Sides Mountain Defense Committee in Rachel, Nevada, would like to see everyone who opposes the Air Force acquisition of more public land to contact both the Caliente Area Bureau of Land Management, the manager there, and the state director of the Bureau of Land Management, and for everyone to attend the Caliente hearing, again, January 31 at 7 p.m. Closing White Sands Mountain and Freedom Ridge would eliminate one of the few locations from which the public has been able to even try to keep an eye on whatever flies in and out of Area 51, including rumors of silver disks from an alien intelligence. How much the United States government knows and how long it has had knowledge about alien life forms interacting with our planet is one of the most controversial issues today. One man has single-handedly carried on a Freedom of Information Act battle with government agencies for several years trying to crack the secrecy. That man is Clifford Stone, a retired sergeant first class from the United States Army who was based in Roswell, New Mexico, Sergeant Stone's interest in UFO phenomena was provoked during his military career during investigations of strange incidents he was either personally involved in or had knowledge about. Recently, Sergeant Stone sent documentation to his United States Senators and Representatives from New Mexico and to other U.S. Senators Sam Nunn and Edward Kennedy requesting that congressional hearings be organized about the issue of government suppression of information about alien life forms. Sergeant Stone feels strongly that the American public deserves truth about the interaction of this other intelligence, which he insists he and others have knowledge about. And in the following excerpt, he described for me some of his earliest discoveries in the late 1970s while in the military, including projects named Moondust and Blue Fly. Sergeant Stone says those projects involve the recovery of alien spacecraft and bodies. But so far, no government agency will confirm their existence. And now I'd like to play an excerpt from a man who has spent a good deal of his uh, personal energy and money trying to get some kind of documentation to back up what he says he was exposed to during his years in the Army. This is Sergeant Stone. And what I found shocking was I knew about moon dust and blue fly back at that time. Can you explain to our listeners what those projects are? Project Moon Dust is the Air Force's overall field exploitation program for the recovery of down on the field space on the so what you're saying is to be satellites from, let's say, the Soviet Union that came down, or there was actually a category of unknown objects. Absolutely. And the objects of unknown origin I find most fascinating because if 
they were in Soviet origin. The Soviets would have been just as capable as we are to determine the point of impact that their space degree would have impacted the Earth. If we recovered that space, those objects belonging to the Soviet Union, and didn't return them, I'm sure that the Soviet Union would have filed an official protest through the United Nations because we are a party to various UN resolutions and uh, UN uh, agreements on the return of space debris if it's the right to enter into the Earth's atmosphere. So during your uh, military duty, did you ever n know for a fact or see documentation of an unknown object that fell under uh, Project Moon Dust and Project Moon Blue Fly that uh, actually was, uh, from your point of view, uh, from somewhere else outside this planet? Oh, I'm pretty sure we had several situations with that happened. Uh, I even have documentation on cases that go back into the 60s that to this day the military, uh, the intelligence community, will not talk about. We have a case in uh, Texburg. I was at Lockwood Air Force Base when they brought that in. I didn't get to see the object. It was covered uh, with canvas. This is the one from Texburg, Pennsylvania. I was in there. Pennsylvania. Uh, happened December 9, 1965. And it was shaped a little bit like an acorn. It was shaped like an acorn. Uh, everyone laughs the way I try to explain it. But to me, if you see these old fashioned concept jobs with the steam scanners, right. that's the best way I can identify it, seeing it under the tarp, because they had it tied down tightly. Well, so what was the uh, either off the record or other uh, scuttlebutt about it when you were in the military? I went ahead, and the individual that made it possible for me to see it was not a UFO but He did not believe in UFOs. Uh, due to the job that he had, he had to be out there. But when he went out, his, his function only required him to be there maybe 15, 20 minutes. I got to stay in the car and parked outside of the fence line, but I could see the hangar where it went into real good from the fence line. And this was it. Which military installation? Lockburn Air Force Base at the time. Which was located? It was located uh, about 20 miles uh, south of Columbus, Ohio. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, when he went in there, his intent, he knew I had an interest in UFOs. His intent was, let me see it, and I'm sure he planned to come back out and say, see, it's a Soviet craft, we're going to return it to him. <laughs> but... That's not the way it came out. When he came out, he was white as a sheet. And I asked him if it was Soviet. And his response was, I almost pervade him, was, no, no, it wasn't Soviet. And I said, well, what was it? And he says, well, it's best you don't talk about it, but I'll tell you this. Every question you have about UFOs, the answer is underneath the canvas on the back of that trailer. Uh, and that was from Texas, Pennsylvania. What other incidents in your military career would have brought you the closest that you could uh, share with us and uh, viewers uh, that it has convinced you that we're dealing with something that is not from this planet? The closest would be the Mintwater incident. Tell us about that. I know for a fact that there were some things that went on there. I know for a fact that there was official talk about entities being involved and being seen. Uh, I know for a fact that something set down there in the forest that was not just light reflection from uh, the uh, uh, lighthouse. I believe some people are talking right now but still have a tendency of not wanting to talk about seeing the entity. Now, where were you serving in the military in December of 1980 when the strange... I was, in a, I was stationed right there at Hanau, Germany. And in, stationed in Germany with a strange event taking place at Bentwaters Air Force Base in England. How did you become involved in the investigation? Once again, with my friend. Okay. Who uh, he went ahead and picked me up on... We, we early morning hours of December 27th. So this was unofficial as far as you were concerned? It was supposed to be unofficial, but I was supposed to be working that day. And I wound up not having to go to work since this was something I had in
an interest in, I could go with him. All right. And so you traveled from Germany to Bentwaters, England with this man. We, we went to England, but we also went to Lindsay Air Force Base. Mm-hmm. The stuff from the, there were photographs, there was film, uh, there was documentation. Now, who did the documentation, I'm not sure of. And what did you see in the documentation? The documentation was alluding to uh, a uh, vehicle setting down there, that there was vehicle seen. Also, some of the people who got to read the documentation was discussing about the entity. And did you, were you able to read any of this documentation to see any of these photographs yourself? If that happened, I can't talk about it openly. Okay. Can you describe uh, from your uh, conversations with, with other people your impressions of what was on those photographs? Oh, I definitely believe that they had photographs of even the entity. And I also know that the, uh, uh, the tape recording that has been around within the UFO circle, that that is a very condensed version of a much longer conversation. Okay, let's try to talk about what you know from your experiences there uh, in December of 1980. First, let's start with what were the descriptions, even if they were secondhand, about the entities on the photographs? How were they, de how were they depicted? The description was of entities that seemed to uh, pop out of the ship with no opening being seen, uh, appearing to be... Uh, Coming through the walls of the ship? Well, like bag, they would put it flashball type flash that were there on top of the ship coming up behind the ship where they couldn't see. A flash of light and then a beam would be there. Right. And how was the being itself described? They described them as being almost uh, between a gray and a chalkish white. Uh, head description? Pardon? Did they give a description of the head and the torso? Uh, they gave the description of the torso as being slender. And also the head being rather lar large and out of proportion to the rest of the body. Can you say about eyes? Uh, the eyes were of, uh, uh, I can't remember what they, in the documentation, they were referring to them as being uh, like a pear shape. I got that wrong. A tear shape with the larger portion pointing inward toward the nose. Mm -hmm. Huge black eyes. Mm -hmm. And any indication of size? Uh, between three and a half to four foot tall. How many of these sort of popped out of the flashes of light? The one report from which this stuff's being taken from, from what I get from that report, there was as many as five entities. Okay. Um, did you... Personally, were you able to talk with anybody who was there the night that those entities uh, flashed into appearance around this uh, object? I got to talk to some people who were personally there, but I can't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And here's the situation I think everyone needs to know, is that even if you get out and you start talking... Meaning out of the military. Out of the military. Uh, there's certain things you feel safe to talk about. There's other things that you don't feel real comfortable talking about because they're not concerned about what you might say. They're concerned more about what you can prove. And when it gets to the point of you get into an area of being able to prove certain things, that's where they get concerned. And they have forms that you sign. For a confidential secret, top secret, you sign what's called a standard form 4190R a standard form 312, which is a non-disclosure statement. Uh, they can do bad things to you if you go ahead and discuss that material, but not as bad as if you discuss uh, sensitive compartmented information. The 312 is only about a page in length. Uh, if you are uh, privy to what's called uh, sensitive compartmented information, uh, extremely sensitive information, uh, which falls under the special access program, then you sign what's called a standard form 4193. And it's roughly five to six pages in length. And what they can do to you there is much, much greater than what they can do to you on uh, merely breaking information that might be uh, confidential, secret, or top secret. What is so threatening? 
military and the government about UFO information? My personal viewpoint and belief is that they're concerned about the technology falling into the hands of some other country. I know this was long, Art, but I feel that it is so Take care. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. All right. That's, uh, that's Linda Howe, 
and uh, consistently fascinating reports. And now Mark Davenport. He is a lifelong student of UFO phenomena, has researched UFOs and abductions intensively for 20 years. He studied uh, chemical engineering at the University of Missouri at Rolla, worked as a manufacturing engineer for a number of years before becoming a full-time freelance writer in 1985. He is the author of several books, including Visitors from Time, which we will discuss extensively this morning, The Secret of the UFOs, which is the first in-depth analysis of evidence that UFOs warp space-time. His articles have appeared in several popular magazines, including Analog Science Fiction, Science Fact, UFO Universe, and UFO Magazine. He lectures on and debates the subject of UFOs and abductions, edits works by other ufologists, and has appeared on numerous radio and television programs. Editor of the from Jackie Gunn's Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. For the entire western United States, this is the Talk of the West, KDWN. Good evening. Area 2000, in progress, Mark Davenport on the telephone. Mark Davenport, hello there. Yes. Good evening. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, you have written a number of works, and uh, will talk to us, I guess, about a, a, a number of things that I've been very curious about. Of all the things that we look into, I think one of the most fascinating for me is time travel. And the title of one of your works is Visitors from Time. That's have, right. Have you become convinced that that is what UFOs are in total or part? I believe that uh, UFOs uh, represent a, a widespread, uh, uh, diff uh, a lot of different phenomena. I don't think that it's uh, any, any one particular phenomenon that we're seeing here. I think we're seeing a very complex grouping of lots of different phenomena, but I think that after you separate out the hoaxes and the hallucinations and the misperceptions of common objects like airplanes and weather balloons and so forth, I think you're left with a, uh, a lot of uh, reports of things that we have trouble explaining, and I think that uh, many of these are probably craft that are uh, piloted and that uh, utilize a, some sort of a generator or some sort of machine or possibly even this may be even done uh, telekinetically you know with the mind but somehow or other these people are able to warp space-time in much the same way that a black hole might warp space-time and that's how they arrive here from other places not only other other planets but uh, possibly other stars other galaxies other dimensions that coexist with ours including even our own future or in our own past <laughs> do you think, do you, again, you think it, it may be all of these together? They may be arriving from other actual um, times and other actual places, both? Yes, if you're, if you're actually able to warp space-time. And, and let me just uh, uh, lay this out a little bit here. You know, Einstein said back in 1905 that space and time are interdependent and together they form a four-dimensional continuum that we call space-time, and the presence of matter warps the space-time continuum. He said that the, the greater the mass, the greater the curvature. And as we've found out since then, these black holes, they actually warp space-time so much that it, that it turns inside out and time runs backwards there. Would it be possible, without actually entering a black hole, Yes. To uh, simply skim the event horizon and uh, and experience this. Well, according to uh, Dr. Frank Tipler, uh, he says that uh, yes, this could be done. Uh, he says that if you were able to bring a number of rotating black holes together, okay. or rotating neutron stars together somehow, you could actually build a working time machine. Now. 
craftsman doesn't make any tools big enough to do that sort of work. <laughs> no. But I think that it's, it's obvious that these people in these UFOs, their technology is so uh, far advanced from ours that, uh, you know, they, they make us look foolish sometimes, and I think that their technology is advanced enough that they have learned how to do this more easily than uh, using things like neutron stars. I think they have learned enough about physics to uh, be able to do it much more easily than that. Let me back up with you a little bit. Um, what is it, is it any one thing or is it many things, what convinces you that this whole UFO phenomenon is real, that we really are being visited? If, if I were to ask you for the best evidence that you have or what convinced you, what would you say? Um, well, I've, I've gone far past that, I, uh, the, the, the UFOs being real. I did a debate uh, this year earlier in Kansas City where that's what we talked about, and uh, we had a tremendous amount of evidence in mass here. We have uh, not only things like burned circles of grass and uh, soil that's been uh, calcified and uh, broken tree branches and, and uh, scars on the people and pavement that's been lit on fire and of course thousands of photographs and thousands of feet of videotape and and thousands of feet of film and so on and so forth even in, including the uh, implanted devices that have been removed from abductees so it is the weight of a lot of evidence that yes, there is a tremendous you. amount of evidence to show that ufos are real by the way mark you are in right now gulf breeze florida is that correct yes i am i'm on pensacola beach uh, right out on the Gulf, and uh, we just came in from the beach. Uh, we were watching, sky watching, hoping to see the uh, one of the craft that they see here often. They've even named it here. Oh. Uh, they call it Bubba. Bubba. Oh, no. Bubba. And, and I just uh, I gave a lecture here for the local MUFON group uh -huh. uh, today, and uh, some of the people who attended the lecture have had as many as 180 sightings. Of, uh, of a craft. Here. That's a lot of sightings. Did you did you have the opportunity, Mark, to see any photographs? Yes, we saw some uh, astounding uh, videotape uh, for a couple of hours uh, last evening uh, that the people here showed us, and uh, uh, some of it was uh, quite dramatic. And uh, they they saw these things from a number of different locations. They were able to triangulate and find out uh, how high the objects were and so forth. Does, does anybody in, in Gulf Breeze have any good uh, reason for why Gulf Breeze as opposed to anywhere else? Well, it's all speculation, of course. Uh, people have speculated many different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons why they appear to be here is there's a fellow there named Ed Rogers. We've got uh, what's it uh, up this year. But Rob Kudelski comes out of nowhere. One yeah. of the leading scorers in the league, uh, leading scorer in the team, and they trade him away. I know they want some deep back. How do you trade him guy away? Guy to put the puck in the net for him. They've been going through the old guy in the old crowd again. We're strange. The meal is strange about this. He goes here. Another one that just came out about three weeks ago, which I haven't had the opportunity to read for a bit. It appears that uh, Ed sees these more often than other people, and sometimes they seem to appear out of nowhere when he happens to be there. So. Uh, There's been a lot of controversy surrounding him. Uh, oh, yeah. What, what, what's your feeling regarding his credibility? Well, I was unable to meet him when I was here. I was hoping to meet him, but he didn't uh, come to the presentation, and I didn't get a chance to meet him. But I do know that some very uh, uh, good experts have studied some of the photographs that he has taken and have, have pronounced them genuine as much as they're able to do. Uh, Bruce Maccabee has looked at these things and... Uh, has said that he can't figure out how these things could have been faked. And, of course, we have uh, lots of other photographs here in this same area that were taken by other citizens here who uh, some of them didn't even know Ed Walters, and they were taken with different cameras at different times, and they looked the same. And we also have a, a great deal of uh, testimony from people that they have seen things here on a number of different occasions. I mentioned a while ago that uh, one uh, couple here, the... Uh, Morrisons have seen UFOs on 180 different occasions. Wow. So that's, uh, and, and on most of those occasions, Ed Walters was not anywhere near. So, um, yes, uh, I'm convinced that they are seeing something anywhere near now. Nobody knows if that was a bizarre. It could be some phone to sort of military craft uh, that's highly secret and that we don't know about. 
Uh, they could be alien. They could be uh, something else that we are, we're unable to even conjecture what they are. Is there a military base close enough to offer an explanation of that sort where um, the secret stuff goes on? Yes, there's uh, Eglin Air Force Base is, is close here. But uh, that's the case. You'll find that in most of the country. There there will be a military base close by just about any place. Indeed. Okay. All right. Well, let us once again jump forward. Um, you you uh, In the little uh, things we ought to talk about here, uh, they've got a section where it talks about uh, 100,000 mile per hour flight, 180 degree turns without sound or damage. Well, obviously, if human biological animals went through that, they would be a puddle of biological soup. Right, that's right, yeah. So how in the world could that ever be done? Well, if these things have some kind of generator aboard or, or whatever it is, something that creates a field around the craft that warps space-time, then that, that craft is totally enveloped in that field so that it's carrying its own little private universe around with it. It's outside of our normal space-time, and it's, it's sort of like the idea of a fly flying around inside your car and you're traveling down the road at 70 miles an hour, mm -hmm. or 65 if you want to be legal. And this fly is just buzzing around your car. It has no idea that you're going that fast because it's totally encased inside the car. When you slam on the brakes because someone turns in front of you, the fly still buzzes around. That's totally in concern about what's happening outside. Mm. Even though the air outside is rushing by at 65 miles an hour. That's a good analogy. And I, I think that possibly these, this is the same way with these crafts. They're inside this little bubble, this little private universe that's outside of our normal space time. And inside that, it could be that even though it appears to us they're traveling at, uh, say, 20,000 miles per hour, mm -hmm. they may actually, to them, they may be traveling at 20 miles per hour. And so when they appear to stop instantaneously in reverse direction and travel 20,000 miles an hour in the other direction, it could be that they're making a leisurely turn and going back at 20 miles per hour uh, to them. See, time is relative. Huh. That's, that's one of the things that Einstein tried to tell us a long time ago and that we're only just learning today, is that time is relative. Time is not what we think it is at all. In fact, it does not even exist as we think of it. It is a, it is a, an abstract It's quite a mass delusion, then, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It does. But according to, now, this is quantum physics. This is not some far out new age idea. This is something that's coming from the cutting edge people in our universities who are studying subatomic particles, and this is what they're finding out. Uh, well, then, I once saw an intriguing movie about time in which. Uh, it was kind of a romance, and I can't recall the, n the name of it. I keep thinking of time after time, but that wasn't the one. Uh, in which a man thought himself, literally thought himself, into the past. And what you have just described would seem possible uh, if, 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 if what you're saying is correct. That would seem possible, that you could, in with your own mind, if you knew how to do it, travel in time. How do you react to that? I think it could be possible. I've, I've recently been uh, reading a book called The Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot in which he describes something similar to that. Uh, Dr. Fred Allen Wolf has a book called Parallel Universes in which he describes uh, what quantum physicists are finding. 
finding out about the nature of the universe and about time. And what they are finding out is that when they do studies with photons and studies with subatomic particles, mm -hmm. the observer during in their experiments actually um, flavors the experiment or actually determines what happens in the experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's hard to describe, but uh, they've, they've done experiments to show that actually it is our own mental processes that are creating the outcome of some of these experiments. And so what they're, what they're extrapolating from that is that collectively and individually we actually create our own reality. And of course, uh, if we are not the only beings uh, in this universe, if there are others, uh, then they're probably helping us and uh, working with us and against us uh, as far as that creation is concerned. Now, I know that's a pretty abstract uh, way of thinking about things, but once again, th this isn't something far out new age. This is this is quantum physics, and uh, what's what's what I've learned is that ufologists don't know about quantum physics. Uh, physicists don't know about ufology, and the metaphysicians, the people who have been studying metaphysics and telling us for centuries that this is the way things are happening, uh, don't know about either one of them and haven't recently and they seem to all be converging on this one point and the point is that space-time can be warped can be distorted it can be changed it is elastic and linear well then it seems to me uh, we could perhaps yield a very great deal by getting these groups together for sort of a um, let's talk about it sort of session has anybody done that or is that underway now or well, I think, yeah, that is being done uh, to more of an extent now than it was in the past. Uh, I, for instance, have started a newsletter called Contact Forum, and the whole point of the newsletter is to get people to communicate with one another. You know, we have, in, in ufology, we have a bunch of factions. We have channelers who uh, say that they're getting information from somewhere out there, and it's, uh, they're telepathically receiving this information and writing it down and and uh, they're sharing it with each other, with other channelers. But uh, the nuts and bolts ufologists, up until very, very recently, have not even looked at this information because they consider it to be unvalid because it's not, you know, they can't put it in a jar and put it on the shelf. I know, but you know, Mark, uh, more and more with the people that I've interviewed, like yourself, um, in the last couple of months, I've found people turning to the same sort of area. So. There's a movement uh, underway in the uh, UFO community, and uh, not by everybody, but by now I think more significant numbers than ever. And you're about the fourth or fifth guest I've had that's talked about this sort of area. So you're beginning to get some company. Uh, I think that's true, and we're finding that with the newsletter. We're finding that we're getting people from all different uh, angles, people from, with different perspectives to join the discussion and to listen to what other people have to say. We have people who consider themselves contactees, those who consider themselves abductees, and they're talking to therapists and to um, investigators and researchers and, and sharing all these different viewpoints. And I think my idea, is, uh, and, and the idea of uh, Pam Meyer at Wildflower Press when we started this newsletter was to get to, to just shake the trees and let all the leaves the, uh, the ones that are truthful and the ones that aren't, and then we, we hope to uh, end up with the truth in the end of that. So I, I, I really think that's a good approach. Well, the nuts and bolts work has been going on for a long time, Mark, and sometimes when you don't find something, you've got to figure you might be looking in the wrong place. That's right. That's one of the things that I told people in my presentation today, that back in the 70s, when I really got into this thing, and even before that, when I was 10 years old, I saw my first Oh. And at that time, uh, that was 1962. Can I can I talk you into getting a little closer to the phone? Yes, can you hear me better now? Oh, that's so much better. At that time, uh, uh, we had been studying these things for many years already, 15 or 17 years, and we still hadn't come up with any good answers. The people had assumed that since they didn't seem to be from here, they must be from out there somewhere, but they didn't know where for sure. Uh, that was about the same time that uh, Betty and Barney Hill were abducted in New Hampshire 
and uh, Betty asked her captors where they were from, and they showed her a star map. And uh, Marjorie Fish, of course, uh, compared the star's positions in that map. Betty, Betty drew a, a representation of it under hypnosis, and, it, and Marjorie compared those with known star patterns. And uh, she thought that maybe they came from the, the uh, reticulum system, Zeta-1 or Zeta-2 reticuli. Well, that, that explained that particular uh, sighting quite well, but it didn't answer a whole lot of the other questions. For instance, uh, what, how is it that these people are able to interbreed with us as they appear to do? Uh, why do so many of them look like this? How could there be so many? You know, Jacques Vallée has, uh, has estimated that they may have landed here as many as three million times. And if they're all coming from 37 light years away at that other star system, how could that possibly be? And there are lots of other things that it didn't explain, like why do they come more often on Wednesdays than other days and so forth. Is that so? They do? Well, if you study large statistical studies of these things, the, the large statistical uh, segment of, of data, you find out that if you plot these on a graph, you find out that there are more seen on Wednesday than any other day. There are more seen on Tuesday and Thursday than there are on Monday and Friday and so forth. And that wouldn't make any sense to me if they're coming from light years away. There probably aren't any Wednesdays in that other star system. But no, but there may be a parallel reference of time of some sort. Uh, that's possible, too, but they, there are other things, like I mentioned. Uh, by, uh, if, if, can you share a few of the numbers with us? In other words, uh, Wednesday by how many? Or what percentage? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think it, 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 it's enough to be significant. It's like uh, it's a couple of more percent on Wednesday than on any other day. Huh. It's not a huge spike in the curve, but, it's, but it's, it is statistically uh, significant. All right. A lot of it's the... also goes into other things, like uh, they're seen more often in July than in September than other months, and mm -hmm. often on the 24th than any other particular day of the month and so forth. Uh, we also found, in, in many cases, the UFOs are seen in one particular state and not in neighboring states, as if they're observing state boundaries. And some of these things indicate to me that these things might possibly be human-oriented. Uh, they might be from our own future, for instance. In those cases, they would have reason to observe our own times and our own calendars and our own state boundaries and our maps and so forth. They would be able to. They would be able to walk in our gravity without problems. They would breathe our air without worrying about virus and so forth. But people from other planets probably would not. They would be probably frightened to death to try to breathe our air if there was virus and so forth. Sure. Well, this is an actual question that it relates to time. Is there anybody in the United States uh, doing any serious work on the possibility of time travel? Is there anybody? Oh, yes, I think so. I'm, I'm talking about nuts and bolts work here. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, there's, a, there's a man I met at the Eureka Springs Conference earlier this year. His name is Dr. David Croning. And uh, David is a, a field propulsion engineer. He is one of the people who is trying to duplicate the things that the UFOs do. Uh, and he, he told me, after he read my hypothesis, about uh, warping space-time. He said, yes, that's what I'm talking about. And he said, our calculations show that there, there is no reason why, once we learn how to do this, we shouldn't be able to travel at literally a million times the speed of light because we're not actually traveling through the intervening space at all. We are stepping outside of normal space-time and then stepping back into it at other coordinates. In a case like this, he said it would take much longer to get out of the Earth's atmosphere and travel from here to, say, Albert, Murray, or a nearby star. Well, uh, again, I've got to ask, stay close to that telephone. It's important. Um, uh, is it, uh, I, I've heard, if, if, let's see, somebody else said it this way to me, that if you think of uh, space as kind of a, a long ribbon, and you were to take that ribbon and double it back on itself, and then jump from one point of the ribbon to the other, you would have uh, you would have traveled a, a very great distance 
literally instantaneously. Is that is that a good analogy? Yes, it is. In fact, I've seen Bob Lazar use that same analogy with the dollar bill and place a pencil at one end and say, now... That's where I got it. Yeah, there are two ways to get to the other end. You can draw a line along the length of this bill, or you can fold the bill over and then uh, turn the, the power off, and you're, and you're pointed at the other end instantaneously. And, and we believe that that's probably how these how this is done. Now, a lot of people who have been contacted and claim to have been taken aboard these ships say exactly that. They say that they have been trained, they have been taught what the nature of time is. And, and they say that, that, they, that the people use analogies. For instance, Leah Haley, who you may have heard of, yes. was told that, that time, that space-time, you can think of it as a slinky, the child's toy. Oh, yes. looks like a spring. Sure. Think of it as, as, as looking like that and behaving like that, so that it's in looping rings all the time. And and there are different dimensions, and each is each one is a different slinky, and they're kind of uh, lined up together there. And it, there are places where they overlap. And you can go to those places and go to into a different time, and you can travel backwards and forwards at different rates, different uh, curvatures and so forth, and then come back to your own dimension. And so that you're, you're able to effectively travel, as I said, uh, to fold space-time around you and then return to it at other coordinates. All right. You mentioned the fact there was research in this area going on. Do you know if anybody has actually had any sort of uh, mentionable success at all? Uh, even private words given to you that you could share with us? If indeed it is possible, then the question is, well, then why haven't we been visited by many travelers in time, to which I can imagine your answer might be, we are being visited. That's right. I think we are being visited now. I think we have been visited throughout our history, and I think that uh, our visitors were probably here before we were here. They may have even had something to do with our genesis, with our, uh, uh, with our beginnings. Do you feel that uh, there are experiments, and I should tell you we're coming close to a break here at the top of the hour, but do you feel that uh, uh, their interest in us is genetic? 
Well, I think the interest of some of them is is genetic because they've obviously taken lots of people aboard and subjected them to to uh, procedures that appear to have something to do with our genetics. They're taking sperm samples, they're taking eggs, they appear to be trying to interbreed with us. Right. And so they're very interested in our reproduction and in, in our genetics. Uh, there could be lots of different reasons for this. As I mentioned before, if they're able to warp space-time, now this probably means that they can literally be coming here from millions of different places, different planets from everywhere, Sure. Also, different dimensions, including our own future and our own past. All right, Mark, I've got to ask that you hold tight. Uh, okay. We've got a five-minute break here at the top of the hour, and we'll be right back to you. Thank you. Fabulous interview. Mark Davenport. We're talking about visitors from time, and we're talking about time. I'm Art Bell. Back now to Mark Davenport, all the way back to Gulf Breeze, Florida, and Mark Davenport. We're talking about time travel. We're talking about the secrets of the UFOs, how they do what they do, and much more. Mark, are you still there? Yes, I am. Good, good. Fascinating stuff. Um, I, I want to jump ahead to something, and then we're going to come back again uh, to time travel. But I want to ask you about the men in black. I've been uh, wanting to ask a number of guests about that, and I see that it's one of your categories of interest. So who are they? What do they do? Where are they from? Well, uh, probably a number of your listeners have uh, have had a UFO sighting. They've seen one of these things. Maybe they've been driving down a back country road in the middle of the night, and they, they saw one of these things and didn't know what it was. They went home, went to bed, never told a soul about it. The next day, some, some uh, men in black suits come and knock on their door, and they say, you didn't see a UFO last night, and besides, don't tell anybody. Uh, this, these are the men in black. They're, they're very enigmatic characters who, uh, who uh, do all sorts of strange things like this. Generally, they threaten people. They, uh, they want any evidence that you may have, especially photographs or pieces of metal or anything like that. All right, but the key is these are men in black, human-appearing men. Well, they appear, usually they appear to be strange in some way. Sometimes they don't appear to have any pores in their skin, and their skin is not the right color for flesh. Sometimes they, uh, they're they wearing sunglasses and hats pulled down low and collars pulled up high so that they're, as if they're trying to, uh, you know, uh, cover up their real appearance. Uh, sometimes they appear to have trouble breathing as if their atmosphere is not right and so forth. Hmm. But generally, they they appear humanoid. You know, they they have two arms, two legs, two eyes, and so forth. And but they're almost always dressed in black, and they almost always have the same sort of a pattern. They they try to tell people uh, not to talk about their sighting, and they try to convince people that they didn't even have a sighting. And if there is any evidence, they try to take it away. Now. What I'm contending in my book is that if these people, if these men in black are uh, connected with the phenomenon, with, with seeing the UFOs, if, they're, if the UFOs are from another planet, it doesn't really make sense. Well, I don't know if it makes sense to me anyway, because if, if somebody knocked on my door, strange looking, trying to convince me I didn't see what I was sure I saw, that would instead reinforce m my belief that I saw what I saw. Yeah, I would think so, but apparently what they try to do is intimidate these witnesses into not talking about it. Well, that might work. Yeah, and, and my uh, hypothesis is that possibly some of these things are from our own future, and because of that, uh, when people see them and they're trying, to, they're trying not to be seen, then they can find out about that, and they can go back into time, and they can convince people not to talk about their sightings so that it doesn't create paradoxes, you know. The old paradox about uh, what if you go back into time and you make sure that your grandfather and grandmother never met one another? Yes. What happened to you? Would you cease to exist? Well, we're not really sure if, uh, according to quantum physics, uh, there are parallel universes, so it could be that you only cease to exist in that one particular universe that you did that action. But we don't really know what paradoxes could happen. And so if people do develop the ability to travel through time, and some, some people claim that we already have done that, then there's going to have to be some sort of control. There'll have to be some sort of 
call it a cosmic police force, if you will, that will have to go back and fix the things that people mess up. And well, is there not also the theory that time is somewhat elastic? In other words, if you were to go and, and do something that would cause a change or a paradox to occur, that even though there would be a temporary disruption, the flow would return anyway. In other words, maybe the couple divorced and then the marriage between the, the, the two people that were supposed to be married to produce you would occur. I have heard that in science fiction, but I, I've seen no evidence to support that from either physics or metaphysics. Uh, All right. The, the All right, so then the, the, the standard scientific theory, then, is a paradox could be a catastrophic event. Could be, yes. And, in fact, if, if you'll remember uh, Alfred Bielek, who, who claims that uh, the, the Philadelphia Experiment, I'm sure you've heard of that. I have interviewed uh, Al Bielek. Uh, he says that this uh, ship, the USS Eldridge, was uh, transported inadvertently from 1943 to 1983. Yes. In that story, and of course this is a very bizarre, far-out story, but uh, Bielik is not the only person who claims that it, that, that it did happen that way. Um, according to him, the reason that they had to go smash the equipment aboard this uh, Eldridge is so that a wormhole that they had inadvertently created between 1943 and 1983 right. could be destroyed so they wouldn't swallow everything up. They didn't know what, what the consequences of this might be if they didn't stop it, uh, nip it in the bud, so to speak. Do you have any view, by the way, on the credibility of uh, all that? Well, Bielik is, is the first to admit that since he has been brainwashed following the, fraud, the secret government project, uh, that he's not sure if his memories are correct or not. Uh, Preston Nichols, who wrote the Montauk Project, which is uh, about the other end of this, the 1983 right. end, uh, he will tell you the same thing. He's not really sure... Uh, if the memories are correct or not. But there are several people now who are coming forward to say that, yes, something like this did happen. There was something wrong with time. People were messing around with time. They were also messing around with things like mind control and some, some really bizarre uh, technology. Uh, so I think that something something strange did happen. We don't know if it happened just as Bielik said or not, but something did happen, and time was involved with it. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I want to talk about the government uh, cover-up a little bit, but I want to preface my question about the government cover-up with the following. Uh, recently, our government began revealing to us something that uh, I think almost no American would have believed, and that is that our own government gave um, uh, shots uh, with radioactive material, plutonium, very poisonous material, injected American citizens. Now, I hear all the time, uh, Mark, people say, look, the government could not possibly uh, cover up. It's not efficient enough. Uh, rumors would get out. The government could never cover up this whole UFO business. But, in fact, we have recent evidence that they've covered up something incredible. So why not? Well, I have two answers to that. First of all, uh, the government didn't cover up the UFOs. We've known about it all along. You and I know about it, and so does a good portion of the population. So they haven't covered it up. It's not a secret. It's only a secret to people who don't want to believe in UFOs. Uh, the second, and, and, of course, the Roswell crash has now been uh, almost 100% proven. There are hundreds of witnesses, uh, and, and so it's, it really isn't a secret. And, and though, even though it's, it's sort of an open secret, uh, uh, the fact of the matter is they still don't admit it, and they still laugh it off, and they still deride people who uh, are saying the kind of things you're saying. Um, so there is a cover-up that continues, even though everybody knows. Well, oh, absolutely. But it's interesting, you know, the, uh, the U-2 spy plane did not exist, according to the government, years after the thing was, was flown and even been captured. The SR-71 Blackbird did not exist officially. And in fact, Area 51 does not exist officially. If you try to uh, delve into the official records and find out about that area in Nevada where these planes were developed and where now we're talking about the Aurora plane that's uh, Mach 7 or something like that is, is uh, supposedly being developed, they don't even admit that the facility exists. So 
it is a standard government procedure to to lie about things like this. It's it's standard procedure, and of course uh, you're talking about the people who are injected with radiation. Uh, it's common knowledge that the CIA for years uh, gave people LSD. They have. Uh, our government has... Uh, yes, well, my point was, until they wanted us to know it... Yes, we didn't know it. We didn't know it. And God only knows what it is that they're keeping from us that they don't want us to know. Uh, the government is very good at keeping secrets. The Manhattan Project, for instance, was kept a secret. And we have all sorts of technology of uh, weaponry that is a secret. Well... I don't think they have any problem with uh, keeping keeping this a secret. And uh, even, as you point out, when it's openly known, they don't admit it. I lived uh, for many years on the island of Okinawa, out in the Pacific, and every single day and night many times, KC-135 tankers would take off and uh, refuel uh, B-52s that were en route to Vietnam. Uh, now, every day, the Okinawan... Uh, the Okinawan press, the television stations, would go out and they would actually film the 135s taking off. And they would go on the air with it the next day. This went on for years, and they would get a, a military spokesman who, while he was denying it, saying, absolutely not, they're not on the island, the video of the 135 taking off would be on the screen. Yes, that's so. the standard procedure. That's the way governments work. That's the way military works. And anyone who's ever been involved in, in any intelligence agency will, will tell you that, that that's one of the first lessons that they learn, is that if you deny things often enough, people will believe the denial, and that's the objective. Well, precisely. Um, what is, is it Linda Cortiel? Is that, is, is, or is it Linda Cort? I guess Tile or Teal? It's not her real name. Bud Hopkins gave her that name to protect her true identity. Cortila, I think, is the way he pronounced it. Cortila. What, what is her case? That's a fascinating case. She was uh, supposedly abducted from her 12-story Manhattan apartment uh, by being taken through the closed window of her apartment mm -hmm. uh, and levitated to a hovering flying saucer outside. Uh, there were other witnesses to this. There was a woman on the Brooklyn Bridge who was her car was stopped, and she saw this. There were two security men who were uh, taking a some kind of government VIP to a Gila port for transport, and their car stalled, apparently, and they saw this happen. And at first, Bud Hopkins did not realize this. When the girl came to him and told him that she'd had this abduction experience, he kind of filed it away with all the other hundreds that he gets, uh, and didn't think that it was anything too unusual until he had these other independent witnesses come and telling him about a similar experience, and when he started putting the dates together, he found that they matched. So this made it very, very important, not just because there were multiple witnesses, but because one of them was a, a very important uh, government official. And uh, the interesting part about this to me is that Bud has been criticized for accepting some of the testimony in this, for the reason that uh, there is a dock that should be in in view of the apartments. Uh, it's a dock where uh, workers, I think it's a newspaper, a uh, place where newspapers are, are made. Right. And uh, these workers should, should have been out on the dock at that time, and they should have been able to see this thing. Uh, if my hypothesis is correct, it could be that one of these UFOs could be right in front of your eyes, and if it's encased in this field, enveloped in it... It would be invisible. It could be invisible. Under certain conditions, it could be invisible. So that the people that, who were in other directions and who were at different, at, at further distances or nearer distances may have been able to see something there, whereas the dock workers may have seen nothing. Uh, recently, Bob Lazar, who says that he was, uh, uh, you know, employed to re reverse engineer these things, he was asked a question up at the little alien there near you. Um, if, if you had one of these things and you had this gravity uh, field around it and you, you had the field to, to such an extent it was strong enough um, that, that you could actually bend light around it, could it become invisible? And he said, yes, it is. He says, if, you, if you're underneath the thing and you're looking directly up at it, you see the sky above it. 
<laughs> right. He says that he's seen this from actual experience. Uh, so it, it could be that it's something like that did happen. There's another case that Bud's working on right now, the, the so-called Washburn family in Australia, where a, a man was taking photographs of his family on the beach, and they disappeared. And during their disappearance, apparently they were abducted for a period of a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, nobody on the beach noticed anything, even though the uh, father uh, was down there frozen in time with his finger on the shutter of the camera. <laughs> and so, once again, you have a situation where nobody really saw anything, and nevertheless, the abduction did occur. So it could be that uh, it isn't that so much that, they're, that they are invisible, but they appear to be invisible because you can see right from behind the camera. It can be right in front of you. All right, there seems to be a strong hint that one way or the other, gravity uh, is a factor uh, in the propulsion system of these craft, or if it's time travel, again, that large magnetic fields are produced. There should be large amounts of electromagnetic radiation occurring in the vicinity of these craft or in the path of their travel, and one would imagine that that could be detected and measured. And if that could be done, I'm leading you down a big road here, Mark, why couldn't a person put together some sort of device that would warn of large electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation, almost an alarm? Does that make any sense? Well, ufologists have been doing that since probably the 60s. They have been uh, building these uh, little magnetometers and, and having them on their front porches. And, and whenever the things go crazy, they go out and look for UFOs, and often they see them. So as far as that's concerned, yes, there, there are electromagnetic... Uh, fluctuations that occur in the vicinity of these things. Now, some of the uh, points that I've tried to make is that UFOs appear to have the ability to emit electromagnetic radiation of all different frequencies, from the lowest wavelength of radio waves up through uh, uh, microwaves, infrared, the whole total vis uh, visible spectrum, uh, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays. Do they shift through it? Do they shift through those spectrums, or are they in all spectrums simultaneously? Well, at times they shift from one to the other. At times they're radiating different spectrums at once. It, it's it's kind of a, a an electromagnetic soup of all different sorts of things. But it appears to me that um, it could be that almost all of this radiation, you see, uh, electromagnetic waves, whether it be radio waves or gamma rays or anything in between, are exactly the same except for the wavelength. In other words, the frequency, the distance between one sine wave peak and the next. And so if these things are surrounded by this field that warps space-time, then they could have just simple heat being radiated from them. And as it goes through that field, the field itself could have a Doppler effect on it. It could actually change the wavelength of that so that it's a different frequency. So that sometimes when we see these things at night and they're glowing so brightly, we're seeing all kinds of different colored light displays and so forth, it could be that we're seeing nothing more than the heat that, it, that is subject to a Doppler effect from these whole of these things. Huh. Boy, absolutely fascinating. Um, of course, we have also measured all different frequencies of radiation. There have been many cases where people have been sunburned. Uh, you may remember the Cash Landrum affair down in Texas where uh, the the percipients, uh, they not only had ultraviolet, they, had, they were sunburned, but they also appeared to be subjected to either gamma rays or x-rays, some kind of hard radiation. They had radiation sickness and were hospitalized off and on for a period of years after that. Uh, there have been other cases uh, where people have... Um, have been subjected to extreme heat. There were a couple of centuries at top of Fort, and I believe it was Brazil back in the 50s, who, uh, they had to strip their clothes off. They were screaming because they were on fire. They were so hot, which could either be uh, large doses of either infrared or microwaves. There have been many cases where radio waves have been uh, detected. Uh, when one of these things is near, you can have a radio, and, and throughout all bands of the radio, there's nothing but static. Uh, there have been cases where even gamma rays currently have been detected. There, some of the gun camera film aboard the uh, Air Force planes that chase these things, even though they never opened the shutters on the gun cameras, all the film was fogged inside. 
So uh, all, all frequencies of radiation have been detected. Now, how do they do that? Do they have some kind of transmitter in there that transmits all frequencies? And if so, why? So I think that probably what we're seeing is some kind of a Doppler effect coming through that field. Well, a large magnetic field, a very large and powerful magnetic field, would probably radiate on most frequencies, wouldn't it? Oh, no, not necessarily. And also, if we had, you know, for a long time it's the common theory that uh, UFOs are nothing but big magnets, and they were riding on the Earth's magnetic lines of force. You know, you've seen the uh, the demonstration where you take a piece of paper, put a magnet under it, yes. sprinkle iron filings on it, you can see these little lines of force yes. on the paper. And the Earth has, it's just a big magnet, the North and South Pole, and it has these lines of force. For a long time, people thought that these things were magnets, and they were traveling along those lines. And the reason they were spinning was so that they could flip over and get to the moon. Uh-huh. We're electromagnetic only. Then the field, it's been calculated how strong the field would have to be to do that. And in order to do that, uh, you know, when they when these things stop cars, for instance, on the highway, right. um, the the magnetic field would have to be so strong that it would not only leave residual magnetism, it would not only leave a, a signature in the metal, but it, it all, would also bend the metal itself. It would blow out all the circuits in all the radios. And incidentally, it would blow out the fuses in uh, power grids that were nearby and so forth. Almost like the EMF effect. Yes, and we have not found that to be the case. We've measured the cars that have been uh, subjected to this and found that the magnetic signature is no different from another make and model that's the same. We have also found that the cars can start by themselves after they've been stopped. And this is, this is more common than most people realize. Uh, in some cases, the drivers, uh, you know, they're driving along this back road at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they see this light, and it starts to worry them, and pretty soon the light comes down and lands in front of them. Their headlights dim, and they go out, and their engine dies, and then the whole car is dead, and there they sit with their mouth open looking at a UFO in the middle of the road. Perhaps a stupid question, but uh, is there any difference between uh, between those people with modern cars and computer ignition systems versus the older? I, you know, I don't think any studies have done been done about that, but I know that this is still happening. It was happening in the 50s, and it's happening now, so I would assume that probably that doesn't really have that much of an effect. But, but what we find is these people, they sit there for a period of, uh, they, they're not sure, maybe a few minutes or even an hour or so, and then when the UFO leaves, the car starts running by itself. And sometimes if they're not uh, paying attention, they can, you know, they can be in danger of having to wreck. They have to grab a hold of the steering wheel quickly because the car starts going down the road again. And, and we've had the same thing happen with the power grid. There were, there were cases in Argentina where UFOs overflew a city and all the lights in the city went out. And as the UFO left, the lights came back on, which is fine, except the power company officials never could figure out how that would happen because the... The um, power grid was designed in such a way that once it went out, it had to be started, restarted manually from several different locations by technicians. And of course, the technicians hadn't even weren't even aware of it yet. And now, the same thing happened in Kuwait a long time before Desert Storm. There was a case where a UFO flew over some automatic oil pumping equipment, the type that that uh, was destroyed during the Gulf War. Mm-hmm. Stuff is designed so that it cannot come back on by itself for, for safety purposes. You know, if, if a pipe ruptures or something like that, you don't want the equipment to come back on and pump the oil out on the ground. No. But it, nevertheless, it stopped while the UFOs was there, and it started up by itself without any help from any technicians. All right, then again a question. Back to the power companies. Uh, Mark, I'm a ham radio operator, so I know something about this. Uh, during solar eruptions, severe solar eruptions, um, power companies have experienced surges uh, in long lines that sometimes will kill power. So, in other words, the energy from the sun uh, during that eruption is sufficient to actually disrupt power companies. The kind of uh, radiation that you're talking about is so tremendous that presumably if you were to look at power company anomalies you might be able to come up with something what what about that 
Well, I, I think that may be true. In, in some cases, the disruption could occur because of radiation. In other words, they keep fairly careful records, don't they? Well, I can't speak for them. I'm sure that every power company is different. And, but I, I can say that, that I believe that most of these interruptions are not occurring because of large doses of radiation. I think they're probably occurring because a field that's warping space-time is coming in the vicinity of a trunk line. And I think that it's, it's just... It's kind of like time is different inside that field. And if the field comes into contact with the line, then the electricity flowing through the line is flowing at a different rate than it normally does. So it... It, it slowed down tremendously so that... So to us it disappears. Yeah, the, the lights go out. There is electricity flowing, but it's uh -huh. flowing very sluggishly. Instead of flowing like water, it's, it's flowing like honey or molasses. All right, hold that thought, Mark, for just a second while I ID the radio station. From Jackie Gong's Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. With Area 2000 for a Sunday evening, I'm Art Bell. Good evening. My guest is Mark Davenport. We're talking about time, visitors from time, UFOs, how they travel, how they do what they do, and what might be. <laughs> All right, Mark, are you still there? Yes, I am. All right, great. Um, well, anyway, I was just, uh, my comment about that, uh, Mark, was just that it might be a, a fertile area of research for somebody to start looking into uh, power company surge uh, uh, records or for any anomalies, uh, particularly in the large system that would notice something like that. Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, one of the things that uh, we set up a, a worldwide or even a nationwide uh, work of highly simply, I mean, highly uh, accurate clocks and tie them all to a central computer somewhere so that we can actually track the movement of these things as they, you know, that, that apparently they create a temporal anomaly. And, and mm -hmm. Probably a good place to put these spots would be in the houses of the abductees who say that they're being taken nightly or weekly or so forth. Uh, another good place to put them would be in the aircraft that actually are sent to scramble to chase these things. Right. That, that you could actually, you could determine uh, by doing this, if you had enough of these in, in enough places, you could probably tie them together and use them just like a radar network. You, you should be able to see a path as these things cross. Wow. Uh, that's an awfully good idea. Um, a lot of people are doing uh, abduction research now. I've found that UFO researchers who have, you know, started at the beginning many years ago uh, come to a point where they settle their mind that the UFOs are real. Then uh, they begin to move into abduction research, and most of them seem to say that's where they think we should be concentrating now, on the abductees. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, I think so, absolutely, because... Uh it, it kind of, it, it reminds me of our SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, where we were spending uh, millions of dollars to look clear out to the edge of the universe in hopes of, of finding uh, signs of intelligent life by decoding radio signals. Uh, meanwhile, uh, UFOs are landing by the hundreds of thousands in people's backyards. And I think we were kind of looking in the wrong place there. And I think maybe we're doing that when we... Uh, when we take soil samples and, and things like that. Now, now I do this. I, I'm not trying to run it, run this down, but I do think that that maybe we're we're concentrating too much on the effects of these things rather than the cause. And uh, I do think that it's extremely important that we study the abductions and what's going on. And I also I'll go a little bit further and say I think it's very important that we listen to what these people are being told by these visitors. Now, we, back in the 50s, you'll remember there were the contactees like George Adamski and Howard Minger and the rest of them, and they said that they were taken aboard these craft and shown lots of things and told that we need to love each other and we need to uh, stop with the nuclear business and that we need to not pollute our planet, mm -hmm. that these utopian ideas. And, of course, they were laughed at by most of the population, and everybody thought they were nuts. And now we're finding out that uh, we're in a situation here where we're, if we keep up the way we've been going uh, for the last few decades, if we keep it up much longer, we're not going to be able to survive on this planet. 
And so maybe what these people were being told, maybe they weren't that. Maybe they were co contacted, and maybe they were being told these things uh, legitimately, because now, uh, since we didn't listen to the contactees, that was about the time back in the 60s when the abduction started in, in full force. And now we're finding, uh, you know, I've, I've asked all the abductees that I've asked, which is uh, the last, oh, 30 or so that I've talked to, I've, I've asked them three questions. Do you consider yourself an environmentalist? In other words, are you? Mm -hmm. Are you concerned about what we're doing to our planet? Do you consider yourself a human rights advocate? Does it bother you that uh, what we're doing to minorities and so forth? Um, do you consider yourself an anti-nuclear advocate? And without exception, every single one of them has said yes immediately to all three of those questions. Recent converts, Mark, or um, had always been that way? Well, it could be that, the, that, the, that they're selected because of their ideas, or it could be that their ideas are a result of programming. You know, Dave, David Jacobs talks about uh, the anatomy of an abduction scenario where people are taken aboard and they're subjected to examinations. And one of the things that's done is there's this staring procedure where the, the so-called alien gets two inches away from their face and stares deeply into their eyes. And while this is going on, a lot of them uh, report that they feel like information is being sort of sucked out of their brain and other information is being put in there, injected into their their brains, and and <laughs> consequently, after after the abduction is over, uh, a lot of these people are changed. They're changed spiritually. They they, they become more spiritual. They they appear to begin to have some sorts of psychic powers and so forth, and you know more ESP and, and things like that. And also, it appears that. They're actually changing the way our, our attitudes about each other and about our planet. All right. Uh, let me re lead you down a road. Um, you, would you suggest, would you agree that it is true that abductees frequently are abducted many times or that uh, even over a series of a, a, a period of a lifetime or even beyond to the relatives of the abductees? Is that true? Yes. Almost invariably, we find when someone is an abductee, if you delve deeply enough into their family history, you'll find out that uh, in most cases they were abducted from the time they were infants or children, and in most cases you'll find someone else in the family, the mother or the son or someone else who was also abducted. All right, that being the case, Mark, um, it occurs to me that you could literally send a message to the aliens perhaps through an abductee, and I wonder if that's occurred to you, and if it has, or it hasn't, I'd like to ask anyway, could, if you could send a message to the aliens, what would it be? Well, this is being done now. There's a, there's a man named Daryl Sims who is the, I think he's the Houston MUFON director, and this is one of his main projects is to, um, he gives he puts abductees under hypnosis and gives them post-hypnotic suggestions so that the next time they're abducted, they will awaken during the process and they will give a message to the uh, their captors and they will also be able to remember things that normally they couldn't remember. I'll be darned. Um, and his message is, Daryl sent me. Daryl sent me? Now, now, my message would probably be different than that. I would probably be say something like, what in the world, what in the universe are you doing? Why are you doing this? But, uh, or provide coordinates and times for a contact? Yeah. Uh, but, of course, what, why they're doing this is, uh, you know, that's their reason, not ours. And if they wanted us to know, I'm sure they would have told us a long time ago. And it may also well be that a post-hypnotic suggestion uh, is as nothing compared to whatever technology they're utilizing. Well, it could be. You know, as I said before, if, if my hypothesis is correct, they could be coming from literally millions of different places. We were, and and the, each each one of them may have a different agenda. In fact, each individual aboard each craft may have their own personal agenda. So it's hard to ascribe, you know, human logic to them. It's hard to to uh, say that that they have a they all have a collective agenda. Mm -hmm. Even though there does seem to be some sort of grand plan you know there are a lot of people who who they they believe that they're that they have some sort of mission to perform 
and that uh, you know they're doing what they're supposed to do and so forth. Um, Mark, I live in a little town called Pahrump, Nevada, uh, which is about 65 miles west of Las Vegas, and just a hop, skip, and a mountain from the infamous Area 51. And I can tell you, a lot of things are seen in the valley where I live, and I mean a lot of things, uh, from there on up north. And uh, the attitude of the people where I live is, we see them, we don't talk about them. Well, I saw one. I saw a large, triangular, uh, silent craft that passed over me at about 150 feet. It was very low, Mark, and very silent, uh, going too slow for normal aerodynamic flight, and utterly silent. I could hear crickets at a quarter mile, and I couldn't hear this thing. This occurred several months ago. And I've seen other things in my body, but that was the most significant. And I, I see in here you so much photos of asymmetrical uh, craft, and I'm curious about shapes since my side. Well, I've given you photos of craft of all different shapes. Generally, the shape is, has something to do with, with the spheres, either completely spherical or stiff shape or, or some you know, variation, an oblate or a toroid or something like that. And I think the reason for that is because that's the most uh, efficient shape to use with a field, because fields are usually that shape. Uh, I have heard many instances of these triangular craft. As a matter of fact, uh, Michael Lindemann and Ralph Steiner were there in Antelope Valley and saw a craft uh, very similar to what you described, a huge, huge triangular thing. This was huge. It turned slowly on several different axes as if it could rotate in any direction and then kind of floated away. Um, That's the way I described it, as floating, not flying, floating. Now, it did no unusual movements, and it just, I, I watched it, uh, oh, I don't know, for a good three or four minutes just float right across the valley. Yeah, that's, that's been seen in that area by many, many people. Uh, as far as why it's shaped like that, I have no idea, really. Um, and, I don't, of course, I don't know who built it. You know, there's a lot of uh, government stuff in that area. Oh, it yes. It could be something of our own. You know, if, if Lazar and others are, are telling the truth about the fact that we are re uh, reverse engineering these things, then it's very possible that we could have figured out how they work and how to get them to stay in the air and we could have built our own or it could be that these are simply from some different place uh, as I said once again millions of different places they could be coming from or as Carl Sagan would say billions of different places do you uh, by the way do you have any I, I ask a lot of people about Carl Sagan when they uh, mention him uh, he of course has kind of turned as it were and um, what do you think about Mr. Sagan? Well, Mr. Sagan is a brilliant man, or Doc, Dr. Sagan, I guess it is. Yes. He, he is a brilliant man. He, As a matter of fact, I credited him in the uh, acknowledgments in my first book, uh, which was called Dear Mr. President, 100 Earth-Saving Letters, because he was one of the people who convinced the world that we should not use nuclear weapons because of nuclear winter. Right. And he, he has a brilliant mind, and so and because of that, I know that he knows enough of the evidence about UFOs not to make a ridiculous uh, conclusion that he made in his Parade magazine article that they are hallucinations. Yes. Uh, so I think he probably has uh, an agenda why he did that. He has a reason for doing that. Uh, it could be that he is employed by the government. It could be that he thinks it's for the for the best, uh, for some personal reason. I don't know, but but I I totally disagree. I, I agree with his article and everything up to the point where he makes that conclusion, and of course that that's utterly fallacious. Or do you think that he might uh, he might feel that uh, it's getting close now, and the uh, the social impact of a revelation? or e perhaps even support from somebody of his stature would be very harmful? Well, if, that's, if that were the case, then he probably should just not write an article. Trying to be kind here. But, but I do think that uh, the, 
the government cover-up is, is rapidly breaking apart, and I think part of the reason for that is that I don't really think that, that our government intended to keep this a secret forever. And I, I think it isn't that they wanted us not to know anything about it. I think it's that they didn't want us to know too much too soon. And I think that they have changed now from a policy of complete cover-up to a policy of education. And I, I think you're seeing that now in all of, all forms of media. You will see little uh, hints now and again that that these things are coming, that we all need to be prepared for it. Yes, I think we're contributing to that right now. Yes, of course. Um, Mark, I, mean, I, I would like to open my phone lines, if you wouldn't mind. We don't have a lot of time left, but I'd love to uh, subject you to a couple of questions. Would you be willing? Oh, yes, I'd be glad to. All right, let's do it then. Um, in the metropolitan area of Las Vegas, 383-8255. Toll free outside the state, 1-800-338-8255. Wild card lines, area code 702-385-7214. And first time callers, 702-385-7213. Wild card line three. Good evening. You're on the air with Mark Davenport. Uh, good evening. This is Fritz. Um, <laughs> Mark, I haven't had a chance to read your book yet, but it seems to me you've done your homework. You mentioned David Froning, Time Travel, and Conductee. Now let's go to the best source of it. Uh, what do you think of the Billy Meyer conduct case? I'm sure you have your mind expanded on this case. What is your opinion? All right, Fritz, listen on the radio, please. He loves to ask everybody about the Billy Meyer case. Uh, Mark, what about it? Well... I'll tell you, a, a lot of people who have studied Billy Meyer's photographs have been uh, baffled by how he could fake them, and I think possibly the reason for that is, is maybe they aren't faked. Uh, some, some pretty high-powered uh, photographic experts have, have uh, failed to show how he could have faked these things, especially since the man only has one arm and he's, you know, he doesn't have... You know, uh, uh, Steven Spielberg's people looked at these photographs and said, yes, we can duplicate them. It will cost about $50,000 a piece. Oh. Uh, so if he's doing this with a, a Polaroid camera in, in one arm by himself uh, with, with very little funds, uh, then he's more of a genius than, than we know. So I, I think that, that we should take a very serious look at these. I think they could well be genuine. All right, fine, Mark. Uh... <laughs> Let me make one interesting point about Meyer. All right. He, he has said that the reason that his photographs are clear is that he is taking them at a time when he is instructed. You can take them now, and he has tried to take photographs when he's not instructed to, and they don't turn out. And I think maybe the reason for that is the field around these crafts is being manipulated so that he can take good photographs. All right. Uh, good, good evening. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Mark Davenport. Uh, yes, Mr. Bell, I would like to ask Mr. Davenport if he believes that these sightings of UFOs or these entities have anything to do with uh, biblical beings like angels or demons. All right, thank you. Uh, religious uh, ties, Mark? Well, I think there is very definitely a spiritual component to these things. I think they've been around, as I said, uh, probably as long as we have. And I think that they that what we're seeing now could be the basis of many of our religions, also our ancient myths, and so so forth. And I think that uh, it's very possible that the angels of the Bible could be the exact same thing that we're seeing now, uh, and we call them euphonauts or visitors. Or mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Bible is full of, of classic UFO sightings and, and abductions. We have uh, Ezekiel Quill, for instance. We have. Uh, um, Enoch, well, that Enoch, that book was, that's a, apocryphal, but uh, we have Elijah and Elisha that were taken up into these, uh, into something. We have the uh, pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that led uh, people through the desert. We have the star of Bethlehem and all sorts of, of, of instances of, of things that could be interpreted as classic UFO sightings and classic abductions. We have Saul's vision on the road to Damascus. Uh, so I think it's, yeah, it's very possible that these things are connected. And who knows? Maybe these UFOs are messengers from God. They're, who's to say they're not? Who's to say they're not? That's right. Line one, good evening. You're on the air with Mark Davenport. Good evening, Mark. I was wondering if it's been said that uh, for forecast that June 5th, 1995, you're supposed to make contact with us. What do you 
Thank you for that. All right, thank you. I've heard all sorts of dates uh, since the 60s. I've been hearing dates when the, the, they're supposed to do this or they're supposed to do that, and, and almost universally they don't. Uh, I think there may be a lot of reasons for this. For one thing, most of these dates come, they're channeled information, and usually uh, all this information is subject to the interpretation of the channel uh, so that the information is not coming, for instance, it's not coming to us in English. It's coming in thoughts, and we have to interpret whatever it is that we're receiving. And, and even assuming that the information is correct, the interpretation may be wrong. And, of course, we also know that these, these people aboard these craft are notorious for lying to us about lots of things, including times and dates. You know, a lot of people have sold everything they had and, and gone up and sat on top of a mountain at a certain date and a certain time waiting for the saucers to come pick them up, and they were still sitting there the next morning wondering, what in the heck am I going to do now? Pretty cruel joke. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't pay much attention to those dates. All right. Um, good evening, Wildcard Line 3. You're on the air with Mark Davenport. Good evening, Mark. How are you doing, Art? Fine, sir. Um, yeah, I'm calling from Idaho. Okay. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask Mark uh, what he felt about some of the stuff that I've been hearing. I, I, I listened to um, my was in Salt Lake City, K-Talk Radio, and they had this woman out in New Mexico who's publishing these journals called the Phoenix Journals, and I wonder what you felt about those and the validity of some of the stuff that's coming out through those journals. Are you familiar with them? Yeah, I am. Uh, All right, I listen have... on the air, sir. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I have read some of those things. Um, once again, I would, I would kind of take it with a grain of salt because even though I think the channeled information needs to be looked at seriously, and studied scientifically, I do think that the great bulk of it usually n it does not come to pass. There, there are all sorts of predictions about things that, that will happen. For instance, the photon belt, I think, was a, a big scare last year, or maybe the year before, uh, where we were supposed to be coming into a period where the, uh, the Earth would be, there, the sky would be light all the time and electricity wouldn't work anymore. You know, there, were, there are all kinds of things like this that are predicted and nothing ever happens. Would you think the, uh, the motive would be to confuse? In other words, if you send a bunch of people up to the mountaintop waiting for the saucers to land and they don't land, the tendency of people is to just laugh it off, of course, and laugh at the person who went and laugh at the whole idea, and it makes the whole thing a little more laughable and more easily concealed. Well, I, I prefer to think that it's that people are not able to interpret the information that they're picking up on. You know, there are a lot of people who are clairvoyant or audient and, and so forth, and they, um, they're they able to, to, to pick up on information, and sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't, and they're, you know, they're the first to tell you that uh, it's, it's not really an exact science. It's not, there's no... Uh, there's not always a good interpretation, and I think that there is information there, whether it's coming from the collective and conscious or whether it's coming from ETs or whether it's coming from something else, from, uh, from spirits or whatever. Uh, there is information there, but interpreting it and, and turning it into words and actual predictions is very, very difficult. And, and I think that that's, that's probably more of the problem rather than and uh, deliberate deceit. I can't see any reason for for that because if they wanted to conceal themselves, they could probably just not say anything, and it would probably work just as well. All right, uh, we're so short on time here; we could do hours here. Um, first time caller line, you're on the air with Mark Davenport. Where are you calling from? Oh, I got closer to this 
this thing, I realized there was something in front of it. It was like a, a, a black line in the sky. I suppose the plane pulling a target. Okay, we've got to hurry here. And uh, so anyway, this thing, these things drifted across the road, and then they just stopped dead in the air. And one was a plane, a black plane that looked something like a stealth fighter. And this black line was in front of it. This plane just stopped dead in the air. There was no motion, no heat, waves, no noise, no nothing. And then the black line circled around behind the, the black plane and tilted on its axis. And a black, uh, another black plane appeared. It was, I guess I was looking at it from a different angle. I just sat there totally still with no engine noise, no nothing. And uh, I was off the throttle. I had my window down a little bit. And I heard no engine noise at all. And they were just set in the sky, totally motionless. And as I drove under them, I tried to catch them in my rearview mirror, and uh, they just disappeared. All right. Well, thank you for the story. Uh, Mark, that sounds different then, but with some of the same components of what I saw. And this would clearly indicate the kind of technology that either we've developed and we're much further ahead than we thought, or they have given us. Is it your view that we have their technology? Um. I, I think that uh, some elements of the U.S. government know one heck of a lot more about the technology than they're telling us because I think as early as 1947 when uh, one of these things crashed uh, near Corona and it was the people from Roswell Army Air, For Air Field recovered the debris and the, and the object, I think since that time we've been studying these things very closely and trying to duplicate them and it's very possible that we could have had some success at that. There are a lot of stories that uh, we have been given technology in exchange for other things. It's, it's possible that that could have happened. It would, as we said at the first of the program, it would follow uh, the, the general modus operandi of our government. Uh, that's just exactly how the military works. It, it keeps things secret as long as it can to keep them out of the hands of the enemy. Mark, we're out of time. We're out of time. I have to stop. I have no choice. But what I am going to ask is that you hold on the line for a moment uh, because I want to talk to you about doing another show. So would you be kind enough to do that? I would be glad to. You're a wonderful interview, and this was not enough. Stay right where you are, Mark Davenport. Well, thank you all. Thank you, everybody. I'm sorry that we don't have more time. We could, and I guarantee you we will do hours on this subject. This was... Uh, Area 2000. I'm sorry, time's up. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000, a program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach to the discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation, please call during the week between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., area code 702-456-1606. Ask for Angela Thompson. That's area code 702-456-1606. And be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000. Translated, we're going to talk about reincarnation, and we have an incident in that area. Otherwise, you would not have gone there in the first place. So you you had heard that something was going on. I have no way of knowing how much you heard was going on, but clearly you went up there because you were personally interested, intrigued, wanted to find out more. And uh, I, the way I look at this as I listen to you is that it frightened you or challenged you to the degree that you then turned around and blocked it out, or in other words, you found more than you wanted to find. Well, I can't say I found more than I wanted to find. I simply would put it another way, and that is that the intimidation and the fear uh, effectively helped my memory last in detail, and I found what I found. Now, I can tell you... Um, Subsequent to that time, in the last 
few years, which only go back about four now, uh, I have done additional studies that I am very cognizant of, and I know very well. But to go back to 1957, mm -hmm. I can't give you the details that I can from today. That's probably one of the first uh, um, examined uh, animal mutilation cases uh, in the country, and that's why I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about that. And, uh, and I'm glad I did. That's a remarkable thing to have done, uh, Doctor. And, uh, and so now I guess we can move forward a little bit. Uh, when did you come back to this whole, in other words, a number of years obviously elapsed when you n not only didn't think about it, but actively blocked it out, uh, and then at some point you came back to it again. How did that happen? The period of time from that early situation to uh, my getting back into investigational work was a period of 22 years. And during that period of time, I would vehemently deny or refuse to accept the notion that there was anything peculiar or possibly involved in, in extraterrestrial behavior that could account for anything that had happened on, on the Earth. I thought I was involved in I just would say, hey, this is crazy. 22 years brings us to about 1989, and I think the beginning of your relationship with Linda Howe. Doctor, I must ID the radio station, so stand by just one moment. We'll be right back to you. You're listening to Dr. Outschuler, who, by the way, uh, is with us from uh, his home in Englewood, uh, uh, Colorado, and we'll be right back to him. Jackie Gons Plaza downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening. It's Sunday evening. This is Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. Dr. Al Schuler is my guest. He's done a lot of work in uh, animal mutilation cases. A lot of modern work and uh, some a very long time ago, beginning with one of the first known examinations of a mutilated animal. On September 9th, 1967. Now back to Englewood, Colorado, and Dr. Altshuler. Doctor, we're back on the air again. Uh, was I right? Is that about the beginning of your relationship with Linda Howe? Correct. Um, I'm curious, uh, how did Linda even know to come to you, Doctor? She had, um, had heard uh, somewhat of a convoluted tale, but uh, without going into detail, she had heard that I, in fact, had been present to examine the horse lady in Alamosa 20-odd years before. And that was really the beginning and the first relatively well-documented case of, a, of an animal death that had not been clearly ascribed to uh, common or uh, clearly explainable causes. So she came to you based on not too much more than a myth. Well, she came to me having heard my name and having heard that I was that I had been present. Yeah. And she called me, and she introduced herself as to her credentials and so on and what her interests were, and I refused to see her, which was the right decision, I can tell you, because. At that time, my, my last desire was to be involved with in any form of, of press, in any form, absolutely in any form. That was not my goal. Uh, I really uh, like to remain in a low-profile uh, situation and to do my work without fanfare, but just to do it quietly, to do it honestly, and to report what I find. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she was persistent, and one day she turned up in my driveway. Oh! And she said, "Look, I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes, just for a few minutes." And I 
thought obliged to be at least civil to her and invite her in my home, which I did. And we went down in the solarium in the house and sat down and began to talk. And we talked, I would guess, for about three or four hours. Uh, after a period of time, I felt a little bit more comfortable with her and was, in fact, convinced that Linda would not do anything to publicize anything uh, that would be detrimental to me, to my work, my reputation, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I felt that I could trust her enough to be relatively candid, not completely so, but relatively so, and relatively open, which I was. And at that time, we discussed the Keith and Alamosa in some depth, and after that, she had continued, uh, in fact, she, she actually had made a television series several years before about uh, the alien, alien harvest kind of, and uh, she, um, I think, was well awarded for her work, which was certainly deserved. She did a excellent job in it, and uh, she was in the mode of continuing her investigation in the phenomena. And therefore, asked if I would be of help to her if I could. And I decided in a quiet kind of way that that I would try and see what I could do. And that's really how I got involved with her. And it began about four years ago, four and a half years ago. Uh, doctor, how uh, convinced are you that there is some or any connection between the animal mutilations, uh, the ones you've examined, and the UFO controversy, or are you still very much in doubt about that and thinking about it? Well, I'll tell you what I, what I tell everyone. I will give you my findings. I will tell you objectively what I see. And then you are going to have to decide on your own what conclusion you come to. You have to decide completely on your own. Uh, in a uh, situation where I am being questioned, as you have, to uh, give a, an opinion publicly of what I believe and what the relationship may be with uh, UFOs and cattle death and mutilation and so on, what I can tell you is that there are a number of findings that are very unusual. Uh, there are coincidental other situations that occur surrounding these deaths, which also are interesting to say the least. And one can come to a logical conclusion in your own mind as to whether the relationship is a real one or not. I'm not about to tell you whether it is. That's up to you. No, well, I don't blame you. And I can, I can assure you that there are a number of findings that are really pretty unusual. It's pretty bizarre. And if we look at the findings that have occurred in these animals that have been found, there are um, a number of them that are very, very difficult to explain in terms of what we as people, uh, enormously capable as we are in a scientific mode, are capable of doing. They're relatively well-known material uh, that simply would defy human capability. And the examples, or a number of them, would include, or uh, would include one, that these animals are found in a relatively trackless area. They're found out uh, uh, and uh, found dead, you know, anywhere from 100 feet to several hundred yards or even miles from the nearest road or the nearest farmhouse or ranch home. And the animals are found without any track, vehicular track, or human track of any kind. Even though the ground may be wet, it's difficult to understand how that happens, but it does. Is that, um, is that typical, Doctor, um, more so than not, that they're found in... It's never the case. I have, I have uh, checked in a number of cases where clearly the cause of death in the animal has been predator attack. I mean, it's just, it's obvious. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure that out. Right. Then there are other cases in which there simply is no explanation. Uh, the animals are found in a relatively 
uh, not absolute, but a relatively bloodless environment. Uh, an animal has a tremendous amount of blood, especially if you got, uh, if you have a cow, a bull, any of the cattle. Uh, the volume of blood is enormous, and to find them in a relatively bloodless field with um, with the animals having been cut open is a very interesting event. No, no, nothing that a predator, uh, as far as you know, could could, uh, could even do. Well, I think you know, a predator may have. It uh, may, may drink blood, for sure, and, uh, and tear the meat. But what a predator will do as a rule will be, in fact, to go to the soft portions of the animal, the underbelly, yes. uh, even the eye, perhaps, and so on. But they will tear the tissue, and generally the tissue will be quite ragged in the area of predatory attack. It looks pretty clear to me that they gnaw and they tear. They don't, they don't make a bite for the sharp nose. It doesn't seem like a practical way of biting nose. Uh, doctor, uh, are there frequently more than one animal uh, in these trackless situations where they're way out in the middle of nowhere? Uh, have there been multiple attacks, in other words, many dead animals, or is it typically one? Well, it's very commonly one or two, but there have been cases, for example, a, a case a number of years ago that Linda has described eloquently in her book, um, the, uh, Wyatt, the Wyatt Ranch, where there were five animals who were almost all over the head, five of them that were all dead with similar colors uh, in a relatively bloodless area without that, with very similar types of uh, incisional areas that were sharply made, uh, with uh, coiling out uh, a rancher, sometimes with a stout, with cookie cutter type of incisions that simply meant and it looked like a cookie cutter that was round that was stamped in the tissue and made a rather sharply defined cut, particularly around certain parts of the body, more frequently the anal genital area. Mm -hmm. And these are consistent. The findings at the border of the tissue show rather clearly that there has been uh, a cut at a sharp uh, border with significant heat because the changes are very typical heat. And there, there's no question about that. That is microscopically very clear. You can tell that clearly by looking at it. All right, doctor, tissue samples or even organs removed. A um, little of this, I suppose, for some of the audience is going to get a little gory, but I'm going to ask, what about the cause of death of the animal? Is that or is the tissue taking the, the apparent cause of death of the animal, or has there been any investigation into that? Well, it's really a very good question. I wish I could give you an answer. I can't. I can only tell you that, that the incisions that have been made in some of the animals clearly could cause death. For example, in the, in the horn that had been uh, killed up in Alamosa, yes. the part of the animal that had been denuded from tissue was in the neck and what we refer to as the median sinus or portions of the chest. Um, and that clearly would cause an animal to die. But it was in a bloodless area, bloodless field, which is really, to me, remains probably the single most enigmatic aspect of the entire event. The fact that there just isn't blood. Uh, trackless, you can say, well, maybe somebody is very, very good and can cover up their tracks exiting from the scene of the crime, so to speak. But how they take blood away is really enigmatic. Another very unusual finding, and one that is consistent and seems to present itself many times, is the denudation of tissue from bone. In other words, the removal of tissue from that part of the skeleton, leaving the skeleton white and clean. Now, this isn't easy to do. If you try and mimic this with our own capabilities, it isn't easy to do. It's very hard to do. I can assure you that I have personal experience in trying to remove flesh from bone tissue to uh, to obtain skeleton parts for the purpose of studying and learning mm -hmm. uh, bone anatomy. Can you imagine a process that could accomplish that? Not anything that can be done in a matter of a few hours. I just can't envision it. Uh, it's taken me weeks to do it. And I mean weeks of boiling bone with lye and then 
scraping it and cleaning it and sanding it and so on. It's really not easy to do. Yes, Doctor. I recall when I was very young, I had a project in school. Um, I, I decided I was going to get a bird and boil its flesh away and take in its bone structure as a project for school. And I boiled that poor dead bird for so many hours until my mom finally made me stop. So I, I'm in sympathy with that. I, it's very difficult. Yeah. And yet, we find these animals within a relatively few number of hours, perf excuse me, perfectly alive, then dead, with clean bony bones. That is an enigma. Here's, a, here's another good question. Have you ever run into a situation where an animal has had a tissue sample taken and did not die? I personally have not, but they have been reported that some animals have remained alive for a short period of time. Hmm. Now, I think uh, Linda Howe has more first-hand knowledge in this area than I do. I have been called almost, well, virtually exclusively uh, after the fact, after the animals have been dead. And I have not had personal experience with live animals that have, in fact, been so-called mutilated or killed. And I think Linda could tell you about that. All right. Perhaps you can speak, though, to the samples that have been taken. From a medical point of view, is there any sense to the samples that have been taken? Uh, can you ascribe any sense to the areas that the samples have come from, the size of the samples, or anything else medically? Well, they... The size of the samples are all they're all fairly uniform, especially when involved the inner genital area with the genital organs frequently removed. The tongue is not infrequently removed. The ear, sometimes the eye may be denucleated and removed. Uh, the skin and the flesh along the jawbone, especially the the uh, uh, maxilla, the lower jaw, it can be cleaned of flesh and white listening quite clean, absolutely clean. Um, speculation. I have heard people continuously and uh, seem to be curious in their asking, could this be some kind of genetic research? Uh, are aliens removing these tissues and using them for research? Yes. Using them for nutrition? If that, if that were the intent, Doctor, would those samples be uh, typical of what you would want for that sort of research? That also is a, is a very difficult question to answer. And the only reason I say that, not that I'm trying to be evasive, is that the, the genetic code, which has been described for many years, you know, 30 years anyway, uh, Watson and Creek did that eloquently a long time ago, and there's been a great deal of additional information in the last number of years, especially in the last few, regarding changes in the code. But nonetheless, the genetic code is uniform for tissue, be it from the eye, the rectum, anal genital area, mm -hmm. chest, doesn't really matter. Uh, right, how these particular areas, I don't know. I, one of the things that has been published, and I assure you not with my name on it, has been that the dissection has been so accurate that it's been able to dissect between individual cells. I have never seen any evidence from it. I've never seen it. I don't know how, if it were to be done, it'd be great. It'd be a very interesting thing for me to see. I've never seen it. Um, and I think the people that have, have propagated this unusual, bizarre capability are looking for a very easy way to explain what it's clearly is being done by by alien technology, we don't have a technology to do it. True, we don't have a technology to do it, to, to dissect the, between individual cells. Oh. Uh, but I've never seen that. Why specific organs are taken around the genital area, the tongue, and the eye, and so why do you, I don't really know. The question can come up over and over and over again. Why is this going on? Uh, there really are a number of factors that we have to consider. Number one, is it, uh, in terms of, of what we know as people and investigators, could this in fact be predators? Secondly, could it be cult behavior? Mm -hmm. Thirdly, could it be some form of investigation or research being carried on by 
federal agency for whatever purpose. Well, I think you dismissed the predator theory pretty well. Uh, but, but not in any case. There, there are plenty of them that are, in fact, considered to be due to unknown causes, and therefore people conclude alien intervention, that are, in fact, scientific. Mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of them that are, in fact, scientific. I went down to a piece of the soap, and it was clearly scientific. It was obvious. Then the ones that cause behavior, I am continually in the process of trying to learn more about cults because I know precious little about them. And there isn't that much known about them, except the fact that when cult sacrifices take place, they generally go for two areas from what I've been able to learn. One of them is the heart, and the second are the sex organs because it gives courage and, and sexual prowess for the cultists to be able to be involved in feeding or creating the blood of the animal that is a sacrifice. But it seems to me that if cult behavior were involved in these situations, that they would have to do it very quickly, and certainly by now they would have been caught and they never have been. There have been cults for sure that, that are involved in animal death and animal killing, and they have been caught in time. Um, I know that in England, about a year ago, I received a call from, I think it was an investigator from Scotland Yard who called me about animal mutilation in England. As you know, we have very interesting events that these phenomena take place, but three years ago, we found a group of people that were, in fact, I think in cult behavior, killing these animals, and we caught them, we arrested them, and they were still in jail. Uh, as a matter of interest, uh, in that case, since it is documented, um, what manner of mutilation was there? Were you privy uh, to that knowledge? Why was it? It would be interesting to know if the same shot uh, is thinking the high heat uh, uh, for you. Well, there was no evidence of people that was called the host. But he called and he said that he thought that he was called because he was interested in the trees about the mutilation that were being reported from this part of the uh, side of the ocean had any relationship to what he had seen in England. And these were clear-cut relations with blood all over the place. And you virtually can't do a, a human dissection or killing without having a lot of blood. That cannot be done, and I know that. If it is, I'd sure like to know how to do it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, probably not the cults, then. Well, you know, there may be a number of cases, but... What I'm really trying to come down to is how do you explain those that are not explainable? There are those that are killed by, by sacrifice. There are those that have been killed uh, by electrocution. There are those animals that have been killed by predators, for sure. There are those animals that die of natural diseases, like bloat and other infections or conditions that occur in cats. What about those cases where none of these take place? Yes. Um, I take it then, in the last few years, you are frequently called when one of these comes up. You mentioned going once to Oklahoma. Do you generally uh, get there far after the fact, too much after the fact, to to come to good conclusions? or? Well, sometimes it's very difficult. I can, I can tell you there are a number of major problems involved with this entire investigational effort. The first one is that the ranchers and the farmers are reticent, at best, mm -hmm. to tell anyone about them. Mm -hmm. It is an economic loss for these people, and you have to recognize that that is true, and that's a major factor for them. They're, they're losing substantial amount of investment when they have an animal killed. And I'm sure they have no interest in publicity over the matter at all. No interest in publicity. None. As a rule. They don't like to notify anybody, and when they do, they generally notify either one of two groups, either law enforcement groups or veterinarians. Now, let us take the example of the law enforcement people. The law enforcement people come out, and they say, well, you know, this animal is clearly killed by a predator. They are hesitant to look at any other circumstantial evidence that would suggest probably not predator. Well, of course, any anything other than predator would probably necessitate uh, some sort of further investigation. 
Now, I will give you a case in point. I was called to see a case uh, that was uh, involved in a horse, actually, in a county north of Denver. Uh, the rancher called me, and I went to the College of Veterinary Medicine, where the animal had been taken. I had been, uh, I had a rather lengthy visit with the chairman of the department of the dog. And the only remains of that animal was kept that I was allowed to see was the head. Hmm. Brought the head out, and I examined the head, and I took tissue, and I found some interesting findings, which were including the finding of, of heat application at the margin of the jawbone where tissue had been taken. And I asked the doctor, I said, well, could you tell me how you signed this case out after the necropsy? And he said, well, this animal clearly died of baldness, which is a condition where you get torsion or twisting of the bowel that can lead to bowel obstruction and can, in fact, lead to death. No question, it can. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, would you mind showing me the slide so I could look at it? Because they're fairly typical when you have a baldness and you have changes that are pretty indicative of that kind of catastrophic event in the bowel. And his reply to me was not unexpected. Well, we incinerated the animal. We didn't take it in mind. <laughs> and I said, well, why not? Because in my experience, I always take tissue, always, to try and establish what I see with my eyes in gross ex examination to substantiate the gross examination by microscopic evaluation as well. And his reply to me was, we didn't need to. We saw that the animal died of bobulus, torsion of the bowel, and there was no need to take microscopic tissue or take sections for microscopic evaluation. Now that would surprise me a little bit from a neophyte veterinary pathology, but it's shocking coming from the chairman of the department. Um, when you talk to somebody like that, do, do you... Uh, do you, in essence, hear an echo of your own self in 1967? Absolutely. 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 I think you hit the nail squarely on the head. <laughs> think you're absolutely right. It's a threat. Look, let's face it. It is a threat to anyone who is in a position of either requiring continuation of tenure or in a position of, of uh, uh, balance where they could be ridiculed and criticized. And I can't blame them because it is, in fact, a, uh, it is a, a frightening place to be in situations where one can be threatened. And that really hasn't changed, has it? Since well, it changed a lot. I mean, if, if it hasn't changed a lot, don't think I'd be here talking to you. Well, that's true. And, you know, I... Uh, but I, I'm talking now in terms of uh, uh, a doctor uh, who might be encountering this for the first time. I would imagine his fears even today are going to be very, very much the same. So I, I suppose... And they are, and I will tell you that the fear is unspoken, and the fear is not there in public. And the fear, in fact, is sequestered in the deep recesses of their own minds and their own capabilities of hiding. And they do it very effectively. And I will tell you, I'm not going to give you uh, uh, names, which I, I will not do, but I will tell you this. That several years ago, I was invited as a guest speaker in a major city outside of the state of Colorado to give a talk discussing this very matter. And I presented, they were all physicians, I presented the data. I was admittedly frightened. But I said, hey, you know, I've been invited to do this, and I'll do it. And I went. And I gave a paper, an hour paper, showing the slides, showing photographs, discussing the medical and technical findings, and allowing people to come to their own conclusions, but yet giving them the option of what their conclusions might be based on the information that I gave them. And at the end of the meeting, at the end of my presentation, which was, I think, just if I remember correctly, just before lunch, uh, I didn't have too many people come up and kind of disappeared into the woodwork with the lunch and so on. 
that afternoon we had a two and a half hour workshop. There were, I don't know, 12 or so, 10 may workshop. And every doctor that presented a paper during that morning session had a workshop for two and a half hours. And I thought, boy, I really, I blew this one. <laughs> and I figured that nobody would be in the workshop. And I thought, well, I'll go there and I'll just see one or two people. Well, I walked down there about 15 minutes before it was due to start. And there was a large crowd. And I got down towards the room that I had been assigned, and I could not get in the door. Oh, boy. I got in the door, and it was just, there were people set up. There was no seating. And this was 15 minutes before it began. And at the end of the workshop, two and a half hours later, I cannot tell you, I can't begin to tell you the number of physicians that came up to me and told me about their own experience. Hmm. And it was a revelation for me. Uh, I felt more that I was among my colleagues again, rather than felt like a complete outcast by noontime. Well, that's remarkable. I think that, uh, but yet I would defy you to find any physician who has had any experience to go into the doctor's lounge and surgery or anywhere else and say, guess what? This is what I believe or this is what I saw, or this is what I've done. I'd never do it. And I don't know anybody of my colleagues, any of them that would. Because it is a threat. And I think... Sure, a good way to end a career. Well, it, it leads to a lack of credibility. And that's why I have persisted, and I have been absolutely dogmatic in my own presentations of saying, these are the data, these are the findings, you come to your own conclusions. I'm not going to tell you what they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is up to you. And I do that tonight as I have done it every other time. Indeed, and I don't blame you a bit. Um, doctor, we are at the top of an hour, and we're going to do five minutes of news, so I would ask that you relax for five minutes, and we'll be right back to you. All right. All right, Doctor. T uh, take care. Dr. Altshuler from Colorado. Animal mutilations, the subject. And uh, this is some fascinating stuff. We'll be back to it in just a moment. You're listening to Area 2000 from Las Vegas. I'm Art Bell. Good evening. Welcome back to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. My guest from Colorado is Dr. Al Schuler, who's done a very great deal of work now. Uh, since 1967, before anybody else really was doing it, on animal mutilations. And back now to Colorado and Dr. Al Schuler. Doctor, are you still there? Yeah. Good. Uh, so, uh, you had a lot of physicians uh, come up to you uh, after your presentation, or in, in the second portion of it, and, uh, and talk with you. Did, did any of them, uh, or I guess a number of them, you said, admitted similar findings? No, not, they were not involved in the animal death situation. They were simply involved in, uh, having expressed their own experiences, interpreting what I had told them about possibility of uh, UFO involvement, and they just simply told me about their own UFO experience, unrelated to the animal situation completely. Well, let me jump forward a little bit and just ask you this. Have you had any experience with or looked into the uh, human abduction aspect of this? Well, I, I've, uh, I have, uh, I have to come to you, yes. Um, is this, are both of these areas, in your view, uh, the animal mutilations and the human abductions, uh, are they both um, continuing uh, uh, valid areas of inquiry uh, with regard to the possibility of the connection uh, to UFOs? Or, uh, in other words, uh, ha ha have there been, obviously, you've reached no firm conclusions or none you're willing to talk about. Uh, will you continue this research? I plan to continue the research, and um, I, what I really have pointed out earlier is that I am allowing 
people, the audience, you and others to reach your own conclusions regarding the relationship between these events and the possibility of, uh, of unknown factors, including UFO factors. I'm not, uh, I'm not expressing my own conclusions in this regard. That's, um, those are mine and, and should not be... Uh, all right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, let me try this angle of attack. Hey, in the investigations that you've done of animal mutilations, how frequently have there been connected observations or reports of UFO activity? Oh, I can't give you percentages, but out of the ones that have been clearly unexplained and have not been uh, that have not been predator or uh, tragical behavior or other natural causes. I would uh, make a, an off-the-cuff guess, probably somewhere around 50%. There have been a number of cases that have not been anything identified or anything unusual, no unusual life, and, and other situations that have been uh, brought as unusual life that are unexplained, uh, the observation of unmarked helicopters and so on. That's a high percentage. Oh, I'd say it's a fairly high, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to decide uh, where to go uh, from here with you. Um, I guess uh, I guess I will go here. Um, a, a related field, Doctor, is uh, this crop circle uh, phenomenon. And in that phenomenon, um, a number of researchers are discovering molecular changes in the uh, in in the crops that have been bent down in these crop circles associated with high heat, which they speculate may be produced by microwave energy, and uh, or that they are able to nearly or closely duplicate with with microwave energy, is there any indication at all that uh, uh, that the sort of uh, uh, cuts that have been made or high heat that's been applied uh, to the animals is of the same nature? Now you've obviously been doing some reading. Uh, the answer is, again, very difficult, and I can tell you very quickly why. If you take tissue that is alive in any animal, be it a cat, a dog, a human, a horse, a pig, doesn't really matter. The changes that occur in the tissue due to heat are virtually the same. Now, whether it's due to heat created by microwaves, laser, unknown cutting apparatuses, electric cautery, uh, doesn't really matter. The changes are the same, and for anyone to come and say, this is definitely due to this particular instrument or technique is virtually impossible. You can, however, make some relatively good conclusions regarding burned areas. Mm -hmm. They're widespread and superficial. You know that the heat has been applied by a rather widespread form of heating, for example, spilling of boiling oil or, or the flame from a burning house to burn down, that kind of thing. If you find a very precise line that is cut and sharp and demarcated and has the changes of high temperature, you would have to conclude that somehow it has been applied by either an apparatus or a uh, a pinpoint dedicated uh, uh, blade or needle or beam that could in fact apply heat in a very precise fashion and that seems to be what I've been finding. What about the types of animals? Uh, is there one type of animal more than another that is generally found in this condition or uh, does it run the gauntlet? It runs a pretty good gauntlet but the majority by far involved primarily cattle and horses. More cattle than anything. But there have been pigs, there have been co uh, cows, uh, steers of all types, uh, dogs, cats, rabbits, deer. Uh, would, you, would, would you think, uh, on balance, that the incidences of this um, altogether are on the increase, on the decrease, or do you see a, a constant fairly constant number of them. 
Well, there was a, a pretty substantial increase at various periods in the last 20 years. And I would say now that it's uh, actually about uh, about a year and a half ago there was a marked increase, and then it kind of dropped off a little bit, and I think it's picking up again. Hmm. So it, it appears cyclical. Pretty much, yeah. Um, are you getting any help now from uh, from other uh, 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 colleagues, or are you still pretty much out there on your own? Are you uh, asking if I'm getting help from that? Somewhat alone at the moment, although there are a number of other areas that seem to be beginning to have a little bit more of an open mind and an interest in investigation or work regarding the uh, mutilation. Well, I know this, the Bigelow Foundation, in an effort to get uh, cooperation from veterinarians has taken certain steps and uh, uh, is implementing a program to try to get better reporting on this and that no doubt is going to help and of course the other thing is the time factor from the time something like this is found uh, until uh, until somebody like yourself gets to make an examination uh, the Bigelow Foundation is clearly uh, highly supportive of the investigation and I think it's the only research-oriented organization that is willing to to support and help establish, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the unusual nature of these killings. I mean, the Bigelow Foundation has been very supportive and, and really, I think, instrumental to try and come to some rational and good conclusions. Nobody else seems to be willing to do it. And that's very encouraging to those of us that are somewhat involved with, with uh, the Bigelow Foundation and uh, Mr. Bigelow himself. Yes, yes, very great to have good work in this area. Um, do you feel like you are more associated with this, in other words, in the of something that you're able to right away and uh, head toward the scene? I haven't done very much of that, but I think that may change in the future. At the present time, I've made several trips, not a great many. One of the biggest problems that, that faces me is the fact that I'm informed about these deaths days and in some cases weeks after the animals have been found. Yes. The most important thing that can really be done is to encourage people that have these things happen to them and to their animals is to notify me immediately to make the time lapse between identification of a dead animal and examination much shorter. That would be a great benefit. What about the uh, hematology uh, that's been done? In other words, uh, with what blood there is available for you to look at, uh, have there been any, uh, have you noticed any strange uh, uh, changes at all that you, or anything remarkable about blood? I have not been able to do any immunologic studies on the blood because it's always too old. Uh, and the only findings are the ones that I alluded to at the very beginning of our talk tonight, and that is the finding of evidence of cooked blood. And this is pretty consistent in the animals where the heat has been applied. You can find the, the uh, areas of uh, blood vessels with the typical changes of heat application to hemoglobin. But only in the localized area, in other words? Absolutely, only in the localized area. Hmm. Um, what about other things at the site um, uh, where the animals are found? Uh, have you noted any other unusual occurrences or changes or things in the area where the animal's found? Anything other than the changes in the animal itself? Let me tell you what has been reported, and I haven't been at these areas long enough to witness this on my own, but reported has been the fact that animals that would normally be predators do not go anywhere near the carcasses of the animals that have been killed. Oh, that's odd. And that is unusual. They don't go and attack and eat the remains, they stay away. Even though the entire may be infested with coyotes and so on and other Typical predators, they don't go near the animals. Oh, that's downright bizarre. Well, it's different. 
Well, I should say, I mean, uh, meat is meat, and I wonder what could be different about the carcass of an animal that uh, has been affected, as you've described. Well, I wish you would tell me. I don't know. <laughs> Very odd indeed. What about, um, what about any tracks, any, uh, any indication of the presence of a human or alien or anything else um, around the animal? Well, it's simply not there. Uh, there have been a number of reports where animals have been seen to be taken up off the ground and then dropped after death. After death. And these reports have primarily been as a result of hypnotic regression. But you have to remember one thing that's very important regarding hypnosis, and that is uh, there, there are a tremendous number of myths that are associated with hypnotic regression. And the first one is that, that uh, you can be made to do anything the hypnotherapist wants you to do. Absolutely wrong. Uh, you will never do anything that you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, you're not in a trance. You're in a state of heightened awareness. You're aware of everything going on around you. And even more so than you are in complete conscious state. Thirdly, if the subject is particularly engrossed in the purpose of the hypnosis, the hypnosis session, or if the subject is particularly uh, fond of the hypnotherapist as a friend or somebody that they really trust and they want to please, confabulation under hypnosis is clearly uh, a possibility and can be done very effectively. Yes, I've heard that uh, flights, flights of fancy, uh, actually, under hypnosis, uh, or telling the uh, hypnotherapist what the hypnotherapist wants to hear. Absolutely, and as a therapist, it takes some skill and training to be an effective and a good hypnotherapist to learn not to lead the session and to avoid the pitfalls that would lead to confabulation. And these are not easy. But they're essential, especially when you get in the reports of somebody under hypnosis saying, I saw an animal that was raised up into a blue beam 5,000 feet above the ground and then suddenly dropped. You know, if you get that kind of information, you, one has to look at it with a bit of a jaw to sign it. You have to really consider that this may or may not be true. Well, have the animal carcasses in the cases where there was... a uh allegedly uh, it was dropped. Um, are they typically in a condition you would expect a carcass to be in that was dropped from, say, 5,000 feet? They're not dropped. I, I assume they're probably let down fairly fully. All right. Hey, they're, they're not uh, multi-fractured uh, carcasses with bones broken from head to toe. Uh, the reports that I'm aware of, and I'm aware of two of them, that the animals have been dropped down, not just plucked, but have been dropped down and in one case that I know during therapy, the, uh, the witness actually saw killing and torturing of the animal and described it with some emotion uh, in terms of torturing of the animal. And, um, you know, I don't know whether to believe that or not. I mean, I've, I've seen the tape. You know, it's, it's possible. I'm not denying that it could well be true, but I'm not saying that I know for sure it is. Hmm. All right. Uh, you mentioned black helicopters, and uh, we have a lot of them here in Nevada. Many black unmarked helicopters that zip about. And uh, I see many of them in the little valley where I live, which is close to the test site, not uh, or rather uh, what's, what's called uh, Area 51. And I'm, I'm curious, this moves into the who's doing it category, and the one aspect we did not cover that you offered up was the possibility that our own government, for some unknown reason, is doing all of this. Have you seen any, any evidence uh, that would lead you to that conclusion? Well, I have to behave as a creature of logic. Uh, I think you would be the one that really should be interviewed by me regarding unmarked helicopters. You seem to know a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> but I will tell you frankly that uh, that if you look at the fact that we know, not that we speculate about, then one can come to a reasonable conclusion. And the facts are, first of all, 
that unmarked helicopters seem to predominate around these animal deaths for some unknown reason. Secondly, are these simply a figment of the imagination of subjects, or are these, in fact, reality? Mm -hmm. And if they're the Air Force or the government or something of that type, because all aircraft in the United States have an end number that identifies them, and if they're unmarked, why, they're, they're marked without marking. They have no end number to identify them. And if so, what are they doing there? Are they investigating the mutilations that are being, uh, are being done or are they, in fact, doing them? Uh, I uh, spoke to an investigator just within the last two days or three days that told me that, again, there's been a tremendous number of sightings of helicopters, but in only one instance does he know, and he's been involved in a lot of them, in only one instance does he know about helicopters arriving um, prior to the time of the mutilation. They all seem to occur afterwards. And I, you know, I can't explain that either. The, uh, the question that you have alluded to is, are these helicopters in fact part of a military plot or a governmental uh, behavior to uh, do these mutilations? And if so, why are they doing them? Well, there are a number of different explanations. One of them is, yes, the government is doing them. My question to you is, why? Why in the middle of the field? The government owns a lot of profit. Why couldn't they take animals and do their chemical warfare investigation and so on in a fenced-off area rather than inciting the wrath and the anger and the loss by some of the ranchers? It doesn't make any sense. Well, darn, Doctor. I was going to ask you that. It doesn't make any sense. No, that's right. They have access to all the animals you can imagine they would want. Secondly, does the government have the technology to do all of these things? Uh, and if so, why don't we know about it? I think the government has incredible technology which the public uh, at large are unaware. Right. But it really seems... Uh, problematic for me to envision uh, government personnel being able to kill an animal without blood, with sharp protection, with the typical burn patterns, with denudation of bone, the findings that are so typical, and yet I cannot see how we can do it. Maybe the government has does something that I don't know about, and very likely they may. But even again, presuming they have the technological means, why is an awfully big question. And to me, it's the other thing that has been proposed, and I've heard this said, and I haven't said it, this isn't my thought, but I've heard it said time and time again, that the government is doing this because there is a reality of, of UFOs, and because they recognize the reality of it, they are trying to confuse the public by launching unmarked helicopters to raise questions, to try and muddy the waters with information that isn't true. Now... Uh, I, I feel that if we were, uh, if I were to be asked, and I would, and I would tell anybody this feeling, if I were to be asked, well, do you really believe that uh, UFOs exist? My answer to you is very simple. If you were to take every grain of sand in every beach in the entire world, think of how many grains of sand in one cup. But if you were to take it on every beach in the entire world, that you would not have the number of heavenly bodies in the universe by counting every grain. And I think that could be true. So the pure mathematics, and I've heard Carl Sagan uh, expand on this. Sure. Uh, yeah. How can you rationally say we are the only forms of intelligent life in the entire universe? I think that's just, that, that just really is not a practical statement. Now, if one says, well, are UFOs coming down, and are extraterrestrials and aliens coming down and killing our animals and doing these things, I don't know. I'm not going to say they are, and I'm certainly not going to say they aren't. I really don't know. And why? I don't know that either. We hear that it may be from genetic research. Who knows? They say it may be nutritional. Who knows? I don't. But I think those are plausible explanations that people come up with simply to try and find some reason to explain the unexplainable. Well, if it were nutritional, one would imagine they'd take the uh, the entire carcass or they would excise that nutritional aspect of it, not mutilate it the way you're telling me it's occurring. Well, let me, let me uh, clarify 
your comment okay. in terms of what I look at in my interpretation. Why would they take the meat and take the entire carcass? If they really need a nutritional basis from animals, they seem to thrive on taking fluid because there's no blood around. And maybe it's the blood that they alter in some way. I don't really know. And if that is true, what better animal would there be than a large animal and a large reservoir of them? Cattle would be number one on the list, in my opinion. Okay, again, to the human abductions for a moment, there have been a lot of cases, or I guess some number of cases, of human abductions in which scoop-type samples have also been taken. And do you see any similarity, or have you even studied uh, these cases for similarities to uh, what you've seen done with animals? I have seen a number of subjects with these scoop-like marks on their ankles and their lower extremities. And I have so far only had one person who said to me, that they'd be willing to have me excise it surgically to examine it and see if I could find any unusual findings in it. And I haven't done it because she has not volunteered in reality. Just, you know, I'll give you a piece of tissue. I don't really know that she would. But nonetheless, I have never examined the biopsy of a scoop area on the skin of a human. So I really can't answer that with any expertise. I simply don't know. Uh, my suspicion from looking at them and uh, looking at them carefully is that one would find that the covering, the epithelium or the covering over the area of scoop uh, excision would not be abnormal. The only abnormality that I would... Hello? Hello? No, I thought you were... Uh, I was cut off. No. The only abnormality, abnormality that I can envision would possibly occur would be a thinning of the tissue directly underneath the lining which is either the, what we refer to as the papillary or reticular dermis. But I don't know, because I've never seen it. It would be a very interesting thing to do, and I would like to do it. Indeed. All right, Doctor, we're going to quickly uh, identify the station here at the bottom of the hour. Stand by just one second. Good evening, everybody. My guest is Dr. Al Shula, and we'll be right back. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. It is on a Sunday evening. This is Area 2000. You're listening to Dr. Al Schuler from Colorado, who's done a number of examinations. We're going to find out just how many right now of mutilated animals. Doctor, um, I've been remiss in not asking. Uh, in the years that you have become active, uh, I presume since 1989 in contact by Linda Howe. How many of these uh, mutilations have you uh, encountered, have you examined? I think somewhere in the, in the 30 range. I, I haven't really made a count, but it's somewhere in there, 30 to 40. 30 to 40. The most common aspect of them is the, uh, uh, is the heat or the type of incision or the missing blood, and that, that's the most common thread that runs through them? I would say that is, yes. Now, out of all these that have done, not all of them have, in fact, been uh, unexplained. I mean, a number of them have shown no changing whatsoever. So it's not uniformly that they're all typical. You know, a fair number of them are, but some aren't. Is there anything at all being published in this area, Doctor? Uh, well, not really. I, I'm, I'm currently, I'm currently writing a, a technical, a technical book to do this, and it's a labor of intensity. It's a lot of work. Um, How do you feel about doing that? Uh, uh, again, from, uh, from from the aspect of um, your career, your ongoing career? I, if I were to do this under my name, I would write the book in a completely honest and objective fashion, which is the way I'm writing it. Uh, I'm not going to make speculation. I'm not going to do anything dramatic. I'm certainly not going to 
appeal to the nuttiness of a lot of people that are involved in the field. Mm-hmm. You don't believe me. That That is probably the greatest and the most serious threat, I think, to the entire area of making any effort to study the entire UFO business is that it attracts a lot of crackpots. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are determined to become uh, publicly known and to develop notoriety, and they do indeed accomplish that goal, and they do it at the expense of everybody who tries to do serious uh, research. Yes, you're right. It's a very serious problem. So it's an incredibly serious problem, and if I go ahead and and, uh, and finish writing this, which I'm really planning on doing, it will be uh, a book of, of hopefully, of credibility, honesty, and objectivity. I will present data that is irrefutable. Uh, you cannot deny certain things that I will publish. Well, I will have the proof of what I publish and welcome anybody to see it. So I, I don't think I can be criticized for being honest and telling the truth. Indeed. I think I can be criticized for jumping to conclusions. I'm not going to do that. Well, would, what, kind of ex, uh, what kind of a response, uh, you know what you're writing, uh, what kind of a response would you expect from the scientific world uh, from your publication? Do you, do you expect it to generate uh, more research and consultation? Do you think it will bring a flood of that? Or do you think they will simply absorb it and move on? Or what kind of reaction do you think you'll get? I really don't know. I would hope the former. I would hope that it would inspire other investigators to be involved and to help. That would be my dream. Would you like uh, consultation with other people who have perhaps um, also quietly for years done the same sort of thing because one one could guess there are quite a number of people like that since there have been so many incidents uh, perhaps not people that have followed it and become involved as you have but people who have done singular or even multiple uh, examinations and, and have simply kept their mouths shut I would welcome it it would be great have you, uh, other than this program that you're now on, uh, run any uh, public work like this that you have on radio or television uh, uh, otherwise? Well, yeah. 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 And, uh, and why do you find that people do come to you um, after these sorts of appearances? Not really. I, I haven't yet. Um, and... I would like to have some credible people approach me and be willing to help because that would be very, I think it would be very good scientifically and I, I certainly think that scientific endeavor by more than one investigator would give a lot more treatment to all of them. Without asking you uh, for specifics because when I ask my question, it would be obvious why you would not give them, but is there anything that you have encountered that you would be hesitant to or would not even talk about here? Yeah. I had a feeling there might be. Uh, is, uh, is this something that would be contained in the, in the book or something that you will hold on to? Well, hold on to it. Uh, well, um, all right, I guess I'll just have to let you hold on to this. <laughs> probably should have asked the question. Now I'm dying of curiosity. <laughs> oh, why don't you call me in my private line and we can talk about it. <laughs> all right. Um, do you continue to consult closely with uh, with Linda Howe? Uh, all right. What I would like to do, Doctor, if I can, is open some telephone lines and... Um, and uh, perhaps try a few questions from the audience. Would you be up for that? Sure. All right. Uh, let's do that then. Uh, in the metropolitan area of Las Vegas, our number is 383-8255-8255. Toll free outside the state, it's 1-800-338-8255. The wild card direct dial lines are area code 702 385 
7214-7214. And finally, if you have never called the program at all, you are, of course, welcome at area code 702-385-7213. My guest is Dr. Alt Schuler, and uh, he's in Colorado. And if you would like to ask a question, we are at your disposal. <laughs> Wild card line three, you're on the air uh, with Dr. Al Schuler. Uh, yes, I'm particularly interested in uh, whether there's a signature to the to the uh, cooking of the blood, the burn marks, uh, the cutting tools that might have been used in uh, in all of the uh, earthly uh, technology. Uh, whatever tools are used, I would assume, would have some kind of signature. Could you comment on that, please? All right. Will there have been any studies along that line that you may have done? All right, thank you. Uh, any type of signature, doctor? Not really. I think uh, when you're referring to signature, you're referring to some identification uh, of the procedure. The There certainly are signatures in that sense by human technology, for example, doing what we refer to as loop procedures that are, are relatively new in the last five years or so for uh, removal of tissue in uh, gynecologic practice. Mm -hmm. It's pretty typical what you see. Again, you get application of heat and very typical kind of findings. Some of these are precisely the kind of findings that you find in, in the animals that have been dissected. Um, laser that is used in, in human surgery a great deal today, in fact, very, very commonly, has a, a signature of its own in terms of changes that are identified microscopically, and these are not found in the animal. These changes are very different because it's a different kind of heat and it's uh, over a shorter period of time, apparently, and at a significantly higher temperature, very likely. Uh, also, I wanted to follow up. Um, you mentioned that you took photographs of the original 1967 incident that got you involved in all this, and then did not have them developed, but alluded to the fact that years later, you may have uh, uh, you may have retrieved them. Uh, is that the case? That's correct. So you have those photographs now. I do. Yes, I do have them. Um, would they be something you'd publish w with your book? Very likely, yes. All right, very good. Uh, good evening on the first time caller line. You're on the air with the... Oh, sorry about that, Doctor. Wild card line three, you're on the air with Dr. Alshuler. Hi. Hello there. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Reno. Reno, okay. Right. My question has to do, um, he mentioned that the uh, predators left the animals alone that had been mutilated. My question has to do with what about insects? Do they uh, come in and uh, cover the animals? That's a good question, actually. Yes, uh, Doctor, thank you. Uh, yes, what about that? The answer is both I don't mean to comment on any specific investment for even after looking at a now that the majority of the veterinary medical publications regarding of large animal predators and this was a great surprise. By the way, that's a lot of work in the book. Well, I didn't find a lot of them. I have kind of looked at this part of the reason I saw about it in town. Uh, and debating whether to really uh, talk about mutilations or simple animal death. I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm, I haven't come up with a title yet. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, good evening. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Al Schuler. Yeah, good evening. Um, where, where are you, sir? I'm in Henderson, Henderson. And my question has to do with um, the helicopters that um, apparently monitor the sighting or the mutilization. Um, it is my understanding that they may be controlled by the Navy as opposed to the United States Air Force. Do you have any comment or any insight into that, please? All right, thank you. 
I've heard uh, I've heard the same thing. Oh, you have. Yes. Uh, but I really don't know. I'll tell you. I think really uh, that Linda Howe probably would know more about this and be able to comment on it with greater expertise and knowledge than I. Um, I know several people that have particularly cited these uh, helicopters, and there's one individual in in uh, the Alamosa area, actually, who's been very involved and who I've been in touch with a great deal, who has seen a lot of them, and he has mentioned to me that they're primarily Navy. And I think they may well be. I, I don't know. They may be military. I don't know who they are. There never has been any contact with the... Uh uh, with anybody in these helicopters, or or known landing of one in the area of one of these mutilations, has there, Doctor? Not contact, but I do know ranchers that have shot, in fact, I've met ranchers that have shot at the helicopter <laughs> and have heard their bullets hit the helicopter. So they know they've hit them, uh, but they've never crashed and... Uh, Gee, that's quite an action to take. I mean, uh, one one would presume, even without a tail number, that it's a terrestrial origin of the craft, and pull out your gun and start firing it at the, at the thing is uh, quite incredible. Well, you know, the ranchers were very upset about this. Back in the early 70s, when there were uh, quite a few of the mutilations taking place in Los Animas County down in, in Colorado, the ranchers would shoot at any airplane that flew by. Oh, yeah. oh boy. Uh, well, that brings on another question, Doctor, before I let it slide. Um, that is the frequency of these incidences uh, with regard to geographic location. Now, obviously, there's more farming in the Midwest and West uh, and cattle ranching and so forth. But is there, is there any one particular area more frequently uh, plagued with this sort of thing than another? As you mentioned earlier, there seems to be a cyclical uh, phenomenon regarding the event. Mm -hmm. There also happens to be a geographic uh, frequency that occurs at different times. For example, Colorado was very heavily set uh, 20 years ago. Idaho, State of Washington, State of Oregon, Texas, Florida, Oklahoma. Well, that, that was going to be next. Yes, they've been widespread, they've been pandemic. I've had a number of, of uh, uh, sessions that have been sent to me from British Columbia and from Alberta, Canada. They have been reported all over the world, all over Europe, Asia. Uh, it's a pandemic of uh, phenomena. It is just limited to Colorado, I assure you. All right. Very good. Good evening. On the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Outschuler. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, Utah, California, by San Bernardino. You cut. All right. Turn your radio off. All right. All right. It's off. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, my question to the doctor is, under hypnosis, did uh, he discover that any persons or agencies who may have influenced his decision to remain silent, too. Have you been ever contacted by the uh, MIB? Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, the first question I like. Um, was there anything in the, uh, in, in the hip, uh, hypnosis sections, se sessions, uh, Doctor, that you went through that would indicate any outside influence? Uh, not really. The, I, let me... Uh, well, I will just tell you very briefly that, that I've, uh, I've had uh, really three episodes that have been fairly widely uh, uh, set apart in terms of time over the last four years. Uh, and I needn't really tell you who the hypotherapists were, but I know that you recognize the names if I were to say them. Nonetheless, I will tell you that the experiences for me were not pleasant. They were... I would say, to put it mildly, uh, traumatic enough for me that I swear I'd never do it again. Um, I don't really recall, in fact, I, I recall everything that happened during the sessions, but not any outside influence. Uh, I 
So we'll answer the second question by not asking. You don't mind. That's quite all right. We'll leave them intrigued. Line two, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Outshuler. Yeah, as an uh, avid outdoorsman, I go hunting in southern Nevada quite often in uh, the central part. Uh, is it only the uh, cattle that seem to be uh, mutilated, or could it be uh, deer also? Okay, well, we have, in effect, answered that, but listen on the air. Uh, doctor, again... Uh, it's been quite a range of animals, though more frequently cattle and horses. Is that about right? Correct. But deer have clearly been involved. Deer have clearly been involved. Um, all right, fine. Let's keep moving. Good, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Altshuler in Las Vegas. Where are you calling from, please? Poco loco, poco loco. Nowhere at all. Line three, you're on the air with Dr. Altshuler. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, is there any strange smell uh, order connected to these? Uh, I guess that's a reasonable question. I think it is. Uh, how about that, Doctor? No, not real. Um, as a matter of fact, there's, there's a, the peculiarity is really the, uh, the lack of odor. Hmm. A lack of odor. Right. Um, and, and usually you're finding these animals uh, after, after some time after the incident. Uh, how, how would you medically account for that? I really cannot because the animals that the uh, case that I did examine that was pretty obviously predator had a significant odor to it. I can assure you. So uh, there was a normal deterioration. Well, for there not to be an odor, and I'm not a doctor, <laughs> you would you would have to presume that a a normal deterioration after death was not occurring. Well, that may be a, a valid conclusion. I I think that. Uh, I have not examined enough animals at the site to really tell you from my own experience, but this is what I've heard, and I can only repeat that, but that's not first-hand evidence for me. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, good evening. You're on the air uh, with Dr. Outshuler in Las Vegas. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, San Diego. San Diego. All right. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Well, I was wondering uh, if any of these mutilations have happened to any sea animals. Oh. Huh. That is a, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, doctor, what about that? Sea animals? I've, I've asked the same question, and I have been told by, uh, by Linda Howe that there have been such reports. I don't know of them, and they haven't been brought to my attention, but I understand that there have been. Fascinating. So there's really, all, though there are certain concentrations, uh, there, there's, there's no specific... Uh, area of concentration. In other words, in the sea, on land? Not, not really. And I really would have to defer to Linda's expertise because she knows, uh, she has uh, kept a little bit more of, a, of an inventory record of these unusual mutilations than I have. Uh, but as I recall talking to her some time ago, that there was an incident or several of them uh, of sea animals, but I just can't give you any particulars. I don't really know. All right. Line, line one, you're on the air with Dr. Altshuler. Good evening. Yes, I'd like to ask the doctor, first of all, how does he spell his name? All right. Um, I, I can help you out there, or he can help you out. Do you have a question that goes beyond that? Yes, I do. But I'd like to, I'm wondering, when he mentions the lack of odor on these animals and also uh, the fact that a uh, great deal of the blood is missing. I'm assuming he's saying it's missing when there's uh, they take these uh, the parts. But what I'd like to know is, has anyone ever uh, gone ahead and uh, uh, cut one of the animals up and, and taken pieces of the carcasses and taken them quite a distance away from where they were found and left them where they could readily be eaten by predators just to see if they would be uh, eaten by predators? All right. Uh, we'll ask that and spell his name for you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me give it, if I'm wrong, doctor, uh, correct me. It's John H., middle initial H, last name A-L-T as in Tom, S-H-U-L-E-R. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, doctor. Now, with regard to her question... Uh, it is so odd that uh, predators have not approached the carcass. Have you tried anything of that sort? Well, I haven't personally uh, tried it, but uh, I, will, uh, I will tell you that the following tale. Uh, I don't know of anybody that have taken the animals after they've been found dead and 
move them to a another area that is known to be loaded with predators to see if they come near the animal. I don't know anybody that's ever done that. And that really is not a bad idea. I, I think that's certainly a, a thing that should be done. However, I know of one of the more recent uh, mutilations that took place in Colorado in the Alamos area with cattle. Uh, it was in a ranch where this particular rancher has now lost seven uh, seven cows, mm -hmm. which has been an expensive and devastating event for him. And uh, the last one, there were coyotes that came within, I don't know what the range, I can't give you the exact feet, but very close to the, the carcass. Maybe 20 or 30 people would not go to the carcass itself. And they had seen the coyotes, and they'd seen them come up and then stop, and not as many close Why? I don't know, but that's been an observation by Chris who told me about it, and I think he's really honest. I think he, he knows. He knows the ranch is doing quite well. Well, that's really bizarre and deserves more investigation. No question about that. Good evening. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Al Shuler. Yes, hi. Oh. Um, I'll tell you, I think that the government is doing it, and the reason I say that is because I know that they have UFOs because I was stationed at Dugway Proving Ground, and there's a mountain there called Dean Mountain, and I used to see the UFOs go down behind Dean Mountain, and one night uh, a friend of mine and I were out at about midnight on a motorcycle, and we went up to the top of Dean Mountain and looked down into the valley where the UFO had just gone into, and there was nothing there, so that tells me that somewhere down there in that valley, that valley opened up and swallowed that UFO, and that was right on a military base. So you can't tell me that the military does not have UFOs. I wouldn't tell you that, please. I know you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you calling? You would. Where are you calling from? Uh, California. California. All right. Well, do you have any questions for the doctor? No. I, I don't really have heard about these mutilations for years, but uh, ha has anything like that been done to humans? All right. Thank you. Um, well... In a sense, I guess the answer would be yes. Uh, we've already commented on some of the scoop marks uh, that have been observed on people who have claimed to be abducted. Um, is there anything beyond scoop marks that is, is to be observed, uh, Doctor, about human abductions? Yes, uh, there are. I'd like to just have one quick editorial comment on uh, the uh, lady's comment. I think one of the questions that, uh, that has come to her mind is, if mutilations have occurred to humans, have they resulted in human death? Because that's more frequently what one would think of. Well, have we found any in the middle of fields, Doctor? Oh, well, not to my knowledge, but I understand. And again, I am quoting Linda, and I wish that she would be able to be on the program along with me because it would be uh, very valuable to have her input and hear her expertise. And I think she knows of some cases where human mutilation or human death, I would rather say, have taken place under bizarre, unusual, similar circumstances. Now, in terms of your comment of have there been any other things that have occurred to humans that are really not explained, it really comes in the area of, of three things. One is the scoop mark. And I'm not talking about the psychological effects of abduction and so on, that this has been eloquently explained by a number of other people and left leaders that have done a lot of work in the abduction area. The second one is the area in which uh, people have had, quote, implants. And there have been a number of, I would like to say, uh, claims of implants. And uh, I I saw a presentation by a noted author in the area of, of uh, UFO work who came to himself to have had an implant, and when he showed this CAT scan on the screen, I couldn't see it. Uh, I, it could have easily been a, a part of a, a bone that was a little bit thickened. Sure. I couldn't, I wasn't convinced that he had an implant at all, but he claimed, he swore up and down he did. There have been a lot of people that have claimed that have had implants and have had nosebleeds the following uh, following the event of implantation of an implant. Who knows what for? Nobody really knows. Doctor, we are utterly out of time. Okay. Uh, you have been a pleasure to interview. 
and uh, I would hope that perhaps at some future date I might do it again, perhaps with Linda Howe. That would be very nice. I'd look forward to that. Doctor, thank you. All right, well, thank you, and have a good evening. You too, sir. Um, that's uh, a Dr. Uh, Altshuler, Altshuler, I guess it is, and uh, from Colorado. And I want to repeat this announcement now. Uh, all good things must come to an end. And so it is, sadly, with Area 2000. The Bigelow Foundation has announced it will cease funding the program as of February 6th. Therefore, that will be the last Area 2000. The reason for the series ending at this point is a concern that guests of the same caliber are increasingly difficult to find. If you'd like to express your feelings to the Foundation on this announcement, please call the Bigelow Foundation at area code 702-456-1606 or write the Bigelow Foundation at 4640 Southeastern Las Vegas, Nevada. We are uh, thinking very hard about syndicating another program, not Area 2000. We would rename it. Uh, if you have interest in getting such a program on your radio station, please contact the CBC Radio Network. Their number is area code 503. 664-8829. Repeating the number for the CBC Radio Network. We're thinking of syndicating it there. Area code 503-664-8829. I'm Art Bell. Thank you for being here, and good night. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000, a program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach for discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation, please call during the week between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., area code 702-456-1606. Ask for Angela Thompson. That's area code 702-456-1606. And be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000. Welcome to Area 2000. This program introduces our listeners to the scientific approach to discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation during the work week, call Angela Thompson between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. at area code 702-456-1606. That's Angela Thompson at area code 702-456-1606. And now, Area 2000. Good evening. Welcome to another Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. And I want to remind our audience, uh, following this Area 2000, there will only be two more. They will occur on January 30th and February 6th. And what's going to occur next is going to be, uh, we're going to do another show, which we have now named Dreamland, and it will be a syndicated program, and you should contact your local affiliates about that. It will be available toward the end of February. So good evening, everybody. Welcome to the program. So glad to have you here. Uh, we're, we do have, fortunately, uh, Linda Howe with us this weekend. Then we'll spe uh, be speaking with uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, who will speak on a couple of subjects, uh, including UFOs, abduction research, and reincarnation. And he tells me he can mix them a little bit. So we'll get to that shortly right now. To Boulder, Colorado the home of the National Bureau of Standards, WWV, which is uh, also the temporary home of Linda Howe. So out to Linda. Linda Howe, good evening. Hi, Art. Hi. I'm glad to be back. It was a, a very uh, rough week and a half. My mother has been very ill, uh, but things have progressed, and I'm glad to be back on Area 2000. And while I have been uh, gone the last week and a half, um, I have been trying to catch up on some very interesting news developments, and uh, sort of at the top of my list is coming up Tuesday, January 25th, day after tomorrow, there will be a launch of a Titan 11G rocket. 
that will carry an unusual spacecraft called Clementine toward the moon. Clementine was designed and built by the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, also known as BMDO, which was formerly known as the Strategic Defense Initiative, or our Star Wars SCI program, which has now evolved and changed its name to the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization. Hmm. The Clementine mission is to map the entire surface of the moon and to study an asteroid called 1620 Geographos. I think that a very interesting footnote is that in the current astronomy magazine, they make the point that we have a clearer surface mapping of the planet Venus than we do of our own moon, which is only 240 million miles away. And it's also been a question in my mind, what stops our returning to the moon to do further exploration and mapping uh, after the Apollo program uh, ended in the uh, 60s to the early 70s. Is the mission defined beyond the mapping, Linda? Well, the development of Clementine began in 1991 when NASA was suddenly reported to be concerned about the possibility of asteroids impacting our Earth with destructive force. Mm -hmm. NASA organized a study then called Space Guard to plot orbits of any possible Earth-crossing asteroids and, in fact, uh, the then uh, sitting vice president uh, was put ahead, was put in charge of one of those programs to study the possibility that an asteroid uh, might impact with our planet and cause a lot of destruction. Well, one such asteroid that has been identified as having an Earth-crossing orbit, not meaning that it is absolutely on target with the Earth, but that periodically it comes close to the Earth and is of some concern, this is 1620 Geographos. In August of 1994, eight months from now, this asteroid will be the closest to Earth that it has been for a long time, about four million miles away. And at that time, the Clementine spacecraft is supposed to rendezvous and study the asteroid, which is especially interesting because it varies in brightness every five hours. It must be some angular piece of something that is tumbling and reflects the sunlight in different uh, ways in a five-hour period. Hmm. Well, this past week, a source close to the uh, NASA space program and the astronaut training program said, and this is a quote, I can tell you right now there are structures on the moon and mining on the moon, unquote. There is no more elaboration or detail beyond that sentence and I have heard allusions like this before, and it raises the question, is it possible that Clementine is part of the former SDI program, which we call Star Wars, because our government is trying to study another intelligence's activities on our moon? I don't know the answer for sure, but I know that I and others have had these provocative statements shared with us over the last decade about these structures and mining on the moon, and the question is, if there are structures, and there is mining, who is there, and what are they doing? Right, yes. Now, government knowledge about an alien presence interacting with our Earth might have begun as long ago as 1947 or even earlier, and the 1947 beginning of this is that alleged crash of a some kind of uh, disk or something silver north of Roswell, New Mexico. Last summer, United States Representative Steve Schiff of New Mexico, who is a Republican, had so many inquiries coming to his office in the form of telephone calls and mail that he contacted by letter Secretary of Defense Les Aspen and asked for more definitive information about these allegations of an extraterrestrial craft being found on the Brazo Ranch near Corona, New Mexico. When Representative Schiff did not receive an adequate response, he went to the General Accounting Office, which is the congressional investigative arm in our government, and he asked the GAO to put pressure on the Pentagon for answers. On January 12th of this year, this month, Representative Schiff was quoted in the Dallas newspaper as saying, it's the Dallas News, Dallas, Texas newspaper, as saying that both he and the GAO are frustrated by the Pentagon, and this was the quote in the news story, stonewalling. The refusal since June of 1993 to provide any information about the alleged Roswell crash. Representative Schiff says that he does not know what crashed, but, and this is a quote from the news article, 
The issue is whether the government of the United States has been forthright with the American people, unquote, and if not, why not? Linda, I don't know whether you knew it or not, but that made the front page of the Al Albuquerque uh, newspaper. No, I did not know. I'm getting this information from the Dallas News. I'm glad to hear it did make it. It should make the front page of the Albuquerque newspaper. Well, it did, and I've got a copy, which I'd be happy to share with you. Great. Well, now uh, Representative Schiff uh, says he wants to know why there appears now to be even uh, stonewalling on his inquiries as a representative. He wants to know why there is a cover-up, and he says now the Government Accounting Office itself is curious about why the Pentagon is quote-unquote stonewalling and has not responded. I would say stay tuned for more developments on this story about congressional efforts to learn information not only about the 1947 Roswell crash, but other aspects that the military and other people have been trying to report over the last few decades about their own involvement with other kinds of alleged craft, uh, crash disks. This could be the beginning or the cracking at least of part of this story. Um, and we'll see as we move along, uh, maybe into dreamland, uh, how this begins to unfold, not only with the United States representatives' uh, efforts, but also uh, the uh, Sergeant uh, Clifford Stone that I had on uh, Area 2000 three weeks ago. Well, it looks like exciting times are ahead. There's a lot going on. Well, and residents in the San Luis Valley here in Colorado have been reporting strange moving lights above the Sangre de Cristo Mountains again very similar to the reports in September 1967 when that Appaloosa mare named Lady was found dead and stripped of flesh from the neck up. On December 13th, some witnesses reported that a large round light went from a position in the sky down into the ground, which I had myself uh, heard many reports from law enforcement as they tried to describe what they were encountering in the 70s in their efforts to investigate mutilation. And the next morning, on December 14th, which is now about a month and a week or so ago, near Eagle, Colorado, between Vail and Glenwood Springs, on the ranch of Lloyd Gerard, two animals were found mutilated. Mm. One was a young two-year-old female cow dead, and the only thing that had been excised from the cow's body was an, what the rancher said was an eight-inch deep plug of tissue that had been removed from the brisket something like a biopsy plug. There was no blood, there were no tracks, and that same day, another rancher in Costilla County, Colorado, 40 miles north of New Mexico, found a 1,700-pound bull dead with its testicles and rectum removed. No blood, no tracks, and up to a week after the discovery, predator tracks came up to within 8 to 10 feet of the body, but the bull has remained untouched. This animal was examined by a veterinarian who said he could not determine the cause of death. Dr. John Altshuler, uh, the pathologist and hematologist in Denver who was on Area 2000 last week and who has uh, worked with me since 1989 to examine the tissue from some of these animals, did receive four excision samples from the bull and confirmed that under a microscope they had been cut with high heat. In the month before December, there were two other mutilations in the Eagle, Colorado area, and in one of those cases, extremely unusual, uh, this was investigated by the Eagle County Sheriff. Uh, two ranchers came uh, to uh, discuss this particular animal, and this was reported by the Eagle Valley Enterprise newspaper that a cow, a female cow, was found inside of a potato barn where the animal should not have been and had never been before. And when they examined it, one side of the jaw, the flesh was completely stripped, and the flesh was stripped halfway down the neck, similar to Lady in 1967. And in the removal of the tissue in the neck, they could clearly see that the esophagus and the trachea were also missing in that neck. And this has been reported in several animals now in my file since 1989, the removal of trachea and esophagus for whatever reason. So in this uh, area of Casilla County up into the San Luis Valley, there have been many reports of amber lights, moving amber lights, all kinds of varying kinds of what we would call unidentified flying objects, and perhaps the most interesting report, and I will end on this mystery, because as of today, it remains a mystery, but on January 12th, 
NORAD contacted the Rio Grande Sheriff's Office and said that from one of our infrared satellites, then moving over the southern Colorado and area, however large that area is, that they had what was called a heat bloom, meaning a bloom of color on the infrared image, and said there was a significant explosion in the San Luis Valley. The Rio Grande Sheriff's Office and others went into the valley to investigate. As of uh, this uh, end of this week, Valley Courier newspaper had reported three stories on this, trying to find out what had happened. And as of today, there is no answer. What is it that NORAD picked up on infrared satellite over the San Luis Valley on January 12th that uh, law enforcement has not have not been able to find an actual explosion? And three days later, on January 15th, three witnesses reported to the newspaper and to other investigators that there were two bright amber objects moving at night over the valley from Monte Vista South in the generally the same area. Linda, I wonder how we could follow up on that, how, how to get more information. That's fascinating. Well, it is, and I will continue. Uh, in fact, I talked with uh, a reporter uh, tonight uh, down in the uh, San Luis Valley. He has sent me a package of photographs and other reports and newspaper articles, and it will be on my desk when I finally, if I can get back into Philadelphia because of all the ice and the snow, but um, I plan to be back there at the end of this week, and uh, hopefully next Sunday I can even bring you more uh, information about it. All right. Well, hopefully you make it home very safely, and uh, it's good. I'm sure glad you made it this week, uh, Linda, and, and, I, and I wish the best, and I know everybody does for your family. Well, thank you very much, and uh, life must go on, and uh, I'm glad we're back, and uh, my mom is at least better. Linda, thank you. Thank you, Art. Take care. Bye. That's Linda Howe uh, from Boulder, Colorado, this evening, and uh, then hopefully next week back home in Philadelphia. And it is my understanding she will continue with us, by the way, in the uh, new program coming up called Dreamland. All right, now, uh, I think you'll find this a fascinating segment this evening. Dr. Leo Sprinkle is a Ph.D., Professor Emeritus uh, Counseling Services at the University of Wyoming, he has many uh, professional uh, qualifications and uh, has wor worked in all kinds of uh, uh, areas of psychology. He has worked in areas uh, touching on ESP, hypnosis, reincarnation, UFO research. He has participated in many regional and national television programs, including ABC Television. That's incredible. NBC's Tom Snyder Tomorrow Show. He's been invited to speak at several international conferences. He and his family have developed and marketed a booklet and videotape on self-hypnosis procedures entitled Transforming to Words Yourself. From Laramie, Wyoming, here is Dr. Leo Sprinkle. Dr. Sprinkle, good evening. Good evening, Art. Welcome to Area 2000. Thank you. Uh, is that indeed where you are in Laramie? In Laramie, Wyoming, right. It is beautiful country. It is a little cool this time of the year, but a uh, very nice day today. Um, doctor, I'm not sure exactly where to start with you. Um, I would think perhaps in the in the reincarnation area, if you wouldn't mind. All right. Um, what research have you done with respect to reincarnation, and what uh, uh, what have you come to accept as a result of whatever you've learned? Well, I started somewhat informally in the 60s uh, because of some uh, client came in with concerns about uh, why was young, a young man afraid of dogs, why was a young woman afraid of drowning, and so forth. And uh, when I gave them hypnotic subject, uh, suggestions to go back to the earliest uh, time when they were experiencing these concerns, they slipped into what seemed to be a past life. Um, I didn't accept it in, in those days. I thought it was nonsense. Uh, but I listened to them, and I tried to work with them, and I found out that they got better, and so I said, well, even if it's nonsense, it's uh, pragmatically helpful to the people. Uh, and so I kept uh, uh, trying to read and learn more that I could, and including uh, Stevenson's 1966 book, uh, Cases uh, Possibly Suggestive Reincarnation, and I became uh, interested, began to explore my own uh, impressions of possible past life, but I was still skeptical about uh, subjective views. 
Yeah. 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 Doctor, if I can stop you for just a second. You said you uh, regressed patients, and then they and you noted they went in, or seemed to go into prior lives. What what led you to that conclusion, and how did that occur if you were not setting out in a hypnotic session to do that? Well, for example, a young man uh, asked me if I could help him figure out why he was afraid of dogs. And so I said, well, sure, we can provide you with hypnotic suggestions to go back to age 10 or 8, 6, 4, find out if you were bitten by a dog or barked by a dog or some uh, kind of traumatic event, and we can explore it, help you to ease the... Uh, fear or the uh, anguish about the experience and then uh, release yourself from this fear, which is standard practice for people with phob uh, phobic uh, reactions. Sure. And uh, when I gave the suggestion to go back to various uh, events earlier, nothing was, uh, was found, and so I became somewhat impatient, and I gave him the suggestion, go back to the earliest time having to do with your fear of dogs, and he went back to what seemed to be an experience as a medieval... Uh, woodsman in Europe uh, who was being chased by uh, wolves, pulled down and eaten alive. And uh, he was groaning and moaning. He was obviously in great discomfort. Uh, and I suggested he come back to the normal estate. He said, no, no, leave me alone. And he worked it through and uh, afterwards said, thank you very much, shook my hands, walked out of the <laughs> office saying he now understood why he was afraid of uh, dogs. How were you able to place, uh, place him in, in another life? And, and I can imagine at that moment, when you realized what it was, however it was you realized it, it must have been sort of chilling. Yes, uh, because I didn't uh, accept the notion of reincarnation, and yet I accepted the notion that he was very emotionally upset and that he was responding to my uh, suggestions, responding to questions. <clears throat> so I just kept it uh, as an uncertain uh, uh, but helpful uh, outcome to him. And then somewhat later a young woman came in and asking me to help her figure out why she was afraid of drowning. Uh, and uh, I gave her the same spiel, you know, we'll go back to age earlier times. And uh, so I gave her suggestions to review experiences of age 10 and 8, 6, 4, 2, nothing that we could come up with, thinking that maybe she was uh, an infant uh, dropped by her mother in a bassinet or something. I once more gave the suggestion, go back to the earliest time having to do with your fear of drowning. And she uh, started to groan and moan, almost falling out of her chair. Uh, she pictured herself as a man, a pirate, uh, who was so obnoxious that uh, his fellows uh, keelhauled him, uh, pulling him behind the ship on a rope, almost drowning over and over and over. Can I ask a couple of questions? When, when she slipped into that, or the, the first patient you had, uh, were there any notable changes in their manner of speech, or um, uh, exactly how did you say to yourself, good Lord, we're not in this life, we're in some other life. Uh, what did that for you? Well, yes, it's not only their mannerisms and their bodily behavior, but also uh, their, their talk. Uh, not so much different in the sense that it was uh, a uh, theatrical dr a drama, although uh, I thought to myself, uh, maybe they're conning me, maybe they are an actor or actress. But in, in the 60s, that just wasn't a uh, likely thing to happen. And so I found out later, as I read uh, uh, other reports from uh, other psychologists and psychiatrists, that uh, this is what many people had found, that as they gave these kinds of suggestions, that people spontaneously slipped into what they felt was a past life experience. So I began to uh, correspond with Dr. Helen Wambach, a psychologist out in uh, California, and went out there during an American Psychological Association meeting and talked with her about her data from uh, workshops. And so in 1978, joined uh, a couple of dozen people who were learning how to, to uh, present these workshops. And over the last 15 years, my wife and I put on 155 workshops or so to about 2,000 people. And so along with individual hypnosis sessions, I've also had the benefit of uh, uh, reading the reports from people who participate in the workshops. and. Even though there's a doubt and uncertainty about the images, it's uh, quite apparent to me that most people are able to recall what seems to be uh, past life experiences mm -hmm. and to recognize that, uh, uh, that these impressions are so significant to them that, they, uh, whether, that whether they believe or do not believe in reincarnation, they recognize that their inner world is much more complex than they previously believed. How many people, without the aid of hypnosis, Dr. Sprinkle, uh, 
do you suppose become consciously aware of aspects of a prior life? I say again, consciously. People report these poets and authors, Mark Twain, uh, many, many others. A book by Head and Cranston called Reincarnation and World Thought provides a series of reports by people who, uh, during uh, reverie or daydreaming uh, or dreams or meditation, whatever, recall uh, what they feel are impressions of, of uh, other lives uh, so that it uh, may or may not occur on the basis of hypnosis alone. Uh, one expert, Dr. Uh, Stevenson, professor of psychiatry at uh, University of Virginia, he's skeptical uh, of uh, use of hypnosis for adults. Uh, however, he does think that children uh, spontaneously recall uh, other lifetimes, and he's written several books on his studies of uh, children throughout the, the world. Well, that, that would make sense, wouldn't it, since it would be a fresher mm -hmm. memory, if you could say that. Be, especially between two and five, six, uh, mm -hmm. those years where children are less uh, constricted uh, in terms of uh, what they distinguish between uh, something that's happening inside or outside. So they seem to be much more willing to talk about those experiences. A nice little book by Peterson called uh, Secret Life of Kids that describes the, the paranormal psychic experiences of youngsters and how parents and teachers can uh, help them deal with these experiences. All right, Doctor, hold for just one second uh, right. while we ID the station here. You're listening to Dr. Leo Sprinkle. This, of course, is Area 2000, 8.30 Pacific Time. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening. Welcome back. This, of course, is Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. My guest is Dr. Leo Sprinkle. And right now the subject is uh, reincarnation. Dr. Sprinkle, um, with all the research you've done and all the studying you've done on this subject, how sure are you personally that reincarnation is a fact? I uh, always give myself a little uh, skepti uh, skeptical view about it. If, if I'm on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd say 9. A 9. Uh, because I recognize the possibility that I may be wrong, uh, that the process may be somewhat different than I envision it to be. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of uh, philosophy, in terms of impact upon a person's life, uh, I'm very impressed with what happens when a person... Uh, takes the philosophy uh, of reincarnationism uh, because it seems as if it uh, provides a person with uh, a view of being uh, a little more kind, a little more gentle towards others because whatever we send out, if we send out hate and violence, we're likely to get it back. If we send out love and compassion, we're likely to get that back. So whether it's true or not, I like the uh, philosophy of reincarnation. Well, it is. It is, it is a nice one. When you say we get it back, uh, do you mean in this lifetime or ultimately? Necessarily. It seems like it's a long-range yeah. justice. Yeah. It's a puzzle about that when I was a kid. You know, if God is good and God is loved, then how can uh, terrible things happen? Well, now I can see experiences in terms of people's lives that would suggest uh, over a period of several lifetimes that uh, whatever we send out, we get back. Or as the biblical phrase, as we so shall we reap. I don't want to get off on this, but I am curious how you reconcile this with uh, uh, Christianity's view of the uh, of what happens to the soul. Uh, do you find, let me just ask, is there is there some way to reconcile uh, the two? Oh, yes. Uh, a book uh, by McGregor uh, is a good one, Reincarnation in Christianity. Uh, apparently the early Christians, like the uh, Jews, accepted reincarnation. Uh, but then the later Christians uh, in time of Rome, 523 A.D., it seemed as if the uh, changing views uh, about uh, the resurrection versus reincarnation seemed to occur uh, when the priests uh, sought to have more power. Uh, and uh, so those Christians who accepted reincarnation, those who did not, uh, were at odds and... Uh, and so one group of Christians killed out the other group of Christians. Uh, huh. Good, well, good compassionate uh, attitudes. I guess in one sense, um, one could imagine that uh, the behavior in this lifetime, to connect it with something you said earlier, w could in effect produce a, uh, a heaven or a hell in the next lifetime or 
some succeeding lifetime? Or in this lifetime. You now Jesus uh, was uh, quoted as saying to the woman at the well, the kingdom of heaven is within. It may well be that we create uh, within ourselves yes. uh, each lifetime what our concepts are about heaven and hell. Yes. All right. Um, I want to hopscotch around a little bit. Uh, I see here you've done some research uh, on ESP. Yes, uh, back in the 60s when I was at the University of North Dakota, I assisted a, a doctoral student with his, uh, or a master's student, he went later went on for doctorate, uh, with his study and uh, done a few studies, uh, various kinds, uh, laboratory studies, but the primary interest has been in the application of these experiences to people's lives. Uh, I have had one very strong experience with ESP, uh, doctor. It's only occurred once in my life but it was unmistakable. And what's always, what I've always found curious is uh, whether or not uh, a person with this ability can nurture it, whether there are ways to improve one's ESP. Mm -hmm. uh, has there been any work done along those lines? Uh, Dr. Charlie Tart, uh, Charles uh, Onerton, many others uh, have conducted studies uh, showing that, uh, like most uh, human abilities, uh, sustained uh, and uh, disciplined approaches can be very helpful to people who are seeking to increase their ability, whether it's in regard to psychokinetic effects or telepathy or clairvoyance, uh, precognition. It seems as if uh, reinforcement of, uh, uh, of behaviors, just like any other learning skill, seems to improve the uh, ability. Well, my limited, my little experience came on me and I had no control over it and I couldn't stop it. When it went away, it went away and uh, I've never been able to get it back. <laughs> yeah, I so I, I have no idea what I did to produce it. I was in, no, in, in a uh, perfectly reasonable, awake, conscious daytime state when it occurred and um, afterwards I was kind of shaken but otherwise normal. And so uh, what kind of state does one get in to encourage such an such uh, happening? Now, for most people, uh, it's spontaneous, and uh, they're not sure exactly what happened, you know, like a near-death experience, out-of-body experience, uh, or an accident, illness. Uh, but for some people, through meditation and self-hypnosis, mm -hmm. are able to get into uh, what some people, you know, athletes will call it the zone. Uh, other people will call it the uh, altered state, uh, where they feel as if uh, uh, time is standing still, that they are very much aware of what is going on inside them. They may or may not be aware of what's going on outside them. Uh, but to many people believe that by fostering that uh, internal meditative state that they're able to increase uh, the opportunities for psychic experiences. But other people say it doesn't seem to be something that they can uh, produce uh, consciously. They, they can produce the state, but then the effect may or may not occur. Yes. Fascinating. Um, if only we knew what tripped it. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, there seems to be a lot of studies uh, going on, uh, and of course, uh, even though we don't, we're not privy uh, to it, uh, the rumors are that uh, many military uh, agencies are also interested in uh, mind-altering uh, conditions. Uh, is there any documentation uh, that you're aware of of people who are able to affect any sort of material object or actually do something, the old mind-over-matter business? Yeah, there's some studies, uh, uh, some some parapsychologists claim that uh, the uh, the PK, the psychokinetic effect, is not as uh, strong in the mediums today as it used to be in Hume and some of the others uh, uh, who were able to produce uh, ectoplasm or levitation or other things uh, that were noted by many people around them. Uh, I have seen, I've watched a woman uh, who uh, was working with Charles Honerton when he was still li alive, uh, and she was able mentally to uh, move an object along uh, uh, a platform, you know, along, along a, like a desk or a piece of wood. Yes. It took a lot of energy, and she got tired of the... Uh, it's just like an athlete, you know, I have to practice several hours a day. And, uh, so some of the uh, Soviet, uh, former Soviet uh, people have been able to produce effects of moving objects. But, but the movies, you know, where people are able to move cars and things like that, that doesn't seem to be within the realm of... Uh, feasibility but doctor would this suggest to you that uh, in human evolution we're beginning to uh, in, in effect 
forget this ability, evolve away from it, or do you think we are evolving toward it? Uh, there are some people who argue both ways. My own feeling is that uh, it depends on what's uh, encouraged. Uh, you know, many primitive societies keep track of one another through mental communication. And uh, Ingo Swan's uh, new book on uh, uh, the Nostradamus factor uh, describes uh, his growing up in a little town in uh, Colorado, Telluride, where people would gather and say, oh, there's going to be an avalanche this afternoon. Yeah, I think it'll happen around 3 o'clock. And the society of the community, uh, because it was of concern to them and the safety of the townspeople, would, uh, would uh, support uh, their views and their actions, their, their, the subculture. So it seems to me that uh, we have gotten away from uh, that earlier notion uh, with our interest in technical communication. Now I think since technical communication is so well advanced and people uh, may be having a bit more uh, leisure if economically we are able to, I don't know whether that's going to happen or not, but if it does, it may provide more people with an opportunity not only to uh, exercise the body but also exercise the mind and the spirit, and it may well be that we will increase our uh, interest in uh, paranormal communication. So in other words, it still may be there, it's always there, it's just whether we choose to pursue it or not. Right. Uh, same way with healing. I think uh, people naturally have the ability to heal, uh, but whether we uh, will foster healing through uh, physical or biological or psychological or spiritual means depends on whether we will focus on that level. How much of uh, disease, human disease and discomfort, do you suppose uh, is controllable psychologically? It's a marvelous question. I think we have so much more potential. Uh, there's an article in the current issue of the uh, Regression Therapy Journal of the American, or the Association of Past Life Research and Therapies, in which a 10-year study was conducted with hundreds of people, showing that uh, regardless of whether uh, people had uh, cancer or dandruff or whatever the condition might be that uh, through uh, individual therapy, through uh, individual focus, that uh, about eight out of uh, ten people reported some improvement. Some people reported dra uh, dramatic improvement. Even if a person didn't change uh, his or her condition, uh, there seemed to be an ability to tolerate these symptoms and to live a better life as a result of that. So I think that in the next few years, uh, uh, as more UFO information comes out, as more uh, ESP information comes out uh, hidden in, in government files, I think that a majority of people will be uh, uh, more concerned about the possibility that uh, we have a greater human potential than we previously realized. Well, I guess you heard Linda's report, and uh, indeed uh, she was absolutely right on the money. There is going to be a new investigation by the GAO uh, about the Roswell incident. Yes, yes. Linda is so, so capable, and she's done so much good work over the years. It's been impressive to see how she uh, keeps uh, tabs on uh, what's currently happening. Well, do you suppose something like this could break it all open, Doctor? Have you given any thought to that, that the government, uh, kind of like they decided with the... Uh, a horrendous nuclear testing that we now found out they've done uh, that they may decide at some point just to let this go I think uh, that's a good possibility uh, of course uh, you know I used to think it was going to happen in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s now <laughs> now I'm hoping it's going to happen in the 90s that uh, government officials will uh, recognize that the pressures on them to uh, keep uh, information closed is, is uh, not as great as pressures on them to open it up, and it may well be uh, the rumors are <clears throat> increasing that perhaps uh, in the next few years uh, uh, there will be uh, a willingness on the part of governments to uh, open up and uh, share information with the public. I hope so. I know that you've done a lot of UFO research, and I would ask you this. Um, do you, it is, is it your belief that we are being or have been visited by aliens? Yes, uh, I started in uh, UFO research in the 60s when I finished uh, doctoral studies at the University of Missouri. I went to the University of North Dakota and with the help of Richard Hall, uh, conducted a study of 250 uh, NICAP members, National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, trying to find out if they were more open-minded or closed-minded than a group of professors there. <clears throat> and then I, uh, in the 60s, 
63 and 64 started a long-range study of uh, people who uh, described UFO experiences, asking them to take uh, personality inventories. I did a four-year study of 84 people, uh, 64 to 68, and when I uh, started another long-range study, well, Dr. June Parnell did her dissertation study, and I was convinced uh, uh, not only uh, in the 60s <coughs> that people were uh, normal at re describing these events, but also that uh, the objects uh, that they came in contact with and the DTs that they came in contact with uh, definitely showed that either extraterrestrial or extra-dimensional uh, entities uh, were interacting with us. So I've had that belief for many, many years. So whoever they are, they are here. I think so. My question then would be, who are they to us? It's a good question, and I don't know the answer. A lot of people claim they know, <laughs> and maybe they're right. Uh, uh, it seems to me that the studies of uh, people like Richard Thompson, who's written a book on the Vedic uh, traditions, the ancient Hindu traditions, and uh, Dr. Reverend ba Downing, uh, Bible and Flying Saucers, uh, uh, it seems to me that, uh, and Sitchin's books on uh, the gods and humans, uh, the, the best uh, thing that I can come up with, based upon uh, the, these ancient uh, studies of ancient uh, times, is that uh, we've been around uh, with humans forever, so that we are involved. Uh, heaven and earth are uh, conjoined, but right now not uh, not formally. I'm hoping that someday heaven and earth will be conjoined formally. Well, I guess uh, I ask you that because of the mix of your research. In other words, as you look at reincarnation and you look at the fact of some sort of presence here, do you find them connected? I think so. Now, many people I talk with are not so sure. They may be frightened by uh, the experience. For example, one young man uh, during hypnosis session, helping him to explore his uh, memory of an encounter, he... Uh, felt like he'd been taken aboard a craft, examined, and uh, felt very apprehensive and groaning and moaning during the session. When he uh, returned to the normal state, his eyes were uh, wide open, and he was aghast. He said, Leo, do you think this is war? And I said, no, I don't think so. I think it's worse. He said, worse? I said, yes, I think it's education. <laughs> I will believe that the UFO phenomena are being presented to us as a puzzle, uh, so that each individual feels uh, initiated and society feels uh, uh, stimulated uh, because we don't know uh, what it means. And so we have to uh, kind of band together uh, in our fear and our doubt. And <clears throat> so the hypothesis that I like is uh, that the UFO activity is a, a mirror and it reflects back to us uh, what we're like. If we project onto them, that they're warlike, it may be a projection of ourselves. If we project onto them that they um, are here to uh, to eat us or to harm us or to control us, um, uh, it may well be that uh, this is a view we have about anybody with uh, power and with the knowledge. Uh, it may well be that uh, as we learn more about ourselves, then we will gradually be able to learn more about them. I wonder if you remember a very old movie called Forbidden Planet. Oh, yes. Uh, where the horrible monster that tracked them down was actually, I believe, a creation of one man's mind. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what was called to mind when you just said what you said, as though we project to them uh, what we think they are, and that is, in fact, what they become. It could be temporarily for each uh, person. So uh, some people have a terrible, horrible painful experience. Some people have a puzzling, uh, confusing experience. Some people have a marvelous, beautiful experience. Uh, and uh, so it may well be that there are various races, various civilizations who are uh, coming to uh, survey, uh, and that's the explanation that some people accept. Or it may be that uh, they're like teachers. Uh, I like the educational model, being a professor, and I think that some people hate their teachers, and some love their teachers, and some are bored and <laughs> apathetic to their teachers, it may well be that uh, uh, that could be an explanation for why we have different uh, kinds of UFO encounters. Do you lecture on these subjects uh, at the university in Wyoming? Well, I'm no longer associated with the university. I left in 1959. Uh, the pressure's on me to uh, 
keep quiet were getting uh, fairly strong. So uh, when the pressures affected my relationships with my graduate students, uh, then that was too much for me. So I left uh, in 89, went into private practice as a counseling psychologist. Uh -huh. When I was there, I would give talks to students and faculty. Well, one of my questions was going to be how this affected uh, and has affected even since your career. Uh-huh. Well, uh, in general, it's been okay. There have been a few faculty members who are very supportive. There are a few who were very uh, critical. Most of them didn't give a damn. They were busy doing their own thing and trying right. to keep their research going. So it just depends upon the uh, particular persons as to their reaction. Um, in some ways, uh, it was uh, uh, difficult to publish papers and to uh, get the kind of um, increase in rank that I thought. But then, of course, that can happen to anybody, regardless of what kind of topics they're dealing with. But the marvelous thing has been that I've had an opportunity to uh, meet with interesting uh, professional people, and I've met with thousands of uh, marvelous people whose courage and, and uh, willingness to share information has really... Uh, made them heroes in my eyes. Uh, I've, I've received so much uh, information and uh, sharing from many women and many men all over the country and from foreign countries as well. Given uh, an opportunity to start all over again, would you pursue the same path? Well, yes. Uh, I, uh, I had a UFO sighting when I was a college student in 1949 at the University of Colorado, and my buddy and I we uh, didn't know what we were seeing. We tried to think of it as an airplane or a helicopter, and uh, it shattered my notion of Western science. Uh, I, uh, to see a flying saucer in daylight uh, was... I had been Can looking at people uh, who claimed to see UFOs. Yes. And so then in 1956, when my wife and I had a sighting, I, for several years there, I had kept quiet because I was shy, I was worried, I didn't want to talk about it. Finally, after the second sighting, I knew I had to uh, conduct research and I knew it was going to be lonely. Uh, so I made a conscious, deliberate choice to... Uh, can you give us some description of what you actually saw the first time? How much did you see? You said it was a daylight sighting. They're very interesting. No, oh, my uh, buddy and I, uh, Joe Wagner, were coming out of, uh, I was a sophomore at University of Colorado. I think it was uh, autumn of, uh, of uh, 49. And we had gone to a meeting on general semantics, how people uh, see the universe and reality. And uh, we, we were coming out, and we were playing a little game, saying, what do you see over there? Well, I call it a tree. How do you describe it? Well, I say it has a trunk and limbs and leaves. And uh, then we said, what do you see over there? What, what do we see? We uh, looked uh, toward the western sky, and uh, moving from the south to north over the arts and science uh, building, Helen's Hall, was a, what seemed to be elliptical-shaped uh, object. It appeared to be uh, metallic. Uh, I wasn't certain if it was reflecting the light of the setting sun or whether there was some kind of internal locus of light, but there seemed to be a little blip of light on the edge of the object. Uh, about every second, blip, blip, blip. I tried to turn it into an airplane or a helicopter or a balloon, but it just wouldn't go. There was no sound that we could hear. Later, as we talked about it, it seemed to be about the size of a fingernail at arm's length, but we didn't know how large it was. We didn't know how far away it was. If it were the size of an airplane, it would be going faster than jets did in 1949. They weren't going very fast in those days. Right. Uh, but if it were a larger size, it would be going very, very fast. If it were a smaller size, of course, it could be going very much slower. So, so we didn't know what it was that we saw, uh, but we uh, talked about it among ourselves, but I didn't want to talk about it to anybody else. In fact, I went into kind of a little depression and uh, lost my scholarship, and uh, I was just... Uh, bamboozled by it because I couldn't explain it and because I didn't want to think that flying saucers were real. Uh, but then in 56, when my wife and I saw uh, a glowing light or an object over Boulder uh, after the sun had gone down, well, then it moved and I stopped the car. We got out and it uh, hovered and moved just below the uh, flat irons, the Rocky Mountain foothills, and uh, uh, no sound, so I knew it was no airplane or no helicopter, and it couldn't be a star or a planet below the horizon. So, uh, uh, so after that second sighting, I knew that uh, flying saucers uh, were real. I, I'm slow, but I've had two sightings, and I, and I started to read reports, Frank Edwards, uh, Kehoe, and others. And uh, It really sounds as though it had a very profound effect on your life. That's right, uh-huh. And I've gone even farther in a little paper where I think that uh, it had a psychological uh, analysis, that it, that it 
because I think that people who have sightings are not only looking at something physical, but they're also having a psychic experience. Oh. I think that they uh, are having some kinds of mental communication, and this can be very uh, powerful influence on their lives. If they choose to, they can allow it to uh, uh, have send them for a tailspin, or if they wish, uh, they can be on a grand adventure. Huh. Um, I don't know if it's always grand. I know that uh, <laughs> a lot of people, particularly professional people, when they begin biting into all of this, find it's pretty sour indeed because they 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 get a lot of criticism from their colleagues. Yeah, I think that that's part of the plan. There's a guy named Deerdorf, Dr. Jim Deerdorf, Professor Emeritus of uh, Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State, and he uh, he argues that the ET strategy for Earth would be to uh, puzzle people uh, and to provide information without physical evidence so that they have to grapple uh, philosophical with uh, uh, their experiences. And the motivation? Uh, the motivation is uh, twofold, to... Uh, to get the information out to the general public so that the public becomes aware of uh, the ET presence and uh, yet uh, minimize uh, the interest of the conventional scientist and the conventional official. Uh, that way the dominant culture remains unaware of the ET presence even though most uh, people, you know, average woman and man, uh, is aware that ETs are here. Uh, then later, after the panic uh, is more personal and private rather than collective and communi communal, well, then more and more evidence gradually would be introduced that would become more interesting to the conventional scientist, the conventional uh, official. So it's more like a grassroots phenomenon, uh, so that we bug the governments, and finally the governments uh, accept uh, the reality, and then the governments can turn toward the ETs. If the ETs came in, according to this hypothesis, and landed at the White House lawn, we'd either regard them as angels or devils uh, and either uh, kowtow to them or else uh, uh, shoot at them. I think we'd shoot at them. Oh, I think you're right. I've done a lot of programs of this sort, uh, Doctor, and enough uh, of the people that uh, will call when commenting on a subject like this will say exactly that, that they would regard them as angels or devils, more likely devils, uh -huh. and uh, would fill them full of lead. So... Uh, what, what about the greater consequences, uh, social uh, consequences of contact? Uh, would there be, in your estimation, panic, acceptance? Uh, what, what effect would it have, for example, on our modern society? There's a nice uh, little book by Lindemann on uh, this and, uh, and also some studies back in the 30s and 40s which would suggest at that time that we would panic uh, and I think we have. I think we've panicked at a slow, uh, slow, slow level. I think that the uh, World War, I mean the Cold War, after World War II, was our subconscious recognition that uh, ETs are here, uh, and so that way we could blame uh, communists or fascists. We could blame uh, KPG or CIA or the devil or, or whoever our favorite uh, bad guy is. Yeah or why things were going so badly. But I think underneath, we recognize that uh, World War II, uh, the ET presence was already being felt. Uh, so that now I think uh, the Cold World is, uh, Cold War is over. <laughs> Cold World, that's a nice slip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still a Cold World. <laughs> well, I, I hope you're right about that. Events in Russia are a little unsettling, actually. Uh, maybe we're going to warm up a little bit more. Uh, but it seems to me that now we're in a position to... Uh, say, hey, we've got uh, satellites out there, we've got uh, rockets going out there, we, we've reached the moon, uh, we can travel beyond. Now we're growing up, uh, maybe we are ready for uh, contact. And uh, I think that contact is uh, not likely to be formal right away. I think it's going to be conscious, uh, consciousness, dreams, meditation, for a little while longer. Uh, before there's any kind of formal contact. In fact, maybe they, we maybe we'll never see them. Maybe we'll just go out uh, in a couple of hundred years and uh, meet them out there. I'd rather thought, Doctor, that it might develop about the way Watergate did, that uh, some newspaper would start in on it, or maybe as a result of the Albuquerque investigation or whatever, something like that would slowly pull the information perhaps from a willing government that would let it out bit by bit by bit so it wouldn't be one single shot 
Yeah. And the revelation would come over a uh, sort of a period of time. Would that make sense? Um, that sounds like a good scenario. Yes. Uh, I can also see the possibility that uh, think tanks could be uh, set up and the UN could be uh, involved so that all nations uh, would be in on the uh, the game plan. Exactly. Uh, as we head toward the, the new one world, whatever it's going to be. Yeah, all right. Doctor, we are at the top of the hour, so I'm going to ask you to hold on. All right. And we'll do a little news and come right back. Thank you. Dr. Leo Sprinkle is my guest all the way from Wyoming, and we'll get back to him in a moment. You're listening, of course, to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell. Reminding you, um, we will continue with another program when Area 2000 ends. It is going to be called Dreamland. We'll be back. His expertise, wide-ranging in areas like ESP, hypnosis, reincarnation, UFO research, and he ties it all together. So back now to Wyoming and Dr. Sprinkle. Uh, Dr. Sprinkle. Good. You're still there. Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. Um... Gee, there are so many areas uh, that we can talk about. I want to touch briefly on hypnosis generally, if I can. Okay. There are so many views um, with regard to hypnosis. Some people in your field believe that patients, in fact, are given to flights of fancy uh, in a hypnotic state. Uh, what's your view? I, yes, it just depends on what one means by flights of fancy. Uh, if a person means uh, that... Uh, people are more likely to lie uh, than usual. Well, I think that the best uh, uh, aphorism about hypnosis is that during the trance state, a person can do better whatever it is that he or she is trying to do. If he or she is trying to relax, he or she can relax a little bit better. If the person is trying to lie, the person can lie a little bit better. If the person is trying to be more honest or more aware, whatever it is that a person is seeking to accomplish, uh, probably can be accomplished a little bit better with the hypnotic techniques, resistance to pain, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so then the veracity of the person otherwise is very important. Yes. Uh, people don't change all that much from uh, altered state uh, to the way they are in everyday life, although uh, <clears throat> some people are so surprised that they can resist pain or that they can relax better and so on. They regard it as a very unusual state, but... Uh, once a person practices, uh, you know, it's like watching uh, an athlete to walk along and say, well, that guy's just a normal guy or, or she's just a normal woman. And yet then we see him or her play tennis or swim or whatever. They display uh, skills that are not uh, commonly displayed by most people. Well, then we're very impressed with, with that. Well, the same way a person who goes into the trance state, uh, most people are able to produce more effects than they previously uh, were able to do. Is there anything dangerous about hypnosis? Yes, uh, the danger is that we might forget to tell ourselves that we're in the trance state, <clears throat> and if we've been telling ourselves, I shall feel no pain, uh, and then I come out uh, without letting myself know that I am, am trying to do the same thing that I was doing before, there could be some danger, but the danger is in the suggestion uh, or not recognizing that we are still following uh, the plan. The danger is not so great uh, uh, in terms of the state itself. It's a very natural state. Most people go into what uh, is called hypnosis every day, but most people don't call it hypnosis. They may call it relaxation, concentration, prayer, meditation, goofing off. Uh, it uh, depends upon uh, what a person calls that state where they relax the body. Uh, they might close the eyes or look off into a distance and then go inside. <clears throat> it's really an internal focus, and that's what... Uh, is uh, uh, the reason that most people are surprised that they can uh, accomplish this and they think that they're going to be out. They think they're going to be asleep. Uh, but and it, it's not that way. No, most people are much more aware, in fact, than their normal state. They can listen to a concert or they can watch TV if they keep their eyes open or listen to a, to a lecture. Uh, they can be much more aware than they are in the common everyday state. Huh. Um, that's fascinating. When you uh, hypnotize yourself, uh, I, I, in other words, when there is a hypnotist, uh, these are very basic questions. I'm sorry, I don't know a lot about it. Uh, right. But a hypnotist brings a patient out of a trance. 
when you hypnotize yourself, who brings you out, or how do you get out? Uh, most people who are unskilled would just go into a, a little nap, and then they'd wake up uh, in the normal state. If a person is a trained uh, self-hypnotist or meditator, then uh, he or she could offer the statement, I will relax deeply and go deeper and deeper. When I return to the normal state, I can be uh, alert, feeling fine, feeling good. It's just kind of the same thing a person would uh, hmm. would do under the uh, state of recognizing uh, whatever the person is focusing on. Can a, a good hypnotist uh, take a patient into a much deeper state than that patient could achieve uh, by themselves? Or? Under normal circumstances, it's easier because there are two jobs. One is to give a suggestion and the other is to follow it. And so uh, uh, with my clients... Uh, uh, some of them say that they can go into the trance state quickly and easily, but uh, if I'm helping them, then they can focus on whatever it is that they wish to uh, work on, you know, whether it's to sure. ease pain or whether it's to uh, uh, go back in memory, to remember where they left. One woman wrote to me recently, wants to know if I can find a, a watch that she uh, put away. <laughs> some people give themselves terrible suggestions and say, I'm going to put this where nobody will find it. <laughs> I do that all the time. And, of course, that means that they won't find it either, and then later they forget about it. And if they give themselves a suggestion, I'm going to put this where nobody else will find it, but I'll be able to remember where it is, and they've given themselves a suggestion, they'll be able to recall where they put it. So even even in that uh, apparent conscious state, you can do that? Oh, yes. Uh, people all the time will tell themselves lousy things or good things. Uh, <laughs> that's all themselves... I'm so miserable that I deserve a bad grade, or I'm such a poor student, or uh, I deserve to get sick. Uh, they may not be consciously trying to make themselves sick, but if they give themselves little suggestions like that continuously, uh, they set themselves up for a miserable time. On the other hand, other people give themselves a suggestion, I'm going to keep working until I solve this problem, I'm going to become a good athlete, a good student. Uh, that's the difference between people who have the winning attitude and the losing attitude. All right, doctor, so then... Could somebody, for example, give themselves a suggestion that they would see a UFO or have uh, an ESP experience or something else of that sort right. and, and make it so? Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a person can give themselves a suggestion that I didn't see a UFO, I didn't have a paranormal experience, and uh, when they're questioned, well, they'll say, no, I didn't see a UFO. I've talked with a family of five or six people, and everybody except the father said they saw a flying saucer, and the father said, no, nobody saw such a thing. <laughs> so the suggestion can work positively, and it can work negatively as well. Wow. <laughs> That's really something. I know one time when I was at a New York uh, TV program uh, during the break, uh, one science writer noticed that I was rather... Uh, sympathetic toward the Betty and Barney Hill, and he, uh, he accosted me in the hall, a very tall, imposing man, and he said, you're a psychologist, and whenever I hear that, I know I'm going to get another lesson. <laughs> you're a psychologist, as you know that people see what they want to see, and I said, yes, I think you're right, people do see what they wish to see, and he smiled, and I said, but I also think that people don't see what they don't wish to see, and then he glared at me because he realized that I was <laughs> saying the other side of the coin, and both sides seemed to exist. Huh. Um... A lot of people, a lot of researchers now in these fields um, tell me that they have turned to abduction research as the most meaningful way to proceed with whatever turns out to be the next step, or they think it's going to be the most productive uh, um, of, of the areas. And I wonder what you have looked into with regard to abductions. Well, that's what I used to think, too, back in the 60s. Uh, I was involved, uh, along with Dr. Jim Harder, with the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization. We were uh, talking to people in the 60s and the 70s. And, uh, of course, uh, now uh, Dr. Jim Harder is interested in uh, the statements by various people who uh, mentally contact uh, what seem to be ETs about uh, exactly. other civilizations. And I'm interested in um, what people say about science and reincarnation so that uh, it's kind of fascinating. Back in the 60s, there were some people who didn't like uh, our work uh, in regard to uh, UFO contactees and experiencers. And now, <coughs> and <laughs> now this is considered big stuff, and uh, we were too far out in those days. Now we're too far out because we're listening to what people say about uh, their uh, communications.
uh, Giles Hamilton works with people who uh, describe what seem to be uh, communications uh, with uh, ETs. So maybe in a few more years, uh, we'll continue to move from uh, the interest in uh, flying saucers to abductions. Maybe we'll, maybe there's something beyond abductions. We'll see. Do you think the day may come when people who claim to be in touch on perhaps even a regular basis mentally with extraterrestrials or visitors or whoever they are will not automatically be a uh, candidate for the, the straitjacket? I think that uh, it's already that way. You know, back in the 40s and the 50s, uh, those of us who claimed UFO sightings, especially if we claimed more than one, well, we were psychotic. And then people said, no, they're not psychotic. They're not really crazy uh, in, the, in the real deep sense. They're just neurotic. Well, then it was changed to uh, they're kooks. So we, people who claim UFO sightings, uh, we misunderstand. We don't know what... Uh, the moon and the stars, uh, uh, we don't understand uh, physical laws and astronomical phenomena. And then it was changed to, um, uh, oh, these people had child abuse, and that's why they think they were abducted as a child. I had, uh, in 1950, uh, when I was 50 years old in 1980, I went through hypnosis with another psychologist, went back to what seemed to be a childhood experience of being on board a craft. Well, then... Uh, people say, oh, it must be child abuse. Well, sure, I was spanked by my dad, so must be that's the reason I had those experiences. Then the most uh, popular uh, hypothesis now is fantasy-prone personality. And uh, uh, so that's the one that uh, has been current for several years. Uh, although several studies have now shown that those of us who uh, claim to have um, UFO sightings, uh, not only are we normal in the sense of uh, psychological inventory results, but also we don't seem to be any more fantasy-prone than others. So now the latest thing is false memory syndrome. That's the popular one now. We've had, uh, we have memories uh, that we think uh, tell us we had uh, contact with ETs, and these are false memories. And so now we can breathe a sigh of relief and uh, keep on sleeping for a while. FMS, huh? False memory. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, where I was headed um, with the initial question was, um, perhaps the attitude today is a little bit different, but for an awful lot of years, I suspect people who claimed these things were committed to mental institutions. And I wonder how many people in mental in institutions perhaps really do not belong there because they're having some sort of real experience or internal experience which is real, we just that we just don't understand and are not, as we understand it, mentally ill? It's a good question. Of course, you might have to ask a psychiatrist that kind of question. Dr. Berth, uh, Berth Eric Swarj, uh, he's a MD psychiatrist. He did a study some years ago uh, when he was uh, still in New Jersey. Now he's in Florida, uh, finding that uh, not very many people uh, where he uh, investigated were claiming to have had UFO experiences. Uh, that didn't seem to be the main reason why they were uh, in wards. That, that was more of a rumor than actually. Now, uh, there are some cases, I know some friends, who have said that, uh, uh, that they've worked with people who have been institutionalized uh, because of their claims of UFO experiences. Or, or perhaps, Doctor, what some people describe as hearing voices and what no doubt we diagnose as schizophrenia of some sort or another. What about that? Yeah, well, once again, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't work with people in institutions, but my reading would suggest that you're right, that there are some people who uh, are inappropriately diagnosed and inappropriately uh, uh, institutionalized uh, when uh, their experiences uh, might be better considered as paranormal, uh, as uh, spiritual emergence. I think the new uh, DSM, the... Uh, uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is used by the American Psychiatric Association <clears throat> and by other mental health practitioners for uh, helping diagnose people's situation. I think that the spiritual emergence uh, uh, is uh, is rumored to be part of the new uh, manual, which will come out uh, sometime in a few years. And if that's so, I'll be pleased because there are many people in my opinion who have near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences or spiritual emergent uh, emerging experiences which uh, frighten them and temporarily cause them to worry about their uh, sanity, but actually uh, they may be uh, 
healthier as a result of the uh, uh, events that occurred to him. On the other hand, if you began to hear a voice or something began to talk to you, clearly you would question your own sanity, and I would imagine if unresolved, it could result in real, real mental harm to you. Well, there are studies by psychologists which show that in an average college population, there are there's a goodly percentage of people who report hearing voices, so that's not, it's not that uncommon. It's just that that is the uh, perception in TV shows that hearing voices is what drove uh, somebody to kill somebody yes. uh, rather than hearing a voice say, why don't you become uh, an NFL star? You know, I, I don't know if you've uh, seen the book uh, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, oh, yes. but the author says that he heard a voice and he wrote down the story and he sold it for a million dollars. That's the American way. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> so hearing a voice doesn't necessarily mean that uh, one is crazy, and it doesn't necessarily mean the person is going to do something violent. A person might do something uh, beneficial to others. All right. Um, a lot of people believe that these are not visitors from other places, um, uh, but either visitors from other times, including our future, um, or right. other dimensions. Yeah, I like the idea. Mark Davenport has a good uh, book on the idea of uh, time visitors. I think that uh, ETs uh, represent uh, both uh, extraterrestrial physical locations and uh, ultra-dimensional uh, time dimensions. I think that we're hmm. encountering both. And that may wow. be one reason why it's so uh, puzzling as to uh, what their purposes and what their powers are as well as their origins. Well, you are by far not the first person to say that to me. That, uh, that, as a matter of fact, I would say a majority of researchers now are beginning to feel that both may be the answer, dimensions and, in fact, time and space. Yeah, and it may well be that uh, uh, some ETs have the ability to present themselves uh, in such a way that we think of them as invisible. You know, we don't think this is so strange about being able to... Uh, hide craft from radar observation, uh, it may well be that uh, uh, some entities are able to hide themselves from our visual perception. How much do you think the government knows? I don't know. I wish I knew. Uh, I suspect on the basis of rumors that uh, governments all over the planet have been interested. Uh, the good book, uh, Above Top Secret, shows some uh, uh, copies of forms from uh, various governments of Africa, Australia, Europe, America, and so forth that uh, indicates not only our government's interested, but to keep a, a big communication series going in regard to UFO reports. I don't know if they have the final answer, but I suspect they have a lot better uh, photographs. No, a lot more than we do. Well, one, <laughs> one, one great theory, Doctor, was always that, look, our government is at best mostly inept poor managers, a giant bureaucracy. There's no way this kind of secret could have been held for all this time. But I think the recent revelations about the injection of plutonium and so forth pretty well crashed that theory. To me, it's obvious they can indeed keep a secret if they want to. That depends on which part of the government one is talking about. Uh, uh, it may well be that uh, the government is, you know, it's not a monolithic uh, structure according to political scientists, and there are lots of different factions and lots of the different levels, and it could well be that a small group has uh, kept most of the information, and then other groups have been fed various kinds of misinformation, disinformation, lies, uh, uh, innuendos, and so forth that just make it all muddled, uh, and so we don't have any idea of what is actually known. Uh, are you pursuing any avenues with the government to try and dislodge some information? Have you filed any Freedom of Information Act, that sort of thing? I haven't done so myself. Early on in the 60s, I would write to uh, government officials. I would write to uh, uh, Air Force about such and such a case, uh, <clears throat> including cases that uh, APRO had submitted and just got back uh, either nonsense or uh, generalities. And so I, I began to realize that it was just wasted time. I do write to uh, our senators in Wyoming and representative uh, about the uh, Roswell case and encouraging them to uh, uh, to look into it and so forth. So I try to be a good citizen, but I don't really feel that my expertise is the political angle. My expertise is helping uh, people come to grips with their own experiences. 
And uh, how much of that sort of work do you still do? Uh, and uh, how do you find people? Do they find you, or how does it happen? Uh, it, it works both ways. Uh, we have a UFO conference uh, in Laramie each year. This uh, next June will be our 15th year. Uh, the 1991 August issue of the Atlantic uh, Monthly Magazine featured an article by uh, Dr. Jim Gordon, a psychiatrist, a professor at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and uh, each year we have about 150 people who uh, come together to talk about their experiences. We'll have experts uh, describe their research, but uh, our bread and butter is several hours uh, w in which uh, we allow uh, interested persons to stand up for five or ten minutes and talk about their experience, uh, their sightings or their encounters, and what influence it's had on them. And many people say that this is very therapeutic, that they... Uh, they no longer become afraid that somebody's going to c claim that they're silly or crazy uh, or whatever. Uh, they may not go public, uh, but they become more able to talk to anybody about their experience if the other person's interested in listening. One would think, because of social pressure, that anybody having an experience um, would think several times before reporting it. Now, I realize you have people that are very open with you, but if you look at the general population, and you consider how many of them percentage-wise would relate a serious experience, whatever it would be, you would think that number might be fairly small. Well, millions of people, according to estimates, have had these experiences. Uh, and, of course, uh, we know that uh, there are some things that people are willing to talk about. You know, it used to be bad when I was a kid for people to talk about their illnesses. As I got older, it became popular for people to talk about their illnesses. Uh, so for, for especially for as a matter of fact, for many, it's a hobby. <laughs> right. And so I've joked about the idea that uh, uh, formerly it used to be people say, what? You mean you think you've had a UFO sighting? And now in a few years it'll probably be, what? You mean you haven't had a sighting? <laughs> <laughs> it becomes socially acceptable. Yes. Yes. And uh, is do you suppose... I, again, I come back to this, that that is the master plan, that uh, s the realization will be sort of a very slow, continued ev evolution with one more piece of the puzzle put in place. I think you're right. I think that it would be, uh, there's a book uh, coming out by Royal and Priest about preparing for contact, and their view is that along with going out and watching, like C-Study Groups, the uh, Center for uh, Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence out of uh, North Carolina, Dr. Stephen Greer. Uh, uh, these groups of people uh, will uh, go out and uh, attempt through uh, lights and chanting and, and uh, consciousness exercises to make contact. Um, it may well be that both physical contact and uh, mental contact uh, will become more and more significant over the next few years. Uh, so that uh, people will prepare both by meditation and by um, by joining groups and encouraging governmental uh, release of secret uh, documents. Would it be your view that it would be the mission of Dr. Carl Sagan to regulate the rate of realization? It's a good possibility. I met him in 1966 at this uh, NBC TV program, and... Uh, at times, he seems to be very skeptical, but at other times, uh, like with Phil Class and others, there seems to be uh, the statement made that, well, if there were evidence, you know, meaning if there were physical evidence, uh, of course, social evidence, uh, testimony doesn't count uh, for, uh, for those people who consider themselves to be, quote, scientists. But if, a, if there were evidence uh, that we were being visited, wouldn't that be marvelous? Well, you see, it seems to me that... Uh, if it gets to the point where physical evidence were introduced, uh, then uh, then the people who had said, well, yes, as soon as there's physical evidence, then I'll start to uh, show an interest, uh, then they can get on the bandwagon. Well, he's made some statements which really do seem to try to slow it all up, uh, put a cog in the wheel, and almost regulate uh, uh, the speed with which people begin to realize certain things. So hold on for just one second, Doctor. We're going to ID here. Thank you. All right. You're listening to Area 2000 from Las Vegas on a Sunday night. I'm Art Bell.
Tigon's Plaza downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. Area 2000 underway. My guest, Dr. Leo Sprinkle. The subject, UFOs, reincarnation, ESP, other dimensions. Pretty much touching on all of it. Dr. Sprinkle, still there? Yes, sir. Good. Um, well, all right. Uh, I, I guess I would ask this. Uh, how far from, and, and you almost answered it earlier, but if you had to make your best guess, when will we know? or realize, or the collective knowledge add up to, oh, yes? Uh, I would say that the turn of the century is a good time uh, to speculate about that. I did a study uh, a few years ago in 1986 with a group of people uh, asking them uh, some questions about future, future forecasting, whether uh, Ronald Reagan would be reelected as president. The majority of people said yes. Whether there'd be a atomic uh, war before the year 2000, majority of people said no. And then the left brain people versus the right brain people had a different response to the question about formal contact. Um, the left brain uh, people evenly chose uh, several uh, targets, whereas the right brain types uh, huh. selected the years uh, or a target that would correspond to the years between 1995 and 2000 for possible uh, formal contact with uh, ETs. And uh, I... Uh, I just my own personal feeling is that 97 this sounds like a good time to me now some people think that there's going to be an announcement this year but then I've heard that you know in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s so uh, I really don't know but it seems to me that we're getting closer and closer to uh, the number of people in the general public who accept the idea of ET presence the government officials and uh, conventional scientists uh, don't accept that but um, I think within the next few years, some rumors suggest that just like uh, the Clinton administration has been forthcoming in terms of uh, information about radiation uh, tests, yes. it makes one wonder if uh, uh, the push is now to release government secrecy on all matters, not just UFOs or radiation, but all, all kinds of secrecy that we thought was so important during the uh, Cold War and World War II. Maybe now we're big enough to, as a society, that we can handle uh, how the JFK uh, and the other murders were committed, whether there was conspiracy and so forth. Maybe we're growing up enough that we can allow ourselves to uh, uh, take whatever medicine we need to take. Well, while it would be true that I think in America, because of programs like this and movies and the media and all of it, we're probably closer to being able to accept it without great panic. There would be an awful lot of uh, the rest of the world that would not be so ready, wouldn't you think? Well, I used to think that way uh, until I was over in Germany uh, in world uh, at the Korean War and talking to people in Sweden have gone to Brazil, Canada, and so on. I'm inclined to think that uh, here in the U.S. Uh, we're more afraid of ETs than down in Brazil, for example, or, or Africa, others. Uh, there's a story it goes around in different forms, whether it's in Mexico or in Korea, about uh, the farmer who uh, uh, says, oh, yeah, one day we are ruled by the Koreans, another time we're ruled by the Japanese. You know? Or in Mexico, it's the U.S. And, and the Mexicans back and forth across the border. Right. Most people who uh, are concerned about day-to-day -day matters, I don't think that they're as frightened by who's in charge. I think that the U.S., uh, we like to think of ourselves as number one in technology, number one in intelligence and culture, and I suspect uh, that uh, uh, most primitive people uh, already recognize the uh, coming and goings of the gods. Of the gods? Oh, yes. You know, and the gods have been around for thousands and thousands of years, and so uh, if ETs come down in uh, Brazilian rainforest, uh, or down in the uh, Hopi Reservation in Arizona, that's not going to cause as much stir as it would on the White House lawn. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would be your view with respect to the theory that these beings are our creator? It's a good possibility. Uh, this is what some people have claimed uh, regarding the uh, biblical stories of uh, Adam and Eve, uh, and the Elohim. Uh, Sitchin's books are excellent in this regard. Uh, it may well be that uh, the Old Testament and New Testament uh, stories are 
uh, not only stories of uh, humans, but also and angels, messengers of the gods, but also the pillars of fire, the clouds from heaven. Uh, it may well be that it goes back thousands of years, and uh, we are the we are the missing link between uh, ape and star man. Doctor, how uh, how important uh, is the near death? experience and research in that area your view i think it's very important i haven't done a great deal myself but i've talked with the groups of people who've had near-death experiences and of course helen wambach when she came to our ufo conference one year she'd had a near-death experience uh, after a triple bypass heart operation and she said leo first thing i thought of when i came out uh, of this tunnel and talking with a father figure who said no your work isn't done uh, uh, you've been working on past life stuff, now you've got to work on future life. She said, the first thing I thought of is I've got to talk with Leo and his uh, UFO contactees about uh, future impressions. And her companion said, no, the first thing she asked for was another cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems as if um, the near-death experience, like the UFO experience, is very transforming. It, uh, it uh, For many people... Uh, what happens is they no longer fear death. They feel as if the soul is what's important. Uh, we are souls and bodies, not bodies who just happen to have souls. Uh, many people feel as if their life has new meaning and that they uh, uh, take a new tack, a new philosophy in regard to themselves and relationships. Uh, most people who come back say that uh, love uh, for self, love for others, love of God, creation... These are what's important, not material possessions. And that would imply that, uh, that there is not predestination. In other words, and I guess that would be your view, that uh, we can modify our lives as we will, or do you think it is all preordained? I think it's both. Uh, some people, have, um, one poet said it very nicely, that uh, we can't uh, choose the tide uh, on which we ride, but we can choose the wave. And I think that we have some uh, some influence, some control. Uh, I, I I tend to share the view of uh, many mentors and, and teachers who say that uh, rather than thinking each person on his or her own merit graduates, uh, maybe we all have to graduate. And if that's true, ouch. <laughs> we have a yep. long way to go uh, to become enlightened. Uh, but it may well be that there are groups of people who come and go, families, uh, nations, uh, and uh, each individual life then would be important, uh, just like yes. uh, one student in class is important, but not so overwhelmingly important. So I, I take the point of view that there are some influences that are greater than individual lives, but I also think that uh, each individual soul has some choice. Um, how uh, how far back have you ever taken anybody uh, into a single prior life, multiple prior lives? How far back have you ever gone with somebody? Well, it depends upon one's view of time. Um, for example, one psychologist I worked with uh, who accepted reincarnation and uh, <clears throat> was interested in, uh, he and his wife attended our workshop and went back to what seemed to be past lives in which they were together. In an individual session with him, he went back to what seemed to be uh, life as a snake. Uh, so he felt oh. that he had had... Uh, I've worked with people who felt that they were uh, animals, you know, uh, mammals other than humans. I've worked with people who felt like they went back to another planet uh, and were robotic. Uh, uh, people who've gone forward in time. Uh, Wombach's workshops wow. used to have, you know... Uh, uh, a choice of like a thousand BC or two thousand BC. Some people feel like they've gone back to Atlantis. Uh, in fact, one young man wept because he felt as if he had been an important uh, scientist who had, was more interested in power than he was in compassion uh, and uh, helped destroy Atlantis. And he feels like he's here as a psychologist uh, this lifetime uh, to help people become aware. Huh. And so that was you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. So I don't know what it means in terms of linear time, and, and I can't claim that I know that these people have experienced something that's true, but what I can claim is that they're very uh, sincere about their reactions, their uh, emotional reactions of uh, fear or hate or puzzlement, very real to them. And the uh, impressions, the images uh, have had an important influence on their lives. 
I've always sort of felt, what good reincarnation if there is no conscious memory of any prior life or experience or anything that would add up to anything? And um, I, I guess the answer is that it can be used, and you know how to do it. Well, I think we all do in the sense of lessons. When I was a little kid, I can recall uh, thinking, oh, I know it's much better not to, uh, to, you know, I hit a bird with a stone, and I was pleased with my accuracy, but then I saw the bird dying, and I was saddened by it. And uh, I thought, why do I have that feeling? Because I was taught to, you know, get a gun and shoot animals. This is uh, manly. Uh, And other things, uh, I think that there are lessons that become important to us. We may not know where they come from, but it's the same thing as looking back on lessons we've had in the fifth grade and the seventh grade. We may not remember uh, our transcripts uh, from those uh, times, but we still remember things about uh, lessons that we've learned. It may well be that um, it's not so important to remember specific details as it is to remember yes. uh, the, uh, mor- the moral attitudes that we learn. Uh, yes, the example you gave was a good one. When I finally got to be 13, my dad gave me a 22 rifle. One of the first things I did in the first few days was I shot a squirrel. I, too, watched that squirrel die, and I have never, ever shot another animal, nor will I. Yeah, mm-hmm. because you realize the pain and suffering, and, uh, and so that was a, that's a good example of uh, a lesson that you didn't have to repeat over and over. Uh, other times, uh, we're like the uh, guy who went to Italy and sang, and everybody said, encore, encore. He sang again, and encore, encore. Finally, he said, I'm tired. I can't go on. And the guy in the balcony said, you've got to keep it up until you get it right. And, well, <laughs> maybe that's the way it is with some of our lessons in, in lifetimes. Uh, we repeat until we get it right. Yes, I wonder if in my next life I will have to again shoot a squirrel or its equivalent. If you won't have to. Would it be your view that those sorts of lessons are carried forth? Yes. Uh, one client of mine said it very nicely. He uh, he was a master's student in biology and geology, and he uh, he said uh, vows are for humans like instincts are for animals. And I said, oh, that's very good. Huh. Uh, <clears throat> instincts for animals uh, uh, can help them or they can hurt them in the same way vows. You know, if someone says, I'm never going to... to uh, take another bite of uh, lasagna ever, ever, ever. Well, if we wind <laughs> up in a desert island, the only food left is lasagna. It might change your mind. Uh, uh-huh. Instincts, uh, I'd like to pounce on that one. It's a good okay. one. Uh, would you say that instincts are, in fact, uh, not something carried deep in a gen- genetic makeup someplace, but instincts are, in fact, uh, in animals, evidence of uh, some sort of reincarnation? Or a morphic, uh, morphogenic field, like uh, yeah. Rupert uh, Sheldrake has hypothesized, uh, it seems as if the evidence uh, is very impressive to biologists that uh, information in the cell uh, doesn't always reside in the cell. It seems to come from outside. And so genetics uh, may be important uh, in terms of uh, uh, some of the uh, conditions under which uh, uh, critters develop, but... Uh, it may be that instincts go beyond uh, the biological conditions in the same way <clears throat> our moralities may go beyond what we are taught uh, as we're growing up because I've talked to so many people who were taught uh, to fear themselves, hate themselves, uh, hate others, and yet uh, still retain a sense of compassion and uh, uh, wondered, why, where did I get that? You know? or, or in the case of the human, the fear of high places or the fear of drowning or the fear of uh, whatever it is that was... There's snakes, so where did we get that? Because uh, obviously some people have never come in contact with a snake and yet there can still be that same attitude. Well, if we look back in, li- in the lifetime as primitive people, uh, we probably died uh, quite often as a result of snake bites. So uh, it may be that these are subcultural or collective unconscious things as uh, Jung would uh, posit or it may well be that this is a result of past life experiences. All right, Doctor, I would like to open some phone lines and expose you to the American okay. public. How about that? Really? You can handle that? All right, uh, let's give out the numbers then. Here they are. In the metropolitan area of Las Vegas, it is 383-8255-8255. Toll free outside the state, you're welcome at 1-800-338-8255. We have the wild card lines at area code 702 
385-7214. And finally, if you have never called this program, you're welcome in um, as a first-time caller at area code 702-385-7213. There, the mechanics are done. Let's do it. Wild card line three. You're on the air. Uh, good evening with uh, uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle. Yes, good evening, Dr. Sprinkle. Um, uh, this question is about abductions. Uh, as opposed to UFO sightings, which, uh, which may be accompanied by photo evidence or multiple witnesses, uh, is there any reason to take seriously uh, or at face value the thousands of uh, so-called abduction reports? Uh, is there any reason to believe that, um, that ET entities rather than psychological aberrations are involved? Uh, thank you for the question. I think so because there are so many people who uh, report uh, not only multiple abductions but also there are multiple witnesses uh, along with the... Uh, uh, internal attitudes. There can be marks on the body. There can be uh, uh, missing time. Uh, there are a variety of uh, things that would be considered circumstantial evidence by the skeptic, but nevertheless, which would fit in with the overall pattern. And also, uh, uh, the studies of uh, Dr. Eddie Bullard and others show that the pattern is not something that is uh, easily uh, hoaxed or uh, uh, fantasized about because there is a definite pattern to what people report happens to them. So uh, regardless of whether one uh, argues that this is a, uh, a paranormal event uh, by unseen forces as opposed to extraterrestrial entities, uh, one still would have to account for a wide variety of evidence uh, regardless of what the source of the experience might be. All right. Doctor, uh, good evening. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Sprinkle. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Las Vegas, Nevada. All right. Go ahead, sir. Yes, I was wondering on the uh, UFOs that uh, you see those often out here in Nevada, or you're asking who? I see them often out there. Not, I'm not out there very often, but a lot of people who are out there. Uh, yes, every place on the planet has uh, had many uh, UFO sightings reported by various people. North Pole, South Pole, every uh, every major. Uh, continent. Uh, there are a lot of reports in the um, southwest USA, uh, whether that's because there's more activity out there, whether it's because the sighting uh, conditions are better, uh, that's hard to know. But yes, there are many people in Nevada who report UFO sightings. I see. I was wondering, because me and my mother watch, you listen to your show very often, and we seem to see every now and then a weird object in the sky above, and it does come to see the display a, a spacecraft of some kind, but we can't really see if it's a UFO or, a, or, a, or one of our ships sometimes. All right. Thank you, caller. It is true, Doctor. Um, here in the desert, we have uh, a very, very uh, high count of sightings. I mean, we just have all kinds of sightings. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of it, of course, may be U.S. government. Who knows? But, yes. but but there are a disproportionate number of sightings. Wildcard Line 3, uh, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Sprinkle. Where are you calling from? Uh, good evening. This is Fritz from Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Okay. Dr. Sprinkle, whatever happened to Pat McGuire and his conduct, one of your prime subjects in the late 70s, whatever happened to him? Yes, uh, Pat went through a rough time. Uh, Pat McGuire uh, used to have a ranch uh, north of Laramie. He uh, built a well on it uh, uh, to irrigate. Uh, his crops uh, of grain and uh, a lot of people would come out to the ranch to uh, have sightings and encounters uh, he uh, ran for governor at one point uh, lost uh, easily to the other candidate but uh, uh, then after that he felt like he was uh, having a rough time whether it was government interference or ET interference or mismanagement according to some people uh, hard to know why but anyway he had trouble maintaining the ranch uh, he and his wife uh, Wanda divorced uh, he uh, went uh, from job to job right now uh, as far as I know he's uh, doing uh, uh, common labor kinds of jobs um, the uh, ranch was turned over to a holding company and then later given to the University of Wyoming as an experimental farm. So so the well is still out there uh, that pumped thousands of gallons of water a minute, and it's still a miracle as far as some people are concerned, but 
Pat himself has had a rough go of it uh, the last few years. Well, the audience is not aware that the EDs told him to dig a well because there was no water underneath and everybody was laughing at him. Right. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Fritz, thank, yeah. thank you very much for the call. Uh, line two, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Sprinkle. Uh, hello, doctor. Uh, hello, Art. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm a first-time caller. I, I called the wrong number, but <laughs> I had two points I'd like to make um, regarding Roswell. Um, it, it just I find it kind of hard to believe that uh, a spacecraft could fly through space and time and then crash in the desert. Right. Well, uh, it's worth noting, caller, that that incident occurred m many, many years ago, and there, there. So, in other words, there has not exactly been a rash of crashes. Okay. It just seemed a, a little, a uh, little strange. Um, and I did have another point on, on the animals. Yes. Did you shot an animal the first time and you felt sick? Yes. I had a, the same uh, thing happen to me when I f first started hunting. I shot my first deer, and I, it, it made me sick, but I thought it would pass. And I shot another one the next year, and I never, I've never hunted since. I, I just, I just don't like the thought of killing an animal. I, I understand. Thank you. And I guess, uh, doctor, that if there is reincarnation, uh, that all of us would, as a result of its being a fact, have a particular reverence for life. Wouldn't that be the more natural thing? Uh, I think, in general, it would be true. I think there might be some people who die as a result of. Uh violence who might come into the next lifetime angry and uh, mm -hmm. ready to commit violence. So there could be a lot of different reactions. Well, I know some of those people. Yes, yes. <laughs> Good evening. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Sprinkle. Yes, Dr. Sprinkle, uh, you've mentioned a lot of information, uh, and you've mentioned royal priests. Uh, they've written a couple books, and much of their uh, information is channeled information. What's your... Uh, your opinion about uh, channeled information. All right, that's a good question. Uh, channeling and channeled information. I don't know who the caller is, but his voice is very much like Dr. Jim Dierdorf. Uh, Gee, I'm sorry, I, I released him. Okay. Um, I think that channeled information is like any other information. It's appropriate to listen, to look, uh, to compare it with other kinds of information. Uh, just like one historian is uh, useful, two historians, three more... Uh, the, the more uh, witnesses, uh, the better. Uh, the more sources of evidence, uh, physical evidence, biological evidence, psychosocial evidence, and spiritual evidence. So uh, if I'm answering the caller's uh, question appropriately, I think that uh, all sources of information ought to be considered, none rejected just because of the source, but not necessarily accepted uh, because of the source either. All right, very good. Uh, line three, good evening. You're on the air with Dr. Sprinkle. Good evening, Art. Good evening, Dr. Sprinkle. Good evening. Um, just as a side note, uh, Pat McGuire was a professional elk hunter many years ago. <laughs> um, but I, I do have a question, Dr. Right. Sprinkle. Um, I met you at the university in July of 1980. I was one of the three young men that came out to uh, Pat's ranch and camped there for a couple weeks. Oh, yeah. Um, but I have a question. I just finished reading Revelations by uh, Jacques Vallée. And uh, he notes in there that while he was doing an investigation in France, uh, a person he was working with confronted a French military person, and that French military person just basically flat out told him, uh, you know, we created this, it's a diversion, and uh, we're doing studies on uh, social engineering. Uh, I was wondering if uh, I could get an opinion on that. All right. Thank you, thank caller. You. Listen on the air. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have an opinion. I don't know whether it's the correct opinion or not. It may well be that uh, that the French and the U.S. and Belgium and other governments are, are doing this. However, it's puzzling to me when I talk with a person like uh, Ida Cannonberg. Uh, she's written a book, uh, UFOs and the Psychic Factor, another book, uh, The Alien Book of Truth. She had her UFO experience in 1940, and... Uh, this was somewhat before it was popular to talk about flying saucers. So uh, I find uh, people who claim that the German rockets and the other uh, World War II uh, events are what caused uh, people to socially and culturally become uh, influenced uh, into thinking that flying saucers and UFOs uh, are extraterrestrial. Uh, and 
Uh, I just have my I have my doubts about it because according to my memory of a 1940 experience when I was 10 years old, that happened before I really felt that uh, I was influenced uh, by World War II stories of German rockets hmm. and so on. So uh, maybe the Frenchman knows what he's saying, uh, but on the other hand, I suspect that UFOs have been around longer than World War II. All right, Doctor. Time is short. Uh, on our first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Sprinkle. Good evening. Where are you calling from, please? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, yes. I have two questions. Um, I have what I just always called women's intuition, like knowing not to be somewhere. Uh, All right. Would you turn your radio off, please? Sure. Not to go somewhere or not to do something, and right. sure enough, if I follow that intuition, something happens that makes it, yes, uh, it was correct thing to do. Yeah, and also, I have very strong feelings about being involved somehow with the Holocaust. Uh, I don't know why, and sometimes I think to myself that it's just that I, I think it's such a dreadful thing that happened, but then other times I have a real strong feeling that I was involved somehow. Now, I'm in my 40s. So it wouldn't seem likely. But uh, can you give me any insight on those two questions? Thank All you very right. much. All right. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. There's uh, lots of information on uh, premonitions, and many people uh, uh, describe their experiences and how helpful they've been to follow those premonitions. Other people have not followed their premonitions and have been bothered or w wish they had. So I can appreciate why you'd say that. Doctor, we, um, we're not going to have time to okay. answer her question in depth. We're out of time. Okay. You have been a pleasure to interview. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. And I would like to do it again sometime. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, take care. That's Dr. Leo Sprinkle. I'm sorry, we're out of time. Just enough time to announce, as you know, the Bigelow Foundation has been uh, very generous in the funding of this program. They're having difficulty finding guests of uh, a continuing uh, a caliber. And so they have announced the last program is going to be February 6th. We are going to syndicate a new program and going to broaden it out a bit and certainly continue it. It's going to be called Dreamland. Repeating, it's going to be called Dreamland. And if you would like to hear it, then you should contact the station that you wish to carry that program. Contact uh, the programming department or management of the station that you wish to carry it. Uh, because it will be in syndication, that means that it, uh, for example, may or may not even be on in Las Vegas. I don't know. It's going to depend on all of you. That's my suggestion. Contact the radio station that uh, you would like to hear it on and ask them to carry a new program coming up between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. Sunday nights called Dreamland. For the Bigelow Foundation, good night. The preceding program was made possible by a grant from the Bigelow Foundation. This has been Area 2000, a program that introduces our listeners to the scientific approach for discussion of two particular subjects, UFOs and near-death and after-death experiences. To contact the Bigelow Foundation, please call during the week between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., area code 702-456-1606. Ask for Angela Thompson. That's area code 702-456-1606. And be with us next Sunday evening at 8 for another edition of Area 2000. And now. Area 2000. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Area 2000. I'm Art Bell, and uh, you're now listening to the next to the last uh, Area 2000. Sad. Anyway, good evening. I've got a special surprise for you this evening. Linda Moulton Howe is in the studio with us. She's actually here in Las Vegas. Hi, Linda. It's nice to be here, Art, and remember things evolve. You're planning to go into dreamland with this, so... It's not really so much a goodbye as it is sort of a twilight. No, One thing is shifting into something else. Exactly right. And we're looking forward to having you on Dreamland as well. Thanks. And I'm glad I was able to bring glimpses of other realities to you and hand it into your hands. The book is finally done. It is here, and it is beautiful. And the cover is particularly nice. Gosh, the cover is beautiful. How, 
How did you come up with the cover, if I can start there? Ron Russell is a very talented man in Denver, Colorado, and he has uh, spent his life dealing with what I consider, and I think he does too, other realities in an art form where he uses some specific kind of uh, pigment that I don't really understand, but you have to put them in glass, or if they're on glass, mm -hmm. and they are lighted from behind. And a year and a half ago, he gave me a transparency of one of his artworks, and he says, Linda, I want to give this to you to use in whatever way you want. And when I started working on this book, September 1 of 1992, his artwork just kept ringing in my head. And I think, in terms of glimpses of other realities, that uh, he had created something that was just almost destined for the cover of this book. So, in other words, that was the one that you ended up That's using? That's right. Oh. That's right. And he had given it to me a whole year and a half before the book was even born. All right. Well, let's talk about the book a little bit. Tell us about the book. What's in here? Well, part of my own frustration of the last 14 years was trying to understand, starting with uh, the physical bodies of animals that we've discussed on Area 2000 over the last few months, where there was this mystery of no blood, no tracks, right. uh, all of the odd anomalies associated with animals. When I began that and was doing it purely from a journalist's point of view of focusing on what is this, and what could be doing it, and is there an environmental contamination, and all those sort of practical questions that any journalist is, con is confronted with. And then finding myself being led from that to the abductions, what the abductions gave insights back to the mutilations, sure. that leading to the whole idea that there are, might be more than one kind of an intelligence that's interacting with our planet. What would that that intelligence be? What might it look like? And all of the various drawings across the United States, Canada, and other parts of the world where people are drawing very similar types, not all the same, that reinforces the idea that maybe that there is either one or more intelligences interacting with our planet, or there might be one, but that it has a variety of tasks and is, abs is capable of making different types of biological we'll call them androids or uh, some kind of worker bees to do various tasks on this planet, designed perhaps for different kinds of physical... So then this book does what? It follows your line of investigation That's all right. the way through? And, well, and even more so, I think now it's 14 years later, and after a while, it's just like anything, you begin to get a, a more distance on it, and mm -hmm. it gives you a little wider perspective. Um, I certainly don't have the answers to the major questions of who, what, or why, but what I am trying to do is to put into a cover a kind of distillation, a synthesis of the patterns. The patterns are there if you start looking at them, and what I've tried to do with, th there are 300 images in this book, 161 are in color, and after a while when you look at all of those images and as the pages evolve, I think that it would be hard to come away from this book without at least saying there must be something more to all of these phenomena just because the patterns themselves that are across the country, Canada, other countries of the world, something must be going on that we are missing as a species. That's my whole motive for doing this book. Would the book make a good case, Linda? In other words, that uh, by, by the time you've gone through it, you've examined the evidence, lots of pictures, would you come to the conclusion that indeed there is something more? Well, the people so far uh, that have looked at the book have said one uh, similar thing to me, and this was basically in the, the final stages where you send a book out to people who know maybe something and some who don't, and sure. you get feedback before sure. it's in this finished form. And the, I think the consistent feedback to me was... We've never seen this much data in these pages compressed before. Mm -hmm. Now, that's part of also the motive for doing this is that because of this unique position I found myself in as a journalist who sort of stumbled into other phenomena that I did not know was there through these uh, animals, that I myself kept feeling a frustration as a journalist that even my colleagues, would say, there's nothing to any of this. Why are you pursuing it? And I would say, but have you looked at the laboratory reports? Have you talked with scientists and, and medical people who are studying some of these phenomena, even if they're not doing it publicly? Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing I've been trying to contribute, 
is there are scientific investigations, whether it's in the crop circles or the animal mutilations or the human abductions. There are scientists who are intrigued. They are doing very valuable studies, even if you don't know who they are. And then I'm the journalist who I'm bringing back these patterns of discoveries, or at least trying to, and saying there is a pattern to phenomena here, and we should at least try to look at it in its bigger context. That's the one thing glimpses of other realities, I, I hope it is doing. It's giving a larger picture of what many times in the past has been reported as an isolated story, a animal mutilation in Duluth, Minnesota. But what people didn't know was that the same year there were mutilations in 23 states. Mm -hmm. I just opened the book randomly, and I came upon a couple of pictures of uh, mutilations. So some of it is fairly rough stuff. But if you want uh, documentation... But very pristine. You couldn't say... There's nothing gory about it. Oh, that. no, 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 no. No, but but this this is real stuff. I mean, That's the, right. the, these are real pictures. And uh, the book is filled with them. And, for example, the uh, crop circles. Boy, there are some... In Incredibly well detailed pictures yeah. of crop circles in yeah. here. Really well detailed. So everybody should know that's what they will get. I'm, I'm kind of giving them a hint because we've got a big surprise for the audience, don't we? Well, yes, and I want you to announce the surprise, but so that people will also understand that with the crop circles is the first presentation ever of uh, the work of the biophysicist Dr. Levengood, who we've had on Area 2000, yes. and the work that he has done in which he concludes that there are fundamental changes in the biophysical and biochemical structure of the plants that cannot be hoaxed. You can't change the molecular structure of a plant simply by walking on it. Something mm -hmm. is affecting the molecular structure. Well, as I recall, the only thing that he could get close with was uh, microwave energy. On one aspect of the changes, one and aspect. that has to do with the cell pits. He knows that some kind of an energy has to be affecting the plants or he couldn't have molecular structure changes in what was called the BRAC tissue. Mm -hmm. This is very delicate tissue that encases the bottom of seeds, like a weed or rye or something. And because he has worked with seeds all of his life, it's that particular part of the plant that he has been concentrating on. He's done work on the stems, too. But this tissue that shows that there is some kind of a fundamental change at a level that no one walking on it could affect is one of the most intriguing parts of the investigation right now. Hmm. Um, so people ought to put their hands on this book as soon as they can. Now, if, if, um, if somebody wanted to get this book, Linda, how would they get it? They can order it from uh, Linda Howe Productions, Post Office Box 538 in Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania, zip code 19006 the address I've given out, or you can go into any local bookstore and simply ask them to order glimpses of other realities, and they can get it just as well that way. It may take a little longer than uh, Linda Howe Productions in Huntington Valley, but every bookstore in the United States has the, the ability, ability to, to have order glimpses it. of other realities, mm -hmm. and several bookstores already are carrying it, like the Tattered Cover in Denver and Oxford and Atlanta. Uh, so it's just a question of going into the bookstore and telling them to order glimpses of other realities. And I will welcome everybody's feedback, and I will try to answer the letters personally. It's a wonderful title, uh, Linda. Are we, do you think that's what we're getting? Are we getting glimpses of other realities, or, in fact, is it a reality in real time? No, I personally feel that there is more complexity to this universe than we've been taught. Coming to the abductees, and they were probably the first to introduce this idea that we're in something like a radio station. Sure. And that this earth and what we perceive to be this universe might be 91.3 on the dial. But that 104.5 is just a tune of the dial over. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. The quantum physicist for at least 12 years, 15 years, uh, quantum physicists mathematically have been saying that if they go into the atomic structure of, let's say, a linear accelerator and what it is that they keep discovering there, that it forces them to begin to conclude that there have to be other dimensions even if we can't articulate them, draw them, photograph them, or touch them. There's something about a mathematical structure that the universe itself seems to be forcing us to see. 
And this also is one of the underlying themes of the book, Glimpses of Other Realities. And so that's all we get of it. If it's another dimension, we get a bit of a glimpse every now and then, somehow. Yeah, and what if? This is a what if, because I don't know. But what if the whole phenomena of ghosts and poltergeists could be, like sometimes we're listening to a radio station, mm -hmm. and it's another station suddenly is phasing into that station Correct. because we're in the stronger field of that particular broadcast for just a certain period of time on the road, and then it goes out again. Correct. Well, it's possible that, that ghosts are a reality, that polter, pol poltergeist activity and various other things that people have seen over eons and have reported and other people have said, well, it must be in the realm of hallucination mm -hmm. or it gets put into mythology. What if in this next century what we're going to begin to find is that these other radio stations have their own distinct reality, just like the one we're living in, and that maybe there are other intelligences and other radio stations that know how to get into ours. But right now, we don't know how to get into them. All right, for a second, let's assume that's true. Um, if there were other dimensions or are other dimensions and we're getting glimpses and we wanted more, what path of investigation would we most uh, effectively follow, do you suppose? Well, there are several things. Um, Bob Bigelow, the Bigelow Foundation and I, uh, tonight we were talking about the whole, um, the, I guess you might say, challenging area of remote viewing, which has been kicked around, and mm -hmm. I know the government has used it and other people are experimenting with it in terms of accessing things that are at a great distance. Tell everybody what, what, what remote viewing actually is. Well, I have seen one of the famous remote viewers named Ingo Swan show me his own remote viewing work in New York last year. And what you begin to realize is that it is, as he's tried to explain it, you're given a coordinate, mm -hmm. a latitude, a longitude. And that's all the remote viewer usually has. Sometimes it may be a, a concealed photograph, but usually it's a coordinate. And it has something to do with the way that let's assume, and I'm not sure that anybody fully understands how this works, but let's say that the planet has an electromagnetic grid to it. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to see it, but we might measure it, and that our brains are also acting on an electro electrical field, and there are measurable it's a reasonable yeah, assumption. electromagnetic sure. Sure. Uh, fields around the brain. It may be that some people have a an ability to interface their electrical brain field and this electromagnetic field of the planet in such a way that with a, a coordinate, for, so, for some reason, they can go to that place and they will get, and these again are impulses, mm -hmm. they are not visions, but they become, as he said, you go to the impulses before imagination or you go to the impulses of thought that you get, like a quick intuitive flash, and they draw. Would, they the remote, draw. would the remote viewer have to understand in his or her own mind um, what that coordinate means geographically? Would you have no. to be... No. No? That's not the way it works. And why huh. I answered with this is you were asking how might we access let's say, another radio station that wasn't in this dimensional reality, right. we didn't have the technology to get there. Right. Well, the mind, as far as we know, seems to operate outside of time and space. It may be that this, this field that is both enigmatic and yet the remote viewers who do it say that it's really quite uh, cut and dried to them. It is something that uh, they have a focus and their mind somehow goes and they get impulses and then they see or they begin to draw things. So it's not consciously directed. In other words, no. it's, it's, it's just something, some ability the mind has. Well, it's a receiving stimulus of some sort. And I really, because I'm not a remote viewer sure. and I'm not, you know, when you try to describe something you haven't experienced, it's difficult. difficult. I can only report what another remote viewer has said to me. But the whole the whole idea of how do you access that which is the in the unseen. Well, that's what... That's one That's way. how remote viewing began in the Defense Department. It's now, you know, the, the famous book Can you tell there. us what's been documented? Out there. When uh, Bloom in New York did the book uh, talking about the, uh, depart the Army intelligence uh, people in the Pentagon who were trying to use remote viewing to access Soviet submarines. That is now 
a story that has been reported, and apparently there was for a period of time our government was trying to access things under the sea using remote viewing, and in some cases were quite accurate. Okay, when you say access, what was somebody able to do? The, the remote viewer sat there. They gave him the coordinates. Yes, he found the submarine. Did he, was he in the submarine? Did he see what's going on? Did he get signals or? The pages that I've seen from remote viewer notebooks, mm -hmm. they're drawing sketches. The whole time that they're getting these impulses in their brain, wow. they're making sketches on a piece of paper. Full pictures. Some kind. It, it's a, some are more abstract and some are more literal. And this gets into this issue that even if we could remote view, let's say, another dimensional reality, mm -hmm. it still could be argued that it was still a subjective interpretation mm -hmm. on a piece of paper till we got there. But it may be that in the next 50 years that what we're going to see is what more serious consideration of how the mind might be able to interface with other realities. Clearly, our intelligence agencies have used and experimented with a whole variety of mind over matter techniques that's been documented since the 50s in a variety of books. How that will relate to our investigating, we'll call it the unseen, or other realities, or even other planets in this universe, I don't know, but it is one possible technique without having to go there physically in some kind of a craft. Okay, I don't want to pry secrets from you, but is this the direction the Bigelow Foundation may be going in uh, to look at or investigate remote viewing? I don't know. I can't speak for the Bigelow Foundation. They are. Uh, I know that they're exploring a number of areas of research, but this is just one of those provocative subjects that it comes up because it seems to be one of those areas right now where people are experimenting. I have a man who came to me three months ago, wanted uh, me to participate in a program he's doing with uh, remote viewers in which he wanted me to supply whatever I wanted to from the phenomena, for example, that's in glimpses of other realities, whether it was crop circles, animals, or something else. Mm -hmm. So I now have some photographs that no one knows but me what they are unless they violated and opened up the sealed envelopes. And I'm going to get a report back mm -hmm. from remote viewers on what they interpret. So I think what, what this is coming down to is, is that at the end of this century right now, and glimpses of other realities is just one uh, indication that we are, we are definitely living on a planet in a universe that seems to be more complicated and has parts to it that we have not been able as a society, a global society, to discuss in a kind of open way that uh, the universe may be different than we were taught. And right. I think we're, we're in a revolution. We're not alone. There are other dimensions. Quantum physicists are saying that. And the next century, who knows, we may actually access some other dimensional reality. So then with this book, somebody could follow all of your investigations and come to some of those same conclusions independently that you did now. This I, book, I, I don't know if they'll come to the same conclusions, but they will certainly be seeing as volume one. It's, it's one of a volume two set, and I'm, su I'm subtitling this, Facts and Eyewitnesses. In this volume, everything in it is firsthand testimony, mm -hmm. photographs, scientific investigations, lab reports, documents, but it builds up over, I think, the chapters to at least a point of view that maybe even our most ancient past is somehow very relevant to what's happening today. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's $39.95. $39.95. It's a big book. I should tell you all, this is a big book, probably double the size of a normal book, or very nearly double. And uh, it is a compilation of a great deal of evidence, a lot of it in pictures, and uh, I, I think it's well worth your time and your thirty-nine ninety-five. You ought to get hold of it. And now I've got a big surprise for all of you. For 50 lucky people out there, thanks to the Bigelow Foundation, if you call the Bigelow Foundation at 9 o'clock in the morning, not before everybody, everybody starts calling early, 9 o'clock, they won't give you a book before 9 o'clock. Um, if you call them in the morning, there are 50 books to be given to the first 50 callers. That was that's really nice, isn't it, Linda? That's a, that's a big yeah. giveaway. Yeah, I, I I am grateful that the Bigelow Foundation is there and that they can do this because I would welcome feedback from those fifty people who get this book. I really would like to know. No, why don't we make that? Why don't we make that a condition? 
and 50 lucky people are going to be required to feed back a little bit to Linda. All right, that's a deal. All right. And uh, the address again to give you feedback is Post Office Box 538 in Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is 19006. Well, that's great, and maybe we could have the Bigelow Foundation in the morning give that information to the winners as they win. And it's in the book anyway. Well, it's in the book. Yeah. That's right. okay, How great. to contact the author is in the last page of the book. All right, lucky folks. The number to call in the morning at 9 o'clock, not before, is uh, area code 702-456-1606. Let me give that again. Area code 702-456-1606. That's the Big Little Foundation. And what you're vying for is uh, one copy of uh, Linda's brand new book, Glimpses of Other Realities. And you had a segment set aside here, Linda. Yeah, there were two things I was hoping Art to do tonight. And one was a quick update on that strange infrared satellite image that I talked about last Sunday. Yes. And I thought I would share uh, an excerpt from the Denver Post Thursday, January 27th, just uh, three days ago. It is a large headline in the front section, and it says, Mystery Heat Source Sparks Wonder. Lights in the Sky, Strange Helicopters Puzzle San Luis Valley. It's like shades of 1967 all over again when that horse was found stripped of flesh. Right. People were reporting UFOs. There were all kinds of things going on in the San Luis Valley. Well, it's happening again. This uh, particular newspaper story, written by Brad Smith for the Denver Post, starts out, a series of sightings of unidentified helicopters, mysterious flares, and falling green orbs of light in the night over the San Luis Valley has some valley residents wondering what is going on. Military authorities say they can't provide any answers to the mystery, but the chief investigator for the Rio Grande County Sheriff's Office speculated that a cruise missile might have crashed and the wreckage was secretly removed. This is where sheriff's offices think when they're dealing with the strange, the unexpected, and possibly <laughs> uh, something from uh, outer space. It all began January 12th when a satellite linked to the North American Aerospace Defense Command in Colorado Springs picked up an intense heat source emanating from the San Luis Valley. Such sightings were reported to the sheriff, and they went out to investigate, and they reported back that they could not find anything. Quote, from what NORAD told us, the satellite would not have noticed anything that was not bigger than a three-acre fire. Hmm. So whatever it was had to be larger than three acres, and they found nothing. At the same time that the sheriffs were out looking for this large, gigantic fire or explosion, a woman driving out of Monte Vista at 6.25 in the evening on January 13th reported seeing, and this is her quote, a soft green light that looked like a soft ball falling out of the sky in the same area. Her report was confirmed by another man who said the green ball appeared to hit the earth in the Rock Creek area, which is south of Monte Vista. On January 16th, the man who saw the green ball of light said that he saw three B-52 bombers flying high above that area. The three planes dived toward the Rock Creek site, flew over a low mountain called Greeny, and flew away. The next night, the sheriff's office got calls from three different people who said they saw a blue flare in the Rock Creek area. Four deputies in four-wheel drive vehicles went to the area but could not find anything. At night, on January 18th, Sheriff's Deputy Mike James was patrolling in the Rock Creek area and saw three helicopters flying about 100 yards apart. Because of the darkness, the deputy was unable to identify any of the helicopters. The following night, an anonymous caller said, who said he lived south of Monte Vista told the sheriff's office he heard two large explosions coming from Rock Creek. And the last report came January 21 when a resident of the Rock Creek area called the sheriff's office to report seeing a black helicopter flying overhead. The resident did not see any markings, and it was gone by the time the deputy got there. This is absolutely another example of exactly the same kind of phenomena happening in a concentrated period of time. Mm -hmm. Green fireballs, black helicopters, animal mutilations in the San Luis Valley, uh, law enforcement going out after things that aren't there. That happened also in 1967, and the green fireballs were what Lincoln La Paz, a scientist in the 40s to the 50s, was assigned to study in a project that has now come out in public as being called Project Gleam. So whether something now in 94 is reoccurring that happened in the 40s 
We don't know yet, but the same kind of phenomena is now being reported, and I, I will try to keep up on this story because I think it's really quite significant. It is. And I know Michael Lindemann is on tonight. He is. Hold, hold that thought for just one moment. Let me ID the radio station. We'll come right back. All right. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening, everybody. I'm Arthel. This is Area 2000. Linda Howe is here in the studio with us this evening. And I've just told you, and I'll tell you again about the big, big book giveaway, beginning at 9 o'clock in the morning and going until we've given away 50 of her brand new books, Glimpses of Other Realities. All right, Linda, uh, indeed, we've got uh, uh, Michael, Lindemann. Michael Lindemann coming up uh, in just a moment, so... Go ahead. I, I think you've got a way of introducing him. He's a dear friend and colleague, and he and I have spent many hours discussing the colors of why is there so much angry denial about the possibility of another intelligence being involved with our planet in some way. And when I was getting to the area of what's called an epilogue in a book, where you try at least to wrap up some of the thoughts and maybe leave readers with some kind of a launching off point, in my case, to the next book. Michael had written something uh, for a presentation he was given, and he hadn't said it to me. And I asked him, I said, I think that that is such a concise and focused summary for this moment right now. Could I use this, as your quote, in my epilogue? And I want to share with our listeners right now uh, what I think is a very cogent and perceptive summary of the condition of our planet in relationship to this phenomenon. This is from my friend Michael Lindemann. The inescapable profundity of the alien presence has become a source of social pathology in our time. As a culture, we have not yet learned how to tell the truth about something so huge, so strange, and so unexpected. Individuals who make an honest effort to deal with it often discover that their personal stability is at risk. Consequently, the alien presence requires us all to grow, to become stronger and clearer, and to help one another to find our way in the genuine So, Michael, wherever you are, hey. onward tonight with your own perception. Santa Barbara, actually, is where he is, and we're about to go there, but you're not getting out of the studio without signing all that right. book for me. Good deal. <laughs> here, here, here's the pen to use. And uh, that's right, folks. I'm getting a book right now. And if you want one, you're going to have to call at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning the Bigelow Foundation at area code 702-456-1600. Uh, and I think you'll find it indeed very rewarding. This is a fabulous book. There's a lot of documentation in it. A lot of times uh, people complain that uh, authors writing in this area do a great deal of speculation and very little documentation. And this book is full of documentation. So if you want to uh, get a, a good glimpse of another reality and a wonderful book, then be on that telephone at 9 o'clock in the morning. Michael Lindemann was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1949. He became a conscientious objector as a university student during the Vietnam War, developed a lifelong interest in arms control, foreign affairs, and government policy. He earned a B.A. degree in psychology from Antioch University, followed by two years of study at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. He later combined his political and psychological interests as an educator, social analyst, and futurist, first as executive director of the Peace Resource Center of Santa Barbara, then as founding director of the 2020 Group, which is a private research organization studying forces that shape the future. Since 1990, Michael Lindemann has earned national recognition for contributions to the study of UFOs. He first examined the UFO controversy in 1989 from the angle of its possible connection to covert weapons development and social policy, finding substantial evidence in support of UFO claims. He founded the Visitors Investigation Project to conduct and publish UFO research. He has been on many radio and television programs to Santa Barbara, California, and Michael Lindemann. Good morning, uh, good evening, rather, Michael. Good evening, Art. Welcome to the program. Good to have you. Glad to be here. Well, where to start with you? Um, I guess perhaps you might want to comment on uh, Linda's book, which no doubt you have not yet seen, or do you have a copy? 
Well, I haven't seen the final copy, but I have uh, had the pleasure of reading it uh, through. Uh, right. In fact, I've read it through twice uh, because uh, uh, Linda asked for comments from me, as she did from some other people. So I have had the great pleasure of, uh, of, of at least examining the text, and uh, I can uh, echo... Uh, uh, very strongly uh, the sentiment uh, that you've expressed that it is it is absolutely a magnificent book and al although the pictures are wonderfully illustrative of the strangeness and 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 uh, uh, just a kind of a scope of this whole phenomenon I really do think the book as a whole uh, breaks new ground I think I think it's going to stand as a real a real basic contribution to our understanding and I think I just feel very proud of Linda and very glad to have uh, uh, played even a very small part in, uh, in, in seeing this thing through because it's a, it's a magnificent piece of work. Well, look, Linda's still here in the studio, so after that rave uh, review, I thought I'd let her say at least hello to you. And here she is, Linda. Well, Michael is one of those colleagues in the world that is invaluable because um, I trust that he'll always be honest with me if I send him something. And it is not easy material. I need to have feedback from the outside sure. world. And um, I value, Michael, if you hear me, thank you, thank you so many times for the edits on this book. And uh, the other part of it is, is that his context has always been trying to deal with what are the bigger implications politically, socially, economically, Absolutely. religiously. If you take this book and you take what's in there and you say here is a tremendous amount at least of evidentiary evidence, if this is real, what are the implications for our planet and how do we get past the point where we are now that we're alone in the universe to we're not alone and his statement that I read from the epilogue and that perspective that Michael is trying to share, I think, is extremely valuable. Well, that's so, exactly the road we're going to go down right now. Onward, Michael. Linda, thank you. Thank you. Are. Thank you. Take care. Take care. See you, All Michael. Right. Hi, Linda. Thank you. All right. Well, there it is. And, uh, Michael, that's exactly the road we're going to go down right now, or at least to begin with. Um, if Linda's book or a book like it uh, were to most of the scientific world, uh, to to uh, make them stand up and take notice and uh, virtually say, yes, there's enough um, documentation here that uh, we've got a little more than smoke, maybe a little fire. There is something to this. What would the implications for society be? Well, our, the problem that we face is that the implications are subliminally frightening before we ever actually think them through. And this has been true in science many times before. Uh, Thomas Kuhn wrote this book called um, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions in which he uh, put forward the concept of paradigm shift and that has become almost a cliche this idea of paradigm shift but it is actually a brilliant description of No, you're going to have to explain it to me, Michael What is paradigm shift? Oh, we live in a paradigm of, of social agreements A paradigm is a large framework of beliefs that comprise consensus reality. You and I are in a consensus reality. Right. And within a consensus reality, there are certain things which are, which are true by general agreement and certain things which are impossible by general agreement. <laughs> and a kind of a gray zone where science and religion and psychology operate. But the gray zone is actually uh, not terribly risky. The risks people take in science tend, frankly, to be very unrisky in terms of the structure of the paradigm. Because when a paradigm begins to actually be challenged, when the whole basic structure of belief begins to be challenged, everything we call normal, everything we call stable, we call predictable, all of it becomes shaky and scary. Yeah. And no one wants to be in that position. Now, I just, I just lived through the periphery of the Los Angeles earthquake a couple of weeks ago, okay? Right. I'll give you an example here. You know, when the ground is actually moving under your feet, you really are a happy camper. That's right. And when paradigm shift occurs... You're not a happy camper. Everybody gets freaked out, and it's really very serious. Now, this kind of thing doesn't happen very often. 
But Thomas Kuhn, in this brilliant little book, which has become an absolute classic, it's not a very big book, heck, I think you can read it in about two hours, um, this brilliant little book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, he wrote it back in the 50s, and basically what he said was, when this happens, most the, 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 the job of the established authorities is to resist it with all their might. They resist it with all their might. And it is almost as if they are genetically wired to, to, to uh, defend the consensus <clears throat> against uh, the hordes of heathen who are going to overturn everything we call real. I'm curious, Michael, has there ever been an experiment where they have taken people um, and uh, convinced them that the aliens have landed or the aliens have here, are here, other than George Orwell's uh, radio presentation. Has there been a modern um, a parallel to that in which we've had an opportunity to observe exactly how a small body of people might react? That's a really neat question, and I wish I knew the answer. Would you like to see an experiment of that sort? Well, I think an experiment like that could be extremely valuable. Um, my sense is that some studies, some covert studies, have been done. I have heard of studies, for example, that were done by the Battelle Memorial Institute back in the mid-50s. And, and they wanted to assess a number of different things. They wanted to assess, first of all, the reliability of UFO witnesses. And they were quite stunned to discover that UFO witnesses tend to be extremely reliable. If anything, they found out That was very alarming for, for them because they, they realized then that if there was a huge proliferation of UFO reports, the likelihood was there was a high degree of reliability there. Um, but Patel was also commissioned uh, to do a number of more covert studies to assess how the society would react to some of these issues. And because those studies have been uh, sequestered ever since, uh, I don't know anyone who can... Authoritative, uh, authoritatively say what what was in them, but the assumption has been that uh, that they were not at all pleased by the way people would react. Now, the one model that is touted constantly is the one you've already mentioned, which we have uh, the Orwell broadcast in uh, Halloween of 1938, and it was, of course, it's hardly a scientific demonstration, but but as a but as a sort of a symbol of how people react. It was extremely impressive. Uh, people don't react well at all when the reality is suddenly challenged. Right, but there's been a lot of sightings under the bridge since then, and uh, a lot of information and a lot of programs like the one we're doing right now. And I guess the question is, are we better prepared today than we were then? Yes, we are. No question about it. And partly I just think that society does evolve on its own steam. We have a certain fascination for this stuff. And to the extent that we are not viscerally threatened, I think we do actually want to know. And, of course, we have a popular culture that's loaded with aliens and spaceships and so forth and so forth, all of which is probably very useful. More than that, perhaps, there are intimations of a, of a somewhat structured effort to bring us along. Now, the, the truth is, I'm not aware of a single smoking gun that we can actually trot out mm -hmm. and say, see, uh, the CIA did this, or the NSA, or somebody did that, or the president ordered that this be done. Uh, we would love to know that, because many people assume it's happening. I myself am rather convinced it's happening, but boy, it sure is hard to show it. If you were to take, uh, this is going to try and get you to answer a question you may not want to answer, but if you were to take a hundred average U.S. citizens right now yeah. and subject them to the seeming reality of an alien presence, whether it was a landing or however you did it, what by percentage reactions do you think in a modern group you might expect to get? It will depend on several things. Um, I asked that question just about myself, Art. Uh, as much information as I have on this subject, I say to myself, if I'm truly honest, what would happen if I were sitting in my living room and a gray walked through the door or through the wall, <laughs> as they sometimes yes. do? 
I think I would be extremely alarmed, quite frankly, and that's despite all my information. Um, I think that we have a very low tolerance for strangeness. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not true of everybody, but I don't think I'm, you know, I don't think I'm particularly wimpy. Really don't. It, yes, if it we're on a uh, close-in personal level, I think you're absolutely right. But let me tell you something, Michael. I deal with current events and news on my syndicated program every night. I've done so for eight years. The news has become almost, uh, it, it's almost to the point where the American uh, the citizen who's listening to the media mm -hmm. is, is, I don't want to say burned out, but close. It's as though um, every day the news tops itself with some spectacular, I call them head shakers, in which somebody goes in and blows up a whole bunch of people with an assault rifle or something. In other words, the news, we're almost uh, numb. And if, if it were to suddenly come over the radio that the aliens have landed, I, I think that people would be able to take that sort of news delivered in that manner, but but not uh, not the kind of thing that you just set up, not the scenario you set up. If a gray walks through the wall, um, I'd, I think I'd react just the way you suggested you would. Yeah, and I think I think you're right. If it came across <clears throat> on the on the on the radio or the television as news, um, if a person were looking around and their immediate reality were unchanged, but the news was saying we got aliens on the on the White House lawn, you right. know, or whatever nonsense they came up with, um, I think there would be. I think the initial reaction would be a lot of curiosity, a lot of wonder, a lot of. A lot Everybody'd of, run, turn on CNN to see it. I think you're right. Instead of cowering someplace or becoming psychotic or some other outlandish reaction. I think you're right. I think you're probably right about that. Um, uh, the question would be, what next? You know, if 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 saucers sa started to appear overhead, that might change things dramatically. Yeah, that'd be a different story. So that tells us, perhaps, just this this little conversation, uh, if it is an orchestrated thing, if there is a government co cover up, and if at some point they decide to make it public, I think we just you and I just decided the way they would do it. Well, possibly. Um, it has occurred to me that they might actually do something like that to sort of uh, break it to us gently, as it were. I think we have a real problem, though, because we know now that it's possible to show us on film absolutely anything. In fact, we can even, we have such impressive uh, um, powers of illusion now. Uh, I think in Las Vegas, people know this better than practically anywhere else in the world. <laughs> the kind of stage magic which turns up there gives oh, yeah. a strong indication of what is possible uh, uh, when, when a guy like uh, David Copperfield, you know, literally jumps off the stage and starts flying around the room and sure. you know, oh, this guy can't fly, but hey, that doesn't help. There he is. Well, there's still a lot of people, Michael, that think we never went to the moon. The whole thing was done in a studio. You're absolutely right. People do that. Well, you know, <laughs> and my rejoinder to that is yes, and there are people who will tell you with shaking their fist that the world is still is flat. You know, the fact is humans can believe anything, and some of the things they believe are truly outlandish, and this makes our job, when we're dealing with other realities, as Linda puts it, uh, it makes our job actually that much more complex. Um, I think we're right at the edge of having to admit that we are neither particularly well prepared biologically nor are we well educated to take this jump and we really are going to have to stretch to do this all right suppose you were michael in the government well aware that we've had contact for quite a while right. and the government wants to reveal it they say listen michael uh... we want you to tell us the best way to do this with the least disruption Tell us your plan. How do we reveal this to the American people? What would you do? Because they might... Well, I, they're probably going to come to somebody just like you. Oh, boy. Uh, it's a perfectly fair question, and I'm thinking here, holy Moses, this guy's got some tough questions. What do you do, sit up all night thinking of me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very fair question. Um, what would we do? Well, I think we would... We would have to, first of all, um, ask people to uh, sit tight for some very important information and then walk them through uh, some historical background. I think that that's very important. I think, what, I think what happens right away is there's a breakdown in confidence. And what the people want is confidence that whoever is talking to them mm -hmm. actually uh, has the, the quote-unquote answer. Now, that's going to be very tough. 
And that has been a tough problem from the get-go, which is why I think the government has not done exactly what you say, and why, frankly, I am not confident that they're going to anytime soon. Well, we, we do have the example, though, Michael, of the uh, plutonium admissions. I mean, we, we gave shots to American citizens of pl plutonium. Uh, that's pretty incredible. Right. Now, the problem there, or, 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 or let's say the way they're getting away with this right now is they're able to say, yeah, but it wasn't us, and yeah, it's over. And yeah, after all, though it was morally disgusting and medically unconscionable, maybe the damage wasn't so bad. Now those are, you know, those are, those are pitiful, you know, kind of <laughs> yeah. be excuses. But the fact is that the Clinton administration can get away with this because they remain above it. They're above the fray. Exactly. So why not UFOs the same way? Let me give you a, an example. Uh, Representative Schiff in uh, in uh, Albuquerque. It was front page. Albuquerque News is trying to get the GAO to reopen the investigation of Roswell, right. and in fact, it looks like he may get it reopened. Right. Schiff thinks there's a cover-up. Uh, I was in Schiff's office the other day talking with his aide, Mary Martinek, and um, Schiff, uh, as just for his own personal attitude, doesn't really think there's a UFO involved here. What he's what he's convinced of is that there's a cover-up. Because there's, there's a cover-up. We well, see cover-up is becoming almost you know like politically correct stuff to go after. And uh, I think um, Schiff had a lot of, uh, of persuasion from his constituency. I mean, down there in Albuquerque, every, every second person, uh, you know, believes in, in Roswell or knows somebody who knows who was there, sure. practically. Um, so it is interesting and very favorable that he's doing this. Um, I will be as interested as anyone, as interested as you, to see what the GAO actually turns up. But frankly, I am not hopeful. As I continue to look at what, at the position the government would be in with this stuff, it seems to me that they are going to hold out as long as they can if the alien presence itself, if the activity of alien intelligence remains as ambiguous as it is at present, I do not expect our government to talk about it openly. But that would be, I thought, well, there's a way they could begin opening up sort of slowly and say, well, yes, we're releasing some documents, or maybe Schiff manages to get hold of some documents, and it starts to look like Roswell really was something. Um, that would be a way to start releasing information. Well, I agree. I think Roswell is the ideal venue to do this, and if anyone's going to do it, this is a good way to do it. Um, I think we have to acknowledge where, where the real problems lie. We live in a world today which is extremely shaky, and many, many people are turning to very rigid belief systems to sort of protect themselves against the basic uncertainty of life. What we see, above all, is a, is a split between sort of rationalism on the one side and uh, religious fundamentalism on the other. And I think our government knows right. that where the real problem lies is in a very large and growing group of believers, not just Christians, but believers literally worldwide from various per religious persuasions, who will see this as the absolute proof of the end time. And that is mm -hmm. a formula for disaster. Um, I would think there'd be a big difference, Michael, between two revelations. On the one side aliens arriving in little saucers, saucers or something else from Zeta Reticuli, another place, without any connection to our beginnings. On the other hand, if it turns out that they would arrive and they are our genetic parents, then it seems to me you've got something that if you reveal, uh, reveal it uh, is going to cause a complete breakdown. Well or nearly a complete breakdown. It would challenge every religious person out there. I think the genetic the genetic connection or the possibility that we are actually related to these guys is, mm -hmm. is actually becoming one of the central issues of this whole business. Um, that would bring, bring the house down. Well, yeah, and it's, of course that, as you've already pointed out, is a far cry from the possibility that one little saucer crashed in 1947. Um, I think that the people who are the true custodians of this UFO information may very well know or strongly suspect that that is the bottom line. The bottom line is that we have a long-standing relationship with the may even be genetically, but maybe, but very likely culturally related to them in some way. And um, it is. It's a minefield. 
Oh, look, I, I can tell you this. If little guys landed and they claimed to be our genetic parents and it seemed to rule out the possibility of the creator as we understand and think of the creator, there would be an army of people with guns that would fill the little green guys so full of lead uh, you wouldn't be able to tell what they were anymore. That's right. Um, and I think the all indications are that the aliens are in no hurry to reveal themselves and that that has been the only saving grace in our government's position. That, that, that it happens that there is a synchronicity. I dare say not an agreement. Some people say, oh, they're in cahoots. Well, I'm not at all sure about that. But let's say that there is a similarity of objective or a similarity of position in this one instance the aliens see that they're, that they're much better off not revealing themselves overtly, at least not in an organized way. And the, and the government is in no hurry to bring this out as long as the aliens don't push the envelope. I really do think that the timetable is in the aliens' hands. <laughs> um, okay, what is the timetable, Michael? Well, if it's in the aliens' hands, then we really don't know. Now, we hear all kinds of guesses and if you you know you hear them from the psychics you hear them from the channelers you hear them from the abductees who, who are rather consistent in, in the things they're saying you hear it from ancient prophecy you hear it from you know from uh, uh, it, it's amazing it's coming from every quarter of the company mm -hmm. that we are in the in the time zone we have entered the time zone our lifetimes right. michael our lifetime a lifetime before the end of this before the end of the, of the decade that oh, that's is, really exciting. That is the pronouncement you hear time and time again. But I, I do not wish to associate my name with that as a prediction, only as a report of what others are saying. All right. Hang tough. We've got news at the top of the hour. We'll be right back. My guest is Michael Lindemann. There's more coming. Stay right where you are. From Jackie Gons Plaza downtown, this is KDWN Las Vegas. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the second to the last Area 2000, the series. We will begin beginning February 27th. A uh, brand new series of programs, this time syndicated to be called Dreamland. And uh, we're all very much looking forward to the beginning of that. I want to remind everybody that Linda Howe's book is going to be up for grabs in the morning, beginning at 9 o'clock, 9 a.m. sharp. And uh, if you call the Bigelow Foundation and you're one of the first 50, you walk away with a 39.95 beautiful copy of Glimpses of Other Realities by Linda Howe. The number to call at 9 a.m. and not before is area code 702-456-1606. That's area code 702-456-1606. Please be careful with your dialing. Back now to Michael Lineman. Michael. Welcome back. I'm back. To, good to be here. Yes, it's good to have you. Uh, you really are a fun guest. And I, by the way, I would love to have you uh, on Dreamland, which is going to be a syndicated version. Oh, I'm looking forward to that, Art, and congratulations on the new show. Thank you. Um, so, where are we? Government cover-up. You are convinced, Michael, are you not, there is a government cover-up? I'm absolutely convinced. In fact, it's one of the few things I think we can be absolutely dead sure of. Um, all right. That leads me then to say, How? How are we dead sure of that? Well, we certainly have a great deal of documentary evidence demonstrating that there has been, uh, from the ver well, from at least 1947, a great many sightings of craft and various kinds of recoveries of, of wreckage and so forth. Uh, the Air Force has been quite forthright about this. If we look only at the most simplistic reporting, which came out of Blue Book, we can say unequivocally that the Air Force knows that UFOs exist, and yet the, the language which has come from the Air Force and from the government generally has persuaded our public that UFOs uh, are, amount to nothing, are, no, are, are at most fuzzy lights in the sky, mean nothing, and that anyone who sees a UFO is either a crackpot or a person of uh, low... Uh, low IQ or, or low morality, so we've got this language in our culture that, that UFOs are simply an off-limits subject. Now, that was an extremely carefully constructed pattern of disinformation, and, it, and the real construction of that disinformation began 
in the wake of Roswell, but it was formalized into policy in 1953. We know this for a fact because we have the documents. When the Robertson panel report, commissioned by the CIA, reported to President Eisenhower that the public interest in UFOs was the biggest part of the problem, they wrote in their report that the president should institute a policy of debunking, and it was set in motion from that day forward. Debunking became policy of government under that term, and that meant enroll educators and entertainers to help bring the, the message forward, create uh, movies and other images that helped create the proper flavor, which is a flavor of absurdity and, and ridiculousness and triviality, and that has persuaded a whole generation of people to come to it. And I became extremely impressed with the quality of this effort when I recognized myself to be a victim of this, of the success of this operation, that I could live 44 years in a reasonable Here's the absolute truth. Here it is. 
And it was absolute proof. It was just one more theory. I was absolutely right about the theory of this information. But, you know, once the church will put it like this, when the truth is important enough, Sooner or later, they're going to have to try it. The government does not have 
an easy way out. And all you're really telling me here is that they are looking for another way to buy more time. If the government did come to me, that would be my signal that I'm actually rattling their cage. And quite frankly, Art, that's fine with me. I think American people deserve to know and are capable of taking it. I have much more faith. All right, then, all right, then let's move on. Uh, suppose you refused it, as you just suggested you would. Yes. Um, would you, what would you then do? Would you go to the press and you, would you tell your story? Would you blow the whole thing wide open? Well, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if that would actually work, because clearly, if they came to me in that fashion, uh, they would know that uh, they had perfect deniability. So I don't think I would have any grand leverage at that point. It would... Well, you would have, though, a lot of hard information, and how could you continue doing what you're doing without telling that story? Oh, I would probably tell that story, yes, but not with any great hopes of toppling the government or making a huge, uh, making a huge splash. Um, uh, I could make up that story right now. Suppose I said, fine, you go public with this, and uh, A, nobody is going to believe you, and B, we're going to ruin you. Um, actually, that would be highly believable. That, would, that, that, that they could ruin me is beyond beyond dispute. If they, if they choose to, yes, that they could do that. Would that stop me? Would that stop me? Would that stop me? Yes. Yeah, it probably would. <laughs> I don't That's a good answer. I don't think tattling on them is particularly important. I think what we're really after here... Are you there? Yes, oh, I'm right here. <laughs> I was having a hard time hearing you there. I think what we're really after here, Art, is simply continuing the education process. And um, I believe that the people are meant, in this nation at least, to lead the government, not the other way around. And in a national security state, which regrettably we have become, the government takes upon itself to lead the people, but that is ba that's backwards, and, it, and it, it, it is not meant to be. I really do believe that education is the answer. Thomas Jefferson said exactly that. He said, if the people are not well informed enough to make good decisions, then by God, inform them. Do not make their decisions for them. Well, this is a little off topic, but not far, um, because it relates to where we're headed, Michael. A lot of people think we're headed for a police state, virtually a police state. And uh, the indications are that we have gun control bearing down hard on us at the moment. We have crime that's so far out of control that the government uh, uh, just about must respond. Where is this going? If you look down the road uh, with present trends continuing unabated, where are we going, Michael? Well, I happen to feel that most of, most of the efforts of our government are genuinely well meant. And... Though I don't want to sound too partisan, I actually have high hopes that President Clinton will continue along the path of demonstrating that he is actually a man of, of genuine intelligence and goodwill. He's by no means a perfect politician. I don't think such a thing exists. But I think we do have a chance of, of, of doing better than we've been doing. I do not, frankly, subscribe to the notion that we're headed for a police state. I do, however, know for certain that we are headed for a world of grave instability. And even the best government faced with instability on a grand scale becomes extremely defensive, paranoid, and, in, and sometimes dangerous. We're not immune to that. I think that the American people, in terms of growing up, have to recognize that all around the world, uh, societies are being shaken to their roots. My Lord, we just saw the second greatest superpower on the planet disintegrate. And if we think we're immune, we're dead wrong and we're and, 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 uh, putting ourselves in grave danger. But I would not pin it on the government to say that they're the problem and they're, and they're the enemy. Not at all. Um, that well, well they're certainly they're, they're being reactive, Michael, but the, the present trends in society, particularly with violent crime, are horrendous. And the government's going to be forced to respond to that, and it's going to be with, uh, uh, with possibly, uh, in some occasions, with some force. I mean, we could have cities out of control. Uh, you can imagine that, uh, in fact, uh, some of our inner cities right now, Michael, are almost out of control. They're sort of a, a, an anarchy or almost anarchy. Oh, I agree with that. Now, the question is, you know, uh, is, is, is the government uh, to blame or is there any way the government can actually respond? I happen to think the government does not have a lot of options, and actually they look very insecure and very inadequate to the task. Um, we are, we're in for some very tough times here, Art. And yes, to some degree, the government will probably be tempted to crack down very, very hard. Sure. But I think the real difference is here in terms of philosophy or, or worldview is the government po 
populated by people who are genuinely evil and kind of power mongers, or are they, is it populated instead with quite ordinary, average people who have chosen uh, the path of government as their job and who are faced with horrendous challenges? Yes, yeah, that, that generally would be my view. I choose the latter view. So that, does not, that's, that does not actually make for a prettier picture in the short run. We must face the fact that things are going to get very, very dicey. And if you throw aliens in that, well, that that's crazy. Where, exactly. Okay, now I want to do that. I want to throw aliens into it. At some point uh, in a disintegrating social uh, structure, huh? would the revelation of an alien presence be possibly unifying if things were really rough? My belief is that they will hope against hope that that will be its function, and that makes their job of handling the aliens so very, very delicate. Yes. Because aliens can either tip us over the cliff, right. or they can be the linchpin that, that pulls us together. And I do believe that if the story actually comes from the government, it will be a calculated effort to unify behind this uh, enormous new reality. That's the only thing I can imagine that they would try to do. W would you suppose we'd be unifying uh, because of the information or because of a perceived threat? Well, I don't... I think the threat angle is going to be handled, have to be handled very, very carefully. If they simply told the bald-faced truth about, for example, our military capability as against the aliens, we'd, right. that would be, you know, <laughs> that, that is a formula for disaster because our military capability is zero, okay? We have no capability against them. And we've known that for 40 years, which is probably the biggest nightmare we've got in terms of telling a good story. But the question is, is there a military threat? And the answer may well be there isn't. There have been several uh, assessments down the years, starting back in, in, with the Robertson Panel Report, where they have said, and they've said this several times since, there does not appear to be a military threat. And therefore, the question is, are we actually not threatened by, by destruction so much as we are threatened by strangeness, that we are threatened by, by beliefs that don't hold up against this? Um, the reason I mentioned this is m several times during his presidency, Ronald Reagan... Uh, referred to uh, the possibility that humanity or the world would be unified uh, because of uh, because of some external threat or alien threat. She did say that. In fact, I'm, I, I think he said it at least five times mm -hmm. in various public venues. Yeah. And people have held that up and said, isn't it puzzling that Reagan would say such a thing? Well, maybe it is, maybe it is not. It might have just been a figure of speech. The fact is we don't know if, there's any, if there was any grand design behind this. But I think the sentiment does speak to a probable reality. Um, we are uh, in this position where if we remain as divided as we are, we are going to slowly self-destruct. And there are many people who know that. And there are some people who think that the real interest of the aliens in this planet is to see what the silly old humans are going to do. <laughs> that maybe this is just a... a, a fascinating little corner of the universe right now because these humans with with really great capability and great promise are right on the edge of not being able to make up their mind whether they want to live or die. I really do think that that's one way of typifying the condition on this planet. And maybe there are aliens who are just here to see the, to, 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 to you know get their get their licks while the getting's good. Sure. Maybe there are some who are standing by to see if they can lend a hand or step in if it gets absolutely, you know, catastrophic, um, but all of that is, you know, wild supposition. The fact is, if we look only at the human situation, we are right on the edge between being able to move into the 21st century with terrific momentum and terrific promise, or kind of teetering off the cliff and just going, and just... Kind of like the bills in the second half. <laughs> right, right. You know, bombing ourselves back to the Stone Age, as it were. <laughs> yeah. I, and, um... If I, you know, I think anyone in government today has taken on the most thankless, difficult task they possibly can. It's it's a nightmare. Would you, uh, would you, if you were in government, would you, uh, would you want to have it? Would you want to be deciding what to do about all this? Uh, I suppose you would. Actually, you spend all your time thinking about the future and about this sort of thing. So, my presumption is that you you would want the task if it were given to you. I, my philosophy of politics would have to be. To, to trust the people, 
to rise to the occasion. I do not believe we have any other viable option. I cannot say that strongly enough, and that is why I am absolutely in favor of full disclosure. It must be done with wisdom and with care. You can't just throw it like a cream pie. But we cannot afford to allow people to languish in non-information, disinformation, and just sort of wild uh, misapprehension about what's occurring. People know things are going on, Art, and the longer we don't tell them, the less trust they will have. Our trust in government today is at an all-time low. It is, yeah. Frankly, that mistrust is absolutely appropriate and well-deserved. Government has no right to expect the people to trust them the way they have been behaving. Mm -hmm. But at any moment, a government can say, all right, clean slate, we are going to, we are going to start again to trust the people. And because we will trust the people, the people can decide whether to trust us. I don't think we have any other choice. It's going to get very ugly if they don't take that step. Um, present trends noted, are we, uh, in your opinion, headed to the end of this century? Uh, you gave two possibilities, one that we go over and we learn and we progress and we prosper, and the other that uh, we fall down and fail at the last moment. What would you have to predict right now? Truth is, um, it's, it's a, it's a toss-up. All of my indicators are that it is that it is absolutely a toss up. But I am, you might say, wired for optimism. Uh -huh. I do believe we will pull it out, but by the skin of our teeth. It's going to be very scary, and there's going to be a lot of damage. It's going to be a close one. All right, Michael Lindemann, hold on for a moment while we ID. Be right back to you. Gong's Plaza downtown. This is KDWN Las Vegas. Fascinating discussion this morning. This evening. Sorry about that. I work uh, five days a week, same morning. It's hard to say uh, evening, one day a week. Michael Lindemann is my guest. He looks into the future and doing uh, that for us this evening. Michael, uh, are you there? Yes, sir. Good. Well, um... At least you're optimistic about it. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. An awful lot of the people that I've talked to that have gone down the road you and I just went uh, are not that optimistic. And uh, some of them uh, predict very dire, terrible things. I will choose to hope that's not true and that you're right. Do you really conclude that based on present trends? If you only had to read our future uh, based on present trends, would you be optimistic? Or is your optimism born of the fact that there will be a miracle. We'll pull ourselves out. Just general optimism. No, I don't. I'm not, I'm not counting on miracles. I really do think it's up to us. However, I do think that there is, a, first of all, a gigantic resilience in the, in the basic forms of life on this planet, including human life. People discover when they're in, when they're in their worst condition just how much they can take. And it is constantly amazing what people can take. But what I think we must recognize is the amount of destruction that can come from our, from our unwillingness to get serious, the amount of destruction is, is truly awesome. And it is, it is coming. All the trends are very ugly. So we must, you know, sit up, take stock, pay attention, and get down to business. Would you like to see a great public uprising, demanding to know the answer on, on UFOs, uh, if that could be generated, would you think it a good idea? Yes, I would. Um, I, I, think, I think symbolically it's extremely important, and I think it can actually happen. Um, in, in a certain sense, it is occurring, and it, it's, it's occurring at a very small scale now, but it's beginning to build. Um, but I think it goes further than that. I'm, I, I think that the idea of, of, of revealing the truth about the alien presence is extremely important. But I think, too, we have to reveal the truth about a great many other things. And uh, uh, our government has become so used to operating in a caretaker and kind of uh, a paternalistic capacity that they have forgotten uh, how to actually uh, follow the lead of the people. And we have to redo the American uh, constitutional framework. We don't need a new constitution. I think it's very important for people to understand that our constitution is just fine, but we have to we have to get back to doing it the way it was written. Um, now, as for the uh, alien 
business, I do think, that is going to strongly restructure, above all, our religious beliefs. It's going to be, and it's going to take a tremendous amount of wisdom and patience and forbearance to get through that little upheaval. It's going to be quite nasty. Well, I just can't imagine how you would get around that. Um, there would be people who would respond with anger and violence and every manner of disruptive behavior you can conjure up. I, I just know it because I talk to these people all the time. You're absolutely right. That is, that's the best we can hope for, Art, and I don't think... The question is, how long can you put it off, and is that your only option, putting it off, putting it off? As a matter of fact, I do believe that our government has seen it that way, that that is why we've heard nothing, because they see no option sure. between putting it off on the one hand and that kind of uncontrollable chaos on the other. So I think people have to recognize that they have the capacity to rise to the occasion and get through this, but if they follow the you know, the, the, the path of least resistance into their fear, into their reactivity, then things get extremely ugly right away. And that that is what makes this subject so troublesome. Yes. Yes, I agree with you. Um, and I agree that's the direction it would go. So then I conclude a reasonable person could be talked into continuing this until some way could be devised to uh, do it in some way that wouldn't disrupt everything. That is right, and that is exactly what has been done. But I think there has been, however, forward movement in the fact that human beings can be gradually acclimatized to practically anything, and I think that that is the state we are currently in. Although, if you threw it at us right away like a like a like a live grenade, you know there'd be there'd be uh, violence in every direction. Uh, as it is coming out, step by step, little by little, uh, it, we are we are laying the groundwork for more complete revelations in the future. And that is why I, who speak, you know, with a certain amount of criticism about the government and about the government handling of things. Regard myself, Art, as loyal opposition. I believe I am serving a function which is in a certain relationship to the government's function of resisting revelations. I'm saying, look, we must reveal, we must reveal, this is real, and what we get is a dynamic tension which moves the social conversation forward. And I do believe that that is happening all over the country. But what we must do to make it work is to up-level the credibility of the UFO argument itself so that we have more people of the quality of a Linda Howe, for example, yes. who does the extraordinary field work and brings a very high degree of integrity and rational uh, effort to the, uh, to the subject. All right, you've read her book. Yes. How do you think it's going to be greeted since it represents a lot of documentation? How is it going to be greeted in the scientific community, do you think? Well, um, it's interesting because one of the one of the people that she showed it to was an eminent scientist who who uh, took it very very seriously. He was not at all predisposed to believe this stuff, but when he looked at it, he said, uh, "My Lord, this is uh, you know this is very impressive and it's very depressing." He said, in effect, that wasn't the exact word, but he said, "This gives me the impression of a very unfriendly universe," and. Uh, but, but I think uh, what that points up is that um, it, it is profoundly impressive and will indeed cause people to stop and look and assess. Now, Linda was quite shocked, as a matter of fact, when this man, I believe, um, I don't want to be out of line here, but I think it was Fred Allen Wolf who did that. Um, uh, Linda was quite dismayed, actually, that, that uh, Dr. Wolf's assessment was that this demonstrated, uh, you know, a kind of a, a malignant kind of force operating in the world. Right. But I think we have to recognize that um, the material is is viscerally very, very agitating. I mean, it's, it's difficult stuff, even if the agency that is actually causing this is benign. We know so little. We are so new at this. Uh, barely but, out of the cradle on this one. But but if you look at her book carefully and you read the documentation, I understand how he came to that conclusion. There are things that are very difficult for us. Um, sexual organs removed from animals. I don't need to go through the list. You know what it is. And a lot of it does seem 
frankly, very disturbing. I mean, would friends do that? No, not necessarily, but again, if we look at what we have done in the name of testing, you know, a popular cosmetic, uh, not to mention what we've done in the name of feeding ourselves and one another, we would have to say that the aliens have nothing on us in terms of butchery, in terms of grotesque behavior, in terms of what would appear to be gratuitous grossities. Exactly. Uh, humans have written a book on that subject, and we must never forget that, that nothing we have seen, not the worst possible thing we have seen from the, from the presumed alien side is any worse than average day-to-day -day human behavior. But if it, if it does turn out to be negative, and if there was a revelation and it was a negative revelation, that we had something to fear, that we represented basically food or something awful like that to them, um, then wouldn't we get a War of the world sort of reaction? Yes, we would. And I think we have to be very, very careful not to jump to those conclusions. I think that we... I, I, frankly, I don't think that's what's going on. Now, the perception of that is easily put out, and there will be demagogues. I mean, this is the kind of thing that a, that a fanatic of any kind grabs onto and says, you know, waves it in people's face and say, you see, they're here to eat you, or they're here to carve up your children in small chunks, that kind of nonsense, and there will certainly be people who do that. There are people who are doing it now. I really don't believe the evidence suggests that at all. I think what the evidence suggests is a profound mystery which requires that we be much more conscious and much more discerning, much more sophisticated to even grasp the nature of what we're looking at. If we would accept this as a challenge to grow rather than as a reason to fear, sure. it would be miles ahead, and God willing, we will do that. Well, God willing, we will. You're right. Um, I guess... If I, if I were to ask you for the date by which all of this might occur, or consciousness, uh, the dawn of consciousness about the presence, might finally collectively reach some crescendo and everybody says, aha, yes, it is true, there is something to this, they are here, that kind of a slow building revelation, you think that might occur before the turn of the century? Well, it, it, I can only offer a guess. What I say is there's a tremendous momentum occurring. And all the people who are, you might say, casting prophecies seem to be in general agreement that we have reached that period of time right. when something has to give. It has to happen. So I would say, yes, by the end of this decade, we are going to know a lot more than we know now. Well, then it's going to be a very exciting time to be alive, isn't it? Kidding. Yeah, absolutely right. Although you also have to imagine, Michael, what about, the, what about this question, that each generation, particularly the ones that usher in a new century, probably start saying exactly this sort of thing uh, as you approach the millennium. You're right. Millennial expectations are... <laughs> I mean, the human mind is capable of a great deal of fabrication. Of oh, yes. Grandiose suppositions kind of run off the tongue like, like water. I, and I have, you know... I. Whenever I make a serious statement like that, I have to back up and say, hey, you know, I could be completely full of it, Art. Let's face it, you know, and none of us should get up on our high horse and say it's going to happen, at, you know, on uh, August 10th, 1995, or any kind of nonsense like that. In other words, don't sell the house and get ready to greet the visitors. That is correct. But we have to look at trends and probabilities. I think the trends are strong. I think the probabilities are relatively high. Uh, but, right, if <laughs> talking about changing your bank accounts or something, you know, hold your horses. <laughs> All right. What I would like to do is open the telephone lines, uh, Michael. Would you be up for that? Certainly. All right. It's a short segment. Stand by just one second, Michael. Uh, Michael Linneman is my guest. He's a futurist, um, and he's a fascinating guy. If you'd like to speak with him, let's do it. In the metropolitan area of Las Vegas, the number is 383-8255-8255. If you're calling from outside the state, our toll-free number is 1-800-338-8255, The wild card lines, area code 702-385-7214. And then, of course, finally, if you have never called the program, we have a first-time caller line at area code 702-385-7214. 213-7213. And if you're ready, Michael Lineman, are you ready? Yes. All right, here they come. Wild card line three. Uh, good evening. You're on the air with Michael Lineman. Uh, good evening, 
good evening, all right. Good evening, Mike. How are you? Hello. I, I find your conversation about paradigm shifting uh, rather fascinating this evening. Um, Michael, um, I was wondering if you're familiar with some of the writings of Carl Jung on this subject and also uh, French astrophysicist uh, Jacques Vallée. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. Um, how, how do you feel about, um, you know, their whole thought, you know, with Jung feeling that it's... Um, this uh, transition period going into a new age and it's actually psychic phenomena that we're experiencing in ballet who thought that it was um, some sort of paradigm shifting uh, mind control type thing done by uh, those who oversee the world. Right. Well, now, <laughs> you've raised a very interesting question. Uh, Valet is one of several people who has suggested that all of this represents what he calls a control system, and that the control system is actually being operated by the beings we call alien. Um, he's not at all convinced, by the way, that those beings are, you know, are flesh and fluid creatures that like ourselves, but he, they may be operating at a different level of reality. He's very open to the concept of, of extra-dimensional beings, parallel universes, and so forth. And once you start talking about that, you get into a realm where the language of Jung may be, may be virtually, you know, just, a, just a, 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 a modification on the same theme. We have only lately begun to become familiar and comfortable with the concept of parallel universes and other dimensions. But one thing's for sure, when, when Linda Howe says other realities, she is opening up the door to all of that. And we are, I think, looking at more than a 3D event here, an event that is simply physical like ourselves. No, we're really dealing in, at a realm where the human mind is challenged to, to rethink itself entirely. And all bets are off as to just exactly what the limits of reality uh, may be. This is the thing that's the hardest of all. We're very used to, you know, thinking in terms of, of, uh, of physical stuff. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, I experienced something this fall. Um, Linda Howe was talking about uh, green balls of light flashing across the sky in January in, Colo in I guess, Colorado. And it, there was a large sighting in Salt Lake City. I'm surprised it didn't make the news back this September. And I was up in Park City, Utah, and uh, they saw it for miles coming across the mountains, and it was sighted by numerous people and also by uh, the planetarium in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. And I felt, you know, it was just a weird feeling after seeing it because it didn't look like anything that was um, of a meteor or anything of that nature. Well, events like that are being reported all over the world. And, of course, with, with, with as little to go on as what you've just reported, what we, we'd say on the one hand it was profoundly impressive, but on the other hand profoundly mysterious. We don't know what it was. But we have to accept the possibility that we're right at the edge of redefining reality, and that is what we mean by paradigm shift, because reality, the way we've structured it and agreed about it, that doesn't work anymore. Unfortunately, with paradigm shifts, there's also a lot of social turmoil that goes on, and it's just a shame that uh, we're going to have to go through it. So. All right, caller, we've got to leave it there. Thank good you. Good evening. Thank you. That was a good call. Um, all right, uh, on the first time caller line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Good evening. Oh, hi, Art. Good, good to hear from you in uh, waking hours. Where are you uh, in waking hours? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Carmel, California. Carmel. I'm, uh, just picked up your show right now. Okay. And in fact, I went looking for you when I went to the Union Plaza Hotel when I went to Las Vegas. Couldn't find it at all. Well, we're here. Trust me. I'm sure your 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 guest is most astute and uh, really quite a bit on the ball. But it really doesn't matter if aliens are here or if they're not. What's the difference? If they're here, they're already having an influence. If they're not, then there is no influence for them to be had. So it all sounds like just a bunch of uh, long-winded talking to me. <laughs> well, it's nice that you think I'm astute but long-winded. Okay, fine. Um, actually, I think it matters quite a lot because if aliens are not here, then we have what Carl Sagan calls a mass hallucination, which means that humans on a very large scale are imagining something quite coherent and quite distressing that has no external trigger. Now, that in itself would prove to be at least a psychological phenomenon of great interest, if not great importance. However, I do think the evidence is overwhelmingly strong that we have, in fact, an alien presence here. And quite frankly, the implications of that are very, very important, as, as we've been discussing. If you're not convinced of that, then perhaps...
perhaps we would have to go a few more rounds with you, well, but Michael, it is not trivial. Excuse me, Michael? Yes. You did mention the psychological impact of the belief that there are aliens already uh, here and present and contributing to our, our society. Uh-huh. Well, if they're here, that's great. We should find out who they are and uh, get them to spill all the beans that they've got to, you know, to tell. Well, it's good that you... Perhaps maybe they could give us the uh, final clue to perhaps fusion for unlimited power. Well, one would hope that they can teach us a great deal. If they are benign and willing to come forth, then perhaps you're right, and that would be the, the upshot. Unfortunately, there are some other... You seem to be very well adjusted with the possibility that this could happen. The, yeah, but these are non-trivial events that you're talking about, caller. You suggested it wouldn't matter. If any of the things you just described were to occur, it would matter a lot, wouldn't it? It doesn't matter at all, because if they're here and they're having an impact and an influence on our society and our well-being and our level of intelligence, uh, you know, understanding, then we're lucky. If they're not here and it's just a mystery or a made-up thing that is mostly made up of psychological impact, as Michael said, well, then it's just uh, it's something that's generated and created by people's imagination. All right. Thank you very much for the call. It's uh, a remarkably well-adjusted uh, point of view, isn't it? <laughs> Either that or pretty heavy-duty denial. I'm not sure which one, but we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have found that a lot of people, uh, as we've discussed, respond with anger. And I suppose what we might have just heard was a bit of a controlled uh, anger and denial. Well, I don't want to analyze the guy. I, sort of a who cares? Uh, uh, there was a, a kind of an internal contradiction in what he was saying. I, yeah. I don't think it takes any proof at all to say that this would be important. I mean, for example, if, if we go to the furthest extreme of, of what we've talked about earlier, that we are actually someone else's lab experiment, I think that that has highly disruptive possibilities. And the fact is, it, it's just barely possible. That, that may be. Or we're in somebody else's pantry. Yeah, right. Two is equally disturbing. Line two, good evening. You're on the air with Michael Linneman. Uh, hi, uh, Michael Linneman. I got uh, three things, uh, two of them to do with UFO. January 30th, uh, 8.34 p.m., we had a mild quake here in Las Vegas, or, or motion. Uh, the water in the toilet was moving, and the lamps were moving, and my uh, little... Uh, iron thingy that I have in my, near my bed moved. Uh, that was at 8.34, and when that happens, to that extent, usually they have a five, uh, at least a five in L.A. Okay, on to the UFOs. Uh, the Roswell incident is a very, very definite piece of information that should have been followed on by everybody that is in the scientific community and also uh, don't forget, there was 10 to 15 students uh, on an outing uh, looking for butterflies or whatever it was, that, and found the UFOs first, and they were all uh, shooed away. Plus, the other people that serviced the uh, military, like carrying the UFOs off, supposedly, and so on, all of those people are beginning to die off, and I think that that Roswell incident should really be investigated with extreme vigor to, to whoever can afford it. Uh, do you think so? All right. Oh, I absolutely do think so, and I'm also happy to say that, that, that good work has been done. Now, there will be a new book by uh, uh, Kevin Randall and Don Schmidt very soon on the Roswell incident, which will break new ground. I strongly recommend you your eyes peeled for it in April, uh, approximately. It will be out. In July, approximately, the Showtime Network will air a two-hour special on Roswell, which I strongly urge people to be on the lookout for. I'm, I've seen some of the advanced uh, footage, and I'm very impressed. Do you know what the uh, the name of it is going to be? I think it's just going to be called Roswell. Roswell. Uh, and I think people should know that it is a that it is a somewhat fictionalized scenario, but based very, very closely on the known evidence. Now, as for the fact that witnesses are dying off, you're quite right, caller, but there are more today still, more than 30 living eyewitnesses, first-hand eyewitnesses to the wreckage and or the bodies, and what we're trying to do now is arrange a way that these people can speak with impunity to the Congress. Now, I'm also very encouraged by the work of, of uh, Representative Stephen Schiff from the Albuquerque District of New Mexico, who has asked the government accounting office to look into the allegation that the Pentagon is holding information on Roswell. The GAO's first foray against the Pentagon uh, turned up the fact that the Pentagon uh, would prevent them. Instead, they said something to the effect.
back. Leave us alone, you know? Well, you remember, do you remember, uh, Michael, when the whole Watergate thing un unwound? Yeah. Is it not possible that this story could unwind much the same way, and the foot in the door, the break-in in the building, in effect, is Roswell? Yes, that is just possible. If there were any one case that could do it, Roswell would be it, no question. And uh, I, I have great hope Roswell could do it. I, I oh, by the way, I, I, I don't want to let this one get away. Um, there were connections and stories about Bobby Ray Inman, mm -hmm. who was appointed uh, uh, nominee to be the uh, defense secretary, and comments he had made about uh, flying saucers. And um, I, I'm curious how you view his very strange, very strange press conference dropping out. <laughs> you know, it, it's a mystery. What can I say? Uh, I thought his appointment was strange. I was most interested to see what would come out in hearings because Inman does have uh, a reputation as something of a loose cannon, actually. He's, he, yeah. he, um, he's a quirky kind of character, although he's very well connected. Um, it's hard to know why exactly, uh, except that maybe uh, his very deep... Uh, covert connection to some of these extraordinary realities uh, gave him the impression that the heat he might take uh, in the Senate during the confirmation would just be very, very difficult and embarrassing. And he took, in effect, the easy way out by making himself look like a fool. Uh -huh. uh, but but that's, a, that's a guess. I don't know. The man's mind is extremely twisted. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> All right, we're, we're woefully short on time. Let me try to get one more in here. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Michael Lindemann. Good evening. Hello, oh, oh, Art. This is Philip from Bonanza. I have a question. Uh, in Revelation, it describes an evil force coming before uh, Jesus, and I was just wondering what the chances are that uh, UFO technology might be the vehicle for this evil force. All right, Michael. Well, we're going to have to contend with a variety of prophecies of that sort, not only Christian prophecies, but prophecies from other traditions, which in interestingly all seem to come to focus during this period of time. I, um, I have no opinion on the, on the ultimate truth of revelations. What I do know is that uh, many people are likely to see it in the way you have described it. However, if I had to make a guess of my own, I would say let us not assume that this is a sign of the end time. It is, I, I, I rather suspect it is not a sign of the end time, but rather a sign that we humans are, as we have done many times in the past, we are looking at a new, a new take on reality. Now, this has happened before, and we've survived it before. And it has always had religious implications. But for those of the faithful who need some reassurance, I personally feel, it's only my own testament, if you will, that nothing that is happening today in, in, with respect to the UFO phenomenon, nothing at all, Mike, is going to change our basic relationship to deity. All right, we've got to hold it there. Michael, our time is way up. Okay. Uh, you've been a pleasure to interview again, and I would like to interview you yet again on Dreamland coming up. I look forward to it. Michael Lindemann, thank you. And I want to remind everybody, call tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. to get a copy of Linda Howe's new book, free of charge. It's normally uh, going to cost you $39.95. $39.95, but the first 50 people to call the, uh, uh, the foundation will get a free copy at area code 702-456-1606, area code 702-456-1606. Remember... To get Dreamland in your hometown, contact your radio station, whatever your local radio station is, even here in Las Vegas, and tell them you want them to carry Dreamland. Take care till next week, everybody.